Seamen's Compensation Act of 1911 and to create a new system of compensation for seafarers who are injured or killed in course of their employment in the maritime industry. The opposition supports this uh, principle behind the legislation that seafarers should have a rehabilitation and compensation system in keeping with contemporary community standards, as so does the industry that we consulted very widely with. Review of the existing legislation followed the recommendation of Professor Harold Luntz in his review of the Seamen's Compensation. The government claims the government claims that its decision to reform seafarers' compensation along the lines of the Commonwealth Employees Rehabilitation and Compensation Act of 1988 was consequential to the Luntz review. This is not actually the case, Mr Deputy President, because the selection of the CERC Act uh, was, uh, uh, was the government's own doing. The Seamen's Compensation Act of 1911 is clearly out of date. Uh, says it's 81 years old and was acknowledged by the review of the Seamen's Compensation, which was conducted by the professor I've just mentioned. The, of course, uh, Har Professor Harold Luntz was the architect of Works uh, Care Scheme in Victoria. Professor Luntz recommended for compensation arrangements to be on the basis of community standards. Cabinet then determined that this would be the Commonwealth Employees Rehabilitation and Compensation Act of 19. Uh, of 1988, commonly referred to, and I will for the rest of my speeches, the CERC Act, CERC Act. The selection of that CERC Act was not necessarily that of the review report, uh, as suggested in the government explanatory memoranda, but was the government's own selection. The Commonwealth justified in setting out the benefit standards of the CERC Act because this is the only act. That, that has a federal compensation, uh, that is a federal compensation act, but has not explained, didn't explain whatsoever, why an act which relates only to Commonwealth public servants and some employees of statutory authorities and Commonwealth-owned businesses, enterprises is appropriate as a community standard. I thought uh, anything to do with the public service is far above community standard, especially when the proposed legisla legislation, as in this case here, will only cover employees in private enterprise. It is not clear on what basis communality has been determined, other than the fact they are both federal acts and only federal acts as far as dealing with rehab and compensation. There are major differences. The Navigation Act provides separately for a three-month sick leave period regardless of the length of service. Due to specific maritime requirements as need for complete recovery and fitness clearance to work on ships, especially for seafarers such as engineers, etc., where the physical demands are specific. In the second reading speech in the other place, the parliamentary secretary, Mr Snowden, when introducing the bill said, the rate of benefits payable to partially incapacitated employees who are able to work will be on a graduated scale, as generally is in most industries. For these persons, the combined total of compensation plus earnings will be 75%, between 75% and 100% of normal weekly earnings, depending on the number of hours that the employee actually works. But, however, Mr. Deputy President, one cannot be at sea unless one is 100% fit. I mean at sea and working and not necessarily on a, on a pleasure craft or something like that. Seafarers, because of the nature of the work, cannot afford to be 75 per cent. They cannot afford to be 90 per cent and cannot afford even to be 95 per cent. They must be 100 per cent fit if they are able to work. In order to be capable of going up and down ladders, confined spaces, lifting and carrying out in the performance of their duties, and at the same time retaining a sure footing in difficult and unsteady circumstances. People cannot operate at sea under partial benefits because of the need for them, as I've said, to be 100 per cent fit. And so these provisions lifted from the CERC Act are simply inappropriate. The CERC Act itself is subject to a review currently underway, which will almost lead to revisions in the level of an approach to benefits. It is not clear how the results of such a review then will affect the provisions of this, uh, this bill that we are dealing with here today, Mr Deputy President. However, this bill basically ties the compensation and rehabilitation for seafarers to the Surf, uh, CERC Act itself, while the CERC Act is currently under review. So I would like to know what the position of the Siemens Union 
Union will be if uh, the CERC Act, under review, uh, will have some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, rights uh, reduced, some of the compensation or whatever reduced, what uh, sort of action the Siemens Union will take on. I presume we'll have a strike in our hands immediately. It might have been more logical to delay the implementation of this bill until the CERC Act completed its review and the recommendations from that review could have been taken into account in this legislation. If indeed the CERC Act had to be the basis for the le this legislation, then the parliament may as a consequence later on be back here debating amendments to this bill due to the review of the CERC Act, because the government decided to bring forward a bill tied to a system that is currently under review. So this may be a very temporary uh, uh, act as far as amended act as far as no, a new act I should say, without amendment. The government has argued that existing federal standards are the only ones that are appropriate uh, for an industry that is not fixed in any one state. The maritime industry, the shipping industry in Australia, indeed locates its employees all over the place, from state to state, from international boundary to international boundary in the course of carrying out their employment. The Commonwealth argues that there is therefore a need for the CERC Act to apply and that the Commonwealth should fix the terms and conditions of compensation and rehabilitation that we need to have one set of standards established by the Commonwealth that overrides all state boundaries, state differences, typical of what this government is doing in Victoria at the present moment. But this is not borne out by arrangements in the aviation industry, for example, where air crews are also habitually uh, mobile outside their home jurisdictions for extended periods. ANSET air crews, for instance, are covered by home port jurisdiction. Also, all even though they may be out of that jurisdiction for extended periods and may be out of state jurisdiction of any sort. In fact, that could be an international flight to New Zealand. There is little apparent, Mr Deputy President, rationale for the choice of the CERC Act as the community standard. But what I believe it does is represent the penthouse level of standards rather than the basement level in compensation. No one denies that there should be that any employees of any industry should have any compensation that's below, that is below community standards. And if I can quickly find them, Mr Deputy President, I'll just give you an idea of the figures uh, that uh, the CERC Act has in, uh, compared to a few others. And just, uh, just picking quickly uh, the lump sum uh, paid to a spouse, the CERC Act is $139,321 in a lump sum plus others for their children, of course. Under the Siemens, uh, Siemens Compensation Agreement, it's at present moment 74,630, Northern Territory 80,449, WA 83,336, South Australia 80,000, Tasmania 83,000 odd dollars, Queensland 77,000, Victoria 108,000, and New South Wales 150,000. So the only state that's anywhere near the CERC Act is, uh, is New South Wales. So you can see, Mr Deputy President, that it is going towards the penthouse level instead. Nor is it clear why, why it has not been possible to close off altogether the liability of the employers under common law. Under this Act, uh, uh, the compensation will be payable uh, on def by definite amounts on definite occasions, but there is still some access to common law. One of the attractions of the arrangements in the first place is that they introduce certainty into compensation and make trauma and costliness of common law action unnecessary. It would be desirable to close off altogether that trauma and costliness in common law action settlements are delayed, often to the detriment of the claimant and costs escalate to the detriment of both claimant and employer. And I could stand here and give you a lot of examples of that. The bill limits common law action to death and permanent injury for non-economic loss, and for injury, uh, permanent injury it is capped but leaves it as an option in the case of death. It would, be, would have been preferable, Mr Deputy President, to make the bill comp comprehensive in its uh, application. There are other specific uh, matters that we were of concern, and uh, we were concerned which would refer to the Senate Standing Committee on Transport, Communications and Infrastructure. 
The opposition has accepted the explanation of the government and department <coughs> of departmental advisers at the committee's public hearing on the 10th of December that in clause 26.2 the exclusion from compensation from self inflicted injury includes death. And if I can just look at the explanatory memoranda for a moment, Mr Deputy President, it is very it is, hasn't been well defined because in 26.2 provides that compensation will not be payable for an intentionally self inflicted injury. But what it doesn't, Mr Deputy President, go on to specify that that self inflicted injury may uh, may have uh, Included a suicide. I know that in the and it doesn't say anything in the in the minister's second reading speech, whatsoever, that it is to exclude suicide at work. But uh, we have been assured by the government advisers that that uh, that uh, suicide at work would be excluded. But in 26.3, where it provides compensation in the case of serious and willful misconduct of employees, and then it says other than a self-inflicted injury. Uh, so I, while we do take on board the government's explanation, I believe it should have been made it clearer. The apparent exclusion of suicide from this course has caused the opposition, I said, and that's a lot of concern, and uh, I believe that uh, by recognising the employer was not responsible for a minor circumstance that it should have been addressed. The opposition made the point that it might have been helpful to all concerned if the explanatory memoranda had made the inclusion of death under 26.2 far more clear, as I've just said. A similar problem arose from the opposition, for the opposition, I should say, for clause 26.3, where the exclusion of compensation to the employee for injury arising from the employee's own negligence is accepted, but the employee or dependents are still eligible for compensation for the more serious case of permanent incapacitation or death, Mr Deputy President. To hold an employer liable for something over which he has no control and indeed willful misconduct implies actions on part of the employee contrary to the requirements or wishes of the employer seems to me very unjust. The government and the union representative at the committee public hearing argued the clause is a standard one in compensation legislation, both federal and state, which I agree is there, and uh, Senator Cook explained that, that at the time. It's designed to protect the widows and dependents of workers who are deprived of their support as a result of the willful misconduct of the worker. While the argument that employees suffer the temporary consequences themselves of injuries, uh, whereas their innocent dependents suffer the consequences later, uh, where, uh, where we have death or, or serious, permanent serious injury. The issue seems to be one of welfare rather than justice. The opposition may not argue against the need to protect dependents from the consequences of willful uh, behaviour of the breadwinner, but does question the justice of effectively holding the employee, employer in that case responsible, Mr Deputy President. There is a manifest injustice in this, I believe, and including employer liability was justified on no better grounds than it was the easiest way to protect the dependents. And I may add to that, Mr Deputy President, that in no way that can be covered by workers' liability because, the, uh, uh, because insurance companies won't cover it. So it all lies at the feet of the employer. The opposition will not, of course, at this stage, make it a, uh, this stage of the legislation, so, uh, because it is a general one. We're not going to make an issue of it, and it should be dealt with in the context of compensation liability in general. It is one for the opposition simply to take on board at this stage and to look at in greater detail once in government and in consultation with the states. Now, Mr Deputy President, social, se social security covers cases where you have unemployment, they cover where you have sicknesses and in a host of other circumstances. And I believe in this case here, where one loses their life, where a person loses, the breadwinner loses his life by willful misconduct, then I believe that it should be taken up by Social Security. Because if it's not, and in this case we are in a happy situation where all of these employees are employed by substantial employers where 
they can probably, well, they can cover such a situation. But if, you, if this award is in, and is certainly is in other, in other awards where you've got an employer of uh, not so much substantive means, then that employer could be sent to the wall, and uh, then, of course, the uh, other employees of that employer will finish up on uh, compensation just alongside uh, the, the children, the wife and children of that employer, of that employee that uh, lost his life by his own, by his own uh, means. So I believe that is certainly a measure that our, our, the coalition and the government will be looking at. Another matter of concern raised at the committee public hearing, Mr Deputy President, was clause 97, in particular the mandatory requirement for safety net fund to reinsure for ca uh, catastrophe uh, with a, a liability of more than $1 million. The safety net fund is run by employees to cover employees on industry training courses and those on rust or in transit from ship or a place of training and may become liable for catastrophe or an event which results in several expensive uh, claims arising from a single accident. Uh, there appears to be inadequate consultation on this clause, which the industry claims was introduced without proper consultation with the Employers' Compensation Agency, and in the employer's view cuts across the exercise of the commercial judgment by the fund's administrators. And it is at odds with the principle of industry and employer responsibility reflected elsewhere in the bill. In the opposition's view, Mr Deputy President, the reserve power to assume responsibility for safety net provisions are sufficient to safeguard the responsible commercial operation of the fund. And commercial responsibility should lie with employers and the industry until the minister's reserve powers under the bill become necessary, including the responsibility to access prudent levels of risk. The department argued from the position that the need for some level to trigger reinsurance was an assumed requirement, and the industry representative at that inquiry indicated the major objection of the bill as it stands is the arbitrary setting of that level at $1 million on the grounds that the industry is well able to withstand a higher level of risk and should, if the fund judges it to be commercially viable, be permitted to do so. The opposition sympathises with this view and has accordingly drafted an amendment which, while still maintaining a, re a requirement to reinsure, enables the level of prudence to be set in consultation uh, with the industry and to be reassessed from time to time. It may be that industry is well able to withstand a higher re level of risk, and I've got, I have an example which I haven't got time to give you now, and the fund should have commercial freedom to determine this. The opposition will be moving in this amendment in the spirit of finding a position that is acceptable to all and does not compromise the rights and freedoms of any participant. By setting a prescribed figure, Mr Deputy President, and requiring the minister to consult with the industry before prescribing it, the industry will be able to put forward its case, and the minister will have the flexibility to react to changing economic circumstances, which will be including bringing that figure below the $1 million should he uh, think it, it should be so fitting. The bill pre uh, presents a laudable principle and uh, noble motives, but nevertheless shows signs of arbitrary dealings which were not dispelled in the committee's public hearing. The Cabinet decision to accept that CERC Act and noble, in uh, uh, noble incentive, but nevertheless shows its signs that that's not quite the way to go. The decision uh, to uh, adopt a CERC which certainly does not line up with community standards, but is exactly what Cabinet decided. Explanations for the decision, Mr Deputy President, to adopt CERC Act as the so-called community standard envisaged in the lunch review are still needed. There's still a lot of loose ends, Mr Deputy President, tied up because the bill, the bill was hastily put together and uh, it was pushed through the, the House of Representatives on the 14th of October. Why it was pushed through so quickly is not quite clear. The opposition supports the principle and the intention of the bill, but does this in the first instance where the government has imposed compensation and rehabilitation requirements that it uses for its own public sector upon the private sector. In other words, we've got CERC Act order, pushed on the order, private Senator, sector. Your time has expired. Senator mm -hmm. Bell. Mr President, uh, the Democrats welcome this bill, as uh, do 
uh, most people involved with the industry, if not uh, because it is uh, brilliantly uh, uh, comprehensive and implementable, uh, if not that, then certainly because it is a blessed relief to see a bill to replace the Siemens Compensation Act 1911. And uh, the Siemens Compensation Act 1911, even by its title, uh, leads us to believe that uh, this bill we have before us today has been long in the waiting and uh, therefore it is welcomed, uh, as I say, uh, at least with relief. Uh, the, uh, the concerns that have been expressed by Senator Panizza regarding uh, uh, details and regarding uh, apparent uh, inconsistencies are concerns which uh, uh, were drawn to the attention firstly of the uh, uh, Committee for Scrutiny of Bills, which I'm a member, uh, and uh, there were found to be uh, uh, several uh, factors which uh, needed to be addressed. Uh, I'm satisfied that the government has made a uh, valiant effort to address those, and uh, the, uh, uh, the subsequent uh, committee hearing also uh, addressed some of the concerns that were expressed there. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, some of the, uh, the concerns were, were ill-founded. The, um, <coughs> the Democrats have been uh, have had represented to them the concerns of both uh, uh, employees who would be re uh, affected by this and industry representatives as well. Essentially the case that's been put to us is, uh, is connected with this sense of relief that at last there is a bill presented to Parliament to address the inadequacies of the Siemens Compensation Act 1911. And uh, uh, essentially the case boils down to, well, if a, uh, if a bill is presented to Parliament to address uh, the problems of that Compensation Act, then uh, even if it is uh, less than perfect, uh, it will be acceptable. And uh, I must say I have some sympathy with that particular point of view. And I think uh, to, uh, to emphasise the slight inadequacies of this bill now and to refuse its passage uh, on the grounds of those slight inadequacies would, uh, would frustrate both the employees concerned and the industry itself. And so, uh, of course, we would not propose to, uh, to oppose it uh, on those grounds. We would uh, uh, welcome um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the ongoing attention to some of the details which are uh, purported to be problems. And uh, I won't here uh, attempt to offer a solution. Uh, it, I, I doubt that that's neither, either my role uh, nor would it be uh, uh, capable of being implemented at this stage. So um, I have little to add other than to say that uh, the, um, uh, the case which was presented to us uh, by the employees who would be affected uh, overwhelmingly uh, brings us to uh, supporting the bill. Uh, the depth of uh, detail that Senator Panizza addressed uh, I can see merit in some of uh, the, the claims that were made by Senator Panizza, but I do believe that uh, uh, the criticisms are somewhat overstated. Uh, for example, <coughs> the criticism that uh, the CERC Act doesn't represent community standards I think uh, can easily be demonstrated to be uh, overstated by the fact that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the CERC Act itself uh, its administration in this, in this particular instance. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not just a case of handing over without any modification what would apply to, for example, public servants operating in Canberra and assuming that that would be relevant to the seafarers uh, operating out of Wyala or whatever. Um, these, uh, these assumptions are, are just a little bit too easy to make. And in fact, they are governed by a bill, uh, an intensely uh, uh, modified and complicated bill, which, which covers some uh, almost 80 pages with an explanatory memorandum of some 75 or so pages. It is not just a case of saying the CERC Act applies to, uh, to seafarers. There is, uh, uh, there is uh, considerable detail attached to how and when and where and what provisions and, uh, and what is involved. 
The, um, there was at one stage a suggestion that the uh, rehabilitation requirements, uh, which were welcomed and uh, which are a, a much more modern attitude towards uh, uh, workers' compensation than had been in the past, um, that rehabilitation was a little more difficult when dealing with seafarers, that uh, uh, the term able-bodied seaman uh, was, was not a quaint term but in fact a very practical uh, description of what was required to go to, to, go to sea and that persons in wheelchairs or uh, uh, persons who were disabled physically uh, were um, much harder to rehabilitate for uh, seafaring jobs. Um, it, uh, that, that was a, a complaint which was registered early in the discussion with us but in fact uh, 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 only a little imagination is required to see uh, or to understand that uh, rehabilitation can mean a lot more than adapting um, uh, wheelchairs or other devices to help uh, disabled people uh, move about. Rehabilitation also, of course, means uh, restructuring jobs and uh, reconsidering um, what roles a person might perform and uh, counselling and uh, uh, other activities which help a person return to work of some sort are included in the description of rehabilitation. So even that, that, that initial criticism uh, is one which, can, which has been addressed and which can be delivered uh, through, this, uh, through this bill. Um, I don't need to take any more time with the, uh, with the Chamber to, uh, to illustrate that the Democrats will be supporting the bill. Yes, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I, I just uh, want to comment uh, very briefly on the uh, uh, First Amendment that the uh, uh, Liberal National Parties were intending to move um, and which we discussed in the uh, uh, committee hearing. I should say, of course, that I support everything that Senator Panizza said uh, and said very well in relation uh, uh, to the bill. I, in relation to the amendment, we were considering moving uh, of... Uh, uh, to uh, clause uh, 26 in subclause 2, um, we were convinced at the hearing that, uh, uh, that the legislation is intended to say uh, what, in fact, our uh, amendment was uh, proposing. Uh, I simply want to uh, put on record in this chamber, uh, for the record, and in case it is of some assistance when this matter is uh, being uh, dealt with. Uh, by the uh, parties involved at some future time, that I would have thought that the better wording uh, for the uh, uh, subclause 2 would have been uh, in this way, and I, uh, I, I quote, compensation is not payable for that, in for that injury if it is intentionally self-inflicted. I think that would have been a clearer way of saying what the government advisers uh, indicated to us that clause intended. But uh, it appears uh, from our committee hearing that we're all of a mind on what that means and uh, I simply rise in this debate to again emphasise that uh, should it be of some assistance for people trying to interpret it sometime in the future. Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I think what we are confronted with on this bill is uh, unanimity in terms of the purpose of the bill. Uh, a considered debate about, uh, with different weightings of uh, importance attached to it about, the, uh, uh, about one element of this bill, that uh, element being brought out in a committee hearing in which evidence was adduced from both uh, the employer organisation and the union as well as uh, the department concerning the uh, status of uh, people affected by uh, uh, death or, or, or a significant disability in circumstances in which uh, they may have contributed to, uh, to uh, those things themselves or did contribute to those things themselves. And uh, a consideration by the coalition of the uh, provision in this legislation concerning um, catastrophe insurance and an effort by them in a foreshadowed amendment in the committee stages to, um, to uh, provide another solution to the one the bill provides uh, to uh, meet that problem. Mr uh, 
Mr. Acting Deputy President, uh, therefore I think the real debate is over whether or not the proposed amendment in the, in, on catastrophe insurance uh, is satisfactory. And if that debate is resolved, uh, whichever way it is resolved, I think the, the bill is then satisfactory to the Senate. I don't, in, in those circumstances, I want to thank the contributors to this debate and members of the committee uh, for the role that they played in, uh, in examining this issue in detail and for the views that they have put. It is true I don't agree with the views that have been put uh, in all cases, but nonetheless I acknowledge that they've been put after some earnest consideration and do reflect uh, a genuinely held, held views and raise and deal with matters of some significance. I would say, however, in terms of uh, a compensation payable to people who may have contributed or in fact did contribute to uh, uh, significant disability or death in their own cases, the debate on that issue, uh, while interesting, has perhaps not brought out this fundamental fact. The legislation we are proposing to deal with that is legislation copied from the previous Act in effect, and so we're continuing an existing principle, we're not inventing a new one. Additionally, I would say that uh, all workers' compensation acts in the States uh, reflect a principle of this type, and they have not invented a new solution to it. They have persisted with the same solution we are offering. And that uh, the acts in the States have remained consistent on this point, irrespective of what party was in government. Now, I recognise that uh, there is, out of the inquiry process conducted by the Senate, an acceptance of this position now, albeit with, fair enough, uh, the views put by Senator Peninsula, which, which I agree with Senator Macdonald, were well put. But I think that the, uh, the material uh, facts that I've just put about the background and history of this probably round out a consideration as to why the government uh, and why, in fact, the opposition too now uh, support the proposition. In order to speed the consideration of this matter uh, before the Senate, I will uh, conclude my remarks on the second reading now and uh, hear what uh, may be said on the motion to be moved by the opposition on catastrophe insurance and reply to the uh, to that argument in the committee stages. I commend the legislation to the Senate. The <coughs> question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. <coughs> Seafarers Rehabilitation Compensation Bill 1992. Seafarers Rehabilitation Compensation Transitional Pro Provisions and Consequential Amendments Bill 1992. Seafarers Rehabilitation Compensation Levy Bill 1992 and Seafarers Rehabilitation Compensation Levy Collection Bill 1992. There is one bill with the amendments, and that is the Seafarers Rehabilitation and Compensation Bill 1992. Is the wish of the committee that that bill be taken first? It's so ordered. The question, is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is the bill stand as printed. Senator Panizzi. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Before I formally move the two amendments, amendments standing in my name, I was wondering if uh, the Minister at the table, Senator Cook, who didn't mention what Senator Macdonald had to say in the second reading speech uh, regarding subclause 26.2, in which he uh, raised the point that, uh, as we were assured at, at the inquiry, that that doesn't include that it doesn't include death. In other words, where uh, it was put that uh, well, it, oh, I'll read it. Provides that compensation will not be payable for an intentionally self-inflicted injury, and uh, I was wondering if the minister is going to agree with what the. Is what his advisers said at the hearing <coughs> that that doesn't include paying for death or suicide in that case there. Well, you might as well stick it in there. 
The Honourable Minister. Um, I, I do apologise. I, I neglected to uh, deal with that point in my second reading reply. The, um, uh, I've just been assured, because I've sought further advice on this, so that my answer can uh, be not only what I believe, but be confirmed by what my uh, official departmental advice assures me is the case. Uh, and I'm advised that uh, willfully self-inflicted injury resulting in death is, is not compensable under uh, this Act. Okay, then. Well, thank you. So I thank the Minister for that, is, uh, for that assurance. And uh, Mr Chairman, uh, can, will, we be, uh, will I be able to move uh, both amendments and deal with them at once? Or You'd, you like to move both. You'd like to move both together? Yeah, Mr. <coughs> President, Mr. Is Deputy the, President, is, I do uh, officially oh, move. Oh, look, is leave granted for the two amendments to be moved together? Leave is granted. Senator Benissa. Yes, Senator Benissa. Yeah, well, Mr. Deputy President, I thank the Senate for leave, but uh, uh, seeing the two amendments are, uh, do rely on each other, I formally move the amendment standing in my name. Now, the reason uh, for moving that we uh, take out the figure of $1 million and, re uh, and insert a prescribed, a prescribed figure is the reason I did say in my second reading speech, because I believe that uh, $1 million is not that uh, great an amount for uh, this sort of industry or combination of uh, various uh, people in industry or companies in uh, industry to cover, that sort, to cover that sort of amount. And I'll give you an example uh, of, of a catastrophe event where you take uh, trainees onto, into a training uh, session and uh, let's take we have a coach carrying trainees involved uh, in a serious collision and with five, say, dead and ten totally incapacitated. The lump sum payout would be five by 250,000, approximately under common law, to defend the dependence of the dead, plus ten by 100,000 under section 139.9 to the injured. Total lump sum of $2.25 million spread over 2,000 births in the industry at large is a thousand and twelve dollars per birth. Now, Mr. Deputy, Mr. Chairman, total uh, compared with the uh, normal total wage salary bill of around one hundred and twenty thousand dollars per birth, the risk of the industry being unable to meet such an immediate call to meet their liability is negligible. And of course, if you've got the case of ongoing weekly payouts, it would be much less per birth per year, and uh, may well decide. That it could be the industry may well could decide the immediate risk of lump sum payout of around two million dollars, but ensure any excess. That, however, would be the commercial decision of the industry. So that's the reason, Mr. Deputy President, that we have moved these two amendments, and I thank the, the Democrats for the, the intended support, because it's uh, as the union representative told us at the inquiry that after all, so what ensuring in excess of a million dollars is cheap but that may not be the case in uh, that may not be the case in five years time that it is so cheap and uh, I believe that if an industry can carry its own risk by its own cash reserves then I believe that it shouldn't be falsified into insurance in the lower figures the lower figures of the end and uh, by putting a prescribed figure uh, which is covered in, in, in the amendments, and added to in the second amendment, by having a prescribed figure, the minister can, uh, with the consultation, either move it, uh, move it upwards or he can move it down. As I said, if the minister uh, or particular government think that a million dollars, even taking a, a risk of a million dollars, is too high, in consultation they can bring it down. And of course, he would be doing so, as he says in the amendment, in consultation with a fund the Australian National Maritime Association the, uh, and the Australian Minerals and Metals Association as to the amount. I say that's the reason, Mr Deputy President, Mr Chairman, that we are moving that amendment and uh, we'll leave it at that. Senator Bell. Uh, Mr Chairman, uh, the uh, Democrats are uh, convinced by the uh, lucid arguments of uh, Senator Panizza on this matter 
and also by its uh, inherent logic that uh, to, uh, to include a, uh, a finite amount in legislation, uh, firstly, uh, <coughs> we believe, attaches with it its own perils, in, uh, as Senator Panizza said uh, towards the end of his contribution just then, uh, becoming outdated rather rapidly and becoming irrelevant in certain particular circumstances. Uh, uh, just take a moment of the Senate's time to, uh, to illustrate why, in an entirely unrelated set of re legislation, I was reminded of that last night, where um, uh, at uh, a, a dinner for uh, the alumni of the, gra the graduates of Tasmania University, I was sitting next to a, uh, an experienced uh, graduate in law who reminded me of uh, the attempt in Tasmania to remove uh, finite amounts defined in legislation and replace them with indexes, indexes or um, uh, coded amounts which uh, increase as uh, the, uh, the value of money uh, increase or decrease as the value of money changes in society. And it seems ludicrous that we have uh, still in legislation finite amounts, you know, fines of uh, 20 pounds or uh, uh, converted to 40 dollars as being considered relevant. Uh, perhaps they, those sorts of amounts might have been in 1950 uh, when they were first defined, but become irrelevant with the passage of time and the change in value of money. And here we have a million, a million dollars defined as being seemingly relevant at the moment, but potentially, as Senator Panizza has said, potentially irrelevant with the passage of only a few years. And um, the, uh, the other explanation that uh, Senator Panizza gave of the capacity of the industry to, uh, to meet its own costs uh, uh, in certain circumstances and uh, in, uh, in certain uh, situations. Uh, that capacity uh, has been accurately described and surely uh, can also be accurately uh, uh, deliberated uh, with consultation with the minister and that is what is proposed in this, uh, in this uh, amendment. Uh, we support uh, this for both of those reasons and uh, we believe it improves the legislation and uh, also expedites the, uh, the, uh, the fair and equitable delivery of what the legislation is trying to deliver. So therefore we support it. Senator McDonald. Mr Chairman, uh, I uh, support uh, the arguments put forward by uh, Senator Panitzer and Senator Bell. Um, the Industry uh, is made up of some of Australia's leading companies. Uh, uh, they are well able to insure or to self-insure up to uh, a reasonable amount. And uh, the consequence to the industry of um, having some flexibility in the, self, the amount of self-insurance uh, means that they do save a considerable amount of money in, uh, uh, in premiums which they would otherwise uh, have to pay to insurers. So it is a saving to the industry and uh, in these days I think everyone recognises that the industry uh, includes both employers and employees and it is for this reason, uh, as well as the reason Senator Panizza has very clearly uh, pointed out, uh, that uh, we move these amendments. Mm. I just, uh, uh, at a slight tangent, Mr Chairman, uh, and without being too pedantic, uh, the Minister in commenting on uh, section 26 did confirm, uh, as Senator Panizza had asked, and he used the word willfully, uh, whereas uh, the uh, Act refers to intentionally. Uh, there is a slight uh, variation in law in willful and intentional, but I, I simply uh, put on the uh, record that I I assume the minister was meaning intentionally in the terms of the. Uh, yes. yes, thank you. Uh, the minister has interjected. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, can I make a valiant effort to try and wrap this up by a quarter two when we might adju normally adjourn for lunch? Uh, look, the amendment that's been moved doesn't offend us, but we would prefer, obviously, our own position. That's not to say we'll roll over or go to a vote on the voices and we'll concede at that point, but. Uh, can I say, firstly, these things. The um, consultations were engaged in. The employer organisations did say they would consult an Australian insurance company and come back with a quote. Two months elapsed. They didn't do that. We had the obligation to present the legislation. We have done that. The, um, uh, the other factors are that uh, 
This sort of thing is typical of state and territory compensation schemes, and the level we're talking about, one million, is typical of those too. We're not out of uh, sync with uh, the states and the territories. And uh, the third point I make is that the cost we're talking about here is, is frankly infinitesimal. However, uh, the, the, well, we can argue about whether infinitesimal is large or small uh, in degree, but rather than go to actually quoting the figures, which would take a lot of time, let me rely on the assertion. The amendment, uh, if it were to be carried, has these defects, which I'm surprised uh, the Democrats just accept, frankly. And that is that the proper name of the organisation is not the Australian Minerals and Metals Association. There is no such organisation I'm aware of. The proper name is the Australian Mines and Metals Association. And the second defect is that this requires consultation in an industry with a long industrial tradition of only the employers. There is no provision here for consultation with the unions. And since the purposes of consultation is to try and get a, an agreed outcome to exclude a major party that, is, that plays a significant role in this industry would be wrong. And uh, I would be more kindly disposed to the amendment if it would read uh, uh, consultation with the fund, employers and unions, rather than name just the employers. I might even agree to it then. Just taking up that point there, uh, the minister did say it's infinitesimal at present moment, the insurance. But what I did say, what I've said earlier uh, in my second reading speech, that it is at this stage, and uh, it has got a big bearing. You don't know what the insurance premiums are going to be in five or ten years' time. So I still do believe that if it's within the capabilities of the employers to carry their own, it's far cheaper. And, uh, and with the, the power that the minister will have to prescribe, whether he can move the million up or down, and the reason that I believe uh, he can, he, under circumstances, he'll bring it down, is if, if we've had a few catastrophes, one after the other one, the minister said, well, the, those employers mightn't have the capability to pay out another catastrophe, so I'll lower it to half a million dollars. That is the reason that uh, behind our views to insert that clause. Uh, Mr Chairman, uh, just on the other matter that the minister raised, uh, the minister, I, I understood the uh, employee's representative at the committee hearing wasn't terribly uh, interested in that particular matter. It really is a matter between uh, the employers who have to pay the insurance or pay the premiums and, and the government. Um, as far as the employees are concerned, their, their only concern is that they do in fact uh, that they are in fact covered. Uh, should uh, a, catast a catastrophe occur, and um, by accepting the first amendment, I, I think the government concedes, as we all do, that the employers are well able to to cover that the excess sort of thing, um, and it's really just a question between the government of ensuring that it, it it's not uh, unreasonably uh, high or unreasonably low, and, and consulting with the employers who have to pay it. Um, and that they come to some agreement. As far as the employees are concerned, as I, as I say, their, only, their, their principal concern is that they do get paid, and I think the government and the employers would uh, ensure that with the raising or lowering uh, of the amount. And as I say, whilst I don't think it was specifically put to Mr Byrne, uh, uh, he was there, he was uh, participating very intelligently, of course, in the uh, committee hearing. I don't think he was particularly concerned about the uh, uh, matter. In practice, no doubt the government would also would as well give, oh, no. give them a call. There have been 12:45. Uh, I shall report progress. Been 12.45. I report progress. Order. Matters of public interest debate. Uh, Senator Bell appears to be the first name I've, I've got on the list that's before me. Senator Shot. Oh, thank, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I want to raise uh, speak and spe uh, raise a matter of uh, public importance about the affairs of the Liberal Party in South Australia. Which have, just, which have just come to light 
in the last, uh, the last few hours. First of all, it was announced, uh, reported in today's Adelaide Advertiser, that in the, a seat of, uh, the, seat, the federal seat of Sturt, that the former federal Liberal member for Adelaide, Mr Michael Pratt, has announced that he will be running against uh, the endorsed Liberal candidate, Mr Pine. Also in the same article in the, Ad in the Adelaide Advertiser, uh, it indicates that Mr Wilson, the sitting member who lost endorsement, is also keeping his options op open about running as an independent, ca uh, as an independent candidate against, uh, against Mr Pine. Um, I, I must say this is an astonishing development uh, where not only did the sitting member lose his endorsement, but a former endorsed candidate to the Liberal Party and sitting member for Adelaide is running against him, uh, as well as now the sitting member considering uh, that he will run. But uh, further information has come to light this morning in, a, in, in Adelaide. Mr Pratt obviously was contacted by the press when he announced that he was going to run as an independent. And on a radio interview this morning on the ABC program uh, uh, compared by Keith Conlon on Radio 5AN, um, he interviewed Mr Pratt. Uh, and not only did Mr Pratt confirm that he would be running uh, for the seat of Sturt, he then went on to say that uh, at a recent meeting of the State Council meeting of the Liberal Party in South Australia, there was a move to expel John Olson from the Liberal Party. Now, uh, he said that the media hadn't picked this up. One of the reasons, of course, in South Australia that these things are hard to pick up initially is that the Liberal Party bans the media from attending their State Council meetings. Uh, they hold them in secret or attempt to hold them in secret. But in this case, Mr Pratt, a delegate to the, to the council uh, meeting, has spilt the beans that there is a, uh, uh, a move against John Olson. He then confirmed uh, that, uh, in response to a question from Mr, Con uh, from Mr Conlon, the compare, was the move by Brown supporters. Yes, it was moved on the floor. I guess they didn't get John, so I guess at some, at some meeting they'll probably want to move to expel me. Um, so, we have this extraordinary situation that a former leader of the Liberal Party in South Australia, a senator in this place who went back hoping to be leader again and didn't count properly and ended up not being on the, uh, on the front bench, uh, uh, being on the front bench only, made an unsuccessful attempt recently to become uh, deputy leader of the Liberal Party and failed again because he couldn't count, is now a move by the Brown supporters, according to Mr Pratt, that he's going to be that he is an attempt to move to expel him from the Liberal Party. Well, all, I, I'm only quoting. I, I'm, uh, he wasn't at the meeting. Well, all I'm saying is that Mr. Pratt, Mr. Pratt. Uh, well, I've th well, I'm sure, I'm sure, Senator Hill, that you'll get up and uh, put put the re you'll put the record straight, uh, as far as you are aware of it. But what I find interesting is that you, your party in the past was good enough to endorse. Uh, your party was good enough to endorse Mr Pratt and, you, were and you, you wallowed in the victory when he won the Adelaide by-election in 1988 as Mr Pratt was one of the new young bloods in the Liberal Party to regenerate the Liberal Party and now when he's running around dropping buckets on you, you don't want to know him. Uh, and he does say in the interview uh, further, uh, Mr Pratt says, Keith, I don't mind in life running and losing. I've won and lost a lot in contests, but yeah, come back to that in federal Adelaide to be rolled by an out of the hill by the out of the hill faction. You know Robert Hill said, Oh Praddy, they don't take too kindly to losers in the Liberal Party. This is this is after me taking Catley to an inch, and Bob is absolutely relieved that I that I'm not running against him. So he, he's fingered the, the leader of the Liberal Party in the Senate as being part of the coup that knocked him off for pre selection. But then Mr Pratt goes on to describe the endorsed Liberal candidate for Adelaide in the following terms. To be, rolled by an, an, to be rolled by an idiot vet who wants to, and I quote, and this is Pratt speaking, and I quote, stick glass rods up people's penises and crush them, end of quote. That's the description he gives of the Liberal Party candidate, the Liberal Party candidate for Adelaide. Now, you have to ask Mr Pratt the reason why he would describe the Liberal candidate as not only an idiot vet, but who says, but, 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 
Well, I mean, Mr Pratt was a Liberal Party member of parliament, and he goes around describing Liberal Party candidates in such terms on radio this morning in Adelaide. Uh, it is a, uh, it, I, I'm only so, so, so uh, he goes on to say, I mean, he's a liability to, to, he, he's a liability, uh, to Federal Adelaide and the Liberal Party. I mean that he's got that baggage hanging over him. Then, 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 then uh, Mr Pratt, Mr, Mr. Pratt uh, who stood for pre-selection for the state seat of Nord, goes on to say, then to be rolled by a Labor traitor in Nord. I think, hang on, is this is what the Liberal Party is about? And then to see Curly Wilson knocked off, because old Curly, he's been rolled only because he's too old. I'll write to everybody in the electorate of Sturt and say, you're 59 years of age. You, your use by date has expired under the terms of the Liberal Party because they don't want you at 60. So uh, it's a pretty, it's a pretty, pretty ex ex extraordinary attack. The uh, pretty extraordinary attack uh, being made uh, about the Liberal Party in South Australia. I mean, that's, you're dead right. You're dead right, uh, uh, Senator Macdonald. The Liberal Party and all the polls in South Australia has not looked better for a long, long time. But what are they doing? What are they doing? Brawling amongst themselves, running as independents, abusing each other, abusing each other. Olsen, the former senator, which you all on the valedictory night he left this Senate, all said he goes back to lead the Liberal Party in South Australia to victory at the next state election. He didn't even end up. He didn't. He didn't get the leadership or the deputy leadership. He tried two weeks ago in a day to become deputy leader. He, uh, he, he went off. He went off and said to the then leader, Mr. Ingerson, "I've got 11 votes out of 22 to be leader." He forgot he actually needed 12. It's one of the worst counting jobs you've ever seen. Then he discovered that in the next two hours, his 11 votes had become 10. So he had to he had to withdraw. So they had to go around and bring back Stephen Baker, uh, re-resurrect him as deputy as deputy leader. This is the party, Senator Macdonald, that you're telling me, according to the polls, and I. That is doing so well in South Australia, and yet they're all—they're all brawling with each other. They're all brawling with each other, and here we have a, a comment by Senator, by Mr. Pratt, the former and sitting Liberal member for Adelaide, that, that there's a move on by the Brown forces to expel Olsen from the party. I mean, what's going on in South Australia? So these are, it's a, it is a uh, the. Uh, and then, and then Mr Pratt I don't think, then Mr Pratt goes on in this interview to say um, about tariffs and, and he's, quoted in the, he's quoted in the paper today as saying he's saying zero tariffs means zero jobs that's his view and, uh, 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 about the tariff policy of the Liberal Party uh, in, in South Australia he knows the effect it'll have on the car industry in South Australia he also says in this interview and I quote I think by the look John, Joan Hall and Amanda Vanstone and Vicky Chapman were very good supporters of mine. I suspect they'll all be diving under the table today. Uh, uh, yes, Senator Amanda Vanstone. Vicky Chapman is the president of the Liberal Party in South Australia, and of course Joan Hall is Steele Hall's uh, a spouse and is an endorsed Liberal candidate in her own right for a state seat. Uh, but they've marshalled together to roll a lot of people. Rod Nettle is now standing. Rod Nettle is a, was a former senior executive of the Chamber of Commerce in South Australia, senior member of the Liberal Party apparently. He's now running as a National Party candidate in Grey while living in Adelaide. Grey happens to be an outback rural seat. Um, and he apparently, pardon? Well, in South Australia, it's a bit unusual to run a candidate for an outback seat like Grey while living in the salubrious suburbs of Adelaide. Uh, but Mr Nettle is doing that for the National Party. So uh, I live I live in in a ordinary suburb of Adelaide called McGill, uh, uh, Senator Senator Watson, and then he finally ends up, Mr. Pratt, and I'll finish on this, Mr. Acting Deputy President, about the extraordinary events that are developing in the Liberal Party in South Australia. This is what Mr. Pratt says about the Liberal candidate, Mr. Pine. Yes, I don't think Sturt is ready for a 24-year-old. I'll live at home with mum, young Liberal lawyer. So I'm very happy to. I mean, it is someone else's line to say that back Pratt and you'll lose your and you'll lose your dough, and you'll lose lose your dough because. And then the then Mr. Collins interjected. Uh, Pratt then goes on to say, 
That's not his line. He's not that smart. They hold $17,000. I know what money they've got. The party's leaking like a sieve. How much money will you take to your independent campaign? Keith, it would, it would be, I think. It's coming up to 10 o'clock and I haven't got enough time to tell you as he avoids that question. So, Mr. 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 Acting Deputy President, it is an extraordinary series of events in the last 24 hours in Adelaide. We have, we have Mr Pratt announcing he's standing as an independent, Mr Wilson not ruling out that he'll stand as an independent against the endorsed candidate who rolled in for the Liberal Party pre-selection after being the sitting member for nearly a quarter of a century. According to Mr Pratt, Mr Hill or somebody else in the Brown faction are up to trying to expel Mr Olson from the, from the Liberal Party. Mr Pratt's identified Senator Vanstone, who's coming into the chamber now as one of his supporters, and then he gets stuck into and used in the most extraordinary language, describing the nature of the Liberal candidate for Adelaide and the Liberal candidate for Sturt. It's an, an amazing performance, and we in, we in the Labor Party in South Australia look forward to the next federal campaign with considerable interest, uh, to get to, with considerable interest as, as Mr Pratt continues on the wondrous campaign he's going to be conducting, obviously more against the Liberal Party, which has been a lifelong member, uh, rather than the Labor Party. Senator Hill. Deputy President. Uh, well, I th thought that might pay to set the scene very briefly. The, the scene in South Australia is— Point of order. Point of order, Senator Powell. Point of order, Mr President. Um, is Senator Hill asking to uh, make a personal explanation, or are we proceeding with matters of public interest? Now, my understanding as expected. Is, my understanding is that we're proceeding as a matter of public interest debate, Senator Powell. I won't be. I won't. I won't be long, and I wasn't planning to speak. But if I could briefly set the scene in South Australia, which is sadly, sadly one of near depression, and Senator Schott as a South Australian would know this. South Australia is in, in an awful mess, Mr Deputy President, as a result of failed Labor governments, both at the state level and the federal level. The incompetence, the incompetence of your Labor government and the person that you helped install as Premier, Mr Bannon, Senator Schott, which contributed to a loss of $3 billion by the South Australian State Bank, money that's going to have to be paid by this, by this generation and future generations of South Australians is disgraceful. And the environment now for jobs in the depressed economy is frightening. Do you know, Senator Schott, what the level of youth unemployment is in the southern suburbs of Adelaide? The level of unemployment is 55 per cent youth unemployment in the southern suburbs of Adelaide, the highest regional level in the whole of Australia. In the western suburbs, it's somewhere around 45 per cent, and in the northern suburbs, it's also around the mid-40 per cent. That's the legacy of incompetent Labor economic managers at both the state and the federal level, and they, Senator Schott, are your people. Now, you want in that environment to try and come in here and win a cheap political point taking yourself back into your glorious days as State Secretary of the Labor Party in South Australia. And, you, and we all know, we all know, we all know that when we all know that, that there are occasions there are occasions when a candidate when a candidate loses a series of uh, pre-selections, becomes disenchanted and uh, and some unfortunate uh, consequences flow. It's happened on your side and, in the case of Mr Pratt, it's happening on our side. But let's just put that aside for the moment and look at the real question facing South Australian voters. And I can tell you, and you know at the moment, that in South Australia at the federal election you are in enormous trouble because of, because of the unemployment, because of the debt, because of the mess. You will be thrown out in the seat, seat of Adelaide. Order. You will be defeated in the seat of Adelaide. You will be defeated in the seat of Hindmarsh, the new seat of Hindmarsh. You will be defeated in the seat of Grey. I don't think you'd even have the nerve to get up here and, uh, and test your credibility. But point, point of order. Uh, this is a, a very interesting two-way conversation, but I do believe you should uh, call Senator Hill to order. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm on my feet taking a point of order. 
I'd just call Senator Hill to, to order and ask him to direct his remarks through to the, through the chair. Senator Hill. Deputy President, uh, you will be defeated in the seat of Grey. And you, at the moment, you would be defeated in the seat of Kingston. That's the seat where we have this 55 per cent of youth for unemployment. Uh, and at the moment, I believe you'd be defeated in the seat of Macon as well. And what would that leave you with? Two federal seats in South Australia. So I'm not surprised that you're desperate enough to come in here with this uh, sort of cheap, cheap political shot. You don't deserve to hold those. You don't deserve to hold those. Uh, you don't deserve to hold those seats in South Australia, and you're demonstrating today why you don't deserve to hold those seats in, in South Australia. But let me take the, take the opportunity. You made mention of, uh, of David Lindsay, our candidate, our candidate for. You made mention of David Lindsay, our candidate for, for the seat of Adelaide. He is a highly respected, competent leader of his profession. Well, 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 my, my point of order is. I quoted what Mr Pratt said about the Liberal candidate for Adelaide. I didn't say that. Senator I quoted Sh Mr Pratt. Senator Shot, there's no point of order, but if you're clearly misrepresented, you may do so when Senator Former Mr. President Mr. of the Senator Veterinarians Hill. Association in South Australia. What was he a vice president of the uh, professional association, professional leaders in, in Australia? A community leader, well respected, well regarded, and will make a fine member for Adelaide. And we look forward, we look forward to his election. We look forward to him being part of a Hewson, Hewson government after the, next, uh, after the next election. Would you like me to tell you about some of the other excellent candidates we have standing at the forthcoming election uh, as well? Martin Gordon, Martin, Gordon, who, <laughs> Martin Gordon, who will win the seat of Kingston, accountant, highly reputable, hardworking, the sort of person who can do something. The sort of person who can do something for the unemployed in the southern suburbs of Adelaide, which is more than you're doing, simply coming in here seeking to take these, uh, these political. No, 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 no. I said to you, and you know, that occasionally disenchanted candidates who fail at pre-selections say things that are un say things that are unfortunate. And obviously, what Mr. Pratt said today is is unfortunate because I think he made a good contribution as the, as the member of, of Adelaide. But the time goes on. He got defeated. He was unsuccessful in pre-selection. He was unsuccessful in another pre-selection, and therefore he's taken this, uh, this course of action. And you can't talk about independence in South Australia, Senator Schott, because you've got three independent <laughs> Labor in the South Australian Parliament, and you recently had to bribe two of them by making them cabinet ministers to ensure that yourself of their vote. You put one of them in the chair, you make him Speaker of the House of Assembly in South Australia, and you give the other two jobs in the ministry to keep them quiet. That's the way your show. That's the way your show operates in South Australia, and the people of South Australia, the people of South Australia, have woken up to it. They're sick of it in South Australia. They, they were sick of Bannon, and he got out not too soon. He knew what was coming out in the Royal Commission, uh, which was, of course, highly critical of his, uh, his, his leadership of South Australia and his failures in relation to the bank. And they don't see his successor as any better because he was in the ministry at the time of the bank's failure as well. In fact, he was being, as a matter of interest, Mr. Deputy President, he was being briefed. He was being briefed by one of the one of the board members at that time. He was, and the now premier was then minister of industry, so he knew what was going on. He was part of the failure of the South Australian government to stand up to the to the uh, really to the incompetence in the state bank, both at uh, both administrative level and at to the level of the of the board. And he's got to wear part of the cost of that as well. And Senator Schott knows that South Australians know that, and they're looking forward to throwing him out. And that's why, that's why the Liberal Party in South Australia is so far ahead in the polls, because they are angry, they are angry with the economic incompetence which has cost them so, so much. Now, getting back to, getting back to what that's the background. That's the background. That's why Senator Schott felt the need to come in here and take a, take a crack or two uh, during this, this lunchtime debate, presumably hoping it would get reported somewhere at, somewhere at home. But um, the only other point I wanted to, uh, wanted to make is uh, to correct Senator Schott in relation to, to Mr Olson. Uh, there was no move at our last state council meeting to expel John Olson. No move at all. 
Mr Pratt wasn't at the meeting, Senator Schott wasn't at the meeting, I was at the meeting. So uh, the press wasn't there, no, no. We have, we'll, uh, no, 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 no. You ask the, you ask the question. We have the press at the, at the annual general meeting. It's not normally our practice to have them at. Uh, do you have them? Do you have them at yours? Or you, or what? Order, 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 order. This is this is absolutely fascinating. Uh, I wonder, I wonder whether the, the, the whole the whole Senate hide. might be included in the debate. Nothing to hide. But anyway, John Olson's doing a fine job in the shadow ministry in South Australia, and uh, and uh, as he did a good job in as he did a good job in this Senate. And and uh, and uh, listen, I tell you what, they'll make a lot better government in South Australia than what your lot are doing at the moment. So all I really rose to do, Mr. Pre Deputy President, to make it clear, as, as Senator Schott is wanting to peddle this incorrect uh, information, that what he was reporting on in relation to our internal meeting was false. Well, Senator Powell. Um, if do you want, to... Senator Powell. Uh, Order. I, order. I've got a Thank you, speaker's list which is provided to me, which Thank you, is a, intended to be a guidance to me. And the next person on the list is Senator Powell. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, I, uh, and having spoken with party whips, seek leave uh, to table for discussion purposes a draft bill relating to toxic chemicals, together with notes on the draft. And um, I was seeking leave to make a brief statement. However, I would also be happy to seek leave to incorporate some notes uh, relevant to this bill if the Senate would be happy for me to incorporate those notes. That would expedite the business of the Senate. Order is leave granted. There would be no objection. Sorry. Senator I'm seeking Rowe. leave to incorporate a draft bill that's been cleared with the whips, but I'm also seeking leave because of circumstances to uh, incorporate my notes yes, to Senator that bill. Powell, I take it you're seeking to table to the table draft bill draft and incorporate bill. the notes. That's right. Incorporate the notes. Is there an objection Thank to that? There will be no objection. Leave is granted. Well, I uh, table the, uh, the bill and um, will give the notes to Hansard for incorporation. Thank you, Senator Powell. Order the, the next speaker on my list is Senator Bill. I, I assume, Senator Kenner, you're speaking. Yes, I am. Thank you. Senator it hasn't stopped you with anybody else, Mr Deputy President, Senator Acting Kenner. Deputy President. The issue I want to raise is that of foreign investment in Australia. In particular, I wish to raise the question of the level of foreign ownership which is allowed in our print media. There is no legislative limit on the amount of foreign ownership allowed in Australian print media assets. There is a reserve power vested in the Treasurer to reject any proposal concerning foreign investment which is, which is judged to be contrary to the national interest. This test, this national interest test, is so nebulous as to be virtually meaningless. There is basically a total discretion with the executive and no parliamentary or other control on the decisions. Recent media reports indicate that the Foreign Investment Review Board is currently, or will soon be, considering an application to allow an increase in foreign ownership of, of the Fairfax Group. Mr Black, Mr Conrad Black, is apparently attempting to increase his holdings above 15 per cent, and the United States investors are also apparently seeking approval to raise their 5 per cent non-voting interest. The Australian public are completely shut out of the decision-making process in this matter. As we've argued here many times, the media is a special industry. It's intrinsic to modern life in so many ways. The impact of the media on our culture and on the nature of our country is immense. Not only are our views on so many subjects, and especially the rest of the world, influenced by the media, but the image of Australia and Australians, which is projected to the world, is inexorably linked to our media, especially print media. And it's for these reasons that the Democrats support legislation which limits the level of foreign ownership of print media. We have such legislative control over radio and television. Why should newspapers and magazines be treated differently? Mr Brian Frith, writing in yesterday's Australian newspaper, made an interesting point when he said, and I quote, it must be presumed that Canadian publisher Mr Conrad Black would not seek formal approval to lift his stake in press group John Fairfax Holdings to 25 per cent unless he believed it would be forthcoming. Mr Keating's office is reported as saying that no guarantees have been given. 
Well, I say, sure, Prime Minister. We all know about the policy-making processes in the Labor Party. Prime Minister Keating decides all policy at the moment, often as a result of a bet with Senator Schott. Now, who in the Labor Party is left to care that caucus set the current limit only one year ago? And it's important to remember that Mr Dawkins, it is Mr Dawkins and only he, as Treasurer, who has the power to refuse the application. Legally, Mr Keating has no status whatsoever, and Mr Dawkins is on record as opposing any increase above the current arrangements. So I think it begs the question, what exactly has changed which would justify any alteration? Why have investors decided that now, now of all times, is the appropriate time to apply for an increased holding? Normally, this period is not good for investment. There's a lot of uh, uncertainty on the outcome of the election and hence on the commercial environment. Surely it is inappropriate that media ownership policy is influenced by the stage of the electoral cycle. If the Treasurer wishes to stop the increase, he simply has to say so publicly, because I would contend that silence demonstrates a new flexibility on this issue which cannot be justified by recent events. What is needed, Mr Acting Deputy President, is a whole new regime of regulation of foreign investment in Australia. And to that end, I seek leave to table, for discussion purposes, a draft bill and an explanatory statement proposing to reform the current foreign investment review regime. Is leave granted? There be no objection leave granted. Senator I thank the no. Senate and I seek leave to have the explanatory statement incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There be no objection leave granted. Senator Curnow? Thank you. Senator Patterson. To Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to table, for discussion purposes, a draft bill relating to removing restrictions on serving in the public service after attaining the age of 65 years, and to incorporate notes on the draft and to make a brief statement. Is leave granted? There be no objection. Leave is granted. Senator Patterson. Mr Acting Deputy President, I table the draft bill and the notes for incorporation, and given the fact that uh, we are uh, been delayed at the beginning of this uh, time at lunchtime, and also the fact that it's the last opportunity, most probably before the federal election, for other senators to raise issues. I'm going to be much briefer than I anticipated. Mr. Acting Deputy President, since 1988, the Coalition's retirement income policy has committed the Liberal and National parties to legislate to provide that age alone shall not be a barrier to employment. The removal of discrimination in employment on the basis of age is a key component of our fight back plan. This private member's bill, the Public Service Abolition of Compulsory Retirement Age Bill 1992, covers com Commonwealth employment and the Australian public service only. It does not transcend states' rights, but complements current state legislation relating to age discrimination and or compulsory retirement. This bill has two objectives. First, it allows the recruitment of officers by the Commonwealth after the age of 65, and secondly, it allows people who are employed by the Commonwealth to work beyond retirement age. The Coalition believes there is a role for government in establishing the retirement parameters of its own public service and setting an example for the private sector. The purpose of this legislation is to give the community at large the opportunity to comment on this important issue. Hopefully, it will also encourage those state governments which have not yet moved to eradicate compulsory retirement, as well as private uh, sector businesses and uh, organisations to move in this direction as well. I commend this bill to the Senate. Senator Bell. I'm sorry, Senator Lees. I didn't realise you'd come in, Senator Lees. I apologise. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I wish to speak very, very briefly today, and I also will be much briefer than I had intended because of our time constraints on food labelling. Um, labelling laws in this country when we come to food are inadequate. And uh, I think that uh, many senators would not be aware of the fact that one really cannot tell where the contents of products come from, and those products are indeed labelled product of Australia. For example, tomatoes in tomato sauce uh, are often imported, but because the processing is done here, they can at the moment, under existing laws, be legitimately labelled product of Australia. And we can move on and go through item after item. The peanuts in peanut butter. Again, more than often, it seems, and uh, through our uh, work over the last nine months on this issue, we, ha we can only find one brand of peanut butter that actually has Australian peanuts in it. But all brands uh, are labelled on our shelves product of Australia. Now, more and more Australians are keen to buy Australian products. The problem comes 
that they don't know when they really are buying Australian. Now, the Democrats have launched a scheme in South Australia, along with a major food retailing chain, Foodland, who are doing this as a public service, a new scheme which allows shoppers to very quickly identify when a product is Australian, when the contents of the product are Australian, when the product is actually put together and processed here, and when the company doing all of that is an Australian company. And the scheme divides products into three categories, category A, category B and category C. Now, these products are identified on the shelves of supermarkets by stickers. Category A has a red sticker, uh, sorry, a green sticker, and that denotes products made in Australia from Australian materials by an Australian control company. Blue stickers show products made in Australia from Australian materials by a foreign control company, and the red sticker identifies those products that have some significant Australian input, although nothing like A or B. Basically, what we have done is to rank products in order of their direct benefit to the Australian economy. This scheme has been up and running in Foodland stores now in South Australia for two months, and it took some four months of uh, investigative work to get it going. And we thank all those companies who have cooperated with us by giving us full details of uh, what is actually in their products. Now, to make sure that we do have some um, honesty and indeed that uh, this system is not in any way subverted, I uh, now seek leave to table for discussion purposes a draft bill and amendments. Uh, on food labelling together, and uh, I seek leave to make a brief statement. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. This bill is in draft. This bill is in draft form uh, because there is a, a very large number of groups now that are interested in this issue: uh, consumer organisations, the companies themselves, individuals, uh, people who are at the moment working very hard, such as Harry Wallace, uh, on the issue of, of Australian ownership. And, uh, we already have had suggestions, hence amendments already, and uh, I wish this uh, to lay on the table as uh, we're obviously coming up to a federal election. And, uh, after the election, I give notice that I will be formally introducing it and working very hard to see Australia's food labelling laws changed so that those Australians who want to buy a fully Australian product are actually able to identify that product on the shelves. Senator Bell. Mr Acton, Deputy President. Um I raise a matter which I raised when commenting on the, uh, the annual report of the Federal Airports Corporation. And in commenting on that annual report, I indicated concern about the effects of the trend towards privatisation and corporatisation of government departments or government bodies. The um, purpose, I would have thought, of the, administration, the administrative body of airports would have been to administer airports firstly safely, efficiently and equitably to provide uh, equal access to uh, all citizens using those facilities. But no, we are told in the, uh, uh, the annual report of the FAC that there is a new purpose since corporatisation, and that new purpose is to chase profits, to make a priority of increasing the income from non-aeronautical operations. And that should be of concern to all Australians, because the effect of that new priority is to compromise the future of enterprises which are based on and rely upon serving the people who arrive at airports. And not the least of those is uh, evident in Tasmania in particular, the hire car business. The, the rent a car, hire car business, which uh, is focused upon airports uh, in Tasmania, has few options but to focus on airports because of the, uh, the geographical nature of the place. And, uh, and yet those particular enterprises are being um, required by the FAC, the, the new breed of FAC, to, um, to consider uh, paying extraordinary amounts of money uh, to continue their operations from those airports. There is no option. Uh, it is not an option to, uh, to operate uh, uh, 20 kilometres away at a city. Uh, people arrive at airports and uh, are then in a situation of seeking to hire a car. Now, the, uh, the, the great uh, bargaining disadvantage which these enterprises f find themselves in when trying to negotiate a reasonable rate to pay the FAC to operate from the airports is that uh, it's a case of there is only one FAC and only one opportunity to establish an enterprise at the airport. The, uh, the problem is that after some uh, many, many months of negotiation in this unequal position, we still have a situation in Tasmania in particular where uh, the current situation is undefined. 
there have been several revisions, all of them have been uh, in the nature of impositions from the FAC, with little opportunity for the other part of the bargaining process to, uh, to participate realistically. And yet uh, it is still undefined because the latest version uh, can't, be, uh, can't be ratified. We don't know now uh, what the current situation is. All we know is that the smaller operators are being asked to pay uh, amounts of money which are extraordinarily uh, out of kilter with uh, uh, their, both their earnings and the size of their operation. And we don't know what the liability is or what the situation is if those small operators uh, are not able to accept the terms which have been um, uh, offered in such a manner by FAC. So we have uh, a, a very inequitable situation and a situation which uh, is, uh, is likely to threaten the very future of uh, a, a considerably uh, large part of the tourism industry in Tasmania. Uh, I also want to briefly mention, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, another matter that I've been uh, pursuing in this place for some time, and that is the situation with regard to another industry which is very important to Tasmania. Uh, is part of the aquaculture industry, the, uh, the growing of oysters in Tasmania. We have uh, a situation whereby the, uh, um, the established growers uh, uh, of oysters in Tasmania were enticed into and uh, um, actually uh, uh, favourable terms were offered to, uh, to take part in a project which involved the growing on of Tasmanian native oysters at established leases. Having uh, uh, become part of that arrangement, uh, established growers who were participating uh, were late, later suffered the indignity, of having, uh, the, the indignity and the uh, uh, personal cost of having uh, the project oysters removed uh, from those leases because it was suspected they, uh, they would be uh, affected by bonamia. Bonamia, a disease which uh, uh, has created havoc in Europe, European uh, uh, oyster beds. And uh, uh, the, the solution offered by the Tasmanian state government was to declare all Tasmanian waters affected by Bonamia. And this solution was offered uh, in defiance of the uh, accepted international uh, method of managing this particular disease. Uh, the effect of that was to mean that uh, uh, those Tasmanian enterprises, which had gained considerable, uh, uh, considerable income from exporting um, oyster spat to South Australia in particular and also to New Zealand, and had prospects of exporting oysters to, uh, to Europe, were now faced with the uh, inability to do that. Um, the, the ridiculous solution which has been offered only recently by the Tasmanian government has been to declare individual growers exempt. Uh, and, and surely that is a nonsense because uh, the, uh, that would mean that uh, after a process of a couple of years we might have 99 per cent of the state uh, eventually becoming exempt, which is the reverse of what ought to happen. What ought to happen and what uh, I would challenge the federal government to do something about is that research needs to be conducted into which particular areas actually have the disease and to declare those as bonamia affected zones. Now, if that was done, we would find that 99 per cent of the state would not be affected, the zones would be clearly defined, and we would be able to, to limit the commercial activities of those zones, the export to other places. Now, it is this uh, stupid, uh, about-face, backward-looking uh, uh, activities of the Tasmanian government which has compromised an industry which has the capacity to earn considerable export dollars for Australia and has the capacity to uh, create uh, uh, considerable employment in Tasmania. It is a labour-intensive occupation and it is the very sort of thing which should be encouraged. It has been compromised by stupid bureaucratic action by the Tasmanian government, action which should be investigated by the federal government because it is of federal importance. The very scheme was established uh, using a federal grant uh, uh, to, uh, to investigate uh, the feasibility of it. And uh, I think that grant has been a waste of money because of the, the, inac the uh, uh, less than uh, competent action of the Tasmanian uh, uh, Department concerned. Order, thank you. Senator Branstone. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I won't uh, delay everybody uh, very long. I didn't plan to speak today, but as a consequence of some remarks made by Senator Schott, I think it is appropriate to uh, 
have a bit of a response. And I, I see Senator Ray um, chuckling. Either he's thought of an amusing joke or is in fact amused at the prospect of some sort of difficult, difficulty um, being raised in this chamber by Senator Schott or, or amused at Sorry? Sorry? No, well, I'm not going to be very witty because it's really quite a sad day. I am actually uh, regarded myself as a friend of Michael Pratt's and worked very closely with him when he inadvertently won the federal seat of Adelaide in a, in a landslide. Um, Michael, in fact, never intended to win the federal seat of Adelaide. He was using it as a dummy run uh, to find out what it was like to be a candidate so that he would stand in the sta state seat of Norwood. And it was much to his surprise uh, on the night of the election when he came in with his wife and children and, and we said, you've won, you've won. His wife didn't look that happy and I don't know that she uh, has been about his interest in politics uh, ever since then. There was certainly never intention that he'd go into politics and travel in the way that, Mr Acting Deputy President, you and I know you have to if you come into federal parliament because his children are quite young. Uh, nonetheless, Sir Pratty was tipped out at the... Uh, at the next proper election, he got in on a by-election and uh, wasn't wasn't re-endorsed. And uh, sorry, I'm. Oh, oh, fair enough. Uh, the, apparently, some bets were were placed on uh, this one way or, or, or another. Right now, I'll just ask uh, ask people who might be listening, and people in the gallery, to understand the situation a man finds himself in there where he's, he, he stands for federal parliament as a dummy run and, and gets in. And you might think, well, what luck. You know, fancy, fancy having that uh, fortune in life. And, of course, to walk through this place and contribute to it in any respect is uh, a lucky accident for all of us. But to then lose it so quickly, uh, having got in on a, a landslide that might otherwise not have happened but for political events at the time, in effect, to be tossed around on the to and fro of politics uh, over such a short space of time, I just can't think exactly how many months uh, Pratt was in, I think it was 18 or something, it is a very difficult situation to find oneself in. As positive as the experience being here may be, that is a very difficult experience to find yourself in. Now, uh, Pratty, as he uh, was called by uh, the Liberals, then decided he'd like to make a contribution to the party in another way, uh, to keep his hand in, I think, and stood uh, seeking endorsement as a vice president, which he didn't get. And uh, that was unfortunate. Uh, I don't say that he necessarily should have got it, but it was an unfortunate to seek to make a contribution to a party in another way, a short time ha having had such a devastating uh, personal loss, and then be rejected in that. He then. Uh, I won't say left the party because technically he stayed in, but you know, distanced himself a bit, went about his life, trying to rebuild uh, his life and, and regain a career uh, away from politics. But of course, as we know, the bug that once having bitten uh, doesn't go away. He then sought endorsement, I'm not sure if this is in the right order, but for the federal seat of Adelaide, uh, at which he was unsuccessful. And uh, he sought endorsement for the state seat of Norwood at which he was unsuccessful. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough trot to uh, try a dummy run at federal parliament, get in, uh, be tipped out, uh, try for an executive position, be unsuccessful, try for a federal seat, be unsuccessful, try for a state seat, be unsuccessful. You know, it's, it, that isn't an easy situation for someone to handle. And I'm, uh, I'm sorry that the, the pressure that these, uh, these losses and, and, and the pressure that the interest in politics that was generated by a brief stay here uh, has all led uh, Michael to decide to stand in Sturt or anywhere else for that matter as an independent because we all know what the chances are of an independent getting up there about Buckley's, Buckley's and none. And uh, I note that Senator Ray says that's correct and he'd be a fool if he didn't because you just have to look at the record to see what chance someone has. And so this place, not this chamber, the other one, but this, this place is a parliament, has so attained someone's interest that they are now prepared to have another go, having had three goes at keeping involved in some way, another go when it's almost certain there are surprises, but it is, you know, Buckley's and none of the chances that he's going to lose again. 
and because of the interest in Parliament. And so I'm, I'm sorry that, uh, that this, this has happened to him and, uh, in a sense, has happened to his family. Now, as to some of the things he's chosen to say this morning, uh, my transcript was typed out for me, Mr Deputy President, by my office. I expect it's therefore a different type than the one that, uh, that Senator Schott chose to use. No doubt it was provided to him by animals, a luxury not afforded to the opposition, just the government-funded uh, media, media team. There, is, uh, there are a couple of points uh, that I would like to make. I'd just like to put one thing on record, and that is that you know, Pratt has used some pretty colourful language. That's his style. And I don't think it would be a misuse of parliamentary privilege for me to give you a trot through some of his views expressed as he would express them and let the electorate make the choice. But I'll exercise some judgment and bypass the opportunity to do that under parliamentary privilege. I expect he'll let them become aware of his views in relation to a number of matters uh, all by himself. Uh, he um, mentions me, and I think that deserves it requires a response because Senator Schott mentioned it. I wouldn't have bothered. It was just Pratt mentioning it on the radio, because as I say, I think he's got Buckley's and none uh, chances of winning. But um, Senator Schott uh, chose to read out uh, his views that uh, I, along with um, John Hall and Vicky Chapman, were good supporters of his. That's true. Well, it's true for myself, and I believe it to be true of the others. But I haven't uh, asked if I can speak on their behalf. Um, but he goes on to say, but they've marshalled together to roll a lot of people. Now, that's the point that I want to make today. Uh, I haven't marshalled together with anybody to roll anybody. Uh, I am very much an independent mind in terms of who I've uh, worked with. Well, well, <laughs> well I, I, I can make uh, the same claim, and I don't want to take up your time by going through the details of who I do and who I don't support and like. Uh, I think what uh, Pratty may be referring to there is the, um, the, um, the effort I put in to ensuring that Mrs Chapman was elected, well, Ms. Chapman, Mrs Hart was elected as a president of the Liberal Party. I make no bones about that. And as uh, I've discussed with other senators here today, uh, everybody, when you have a presidential competition, supports one or other candidate, however many there are. I happen to think that uh, a 35 year old, successful, smart, as in intelligent, but I suppose good looking, smart as well. Uh, female to run the Liberal Party and uh, with an absolute determination uh, to do what she could for it and seeking nothing out of it since her legal practice is so success successful, I doubt we could convince her to stand for Parliament. I doubt we could convince her to do that. I'd, I would uh, do everything I can to encourage her to do it, but it's a lot to ask. I beg your pardon? Um, well, I don't know. It's a question of timing, isn't it? It's a question of timing, and there are plenty of opportunities around. But in any event, uh, no, no, it wouldn't. You see, it wouldn't. That's the point I'm making. That uh, I, I, I doubt that we will ever convince uh, uh, Vicky Chapman to come into federal or state parliament. And all I'm saying is, I unashamedly will tell anyone, everyone in the party knows that I think that we should be doing everything we can uh, to do that. Give, give you people a run for your money when we get her here, or into uh, state parliament. But as I say, I don't think we. Uh, I don't think we will. Now, I don't call uh, making a decision as to who you think would be the better candidate in any contest, be it for presidency or for a pre-selection or whatever, and uh, doing what you can to support that person, getting together to roll people. And having, having said uh, that I don't regard that as being the case in, in presidential nominations, executive nominations or pre-selections, it's also worth putting one other thing on record, lest one thinks that I would go to an effort and ring around in pre-selections. I have never done that for someone, and I never will. I regard pre-selections for this place as matters that you have to conduct yourself. That the way my party's pre-selection system works, you go out and speak to people, and you should do that for yourself, and not expect other people to do it on your behalf. And and treat the uh, people on the college as uh, 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 for what they are, people who want to exercise their own mind as who should be the candidate on the day. So that's really the point that I wanted to, uh, to address, that Mr Pratt somehow got the idea that uh, I'm forming, some sort of or forming and or in some sort of cabal to roll people. Uh, that's not the case, but I will continue to support the, 
and get those people on the executive of my party that I think will think will do the best job for it. Now, Senator Schott uh, made some remarks about uh, uh, the Liberal Party State Council meeting last Friday and abuses the Liberal Party for not allowing the media into these meetings. And I just want to put on record there's one very good reason for not doing that and one reason we allow them in at the AGM and not at other times. Because what we try to do, and we've obviously been slightly unsuccessful in this respect, is air our differences internally. And if you have a, if you have a meeting where, where, for whatever reason, it's going to happen all the time in politics, different people want to go one way, some people want to go another way, one side is definite to, 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 to win, there's only one choice, and the losers are unhappy. In, in, in any a matter. It might be over a simple decision about an administrative decision. It might be over a deputy leader's position. It doesn't matter. There's going to be some unhappy people. And the appropriate way for the Liberal Party to conduct itself is to ensure, in my, this is my view, is to ensure that the steam with respect to those matters is let off internally. And I don't see why the media should be invited in to comment on that steam letting off. It seems perfectly reasonable to me that we would have such a meeting. In fact, I congratulate the president for ensuring that anyone who wanted to have their say could have their say. And uh, I'm only sorry that a couple of people have obviously gone out and had a chat to, uh, to Michael, who of course wasn't there, which is why he's speaking in, uh, in ignorance rather than knowledge as to what happened. Last but not least, uh, Pratt is a little bit out of date. He says our candidate in Stuart is a 24-year-old live at home with mum young liberal lawyer. That's simply not the case. He might like to acquaint himself with the facts before he opens his mouth next time. Senator Ray. I've indicated on other occasions uh, that I'm going to use this opportunity to respond to matters raised, but I'm going to resist the temptation and uh, uh, move uh, Mr Acting Deputy President of the Senate to uh, uh, be suspended till 2 p.m. this day. Questions that be agreed to? Those that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have. The sitting of the Senate is suspended until 2 p.m.
Questions without notice. The Leader of the Opposition, Senator Hill. Uh, Mr. President, my question is directed to Senator Button, Leader of the Government in the Senate. And on this occasion, which we expect to be his uh, last day in last question time as uh, Minister of the Crown, I thought we should give him the opportunity to the opportunity to again address the major issue facing this country, and that's the that's the economic crisis. So, Minister, I ask you, as the as the trend estimate of full-time employment, the trend estimate of full-time employment under your policies continues to decline with last month's seasonally adjusted figures showing another 80, 78,000 jobs lost. Can you assure the people of Australia, and particularly the young people coming onto the job market, that by early next year unemployment won't have reached the figure of 12 per cent? The Leader of the Government, Senator Button. Mr President, uh, I've said on a number of occasions in the Senate in the past, I repeat it. Uh, what the government did in the last year's budget was to estimate uh, the uh, level of unemployment by the uh, middle of next year. Uh, Mr Dawkins has already uh, uh, commented publicly as Treasurer that he feels that the uh, estimate in the budget may not be attained, and I'm uh, not going to add to any speculation about unemployment, unemployment, unemployment figures. Let me just say it will depend on the capacity of this economy to grow. Uh, Senator Short yesterday asked me questions about uh, the growth estimates for this economy, and, uh, and I, uh, I, have, uh, I have nothing to add to that. Senator Collins has referred, uh, by way of interjection, to the OECD figures on growth. Let me, uh, let, let me just. Order. Let me just say that in terms of those OECD figures, uh, Australia is by uh, 1994 uh, will, be one of, will be the fifth highest growth economy in the OECD. In 1993, it will be the fourth highest growth economy in the OECD. And uh, both those things are relevant, of course, to the question of uh, international levels of growth and unemployment consequent, consequent upon. Uh, the low growth rates which have now been suggested for a number of countries. So uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, Senator, going to uh, make predictions about that. I, I sincerely hope that that will not be the case, but I'm not making predictions about it. Supplementary, Senator Hill. Well, Mr. President, as the, uh, the OECD's estimate of growth rate for Australia will be at a level insufficient to reduce the unemployment level in this country, I therefore ask you, as I've asked you on recent days, is the government going to offer anything new at all, any change in economic direction that's going to give the unemployed in this country hope, a chance of future work, or is all this government going to do in its last few months in office offer more of the same? Minister, Senator Button. Well, Mr. Mr President, uh, I think it's very important that uh, governments uh, maintain a level of uh, consistency and stability in what they do, uh, we're not going to uh, we're not going to change our policies on the basis of uh, uh, not, not, not. Well, Senator, the unemployed have been there for a fair while, yeah, but but the but the opinion polls Order. the opinion polls, Senator, Order. were the things which touched off your changes to policies which you said would solve all these problems. You've been yelling your head off for a year, for 12 months, telling us about Fight Back and how it will solve the problems of this country, and you don't even know what's in it, Senator Knowles. You tell people in Western Australia different things from what's in Fight Back itself, and uh, you should go back and rectify that dreadful mistake you made on, uh, on radio in Western Australia. Now, I know you don't want to hear this, but it's... Uh yeah. Uh, Senator Senator Button Kemp. was asked a very clear question to tell us what his policies are to deal with the problems that his policies have created, and is he going to have any new policies? I ask you to instruct Senator Button to, to return turn to the, the, uh, the question and either give a proper answer or sit down. President, I find it incredible that Senator Kemp raises a point of order asking you to redirect Senator Button on a question when he has two seconds to go. Yeah. Mr. Order, order, 
Senator Button was asked a specific question, but he was not helped by the interjections, and, I, and he was answering interjections for the last part of that large minute, and I would ask senators from both sides to cease interjecting. Se Mr uh, President, uh, question time is not a time to announce uh, new or different Order. policies, and I will not Order. be doing that. Order. Senator Charles, and I remind senators again that I will tell the Speaker when time's up. I've been allowing people to finish their sentence from both sides. Senator Charles. Mr President, I address a question to Senator Cook, the Minister for Industrial Relations. Is it true that the individual work contract being forced on some Victorian employees of the company Copperart cuts their wages by $41.86 per week? Is it also true that the Coalition supports the introduction of this type of work contract as a replacement for a fair award system, and in, and in particular supported the Copper Art contract, Senator Parra asserting, as does Copper Art, that their individual work contract means a wage increase of $29 per week, even with 10 hours overtime. Is Copper Art misleading the community, and is Senator Parra misleading the Senate? Has Senator Harradine offered to arbitrate on whether these employees will be better off as a result of this contract? Do you accept this offer? What is the proof that copyright individual work contract results in a wage cut and ass assertions to the contrary are misleading? The Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cook. Mr President, the answer to the first five questions is yes. Yes, the copyright contract cuts wages by $41.86 per week. Yes, the opposition favoured this type of contract, and Senator Perra contended that with 10 hours overtime it in fact increases wages by $29 per week. Yes, both Copper Art and Senator Perra are misleading, respectively the community and the Senate. Yes, as I understand it from Hansard, Senator Harradine made such an offer. And yes, if that offer is still open, the government is prepared to accept Senator Harradine to arbitrate the matter between us. Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, President, I am asked what is the proof. Mr. President, uh, if an attendant can step forward, I table the proof. There is a copy of this for Senator Perra, for Senator Bell from the, uh, from the Democrats, and for Senator Harradine. I table the documents. Mr. Uh, President, the uh, documents are in the form of legal proof containing a number of exhibits. Exhibit 1 is the Copper Art contract. Exhibit 2 is a certified copy of the award. Exhibit 3 is their Christmas catalogue. Exhibit 4 is a note from my department. Exhibit 5 is a statutory declaration by the union. Exhibit 6 is a copy of the wages clause of the award issued by the Victorian Commission. Exhibit 7 is a statutory declaration from the secretary of the Victorian branch of the union. Exhibit 8 is, a, is the Copper Art press release unsigned, issued on the, on the 2nd of December and undated. And uh, Exhibit 9 is a comparison of wage rates under Copper Art contract and the Victorian Electrical Furniture and Hardware Shops Award 1991. Mr. Uh, Mr. President, uh, these documents prove to the proper legal standard that we are right, the opposition is wrong. Yeah. The figures that I have contended that uh, this contract cuts are true. The figures that the opposition alleges that it uh, increases wages are wrong and are misleading and should be withdrawn, lest the opposition want to be part of promoting a lie in the broad community. Mr. President, uh, what the Copper Art contract does is in fact force on workers in Victoria a reduction in their standards below those of the award. It is supported by the opposition, who have supported the exploitation of vulnerable workers in this way. It is in keeping with the kennett hewson industrial relations policy. It is why this government will not support an individual work contract approach, why we support the protection of properly determined by uh, award wages decided by an independent arbitral authority when there is, when there is disagreement between workers and employers. I table the uh, documents for the Senate and ask an attendant, a parliamentary attendant, to distribute them to Senators Order. Perra, Bell and Harrity. Order. Parliamentary question. Order. For uh, ministers to engage in stunts of this nature, documents can be tabled. Documents can be tabled, and I'm sure we'd have no objection, but uh, there's certainly no provision that would enable uh, or let alone require attendants yes. to, to uh, be part and parcel of a stunt of this nature. 
Order, order. It is quite in order for the minister to table the document and ask that it be circulated. Senator Charles. A supplementary question. In view of the answer, does the government propose to introduce a system of individual work contracts and the power of one party to veto the right of the other party to fair arbitration if there is a disagreement? Minister. We will not introduce Senator the Cook. sort of policy that the Kennett government in Victoria has introduced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We stand for dignified treatment of workers in the workplace, not exploitation. We stand for the proper protections of an award, access to fair arbitration where there is a dispute, and a provision for the proper flexibilities for enterprise negotiations so that uh, productivity improvements can be achieved. Mr. President, uh, over Christmas, work uh, sorry, over Christmas, copperati employees may be under pressure to, to accept these individual work contracts. I ask Australians, if they shop at Copperart over Christmas, to let the shop assistant know who serves you that you're on their side and that you want the and you support their right to proper award protection. Senator Short. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to uh, Senator Button, representing the uh, Treasurer, <coughs> and I refer that I refer the Minister to the work that has been done within the Australian Taxation Office and the Treasury in recent months for the introduction of the new tax on services that the government will introduce in 1993 if it were to win the uh, next election. <clears throat> and I ask, one, can he provide the Senate with the specific details of the tax? Two, has the government yet determined the rate of the tax and, if so, what that rate would be? And three, would the new tax be introduced in the 1993 budget uh, or earlier? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator well, Button. Senator Short's a bit of a desperate, real desperate. This matter has not been to the government. It's never been discussed by the government, not been considered. And uh, I know that uh, Treasury does uh, work all the time on various tax options like, uh, which, which, uh, which are available on international tax comparisons, things of that kind. And, uh, uh, Senator, to... Uh, suggest that the government has any uh, commitment or even knowledge uh, of this proposed tax is rubbish. Supplementary. Yes, uh, thank, you. Thank, you, thank you, Mr President. I ask as a supplementary uh, uh, the Minister, one, will he categorically deny that the Australian Taxation Office and the Treasury have been working on the details for the implementation of a new tax on services? And two, if the government is not proposing to introduce a new tax on services, which constitutes 60 per cent of the economy, then what other new taxes will it be introducing to fund the enormous $30 billion hole in its budget over the three years of the next parliament? Minister, Senator Button. Mr President, um, first of all, let me say that uh, I have no idea of what work the Treasury is doing on various taxes, and I'm not an I'm not in position. Well, I mean, Order. Senator Short, you ought to go into law and prosecute drunks in the Williamstown court or something like that, asking questions of that kind. Asking questions of that kind. The fact of the matter is, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, as the OECD report said the other day, Senator, Australia is in a position. Uh, Australia is in a position to move to use government spending to boost the economy as distinct from most other economies in the world. So if you don't understand the answer, you might as well be quiet. Now, <clears throat> let me say that uh, I'll, I'll make inquiries about, uh, about your question, but uh, as I said before, there is no proposal or consideration of this kind before, before government. I will, I will not come back to the Senate this afternoon. Don't be ridiculous. There is only one thing reasonably certain in this life that if the opposition Order. were elected, some sort of GST, whatever Button. shape it will Order. be, will be imposed. Senator Button. Order. I wish to acknowledge the presence in uh, the gallery, my gallery to the left, of uh, Senator Kemp Hannan from New York State and his wife Bomlin, wish, and on behalf of all senators, wish them well on their visit to Australia. Yeah. Senator Colston. Probably. Mr President, I just direct a question to Senator Tate in his capacity as Minister representing the Attorney General. I refer to a confirmation by Mr Rodney Adler that his FAI insurance has purchased Westpac rights to affect the Australian share price index so that FAI could profit from futures linked to that index. 
Did the Australian Securities Commission undertake an investigation into FAI's purchase of, of Westpac rights and its subsequent profit from an increase in the share price index? If so, what are the results of that in investigation? Finally, is the Australian government satisfied with a system which allows individuals or companies to manipulate the stock market for their own speculative benefit? The uh, Minister for Justice representing the Attorney General, Senator Tate. Mr. President, I haven't seen the confirmation which uh, Senator uh, Colston refers to uh, about remarks by Mr. Rodney Adler uh, about the involvement of uh, FAI insurance in purchasing Westpac rights to affect the Australian share price market index. But I, I do understand that the Australian Securities Commission naturally, uh, as part of its responsibilities, monitors developments in the securities market. I've been informed that the Australian Securities Commission is aware of the transactions referred to by the Honourable Senator and, uh, of course, the Australian Securities Commission is considering the matters raised uh, in the context of those transactions. Naturally, the Australian Securities Commission, as is its uh, proper role as an independent statutory body, will make its uh, investigation without any uh, prejudice or interference uh, from any remarks made either in this chamber or certainly from the federal government. As to Senator uh, Colston's more general question about whether the Australian government is satisfied, as he put it, with a system which allows uh, individuals or companies to manipulate the stock market for their own speculative gains. Quite clearly, in setting up the Australian Securities Commission, in establishing for the first time companies and securities legislation which uh, has a nationwide uh, uh, effect uh, rather than the fragmented uh, federalised uh, system that allowed the speculative excesses of the 1980s to get out of hand and damage Australia's credibility and certainly the uh, av availability of investor uh, monies uh, through having confidence in the Australian market, whether from uh, domestic sources or from overseas. All that has been remedied by the Commonwealth Government taking very firm steps to establish the Australian Securities Commission in its independent stance. And, uh, I believe that uh, certainly in relation to insider trading, the various reforms, Senator, which have been passed through this chamber, through the, uh, through the Senate over the last uh, 12 months or so, to do with insider trading, make it very clear of our commitment to a well-regulated market so that uh, insider trading does not occur, or if it does occur, is identified very quickly and, uh, and action is taken to punish those involved. Um, Senator Bourne. My question is also to Senator Tate, representing the Attorney General. I ask: Is the Minister aware that the racist British author, Mr David Irving, is currently soliciting speaking engagements in Australia during March 1993? Is the Minister also aware that Mr Irving was recently prevented from entering Canada, Italy and Germany on the grounds of his violently racist views? And is the government in a position to use anti-vilification laws now in place in New South Wales, Queensland, Western Australia and the ACT? From being coming into place in, in the Commonwealth to prevent Mr Irving from propounding his racial vilification and hatred in this country. The Minister for Justice, representing Attorney General, Senator Tate. Mr uh, President, I'm not aware of, uh, of uh, the claim by Senator Bourne in her question that uh, Mr David Irving was recently prevented from entering, I think it was Canada, Italy and Germany, was it, on the grounds of violently racist views, as was put by Senator Bourne. I do know that uh, Mr Irving has lodged an application in London for seeking to uh, arrive in Australia as a visitor, I think, about March the 17th of next year. Uh, this is a visitor visa application and, of course, it will be referred to the minister when he uh, considers these matters, uh, perhaps in late January, uh, in the normal course of, uh, of, of uh, these matters reaching his desk, uh, in order, I would imagine, to uh, understand better the application or possible application of the controversial visitor uh, categories which are administered uh, within the Department of Immigration uh, and Ethnic Affairs. For example, in the public interest criteria, uh, there is provision for uh, consideration of the visa in terms of whether the minister acting personally considers that it's like that the uh, person making application is likely to become involved in activities disruptive to uh, the Australian community or a group within the Australian community. And again, under the good character of provisions, the question of whether Mr Irving has been deported from another country, uh, as has been suggested, I understand, in some media, uh, would also be relevant to consider. Senator Bourne asks about uh, anti-vilification legislation. As I understand it, Senator, whilst there are such laws in place in various jurisdictions uh, throughout Australia—I think New South Wales, Queensland 
and a couple of other states. Quite clearly, whether in fact there was transgression of such laws would be a matter for those jurisdictions, and uh, they would enforce such laws, no doubt, if there was any uh, suggestion that uh, Mr Irving or anyone else was, uh, was, had transgressed them. So, uh, as to our own racial vilification laws, I think they were introduced in the House of Representatives uh, perhaps only last night, but they're not to be passed, of course, until the autumn session of the Parliament. So, in the case of Mr Irving, I would imagine that uh, if he was present in Australia and engaged in such activities as uh, suggested, he might be subject to state uh, uh, laws in that regard, and uh, that would be a matter for state authorities. Senator Loosley. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. My question is directed to the Minister for Industry, Technology and Commerce, Senator Button, and it follows the question which I asked yesterday about the TCF industries and their future. Is the Minister able to provide details of the Federal Government grant provided to Chargeurs Textiles Proprietary Limited to enable the company to expand its superfine wool processing capacity in the city of Wagga Wagga? Has the Minister seen negative comments regarding this decision, and does the Government have an effective response to this criticism? What is the position of the Federal Government? The Minister of Industry, Technology and Commerce, Grant, uh, made to uh, the company Chargeurs in Wagga by the Textile Clothing and Footwear Development Authority under uh, its further wool processing program. That will lead to the expansion and modernisation of this uh, top-making plant at Wagga. Uh, $62 million will be invested. The plant will earn an additional $120 million in export earnings per year and an additional 90 jobs will be uh, created. This uh, move has been welcomed by the New South Wales Government as an example of cooperation between state and federal governments, but it is true, Senator, that I have also noticed some uh, criticism of the project. Uh, for example, the uh, opposition spokesman on industry, Mr McLaughlin, said yesterday that Australians should feel outraged by this grant. Now, uh, why does Mr McLaughlin say that uh, Australians should feel outraged? Because he says it is a French company. It is a French company. A French company, which I might point out has been uh, processing Australian wool in Wagga for 11 years. And uh, what is the point of this identification in a country which uh, has a uh, significant share of foreign investment in manufacturing industry of saying we should be outraged because it's a French company? The opposition tried this stunt in Geelong earlier this year with the German company BWK. The member for Karangamite went round Geelong saying this is a German company, therefore it shouldn't get any government assistance. And uh, This is an extraordinary message for a uh, potential or possible alternative government to send to foreign investors and say, and say this, uh, no, no, you'll have to do better than this. This is the point I'm making, because fancy an alternative government sending this message. If you're a French company, we don't want you. If you're a German company, we don't want you. But what did Mr McLaughlin say this morning when he was asked to give examples of Australian companies which might have uh, had received assistance under this program? There are nine pages of them in the TCFDA report tabled in the Senate yesterday. Nine pages of Australian companies that have received assistance. But what did Mr McLaughlin say this morning on Townsville Radio when asked to identify Australian companies? He referred to Michelle's. He referred to Michelle's in Adelaide and other Japanese companies. Other Japanese companies. So the message of the opposition is this: that if you're going to invest in Australia, be very careful about your nationality. If you're French, you're no good this week. If you're Germans, you were no good last month. If you're Japanese, it's okay. Now that is the message that these remarks are sending to international investors in Australia. And it really is a grubby, grubby point, a grubby point to, to try and disguise Mr McLaughlin's deep-seated ideological opposition to the role of government, to the role of government in assisting Order. Australian industry. Senator McGu Fox, McGibbon. No. Thank you, You're Mr. Not. President. You're not. My, question, my question, without notice, is to Senator Collins. I refer to your stubborn refusal to entertain that any allegations raised by parliamentarians from both sides of the parliament about the Civil Aviation Authority's TATS contract were accurate and which have now been proved to be so in the McPhee report. And I won't bore the Senate with going through all your quotations, but they're best encapsulated in the quotation, and I quote, a number of claims have been made about irregularities some of them quite extraordinary and defamatory in aspects of the process followed by the CAA in relation to this project. 
There is no evidence to support any of those claims. <laughs> Minister, since if you've not resigned, when are you going to do the honourable course and resign? The Minister for Transport and Communications, Senator Collins. Mr. President, uh, as I advised the Senate yesterday when the, uh, the, there was a debate on this matter, the processes to establish the independent inquiry Order. that was in fact held were begun by me and would have been concluded by me uh, had uh, Senator Richardson's resignation not occurred and I had moved out of the portfolio. That is a matter of record, Mr President, which can be confirmed, of course, by the two senior officers of my department, the secretary and the associate secretary, who conferred with me uh, on this matter. And uh, I must say I had a very useful and I found productive uh, hour or so, or perhaps it wasn't quite an hour, with Mr McPhee uh, today uh, discussing uh, that report. But the facts are, Mr President, although Senator McGibbon would like to, uh, to hide from them, is that the substantive number of allegations made by Senator McGibbon were Order. all rebutted by the McPhee report. And to put in context these claims again, and I have uh, great pleasure uh, Mr. President, in highlighting this again, the most outrageous of these allegations made by Senator McGibbon, with careless abandon, I might add, were that people had behaved corruptly. And those allegations, Mr. President, included me. And my colleagues will recall who were in here at the time, and I see them nodding in assent, that those outrageous allegations that people were receiving kickbacks, kickbacks were made with careless abandon, not just for the reputation Order. Order. of the individuals Order. involved, McDonald. but more importantly, in my view, in absolutely careless abandon of the reputations of the reputable companies concerned who would have to have been parties to such corrupt practices. And I am delighted that not only did Mr McPhee lay that outrageous allegation of Senator McGibbon to rest, but he confirmed it, I thought, in a very succinct way in his interview on AM this morning. Supplementary, Senator McGibbon. Mr President, I never at any stage accused people of corruption. I said I was hearing allegations of corruption, and for a limited intellect by Senator Collins, I can understand Order. he can't understand the difference. But in the light of his answer, how does he reconcile the finding of the report? that the advice to the board by Mr Baldwin and Dr Edwards is fatally flawed. It was inadequately researched and tested. Hughes were not assessed fairly. That was the burden of the criticism from both sides of the parliament. What's your answer to that? Minister, Senator Collins. Mr President, the facts of the matter were, and they have been, I think, well laid out in the McPhee report, that these were two competent, reputable and technically proficient companies that entered into a very close contest. And in fact, if Senator McGibbon wants to refer to the actual points that were allocated uh, to every single one of the criteria of both these companies, they will find out that in every single criteria they were literally one or two points apart in an overall score of 100. It was a tight contest. On the crucial question of the complicated and technical issue of the number of lines of computer code that were contained in the flight data processing heart of that system. From personal experience as a non-expert, can I tell you, an area that causes everyone's eyes to glaze over if you're not a computer engineer, it was found that a risk did exist, did exist in the Hughes bid, but that uh, Dr Edwards had placed undue weight on that risk. Now, for that, he stands criticised. And it's now a matter for the board. And of course, as Mr. McPhee confirmed again with me today, the primary responsibility, as his report uh, lays out, is with those two named individuals uh, in that report. It's now a matter, following the government investigation, Order. for the board to determine what will Order. happen with those individuals. Order, Senator Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. President. I address my question uh, to the Minister for Industrial Relations. Has the Minister seen the report of the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission's inquiry into sex discrimination in regard to over-award payments? Does this report show that women workers would be disadvantaged under a system where pay was negotiated between an employer and an individual employee? The Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Cook. Thank you, uh, Mr President. I have seen the report prepared by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner. It does find, as uh, Senator Reynolds in her question has uh, suggested, that there is in fact discrimination in over-award negotiations. 
Now, this is a relevant uh, question, Mr. President, because it does touch on the difference between the two major parties in Australia on industrial relations. What the report finds is where there is access to independent arbitration to, in, a, in the event of a dispute over wages, determine a fair wage. The earnings gap between men and women in Australia has closed, and in fact we have one of the smallest gaps between women and men's wages of any country in the OECD. But where negotiation has taken place between workers and employers for over-award uh, payments, and classically that negotiation is, uh, if, uh, if a union is not present, between the individual worker and the employer then the wages gap between men and women has opened widely and that women have come off second best and are the, the, uh, the poor wage cousins or sisters of men in those circumstances. Mr President, the report found uh, as well that there the report found well they are the facts, Senator, and I'm surprised that you should be one that would query them. Because under Order. your system, should we, ever have a, should we ever see it in Australia, under your system, women would be clearly worse off. And that is, not, that is not an objective that this government wants to see, because as I said in an earlier answer today, we stand for fair wage determination and fair treatment between men and women in the determination of wages. Mr President, in contrast to the coalition, we, uh, we have uh, just recently extended the Sex Discrimination Act to cover new awards and certified workplace agreements. Workers can now bring complaints relating to discrimination in both their, their award and over-award pay to the Sex Discrimination Commissioner. We have also announced our intention to legislate to guarantee equal pay for work of equal value for men and women, fair minimum wages and protections against unfair dismissals for all workers. The government rejects and protects the re rejects, sorry, the government respects the, the, the government respects and protects the, uh, the right of women to a fair deal in the labour market. And uh, while I uh, appreciate that Senator Newman has maintained a constant stream of interjection here to put me off the case, in, it, thus, <laughs> thus, in order, thus in order to prevent the facts getting out, this report by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner is profound on this point. Is profound on this point. Women would be worse off under you. Women in employment, much better off under us. Senator Bone, Mr. Mr. President, Order. Mr. Senator President, Bone. my question without notice is addressed to Senator Button. I refer the minister to the meeting he had on Thursday, November the 26th, with Dr. Bella Kadar, the Hungarian Minister for International Economic Relations, followed by meetings with Dr. Kadar by Treasurer Dawkins, Foreign Affairs and Trade Minister Evans, and a previous meeting in Hungary with Trade Minister Kerin. What government-to-government -government discussions or negotiations have taken place relating to a joint venture outlined by Dr Kadar between the Prime Minister's half-owned piggery group, Brown and Hatton, and the Hungarian Zeged small goods group for a $50 million project, 35 per cent owned by the Hungarians at Scone in New South Wales? Now that a letter of intent has been signed under which a pilot salami project is to proceed, I ask the Minister to explain why there is not a massive conflict of interest involved in the Prime Minister standing to gain a substantial benefit as a half-owner of Brown and Hatton as a result of intergovernmental negotiations involving considerable work by Austrade and Australian government agency. Leader of the government, Senator it's Button, a, Mr. order. Mr President, I had a uh, meeting with uh, Dr Bella Kadar on the uh, 20th of November. It was described by him as a courtesy call, C-O-U-R-T-E-S-Y, in case, Senator Bohm, you don't understand the word. It was a courtesy call. No arrangements were discussed about, uh, uh, <coughs> of any kind relating to trade or investment matters. And uh, <coughs> that, uh, that, that is all that happened in the course of that discussion. Might I just say, uh, say to Senator Bohm, uh, you know, <coughs> Why don't you perhaps take the view of the Canberra Times article yesterday, which said that if you really want to get answers to these questions, Dr Hewson should have the courage to ask the questions in the House of Representatives. Dr, Dr. Hewson should have the courage 
to ask them in the House of Representatives. Order. I know it was my meeting. I know it was my meeting. But the point is nothing to do with my meeting, Senator, as you well know. And uh, that, that he should have the courage to ask these questions in the House of Representatives. Now he's become, you know, Mr. Listener, Dr. Listener, all around the country, like Billy Hughes, putting out his ear trumpet to hear the signals. And uh, after the election, if he was uh, successful, he wouldn't hear any more. Uh, that, that's the posture which is now adopted. But uh, Senator Bohm, uh, <coughs> these uh, these questions, as the Canberra Times uh, <coughs> commented yesterday. Uh, should be asked by a courageous opposition in the place where perhaps they can more directly be answered. Instead of which, he uses his uh, uh, how failed shadow minister, his failed shadow minister, 21 questions this year, one of them about his shadow portfolio. He uses him in the Senate to do this sort of thing. For Point him. of order, now that's Senator Ocho. Point of order, Mr. President. Senator Button said this before about Senator Boehm. He of course, neglects all the speeches Senator Bowman has made about his portfolio, about dozens and dozens and dozens of questions he's asked in estimates. And I really feel that this is a personal reflection on Senator Bohm, on his integrity, or on his capacity to act as a shadow minister. And I would suggest that he be he be asked not to, to order, reflect. Like order. That. There's no point of order, but I, I would suggest to Senator Bowman he's beginning to debate the issue. Well, Mr. President, it's not a, certainly not a personal reflection on Senator Bohm. I would not do that. It's a reflection on his professional capacity as a senator, and he shouldn't uh, he shouldn't lower himself he shouldn't lower himself to this sort of thing at the behest at the behest of a leader in the House of Representatives who doesn't have the courage to do it himself and wants to be regarded as Mr. Clean, even if he's Mr. Confused. Su Supplementary question. Supplementary. Mr. President, I, I ask the minister why these questions can't be answered honestly and in substance in Parliament, which is this place here. And I further ask, as the ability of the Prime Minister's piggery group to repay Mr. John Brown the four million dollars I'd owed to him depends on the success of multinational deals involving government-to-government -government negotiations, and as Mr. Brown was involved in initiating this deal this year in Hungary, is the minister able to resolve this problem of conflict of interest? by assuring the Senate that the Prime Minister's half-ownership of this group was not a factor in any decisions to assist or to establish this joint venture. Minister, Senator Mr. Button. Mr. 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 President, the, the issue of uh, Dan Pork, for example, has been canvassed very fully in this place. I think three times, three times Senator Boehm got it all wrong with the allegations which his leader is not prepared to make in the House of Representatives. So Senator, Senator Boehm, of course, a failed shadow minister, has nothing to lose. Has nothing to lose. So he asks the questions up here. And the fact of the matter is, Senator, insofar as the supplementary is relevant to the original question, I have answered it. Senator Walsh. Mr. President, my question is addressed to the Minister for Justice. Averse though I am to enhancing lawyers' incomes at taxpayers' expense. I ask, will he guarantee that the first victim of the sexual harassment amendments enacted earlier this month will be given legal aid in order to test the issue in a real court? The Minister for Justice, Senator Tate. What have you been up to, Walshie? <laughs> Mr President, I can't give any guarantees about the uh, provision of legal aid because, uh, quite uh, obviously, in general, uh, legal aid is made available through the Legal Aid Commissions, which are independent authorities, uh, uh, though funded to a large extent, I think to 55 per cent, indeed, by the Commonwealth. But they exist in the states under state law, and any application made by somebody under that uh, uh, process would, of course, be considered by the Legal Aid Commission in the state concerned. Uh, Senator, uh, insofar as uh, a right to legal aid is concerned, whilst the High Court has recently spoken in terms of, uh, of the need for a fair trial, which may require that a trial be postponed until a lawyer is provided for a person facing a serious charge, I don't think that the sort of, uh, of harassment uh, charges or, uh, or claims of unlawful activity in relation to sexual harassment, which you are speaking of, would fall into that category. Uh, nevertheless, insofar as the matter would uh, uh, come to my attention, insofar as uh, uh, a particular person offended by the application of the provision, uh, sought uh, some legal aid, we would look at the matter sympathetically, in order to ensure that uh, the validity of the Commonwealth statute was put beyond any constitutional doubt.
Senator Patterson. Supplementary. Supplementary, Mr. Senator Walsh. In view of that answer, I ask the minister, does he not regard the award of punitive damages of, say, thirty or forty thousand dollars by a non-court as a serious matter? Minister. Senator Tate. Mr. President, as I recall the provisions of the uh, statute, in fact, uh, that wouldn't definitively happen unless the federal court itself had uh, so uh, determined. And I believe that in that situation, in that situation, uh, the challenge, as I say, being finally uh, determined within the federal court structure, then uh, I believe that a proper exercise of the judicial power of the Commonwealth would have taken place, and uh, it would not be a non-court uh, applying that particular uh, penalty. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Tate, representing the Minister for Health, Housing and Community Services. I refer the Minister to the New South Wales Health Department figures, which show that waiting lists at Bankstown Hospital in the Prime Minister's electorate would double every year for the next five years because of the federal government's new Medicare deal with the states. I also refer to the fact that since 1985, federal government, of New so federal government funding of New South Wales hospital costs has declined from 40 per cent to only 31 per cent. In light of these figures and the Prime Minister's recent claim that Australians do not need to take out private health insurance, I ask how can constituents in the Prime Minister's electorate expect to get access to a hospital bed when they need it? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Tate. Mr President, quite apart from the fact that in the latter part of her question, uh, Senator Patterson didn't give sufficient weight to the fact that through this Senate only a couple of nights ago, for the first time the Australian Parliament endorsed the idea of the right of Australians to choose uh, public or private hospital uh, accommodation for the treatment of their illnesses, supported by private health insurance. Uh, that has been made very clear and is endorsed by this government. But as to the question of access to public hospitals and waiting lists, quite clearly what the New South Wales government ought to do is to accept the new Medicare agreement that has been put forward by uh, Mr Howe, the Federal Minister for Health. What that will do will allow, will allow Australia-wide $1.6 billion over the next uh, six years in extra expenditure to be directed into public hospital services. And in the meantime, of course, uh, some $70 million is, uh, is available to the states to enable waiting lists themselves to be specifically and directly attacked and reduced. Now, at the Perth meeting of heads of government uh, only a week or so ago, the Prime Minister untied the availability of that $70 million to any progress on the uh, resolution of the Medicare agreements. And, uh, in that way, it is available immediately to be taken up by the New South Wales ministers. If he were willing to accept the proposal for uh, accepting money for, for a reduction of waiting lists, he ought to take up that offer. If he doesn't take it up, then the Commonwealth is quite prepared to channel the money that would otherwise go to New South Wales to reduce waiting lists direct to the hospitals concerned. And perhaps that is what we will have to do in order to ensure that uh, the reduction in waiting lists program is not held up and frustrated by the intransigence of uh, the New South Wales government in this respect. By the way, I don't expect that intransigence to last much longer, because under Fightback, $1.3 billion would be removed from the public hospital system. $1.3 billion would be removed from the public hospital system. And in that situation, of course, the strain on the public hospital system in New South Wales would be absolutely enormous. And I believe that in that situation, quite clearly, the New South Wales government will be only too anxious to sign up in order to enable the very persons with whom, uh, with whom uh, Senator Patterson expresses concern uh, so that they could get the treatment that they deserve. Senator Lees. Thank you, Mr President. I direct my question to Senator Cook, Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Education and Training, and I refer to the likelihood of continued levels of high unemployment and hardship amongst young people, as predicted by this report, Wanted Our Future, by the Senate Standing Committee on Employment, Education and Training. And also I refer to this week's prediction by the National Institute of Economic and Industry Research that unemployment will remain unacceptably high till at least the year 2010. And I ask the minister, when will the government acknowledge that there's an urgent need to both redefine the concept of work, to include such activities now are known as voluntary work, for example, and to redistribute work, uh, for example, by uh, uh, reducing hours where, pro where possible for some individual workers. And does the government also accept that to redefine work is meaningless unless all Australians are entitled to a guaranteed minimum income? The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Education and Training, Senator Cook. <coughs> Uh, Mr President, I'm invited uh, in that question to comment on a report that has just come out. Uh, 
Uh, clearly, the, uh, the government is not in a position to immediately respond upon the tabling of a report to the contents and recommendations of that report. I'm advised that the minister, uh, Mr Beasley, is examining the report and will uh, make a considered response shortly. To the last part of the question in which uh, I'm asked should a fair minimum wage apply uh, in Australia, I'll come to the other parts of your question in a minute, Senator Lees. The government's answer is yes, of course it should. And uh, the award system in Australia provides, particularly in the private sector, the determination of fair minimum rates for those industry sectors by an, by an independent arbitrator. And it's the government's announced intention to uh, legislate using the external affairs power of the Constitution, the ILO Convention concerning minimum uh, wages, in order to see that the minimum rates uh, are basically protected so that uh, people uh, who may be in positions of non-award coverage can negotiate knowing that they have a, uh, a fundamental protection on minimum wages. The other questions, uh, Mr President, uh, were about the definition of work. And I take those questions to be uh, definitions for the purposes of uh, determining the uh, provision of government services or uh, supports for people who, who may be unemployed. They are questions, if I may, Mr President, I will take on notice, refer to the minister and reply as soon as possible. Senator Boswell. Mr President, uh, my question is addressed to Senator Cook representing the Minister for Primary Industry. And I refer Senator Cook to the article in the uh, Financial Times this morning. Financial Review, I should say, uh, and uh, I, I, uh, and I refer to the latest estimates from ABER that real wool prices will grow by only six cents to 551 cents between now and 1997. In light of these poor predictions for the returns for the industry, can the minister give an assurance that the wool tax rebate of 3.5 per cent will not be abolished during these hard and difficult times? Minister representing the Minister for Primary Industries, Senator Cook. Thank you, Mr. President. I seem to have uh, attended the chamber without my normal briefing from the Department of Primary Industry and Energy. <laughs> uh, you are asking me for an assurance, uh, Senator, and uh, quite clearly, as a minister representing another minister in this place, it is not appropriate for me to express myself on that assurance. I will refer the question to uh, Minister Crean and reply in due course. Senator Haradine. My question is directed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade. Um, uh, and, uh, I refer to the devastation in Flores, Indonesia, caused by the, uh, uh, by the earthquake and subsequent tidal wage, wave, which has uh, killed some two to 3,000 people and uh, caused billions of dollars' worth of damage. Isn't it a fact that this is the worst natural disaster to occur in our region for the last 30 years uh, since uh, the Gunung Agung volcano? In view of that fact, what is the government's uh, policy in regard to urgent aid uh, for the area? And uh, as uh, Australian NGOs such as ACR are uh, very capable of making sure that aid hits the ground urgently, will the minister give consideration uh, to providing Order. dollar for dollar Order. an amount uh, for a dollar for dollar on that basis? Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade, Senator Evans. Well, Mr. President, I'm not sure whether it is uh, the most serious disaster for the number of years that Senator Harradine describes, but it's certainly unquestionably a major tragedy. Latest figures from Indonesian authorities put the death toll following the earthquake in Flores at 1912, with most of these uh, deaths occurring in the Maumere area. There are some media reports indicating the death toll may well be over 2,200, and it's a matter, I guess, of just seeing unhappily what the final confirmed figure is. The Australian government uh, stands ready to offer such uh, further assistance as is wanted by the Indonesian government. The initial Australian assistance, valued at, as I said yesterday, some $200,000, arrived in Flores uh, uh, yesterday on two RAF aircraft. The emergency supplies provided included uh, tents, tarpaulins, plastic sheeting, 
large water containers, generators, antibiotics and other medications, purification tablets and so on. Um, and President Suharto has expressed appreciation for that. We do stand ready to respond to further emergency requests from Indonesia and to participate in rehabilitation uh, activity as requested. Uh, it is a matter, really, of being responsive to Indonesian requests uh, rather than really being able to do anything else just at the moment. A lot of coordination meetings are proceeding and, of course, there has been a very significant relief effort put into train uh, by the Indonesian authorities themselves. Uh, I heard uh, Senator Haradine's last uh, suggestion about a possible dollar-for-dollar -dollar, um, supplement to NGO funds in this area. Uh, that's an issue I will raise uh, immediately with my colleagues, uh, Mr. Kerrin, the Minister for Trade and Overseas Development, uh, and the uh, Treasurer, Finance Minister, to see what it might be possible to do uh, in this respect. But I can't give an off-the-cuff response now. A brief supplement. Uh, could the minister also raise it with the Prime Minister, who had uh, given the undertaking to provide a dollar for dollar for uh, uh, appeals by local NGOs for poverty alleviation in Australia, and uh, in view of the fact that these that the NGOs, uh, the aid NGOs, uh, are able to make that money hit the ground urgently in uh, in uh, Indonesia, could we? Uh, uh, could, could the minister take that on board and ensure that uh, something is done so as to encourage donations over the Christmas period by Australians? I will minister. take that further suggestion on board, Mr President. Senator Durack. Uh, my question is directed to the Minister of Defence, uh, Senator Ray. And I refer to the decision of the government to deploy a full battalion from the ODF to Somalia in support of the United Nations Operation Restore Hope. Could the Minister explain to the Senate what capacity Australia would have to respond to a defence emergency in our region during the period in which this battalion will be deployed in Somalia? The Minister for Defence, Senator Rowe. Mr uh, President, uh, Third Brigade uh, operates on the basis of rotating battalions. On this uh, basis of the 1st Battalion uh, going to Somalia, the 2nd Battalion will be on uh, a readiness alert for that period of the 17 weeks. And uh, we only ever have one uh, battalion at that readiness level. It will be at the readiness level as, as is normal. It's pointed out, I think, that uh, using the operational deployment force rather than other battalions uh, did give us a strategic requirement, though, to put a shelf life on our offer, which is, uh, as you know, 17 weeks, not from today, uh, as I think Mr Houston confused a few minutes ago in the House of Representatives, but from their deployment to Somalia. Senator Faulkner. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, my question is directed to Senator Evans, Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade. I ask the Minister if he can advise the Senate on the significance of the new report, Grain in China, by Professor Ross Garno and uh, Dr. Guonan Ma of the Australian National University. I further ask the Minister if it's true, as the report suggests that there could be potential for large increases of exports from Australia to China. Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade, Senator Evans. Mr President, uh, Mr Kieran yesterday launched an order. Point of order. That uh, report is listed on the notice paper on the red today to be discussed when the report is tabled and to be debated by this House. If the minister has a statement to make about, about that report, that is the time to make it. It is quite inappropriate that he does so now, and I would ask you to really rule the question out of order. Mr. President, order. it's already a report that has been publicly released a couple of days ago. It has been given to the Senate as a matter of courtesy whether or not the Senate chooses to debate the issue when the report uh, is available for debate later on is a matter for the Senate. I put it to you, Mr President, that uh, it's an extraordinary suggestion that, uh, for me to respond to a question on this is in any way out of order. No, I don't think it breaches the anticipatory rule. I'll allow the question. May I please ask your guidance on this point? The red on which that report is noted says as at the bottom with an asterisk that this report that this report is not available prior to tabling. I have asked for a copy of the report and I have been told I can't have a copy until it's tabled. Technically, 
Yeah. Order, techni technically, I'm sure this is the point that's going to be made. Technically, it's not yet on the notice paper, and I've got one way to rule, and I'm allowing it. I repeat, Mr. President, it is a report that's publicly available because it was, if not through the parliamentary process for obvious reasons, because it was launched yesterday uh, by Mr. Kerrin, and it is the latest in a long series of reports that have now been published under the auspices this year of the East Asia Analytical Unit, including reports on Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, and South China. In this instance, it was written by the former Australian ambassador to China and uh, Professor Guanon Ma, the Australian National University. It's worth the attention of the Senate and the nation, as it will be worth the attention of the whole international community, because it's a path-breaking piece of analysis of China's grain economy and trade. The principal findings of the report are of major significance for Australia's export interests, not only in grain. They are as follows. China's per capita income is estimated to be between two and three times greater than official Chinese and World Bank estimates. Secondly, in the 1990s, a very big shift in China's consumption patterns is expected, involving the substitution of wheat for rice and meat for grain in diets. Again, higher demand for food and much greater competition for land, for feed and livestock than previously thought, could result in a shortfall of grain production of more than 50 million tonnes by the year 2000 or about one-third of total current world trade in grain. How much this means for imports and what opportunities it will represent for Australian exporters will depend, of course, on whether the China, Chinese leadership can be persuaded to relax the present policies of grain self-sufficiency that has begun to happen in terms of China's resource allocation. To do that would be a major contribution to China's growth, and one of the many merits of this report is that it makes a formidable case which can be put to the Chinese leadership for doing just that. In terms of the implications for Australia, as the world's largest, fourth largest rather, exporter of wheat and barley, which are two of China's main grain imports, obviously the findings are of major significance for Australia and for rural producers, particularly because of the potential size of the Chinese market which has now been identified. We're very well placed to take advantage of these emerging opportunities and we're also well placed to raise these issues internationally. Professor Garno and Professor Ma provide, as I said, a far-reaching strategy to deal with the self-sufficiency question. They argued that a narrow window of opportunity exists to deflect China from the path of Northeast Asian agricultural protectionism. We're already pursuing these issues with Chinese leaders and senior officials. We'll continue to pursue them, and Mr. Curran will also be writing to relevant members of the incoming Clinton administration, the U.S. Congress and elsewhere to draw their attention to the significance of this report and to enable some concerted approaches on these policy issues to be made to the Chinese government. If that's not enough to satisfy Senator Bishop about the relevance and utility and importance of this report, I don't know what is. Senator Heron. Thank you, Mr. President. I have a question of you, Mr. President. As joint head of the department, which paid damages of $65,000 to the other joint head of the department, are you aware? that the Workers' Compensation Board of Queensland has a maximum payout for injuries covered by workers' compensation of $71,310 for loss of both eyes and $65,000 for loss of the genital organs, $35,660, and loss of the sight of one eye, $28,520. Mr President, I seek leave to incorporate the table of that uh, within the hand side. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Mr. President, would you not agree that $65,000 for injury is, is excessive for injury to an elbow? Order, order. In reply, in reply to Senator Herron, no, I am not aware of any of the issues that he just raised. Whether the amount judged or not is, is an appropriate amount is something that I am going to be referring to within a very short time when I give an answer, and I am going to be offering to give all of the documents at which these figures were uh, uh, arrived at uh, in confidence to the Leader of the Opposition, Senator Hill, which I, which I will explain. S um, Senator McGuire. Thank you, uh, Mr President. My question without notice is to the Minister for Industry, Technology and Commerce, Senator Button. Has the Minister seen reports of the appointment of a senior Japanese executive to the position of both President and uh, Chief Executive Officer of Toyota Australia Limited. This follows the appointment of a US citizen to head Ford Australia. In both cases, the outgoing Chief Executives were, were Australians. 
Does the government agree with a report in today's business press that the changes at Toyota confirm a drift in recent times from Australian to foreign chief executives in the local car industry? And does the government have any concerns about the replacement of Australians in these very senior positions in this vitally important industry? The Minister for Industry, Technology and Commerce, Senator Button. Mr President, Toyota has announced the appointment of Mr Tom Nakagawa as its new president and chief executive. He will succeed Mr Robert Johnson, who has been elevated to the position of chairman of Toyota Australia and becomes the only non-Japanese chairman in any part of Toyota's international structure. So Mr. Toyota's appointment, uh, Mr. Johnson's appointment is a significant achievement and one uh, justified by his enormous contribution to the automotive industry in Australia. Mr. President, I look forward to meeting Mr. Nakagawa, who comes to Australia with a wealth of experience in bringing new passenger motor vehicle plants into operation, which will be very uh, useful, of course, at Altona, where the new uh, Toyota plant is being built. It is true that, Mr. that Ford's uh, new president in Australia, Mr John Ogden, is an American. Let us not forget that his predecessor, Jack Nasser, an Australian, is now not only chairman of Ford Europe but as vice president of Ford's parent company in the United States, where he holds the highest position ever achieved by an Australian in the international automotive industry. I have met Mr Ogden, and he is now committed to Ford's future here in Australia. As I said earlier, the automotive industry is an international business. Increasingly, Australia is becoming more integrated into international strategies of the major car companies. That is reflected in export figures from Australia. And this means that sometimes the Australian arms of the international car makers will be headed by Australians and sometimes they will not. The commitment of, us, of the car companies to Australia is far more important than the nationality of whoever happens to be a local chief executive at any particular time. And the important factor in determining that commitment is the policy framework the government provides for the development of this industry. That is why the tariff policy, the zero tariff policy, or should I say lunacy, of the opposition's car industry policy is such a threat. The car in companies are unanimous that zero tariffs will mean zero car industry in Australia. Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Mr. President, earlier today at question time, Senator Short uh, uh, raised a, uh, you know, tried and endeavoured to raise a spectre about uh, uh, services tax. And he asked me to uh, deny uh, that uh, any work was being done. I, I indicated that the government had given no consideration to this matter. He asked me to deny that work was being done by the, Treasurer, uh, the, the Treasury or the Australian Tax Office. I can now provide a categorical assurance uh, on advice from the Treasurer's Office that no work is being done by the Treasury nor the ATO on this issue. On this issue. It doesn't matter where, Senator. I'm giving Senator a categorical Tate. denial. Mr. President, uh, uh, yesterday Senator Sawada uh, asked me a question about the, uh, uh, the uh, ANSTO reactor and the inquiry, and she asked me, as part of that question, which I was not able to answer yesterday, whether the Minister for Science and Technology would release the minutes of the meeting of the Australian Science and Technology Council at which the new high-flux nuclear reactor was discussed, and prepare and release an index and guide to the documents written during that process. Senator, I have been advised by the Minister for Science and Technology that this material will be made available as requested. Mr President, on the 14th of December, uh, Senator Watson asked me a question as Minister representing the Treasurer uh, relating to taxation determinations, I seek leave to have that answer incorporated in hand. Is leave, is leave granted? No objection. Leave is granted. Senator Evans. Mr. President, on the 10th of December, uh, Senator Chi sought advice and supporting documentation clarifying what knowledge Austrade and the ambassador in Copenhagen had concerning a proposal by a Danish company for the major piggery investment in Australia that has been exercising the opposition. I now uh, table those documents together with an index and guide to them as requested by Senator Chi. As the index uh, notes, Mr President, in the documents I'm tabling, five of the 76 documents in question have been withheld in whole or in part on commercial and confidence grounds. I have, however, acceded to a request that I receive from Senator Hill's office that he be able to view those documents on a confidential basis. 
In tabling the documents, I'd like to point out that they show clearly that the series of allegations made by Senator O'Chee, based on his extrapolations of the contents of the Austrade memo of 22 November 1990, are all entirely unfounded and indeed erroneous. These documents clearly show government agencies going about the work that they're supposed to do in creating trade and commercial opportunities for Australia. There's no impropriety here, nor any suggestion that the connections that the opposition is seeking to draw between Austrade and the Prime Minister's piggery interests exist. Throughout the uh, life of the project, 1989-92, Austrade offered its investment facilitation services where appropriate. This involved monitoring the project in Denmark and in Australia. Austrade worked to optimise the chances of the project, which represented an important investment for Australia, which promised to generate substantial export income. It was also a project which was enthusiastically supported by the domestic industry and by various state governments who were seeking to have the investment located in their state. The documents clearly show that Austrade worked to facilitate the investment but did not at any stage give any assurance regarding its Austrade's capacity to resolve the quarantine issue. This was clearly left in the hands of the Australian Quarantine Inspection Service. The documents also show that, contrary to Senator O'Chee's suggestion, Austrade did not receive any application from the Danish company seeking quarantine clearance for the import of pigs or genetic material. The reports by Mr Landos of Aquis that Austrade and the ambassador to Copenhagen, Mr Benson, knew details of the project in September 1990 and detailed these to him during his meeting with them in Copenhagen during that month are borne out by these documents. Their knowledge of the project was perfectly natural given this background of domestic interest and appears in Austrade reports back to Canberra in May and June 1990. As I previously advised the, uh, the Senate on the 10th of September, the Austrade memo of 22 November which reported, 1990, which reported advice from the Danish company that, and I quote, all technical, principally quarantine, issues are resolved, unquote, was simply that a report of advice that he had received. The documents also show that when this report was received in Canberra, Austrade sought to clarify this point and was advised that Aquis had told DPIE the protocols had not been signed because, in fact, they had not been developed. DPIE felt that the Danish company was presenting an optimistic gloss for the benefit of potential investors. This was accepted by Austrade. It's also been suggested, finally, Mr. President, by Senator O'Chee, that Austrade was acting in the belief that the potential Australian investor involved the Prime Minister's company. These documents clearly show that neither Austrade nor the ambassador in Copenhagen knew of any such involvement until it became public knowledge earlier this year. So, Mr. President, this squalid little exercise by Senator O'Chee has proved manifestly ill-founded. I table the documents accordingly. Mr. President, while I'm on my feet, sorry, Senator Bishop um, asked me uh, yesterday about uh, details of Mr. Boucher's uh, appointment. I asked her to put that note, question on notice. She has not done so. I did, however, have drawn to my attention uh, yesterday by Senator Bishop that she had asked some questions about uh, this issue back on the 3rd of November, which I would undertook to reply to when documents became available. Lest she further mislead the Senate or anybody else about the status of this matter, let me say, by way of uh, answer to her question yesterday, that I have now checked uh, what I undertook to do on the 3rd of November. I undertook, first of all, to table the document about the terms and conditions of Mr Borthwick's appointment. I did so the following day. As to, as to Mr. Well, you've had your figures subsequently. There's no. Well, you'll get your figures then, if that's what you're still yelping about. You can have them. There's no mystery oh, about it. They're on the. Pub, they're a matter of uh, public legitimate interest, and they'll go on the public record if they haven't been oh, to yeah. your satisfaction. Well, if you know them, okay. Well, I won't. I won't bother then to table if you know already what it's about. Okay. As to, uh, as to Mr Boucher's, I did not undertake to, uh, to advise you or to table documents about the date of his appointment by the Executive Council, but I am now, out of the goodness of my heart, willing to tell you that he was formally appointed by the Executive Council on 23 November 1992. I did undertake to tell you about the terms and conditions of his appointment by way of tabling the relevant document when that document was, uh, was finalised and the terms and conditions were determined. Uh, I'm able to tell you now that that document has not yet uh, been prepared, uh, nor is it expected to be for some time. Normally, terms and conditions documents for a departing head of mission are settled only quite are settled just before the the uh, member in question uh, departs. That's the normal practice, and that was the practice that will be followed uh, again on this occasion. Uh, and he. Uh, hmm? 
in the sense that uh, Mr Boucher doesn't take up the position in March, I don't expect it will be till some time early in the new year that the matter is addressed, in particular when Mr Boucher returns from his present sick leave and is able to address this and other matters. May I say, however, lest there be any—I'm told he's on sick leave at the moment. Well, is that giving you some joy, is it, uh, Senator Bishop? There Order. has, however, may I say, uh, Mr President, there's been no suggestion of which I or my department uh, are aware that Mr Boucher will be treated on anything other than absolutely a standard basis, so far as this appointment is concerned. In particular, there is no suggestion uh, that he be paid at other than his uh, present substantive rate of remuneration, which is the normal basis on which these ambassadorial appointments are made. So again, Mr President, that is not enough to shut Senator Bishop up and satisfy her about the good faith of which I Order. respond to her inquiries, then uh, that is her bad luck. Senator Evans might be appropriate in certain forums of the Labor Party, but certainly not in the Senate. I ask we withdraw that. Yeah, that's why he can't language. Oh. Yes. Look, look. If, uh, if Senator Evans will withdraw, it might improve the, uh, the, the debate. The words shut up. But I, I, look, I've got to point out. I'm sorry. That wasn't I'm not going to go through the words. I wrote down a question time that I regard as unparliamentary, but there were plenty. If it's the way I said I'm sorry, no, it's the way I said it. Well, you're probably right. It was there was there was malice in my heart, if not in my expression. So under those circumstances, I do withdraw. Senator Cook. About the CES, uh, I wonder if I can have the answer incorporated in Hansard rather than read it. Is leave granted? It, it establishes that there's no content to the question raised by Senator Brownhill. And earlier this week, I was asked a question by Senator Perra. I wonder if I can ask the same <coughs> indulgence of the Senate. Uh, both these questions were uh, in my capacity as Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Education and Training. It's leave granted. Leave granted. Ministerial. Yes. Senator Tate. Mr. President, uh, some time ago, Senator Knowles asked me a question about Med Network Systems Proprietary Limited. I have provided the honourable Senator with a copy of the answer. I seek leave to incorporate it in hand. Sir. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Unanswered question. These are unanswered questions from yesterday, and that's why I'm taking this position. Um, late yesterday, following a statement by me in response to the question raised by Senator Hill earlier in the day, I made a statement to the Senate. Uh, in discussion on my statement, further questions were put to me by Senators Hill and Crane. As I advised the Senate at the time, I've obtained further. I have obtained further information from Mr. Speaker and the Joint House Department. There's quite a number of detailed questions were asked, and I was going to, to table a list of them because it comes to five pages, but I believe Senator Hill wants them uh, read out. So uh, I, I, I propose to do that. Uh, I became aware of the accident at a meeting with the Speaker a couple of days after the event. At that time, advised me he was considering taking legal action. I did not become involved in the process, nor would it be appropriate for me to do so. And I must say to Senator Heron, I'll have a look at the hands up, but if you implied that I had some input into the amount paid to the Speaker, I reject that absolutely. F uh, furthermore, the Speaker advised me that he was keeping himself at arm's length from the matter. I leave it to the judgment of the head of the department, for which I am either singly or jointly responsible, to seek my assistance or decision if that is required. The Secretary of the Joint House Department did not seek my intervention in this matter and has assured me that neither he nor his officers discussed this matter with the Speaker. One of the questions raised by Senator Hill is contained in the following questions, and I'll mention at this stage. Will the department make available the legal opinions upon which the assessment of damages and liability was made? Oral advice from the Australian Government Solicitor's Office is that this information is covered by legal professional privilege, and to release it could provide possible litigants with information, pro with information properly the property of the defendant and their solicitors. Nevertheless, I have offered to provide Senator Hill on a confidential basis with copies of the legal advisings to satisfy himself that proper process was followed. Order. I'm going to go through the questions and answer now. The accident occurred, out question. The accident occurred outside the parliamentary precinct. I'm going to ask you whether that is correct. Yes, the accident occurred in the Canberra suburb of Hughes. Question, was it an exercise bike? No, the bike was not an exercise bike. It was a strider fold-up bike which was purchased to be used by members, senators, their spouses and children, staff of the parliament for recreational riding. Was the bike assembled outside the building? It was delivered in fold-up form to the speaker and unfolded by him. What was the basis of the claim? Uh, these are questions. Why was faulty equipment being used by the speaker outside the precincts of parliament? 
We would very much like to know the nature of the fault in the equipment. The fault was at the frame of the bike collapse when the speaker rode over a pothole. The issue of the Commonwealth being negligent arose. The issue of the Commonwealth being negligent arose because the Joint House Department officers were considered by the barrister engaged by the Australian government solicitor not to have exercised their duty of care. The barrister believed the Joint House staff had possession of a manual on the bike and information from safety officials in the ACT, which was not passed on to the users. The manual stated, do not ride over curbs or through deep potholes, and the maximum load for the bike is 100 kilos. Of course, the speaker's weight was thought by the Joint House to be in excess of 100 kilos. This information, any other instructions, should have been brought to the speaker's attention. The department should also have advised that care should be taken in riding the bikes because of their method of construction and different centre of gravity from ordinary bikes. Who authorised the payment? After receiving a recommendation from the Australian Government solicitor, the Secretary of the Joint House Department accepted the recommendation and authorised the settlement for the amount recommended, i.e. $65,000. Question. I thought that an accident which involved parliamentary equipment would have been brought to the attention of the Joint House Committee. Following the answer, following the accident, four Strider bikes were initially purchased. The equipment was removed from use. This action was taken by the department prior to legal action being commenced. Equipment failures or breakdown are not normally brought to the attention of the committee. Legal matters go to the administrative functioning of the department and are not matters for the committee whose role is to advise the presiding officers on the provision of services and facilities to members of parliament. Why did the Joint House Department annual report not state that it was the head of the department, the speaker, who was paid the damages. It is not the practice to identify the recipient of personal injury claims for privacy reasons, but the department identified the quantum of each claim settled in the 1991-92 in its annual report for accountability purposes. What was the injury for which damages were paid? The speaker suffered injuries to both hands, his right elbow and face. The statement of claim related to the injury states fracture of the right radial head, severe right ulnar nerve entrapment, and chronic ulnar nerve compression requiring surgery, development of myos myositis ossificans of the elbow, bruising, lacerations and abrasion shock. What medical advice was given? What was the assessment? This was personal medical information which was provided to the Commonwealth's legal advisers. It is not appropriate for privacy reasons to publicly disclose this information which they assessed and took into account when recommending a settlement figure. Question. What was the legal advice that the department heads received? The presiding officers in their capacity as heads of the Joint House Department neither sought nor received any access to the Commonwealth legal advice. This was an administrative matter handled by the Secretary of the Joint House Department. Question. The question of contributory negligence has not been addressed. This was not an issue in this case. Details of the contract of hire. No formal contract exists. The use of health and recreation facilities by members, senators, members and staff who do not pay an annual membership fee includes a hiring fee of $2 per use. The Speaker was not a member of the facilities and paid the hire fee. Who made the decision that the Australian Government Solicitor Act for the Department? In the normal course of events, the Joint House Department seeks advice from the Australian Government Solicitor on damages claims. In this case, the Secretary of the Department thought it doubly prudent because the Speaker had made the claim that the matter be handed over to the Australian Government Solicitor to ensure probity in the handling of the matter. Question. I should also like to know why the settlement was paid by the Department of Finance and not by the Joint House Department. The Secretary of the Joint House Department has corrected earlier advice, which he inadvertently provided to the Speaker and the President. A form authorising payment based on advice and instructions from the Australian Government Solicitor was forwarded to the Department of Finance, who issued a cheque on behalf of the Commonwealth and debited the Joint House Department Contingency Fund, which provides funds to pay for claims and damages. Questions asked by Senator Crane. How much was the total claim? Was it fully paid? Answer. The settlement negotiated by the Australian Government Solicitor was for $51,205.55 damages plus $3,794.45 medical expenses plus $10,000 legal expenses, total $65,000. Was court litigation involved or was it settled out of court? After negotiations lasting 12 months, the matter was settled out of court in November 1991 after the writ of summons had been issued in the ACT Supreme Court, but before proceeding to hearing. Question. What were the legal expenses incurred by the Speaker? After examination of the Speaker solicitor's claims for costs, the Australian Government solicitor endorsed a claim for $10,000. Were they met by the Commonwealth? Yes, they were included in the $65,000 settlement. 
question, were there any other legal costs involved in the matter which were met by the Commonwealth? Answer, the Commonwealth met its own legal costs. The Australian Government solicitor, as was the practice in 1991, did not charge the Joint House Department for its own costs. The Australian Government solicitor engaged a barrister and passed the cost of $500 onto the Joint House Department. To assist in the consideration of issues arising in the case, the Joint House Department obtained expert technical advice on the bikes at a cost of approximately $800. Senator Hill. Mr. President, I seek leave to move a motion to take note of, the, the, of your statement. Is leave granted? Hmm? Well, if to answer or state. We'll Is leave it. granted? We'll... <laughs> I see. Leave's granted. St statement. Um, Mr. Mr. President, uh, um, what you put before the Senate is, is extraordinary and ra again raises many questions in itself. But uh, there's, only one, uh, there's only one issue that I, I want to, uh, to raise uh, and to put to you in the light of what you have said. Um, it seems that what you have said is that, the, that the, uh, the fault of the Commonwealth was not to advise was not to advise the Speaker that there was a weight, uh, effective weight limit on the use of these, uh, these bicycles. Uh, I understand that a woman from the health centre was on duty when the Speaker, Mr Maclay, came in to hire the bike, and she refused to let him have the bike because he was more than 100 uh, kilograms in weight. Mm. I'm further advised that uh, the Speaker later, undeterred, went back to the health centre during the lunch break so he could hire the bicycle from another person who was unaware of the weight limit. I am told that the woman involved in the matter, the one who, who made the first, gave the first advice to Mr Maclay that it wasn't a bike suitable for him to use, gave a statement of the incident to the lawyers concerned. And I ask you, therefore, are you aware of that statement? And when, now that you've been through the file in detail, can you tell the Senate whether there is such a statement on the file? No, I, I cannot do that because I haven't been through the file in detail at all. Not, a, not at all. This, these question, the, this, the, the, the questions and the answers were prepared by the head of the Joint House Department and the Speaker, and I will, I will get you an answer for this. I said it was a matter that I had. I, there was an issue raised by Senator Hill. And I will get an answer to it. Senator, Senator Austin. Um, Mr President, I would have thought that uh, the matter raised by Senator Hill was uh, of the utmost seriousness. It may even be uh, a sufficient defence to preclude any payment. And in those circumstances, uh, I would ask you to uh, very urgently consider what material ought to be made available publicly. For example, to uh, say to us that um, certain documents attract legal professional privilege, and one I think you said which was claimed by the defendants, uh, is certainly not uh, the usual understanding of the term. It is a privilege normally claimed by the plaintiff, but in any event, I would have thought that both parties could waive that privilege. In other words, in the interest of the public and given that we are talking about public monies, both parties ought to be prepared to make all relevant documents available, including the documentary evidence in support of the claim and the medical reports. Certainly uh, from the, the scant nature of the injuries as described by you, and I would have thought you'd have been in a position to have at least tabled the, the writ, which is clearly a public document having been issued out of the Supreme Court. On the basis of that evidence, it is very hard indeed to see uh, the basis of the claim. For example, did it contain a claim for future economic loss, for any loss of earnings uh, or any other pecuniary loss? And uh, If not, is that all meant to constitute uh, pain and suffering, loss of enjoyment of life, which is a very nebulous concept, one which Senator Kearney would well know because he used to make these sorts of outrageous claims on a regular basis, uh, need to be very carefully and independently assessed on the basis of expert evidence. And, uh, we would want to know uh, whether there was an independent investigator's report into the circumstances of the injury. Uh, for example, I note you say that the bike was assembled by the Speaker. Now, it may well be that he did not uh, assemble it as he ought to have done. He may not have done up the nuts as tightly as they should have been done up. 
And in those circumstances, it seems extraordinary that you can say that contributory negligence was not relevant. Indeed, uh, the onus of proof being on him, I would have thought that there were, there were considerable difficulties confronting any plaintiff in these circumstances to show that somehow it was the fault of uh, those who didn't bring certain matters to his attention. He ought to appreciate, uh, presumably, what uh, can and can't be done in riding a bike of this sort. He ought to test it before he gets on board and uh, he generally ought to take account of his own uh, physical condition. But more importantly, it is absolutely impossible for anyone to make a judgment about the ultimate merits of the action without looking at all the relevant documentation. But can I say, uh, as an outsider, that it seems an extraordinarily high payout, certainly uh, one that I'd be amazed you could recover in uh, the normal course of negotiations for uh, an injury such as this. We don't know, for example, whether uh, the injuries had substantially resolved, whether there's any permanent disability. Uh, Senator Heron, no doubt, is in a much better position to comment on this than others. But if we're talking about severe ulnar nerve entrapment. I would have thought that's simply a matter of an operation to uh, clear the entrapment, and uh, it doesn't necessarily follow there'd be any residual damage. And uh, therefore, to merely say that uh, there was some damage to uh, the right. A fracture of the right radial nerve doesn't tell you a thing. Was it an undisplaced fracture? If so, uh, was there any continuing uh, injury? Uh, unless you know those matters, then of course there's no basis for suggesting that it's a serious claim. And uh, a figure of uh, $65,000 or $50,000 on the face of it for pain and suffering, loss of enjoyment of life, as Senator Cooney would well know, is something that you'd normally uh, be looking at if you were permanently and severely disabled. Now, None of us know the extent to which Mr Maclay is disabled other than in his conduct of proceedings in the uh, House of Representatives, but presumably he doesn't need an elbow or a wrist or a to, in, to order, enforce order, order, even if he were so minded. Order. And, time's up. Um, Senator, Senator Ray. Mr President, on this particular matter, again, the Senate setting itself up as a jury, but I think— no, no. Well, Let's, let's, uh, you, Senator Orson, have made comments about and an analysis about the medical circumstances of Mr Maclay's injury. You've said it here and you've done it here. Where, where, there are two, where there are two issues to be determined here. Two issues to be determined here. One, whether the correct process in all this uh, thing was followed and uh, Mr President's role in that. And secondly, Having gone through those processes and established whether they're right or wrong, was there an appropriate outcome? I think they're the two questions raised by all of this. And uh, in terms of the role of the president, I think he's behaved quite properly. He hasn't. Uh, you see, this is why we can't take this seriously, That's Mr. Right. President. We have all the snide comments right. from Senator Olson and Senator Patterson and all the rest. Who would open their remarks here and say this is a serious matter, and then just sit here making snide interjections about the matter, about the matter that has no relevance to the matter? Well, I, well, the jury, the jury over here has brought in the verdict. But I'm going back to the question of process. What would be the appropriate processes in this particular matter? I think the first, uh, I think the first uh, process. Is does Mr. McClay retain rights that everyone else in this building has, or is he excluded from that? And I think the answer has to be, of course, he retains those rights. And maybe this debate would not be occurring if it had been some other person in the building that went through the same circumstances. So we agree on one thing, I think, across this chamber, that he retains his rights. Secondly, though, he is in a different position from everyone else in this building. We also acknowledge that. That is one of the uh, another snide remark from Senator Knowles. Why don't you treat this issue seriously? Well just be quiet, make your contribution. Order. Now Mr President, <coughs> we've established the fact we've established the fact that Mr Maclay has the same right as anyone else in the building, but he is not in the same position. He holds a, he holds an office in this building that would mean the handling of any such matter would be far more sensitive and complicated for than the average person in this building. I think that's the second thing to be conceded. Therefore, 
when Mr Maclay wishes to proceed with a claim for compensation, how should it be best dealt with? Well, certainly not by himself, certainly not by, uh, certainly not by uh, Mr President, and I think that the uh, Joint House Department was quite correct to refer this to the government solicitor. And I think it was quite correct that the adjudication on this was made at that level with the president and speaker at hand's length having no involvement in it whatsoever. No, no, no. I know someone with your concentration span, Senator Walters, would not yet realise. Order. She said it last night. She said, I must order. be yeah, Order. 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 It should be with yeah. well, I am talking about the process, not the result of the adjudication yet, Senator Walters. I'm trying to establish the case that the proper processes were gone through. The third matter, of which I don't have enough knowledge to comment on, is whether it's a fair figure, whether they considered everything, all the rest of it. And uh, I do support the fact that at the initial stage, Mr President should release that information to Senator Hill. He will then be in a position to say there is no cover-up, or if he thinks there is a cover-up, to pursue that third and critical issue. But I must say, Mr Maclay retains his rights. He retains his rights. He is in a more special position from others, which can hurt his rights. The proper processes went through. Whether the result is right or wrong, that is another debate to be had, maybe today, maybe now, etc. But I wanted to establish those other processes, and Mr. President, I believed acted within the highest propriety of this chamber. Senator Heron. Mr. President, I agree with Senator Ray. There are two aspects that need to be covered here. One is the process. Mr. President, I find it absolutely extraordinary that you can wash your hands of this thing. You are the joint head of, this de of the department, and you cannot say that the secretary, it was handled at secretarial level. You are the joint head of the department. Now, if you were not informed and you did not have a hand in it, and I accept that assurance, if you were not, it is derelict of the secretary not to inform you as joint head of the department. That's the Nuremberg defence. I didn't know. I didn't know it was going on. Mr. President, you don't have that right. You are joint head of the department. So what Senator Ray said was absolutely correct. There is a, there is a matter of process. And within that process, you are responsible, Mr. President, with the joint head. And you are responsible for the expenditure of taxpayers' money. And you cannot wash your hands of this matter. And the second point that I wish to raise is the appropriateness, as Senator Ray said. And I would like to read to you with each, from each state what happens in, re, in compensation to the dependent spouse of somebody who is killed in an accident. In my own state, it's $77,470 a lump sum goes to the dependent spouse after death by accident. In Victoria, it's $108,640,000. In New South Wales, it's $150,000. In South Australia, it's $80,000 lump sum and 50 per cent of the deceased's average weekly earnings. In Western Australia, it's $83,776 lump sum. In the Northern Territory, 80,449,000 lump sum. Mr President, that's in, in death, and that goes to the dependent. And here we have $65,000 to an injury to an elbow, where, and I can assure you from a medical point of view, a displaced factor of the head of the radius with entrapment of the, of the nerve and myositis ossificans, which is in, that, that is just a bit of calcification in the bruise around it. As, as uh, Senator Olson said, it is a not uncommon occurrence in that sort of injury. It is remedied by a simple operation to pull the nerve out, and at the most it will give you 10 per cent disability. I'd like, to, I'd like to know how much disability occurred in this place. That hasn't been answered. But $65,000, Senator Collins, $65,000 for an, an injury of this nature is absolutely exorbitant. It has no relation to the injury uh, concern. And I believe that there should be expert advice sought on that matter. So there are two, two aspects, Mr. President, as Senator Ray quite rightly said. There is the process, and you're, you're attempting to take no responsibility for the expenditure of this sum, this sum of taxpayers' funds, and the second aspect of the appropriateness of the, of the sum that was, that was given. Senator Kearney. Kearney. But, uh, I think uh, what Senator 
uh, Ray has said is happening here, that we're becoming a jury. And I'm a man who has great respect, may I say, for Senator Heron, but he has made judgments and he's made, uh, uh, made uh, statements on the basis of facts with which he is not equipped. And uh, well, no, you haven't. Uh, you haven't, Senator Heron. If you, if you were in this, this is a matter which is very much to do with the assessment of compensation in the court. There is a, uh, there is a process that has to be gone through. Senator Alston knows this. I thought his uh, address was a uh, quite a brilliant defendant's address, but I still would have, uh, I still would have thought that uh, I would have got the money uh, nonetheless. Senator, uh, Senator Heron, can I say that Senator Heron has read out figures about uh, the death, uh, the, 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 the figures that indicate the compensation a widow would get for the death uh, of a husband. I think you'd probably find that was under a compensation system, uh, uh, Senator Heron. As I understand uh, what has been done here, this is a common law action, as Senator Alston will tell you. It's quite a different issue. The fact of the matter is that if there is a common law action, uh, uh, widows get a lot more if it's, uh, if it's justified than the figures you have quoted. And I think uh, not that you would have intended this, but the quoting of those figures has been quite an unfair uh, uh, reflection on what is a common law action. We've got to decide uh, in this uh, chamber whether or not we want to go in to the exercise of deciding whether or not we are going to decide uh, what is a fair figure or uh, otherwise. What I say is this, Senator Alston that we can, I think, quite properly look at the process as to whether or not the amount, uh, the, not, not the amount, but the way that amount was assessed in terms of who did it, whether the proper people did it, whether the proper process was gone through, whether that was done, that's something we can look at. That's the issue that, Senator, uh, that the President has dealt with. The President should have kept quite clear of this. It would be wrong for somebody who knows uh, uh, I would think uh, Senator Maclay on the uh, uh, Mr. Maclay on the basis that um, that the president does to assess it. He has stayed uh, clear of that. What we can do, I think, and it's, there's, there's no uh, problem about this. I think it's, we're entitled to look at uh, whether or not the uh, proper people, of, in, in terms of the sorts of people who assess this, were quite uh, were, were the proper people. Uh, as I understand it, there was a barrister who did it. Uh, <coughs> I take him to be a barrister competent in this field. The Australian public solicitor looked at the issue. Is that the proper body to do it? They're the sorts of issues that we can look at, but I think it's wrong for us to be going about whether or not the figure was fair on the basis of the evidence that has been given to us, because we're not in possession of all the evidence. The only, the only other thing I would like to say is this. that. The, the fact that it's taxpayers' money, that is, it's money from the consolidated revenue that goes to the uh, uh, president, shouldn't uh, uh, be a uh, factor which leads us to go into uh, uh, the issue of whether or not a fair figure has been assessed on the evidence. That's a uh, taxpayers' funds are paid uh, again and again to people who have been injured as a result of the Commonwealth's negligence. So I simply say this: let's get round to the real issue. Which is whether or not, as Senator Hill, I think Senator Hill has said this on AM this morning. He said it now. Let's look at the process. If the process is right, then uh, let it uh, go at that. But it's wrong, I think, to go into uh, what is really the exercise for a jury otherwise. So I would suggest that we uh, go on the line that Senator Hill has suggested. Senator Crichton Brown. When's the time? Might I say, with respect, that while it's only become apparent today, notwithstanding statements put out by Mr. McClay yesterday, that the decision, the decision, the final decision to settle at $65,000 was made by Mr. McClay's subordinate, was made by Mike Bolton, head of the department. Now, I do not reflect, nor would I reflect, on Mike, to Michael Bolton. The truth of the matter is, Mr. McClay is his boss, and boss he is. Anybody who's been on the Joint House, Joint House Committee will know how much he's his boss. And it's an intolerable situation for Mr. McClay to have to sit in judgment. On what negotiation should take place, Mr. Bolton? Mr. Bolton. Mr. Yes, absolutely. Uh, knowing, knowing that he was still, he's still in the employ of Mr. McClay. Now, at the very least, with respect, Mr. President, I would have thought that Mr. Bolton, so as to remove himself from the personal relationship, should have referred the matter to the Joint House Committee, which is made up of every political party in the Parliament. It is that we're always reminded by Mr. McClay, but an advisory body, an advisory committee. I can think of no better occasion 
than for that advice to be sought. I note, Mr. President, that you observed that um, that committee is only responsible for offering advice in respect of services and facilities and amenities for members and senators. I would have thought the provision of a bicycle would have fitted perfectly, perfectly into, that, uh, into that category. The, 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 other, the other things I'd say, Mr. President, which I, yeah, particularly if the bike is defective. The other, thing I, the other things I'd say, Mr. President, I noticed in today's Canberra Times the standard comment when information is being backgrounded to a journalist that says it is understood that Mr Maclay had been taking the bike, a collapsible model, on a trial run near Parliament House as part of a mooted program of politicians using such bikes for commuting. It is understood that Mr Maclay had been taking the bike, a collapsible model, for a trial run near Parliament House as part of a mooted program of politicians using such bikes for commuting. I must say it's a well, it's a well hid, hid, hidden secret, that program. But when he had bumped against a curb, the bike had collapsed beneath him. Well, of course, that's, now, I'm not suggesting that, that that information came from Mr Maclay, but I rather wonder who else would have that information that could provide it to the journalist in the Canberra Times. I, I, no, I, note, I, I note the dedication of the service of Mr Maclay, that he was in fact undertaking this, this, um, this uh, project on behalf of all of us on Anzac Day, on a, on a public holiday. And, and for the generous contribution that his family made also, because I understand his son was also undertaking this pilot, pilot project. Mr. 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 President, Senator Ray is quite right when he says that Mr. McClay doesn't abrogate any of his rights simply because he takes on the responsibilities of the speech any more than you do, any more than any of us do when we assume any responsibilities. But when he's elevated to such a position, He's required to balance his rights with his responsibilities. He is not simply an ordinary employee who, who, who has injured himself as, as a result of the conduct of his employee, employer. I don't make any judgments as to whether the facts as presented uh, by uh, Senator Hill as a question are right or not. But I would have thought by any measure the ordinary average intelligent person in taking a dismantled piece of equipment unless they got some particular skills, would have asked for the instructions. And I'm certain that any responsible officer of the parliament, if they were told that their particular model didn't fit the bike, Time, time's expired. wouldn't have continued to have asked for the bike. Senator McMullen. As Mr President, I had no intention of entering this debate because I thought that the position had been adequately presented by Senator Ray and Senator Cooney. But there is one additional point that I wish to add to this debate, because we have checked one fact that has been raised that was new, was not contained in your uh, response and was not an allegation that hadn't been heard by anyone on this side. And I want to say for the record that the Speaker, Mr Maclay, absolutely and categorically denies the allegation that he had previously been advised by anybody that he should uh, that he was not they should not take the bike and that it was not suitable for him he, he even he denies that he even went down to the uh, health center to get the bike the bike was delivered to his office and there and his advice to us is unequivocal that no such advice was ever offered so i think it's important that, and it's one of the problems that arises. One of the problems. Well, can I just say to you that what you have just, your fanatical attempt to put something on the record that will d damage uh, the speaker, is one of the very good reasons why the argument that was put by Senator Ray and Senator Cooney that it is entirely inappropriate for people here to be rising and purporting to make quasi-judicial determinations about the nature of the determination, the decisions that have been made by the, common, by the Australian government solicitor in this matter. And remember, we had a lot of comment about how uh, uh, a lot of comment probably because we knew what people like you would leap into the gutter about with it as soon as it was became available and every such fear has been proved 100 per cent plus. Now, the fact of the matter is simply this. 
The fact of the, no, no, I understand the question and the response, and I enjoyed it absolutely. The fact of the matter is simply this. No, no, it, was just news to, it came as news to me when it was announced, but I enjoyed the opportunity to make that response, and I enjoyed it. No, no. Compounding ignorance with misleading is not helpful. Order. Order. The, uh, this is a great example all of this is why a lot of students stay out of politics. I think this is the chamber is absolutely in grave danger of significantly abusing its responsibilities with regard to this matter on a day when a lot of people are going to very soon be getting up and expressing serious concern about how late we're sitting and how much business there is and look at all and then we'll have the rural members getting up and saying why are you dealing with the rural issues so late at night it shows the government doesn't care about it i can hear all the speeches now i think we might even hear one from senator heron and yet here he is getting up prete pretending to be contributing in a serious professional manner to what is merely another heap of rubbish on the smear trail now let us the only reason I got up to participate in this debate, although I've enjoyed the opportunity, is to say that the way that that further allegation was dragged across the trail without checking, ignorance is no excuse for you, Senator Knowles. The Order. fact of the matter is Order. that no, no, not in the slightest. And it is absolutely clear that the speaker categorically denies that, and it's important we put it on the record before the deliberate misleading or the accidental misleading I'm sorry, I don't think it was deliberate the accidental misleading could have been compounded by people Order. taking it up and pursuing it Order. further. Time's expired. Senator Crane. Thank you, um, Mr uh, President. Was this a point of order? Or? Uh, well, pursuant to uh, standing order 191, I wish to uh, explain some material part of my speech which has been misquoted or misunderstood. And I think it is a very important matter arising. Sorry? Oh, yes, you do. Arising. No, no. Well, I've, I've written down what you said. Well, yes, yes you, you've got the right to, to make a speech now. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, what Senator awesome. McMullen said uh, in referring to me was that uh, I had been making fanatical efforts to put something on the record that would damage the Speaker. And that is that is a clear that all right. Well, I mean, you're you're compounding the allegation, and that's why I wanted to, to clarify the position. Well, I just want to explain this. Uh, what we are saying on our well, yes, Senator Rowe. Senator Rawson has used one part of the standing orders to make an explanation, where in fact. The intervention by Senator McMullen was to his interjection. There's nothing in standing orders that allows Senator Alston to get up and explain his interjection or someone's response to it. Out of order, Mr. President, uh, nothing was said by Senator McMullen using those words to suggest that he was only referring to an interjection on my part. He made the broad statement, which clearly is taken to refer to my speech, and I therefore seek to. Respond order. To it. Look, I think Senator Ray is technically right, but I, I find it very difficult to remember every single thing that was said, and that's the problem that I've got. Well, Mr. Can I, before uh, dealing with this man, with uh, Senator Alston's uh, right to speak on this matter, speak to the point of order, because yes. it is, it was, and there was no doubt in the circumstances that I referred to a further question which Senator Alston sought to drag across the trail by way of interjection. Not the slightest doubt at all. If he wishes leave to explain why he made that interjection, we will give it. That is the only matter to which I was referring and therefore the only matter to which properly he might respond now. But if I he wants leave to explain that. why he made that interjection, yeah. we'll give it to him. Look, look, I'm not in the position of remembering whether it was an interjection or whether it was part of his speech. I think it might be in the circumstances. It might be better if your contribution is very brief, Senator Austin. Thank you, Mr. President. I simply want to say this: we are not seeking to prejudge anything. What we seek is for all the all right, just a moment, for all the relevant material to be put on the record, including material that will go to the point made by the the matter raised by Senator Hill. Now, it is Im it is impossible for anyone to make a sensible judgment, not just on the process, but on the merits of the argument. And I, I say again. 
$50,000 for general damages on the face of it suggests a very, very generous award. We don't want to say that it was, uh, certain, was not something that could ever be uh, uh, given to someone by way of settlement. We simply say that, faced with what appears to be a very high offer, or not, yes, offer, then uh, you ought to provide the material to substantiate it and to justify it. And that includes the material that would refute the matter that Senator Hill raised. In other words, Senator Hill suggested there was a statement made by this woman to that effect, that there had been a complaint and that indeed the Speaker went and uh, saw someone else who was unaware of it. In those circumstances, uh, I would ask that uh, you, Mr President, uh, go through the file and uh, make this material available by way of tabling so that proper and sensible judgments can be made about the merits of the claim. Um. Senator Roy, well, just by leave, if I may comment on Senator Rawson for one minute. I mean, well, you've asked questions here. Time's just about to expire. You've Senator asked Roy. questions of uh, the president at this stage, uh, Senator Rawson, about these matters. I don't believe you should get an immediate Senator response Rawson from the. Don't believe you should get immediate response from the president, and uh, the president can go away and think about the points you've made. Order. The time for the debate has expired. Could I, could I just say? I have no details of the court case whatsoever, but the legal opinions upon which the assessment of damages and liability was made have been delivered to my office. I haven't even had time to look at them, but I'll be, before I look at them, because I now have another meeting, I'll give them to Senator Hill's office immediately. Immediately. The question, yes. The question, the question is that the Senate take note of the answer. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator McGibbon. Mr. President. Pursuant to contingent right. notice, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely the moving of a motion of censure against Senator Collins. Order, Mr. President. I'm not trying to interrupt you in any way, Senator. Uh, no, but I think uh, uh, no one was given an opportunity to, an to note answers. Uh, we went straight into a noting of the President's statement. As, well, we were told. Well, if it's going to be interpreted that way, I'm del deliriously happy. Yeah. Senator McGibbon, and I move that a motion to censure be moved forthwith and have precedence over all other business until determined. The, yeah. This motion that will go through whatever procedure well, the question is, the question is to, is to allow the motion to be put. The question is the standing orders be suspended. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator McGibbon. Mr. President, I move that a motion of censure be moved forthwith, and uh, that motion will be that this Senate censures the Minister for Transport and Communications for his persistent failure to immediately investigate allegations of irregularities concerning the CAA TATS contract and his inordinate delay in establishing the McPhee inquiry. Mr. Deputy President, this is the most serious charge. It's a question of putting the uh, motion on the procedural motion. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Thank you, Mr. Deputy you can President. Now move your censure motion, Mr. Well, well, yeah. Mr. Deputy President, I move that the Senate censures the Minister for Transport and Communications for his persistent failure to immediately investigate allegations of irregularities concerning the CAA TATS contract and his inordinate delay in establishing the McPhee. Inquiry. This charge before the Senate of a Senate motion is the most serious charge we can move against the Minister, and it's not a charge we move lightly. The charge is that the Minister was clearly negligent in the discharge of his duties and his responsibilities as a Minister of the Crown when he was the Minister for Aviation. A Minister is answerable for the actions of his department, not in minute detail, but in the overall. He is clearly responsible for the efficiency and the drive of that department in fulfilling their duties. And it cannot be pleaded in the case of this minister that he was ignorant of the charges that uh, the department was not operating in an efficient manner. It is possible, of course, given the complexities of some disaster, uh, departments on some issues, for a minister to claim in perfectly good faith that he has no knowledge of maladministration, and therefore he is not obliged to vicariously accept any shortcomings of any of the officers or servants in his department. But this wasn't the case with Senator Collins. 
Senator Collins had much advice on numerous occasions that things were wrong with the CIA Pat's contract, and he did nothing about it. Now, during his period as a minister, the chief executive of the uh, Civil Aviation Authority, a Mr Baldwin, was appointed. The Civil Aviation Authority, on the advice of Mr Baldwin, abandoned contracts that were worth $200 million that were in train and incurred $48 million in cancellation costs, a cost which was borne not by the department but by the public of Australia. And the department under Mr Baldwin embarked on an ambitious new nationwide air traffic control system. And as soon as it embarked on this, irregularities became apparent in the way the selection process was going to be handled. Those irregularities were small in the first instance, but they became of increasing number and of increasing importance. And a number of questions were asked on both sides of the Senate about the process being followed by the CAA in this matter. Those questions were asked by individual senators and they are asked by the properly constituted authority, the Senate Estimates Committee, and by the Public Works Committee. Senator Collins never answered those questions in a responsible way. Furthermore, he never instructed his department, the Civil Aviation Authority, to answer the questions that were properly put to them in the Estimates Committees. He never advised people like Mr Baldwin and Dr Edwards that Parliament is supreme and that when Parliament directs a question through the form of a committee to the officers of the Civil Aviation Authority, they, like every other public servant, had to answer those questions fully, honestly and comprehensively. Now, Mr Deputy President, the questions that were put to Senator Collins in relation to the Civil Aviation Authority were not trivial questions. They were questions that senators were properly asking in the public interest. And it's history now that an independent inquiry, the McPhee inquiry, which reported yesterday to the Senate, found that the worst fears of this chamber were confirmed, that we were dealing with gross professional incompetence in the Civil Aviation Department in the way it handled the TATS contract. You yourself, Mr Deputy President, must feel a particular pride in your part in the Public Works Committee in the way that you sought the truth in the expenditure of public funds on this matter. The Parliament was completely vindicated by the report for the actions of its members. And I'd just like to quote from an independent source, Ms Verona Burgess of the Canberra Times, who wrote in the paper today where she was praising the determination of backbenchers of this Parliament in relation to this issue. And I quote, they persisted that something was very smelly against absolute and categorical denials by the former Minister for Aviation, Bob Collins. What we have before us in this report is a devastating record of professional incompetence. And the matter for the Senate to come to a decision on is what did Senator Collins do about it? Well, every senator who challenged in the form of a question the activities of the Civil Aviation Authority was vilified or denigrated by Senator Collins. If there wasn't an attack on the questioners, Order. there was Order. a support, an unquestioning support for the actions of the authority, a support for its officers, for its activities. We were told incessantly that they were making the best of decisions and it was of the highest probity. Let's have a look at some of the examples of the way Senator Collins dealt with questions. In an answer to me, he said, I trust that the newspaper that gave such prominence to Senator McGibbon's totally false assertion will give similar prominence, having read the Hansard to my correction. Again, I must say that there are similarities between the nonsense that Senator McGibbon has run consistently in this debate. And again, I hope that I will actually have the opportunity of rebutting the nonsense that Senator McGibbon has delivered ridiculous point by ridiculous point. He turned on Senator Lewis as he turned on Senator Macdonald, Senator Achee and anyone else, Senator Bishop, who dared to raise a question. Senator Lewis has done extremely well with that question. Every single thing he said without exception was wrong. 
Senator Lewis demonstrated a fairly profound degree of ignorance on that question last week, but he has just exceeded himself, if that is possible. Again, I have already stated in question time this week for Senator O'Chee's benefit, and it was lost on him because he is obviously not interested in the truth on this issue. Again, I am afraid that the substance of Senator Lewis's question is completely wrong. Again, in answer to that silly interjection from Senator Macdonald, again, for God's sake, if you just belt up, I will finish the bloody answer. It will take a lot less time without stupid interjection. To Senator O'Chee, calm down, chicken little. To Senator Chee again, Senator O'Chee has told an absolute whopper. And finally, on the business of personal attacks, Senator Lewis asked him on the 2nd of April, Mr. President, I ask the minister if he will tender his resignation when the things that I have asked him about are proved to be correct. Senator Collins, Senator Lewis, you are a mug. And then it goes on to say, that Senator Collins goes on to say, the rank hypocrisy of the opposition on this question, and it is pretty rank, would be demonstrated by a very simple proposition. So much for the personalities. Let's look at the way he had defended the Civil Aviation Authority. He said on another occasion, a lot of nonsense has been delivered in this debate about Thompson. Again, I want to get one thing absolutely clear. The officers of the CAA have been constantly vilified and defamed in print. I think it is outrageous that Mr Baldwin and Dr Edwards were named in a newspaper article the other day as having hijacked this matter and made decisions about it. They did nothing of the sort. Again, a number of claims have been made around, about irregularities, some of them quite extraordinary and defamatory, in aspects of the process followed by the CAA in relation to this project. There is no evidence to support any of those claims. And again, on behalf of the Australian taxpayers, I am pleased to say that in extracting the best value for money, it is a very sensible way to proceed. During this 18-week phase, the CAA will have the opportunity of extracting from the preferred tenderer the maximum benefit to Australian industry. But now we come to the piece de resistance, the final quote I want to make, which typifies Senator Collins' approach to the discharge of his duties as a Minister of the Crown. And it comes from an Estimates Committee hearing on the 30th of March, 31st of March, where a question from uh, a senator to the minister was, is the minister entitled to answer questions that he anticipates we will not ask, or is he here to answer the questions we ask? The response from Senator Collins was, I am here to do what I bloody well like, frankly. So much for the way Senator Collins discharged his duties as a minister. Most of the senators in this chamber, Mr Deputy President, would never use the intemperate language that Senator Collins used. But I defend his right to defend his position as a minister defending his department and the actions of his departmental officers. That is not the point at issue. Where Senator Collins failed was in the face of voluminous repeated and informed questioning as to what was going on in the process being conducted by the Civil Aviation Authority, he dismissed those questions in the way I have demonstrated with all those quotes from Hansard. And they are only a small sample of what's in Hansard. Senator Collins failed to demonstrate prudence and common sense in finding out as to whether there was any substance in the questions that were being asked. Now, in Senator Collins' defence, he makes two points, because we've heard him defend his actions on numerous occasions. The first is that he attacks me on the grounds that I had alleged corruption against officers of the department. And Senator Collins, I'll do. Order. I made an interjection that I regret, and I'm quite happy to withdraw that, that I asked you on one occasion whether, whether you— uh, Order. Order. I, the, the question was, I, the, the interjection I made, Senator Collins, about you is I said, what are you getting out of this? Because uh, it was after you demonstrated a particular point of irrelevance in your answering, and I apologise for that. Uh, it was an intemperate remark at the time. But I want to deal with your general allegation that I have alleged corruption against the officers. I have never alleged that at any time. 
And I will read the only time I've referred to corruption in this Senate, either inside or outside. outside. And on the 5th of May in the Senate, I said, I've taken an interest in many tenders since I've been in this place. And I've never seen a selection process conducted like this one. I say to my colleagues that I do not like what I see. I do not see why the Parliament and the people of Australia should tolerate such a process for one moment. On many occasions, I have been aware that there are disappointments at the outcome of tenders. On occasions, I have raised my concerns about the outcome of the selection process, but I have never before heard any criticism of the integrity of a selection process that the Commonwealth entered into, let alone any allegations of corruption. And these are the relevant words. I am now hearing allegations of corruption throughout the aviation industry and in the wider community as to the way this tender was handled. I do not know whether those allegations are true. I have an open mind on the issue, but it is intolerable that the parliament should find itself in the position when it is accountable at the end of the day for the funds involved. And it is perfectly true. There were many allegations out there in the general community about corruption, which led to my raising that as a concern. So Senator Collins' first defence is false. His second defence could be aptly titled the Bannon defence, that he didn't want to know what was going on in the department. He's made great play in this place that he will not interfere in a commercial decision made by any of his departments. And that is perfectly true. No minister should do that. But it is absolutely beside the point. What we're concerned about here, Mr Deputy President, is process how the department was coming to the decisions it came to, not the decision itself. And it's that point which seems to escape Senator Collins. He failed, and he failed dismally, to honour his obligations as a minister when he was told and told repeatedly that something was wrong with the process to investigate, to find out if there was any substance to those claims or allegations. That's his crime, and that's where he fails as a minister. Senator Collins, if we move back several hundred years and make a hypothetical case, and uh, if Senator Collins was of, no of noble birth and he was of an arms, uh, a midgerous family, that they had a coat of arms, the coat of arms of Senator Collins would have a dying, wounded water buffalo on it, because that's the way he approached his ministerial duties. He was unintelligent, he was uncaring, he was irresponsible. Any criticism was met by a bullying response without thinking as to whether or not there might have been substance to the question, whether or not it was in the public interest that those questions were asked. As a minister, as a member of the executive and therefore accountable and answerable to the parliament for the exercises, exercise of the great powers and privileges that he has as a minister of the crown, he has failed to exercise those powers responsibly. He has failed the test of accountability before this parliament. That is why the parliament moves to censure him today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Senator Collins. Mr President, over the years, censure motions have become such a degraded currency in parliament that they're worth nothing. I have to, uh, to confess that I've added to that uh, process myself. Not this one I don't take seriously, no, Senator. I've, uh, I was ten years in opposition, and I guess I moved more censure motions against uh, ministers in my five years as leader than I've had hot dinners. And this is a classic example, classic example, of the degradation of the value of a censure motion, which is probably why Senator McGibbon didn't have much heart in that previous address. But I welcome it being brought on, because it will give me the opportunity today to place a few facts on the record that perhaps should be placed on the record are not contained uh, anywhere within the McPhee report in terms of the involvement that I did have in the tender, and uh, will perhaps put into context some of these uh, statements made by Senator McGibbon. Now, can I just say uh, that Senator McGibbon said that, the, that when quoting me uh, that he was quoting from just a few examples. Well, that's certainly correct. And not only was he quoting from a few examples, but quoting many of them out of any context whatsoever. I mean, they weren't put into context at all. And I am, I have to say, pleased and appreciative, and I mean that sincerely, of Senator McGibbon's apology to me today 
uh, here in the parliament for, for his uh, accusation that I had in fact received corruptly uh, kickbacks from uh, Thompson uh, in respect of how this project was managed. Now I accept that, um, that apology in the, in the spirit in which it was given, and I'm appreciative for it today. But I'm glad he's made it, because whatever I have said about this uh, project in response to those comments made by Senator McGibbon has been delivered in the context of, oh, well, uh, I said some hard things. Well, the reason I said some hard things, and Parliament is not a sheltered workshop, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, is because some very hard things were being said, as Senator McGibbon has now indicated, on the other side. Not only, not only Mr uh, Deputy President, has, uh, has this uh, been laid bare by the McPhee report, but there's one huge hole in this censure motion. One huge hole in this censure motion. Mr McPhee was given the broadest terms of reference possible. Not only was he given the broadest terms of reference possible, but the minister made it clear in here and was commended by Mr McPhee in the report for doing so that if there was any restriction whatever on the investigations of Mr McPhee, the terms of reference would be further modified so that Mr McPhee could investigate anything he liked. And Mr McPhee, and it's stated in the report, was given access to all of the Hansard records of all of the committees and all of the proceedings here in Parliament. It was absolutely open to Mr McPhee, and in fact it would have been obligatory upon him in investigating this matter to have uh, mentioned my role in the uh, report should he thought it was necessary in terms of any dereliction of duty on my part, and certainly to have questioned me and spoken to me about the role that I played. It was totally open to him to do that, and Senator McGibbon knows it, and he chose not to, and rightly. Nowhere, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, does uh, that appear in the report, and until today I had not even met Mr McPhee. No censure of me here, no criticism of me here in the report, and rightly so. But I do want to place a few uh, facts on the record about my involvement. Now, we have set up these government business enterprises deliberately at arm's length from the government so that there will no be, be no political involvement in the letting of uh, substantial tenders, and you can criticise that process if you wish. You can attack that process if you wish, but you can't reasonably attack ministers for complying with their statutory obligations under those processes and not interfering in the tender process. Because the one thing I have got no doubt about at all, I'm in here this afternoon in this pathetic censure motion being censured because I didn't involve myself. Had I done so, had I directly interfered, I have no question whatever that I would be in here being censured now, as Senator Balkus was, for interfering in a tender. And it might like, uh, members might like to, senators might like to refresh their minds from the Hansard of the 13th of May 1991, when Senator Balkus was in here, Minister Balkus, being attacked by his shadow opposite, Senator Perra. I, and I quote from Senator Perra, I remind the minister that he improperly intervened in a tender. Now, what was this charge? And Senator Panitza, in fact, joined in and said uh, his actions have put the tendering system in jeopardy. What was Senator Balkus's action? Involving himself in a tender for the purpose of ensuring that an Australian company would have an opportunity of tendering. And for doing something as commendable as that, he was put on the coals in here by the same canting, hypocritical, mewling, puking opposition that are in here today taking me to task for in fact doing precisely the opposite. It is hypocrisy of the worst kind. Now, Mr Acting Deputy President, I will state now Mr. what Chairman. my involvement was and Mr. I will Acting reiterate what I told the Senator. Senator Calvert. I, I uh, take exception as being referred to collectively as mewling, puking opposition and I'd ask the Minister to withdraw. Well, I'm sorry. I did, I, uh, order, order. I'm sorry, Senator Calvert. I didn't hear. Would you repeat the assertion? Well, yes. Well, it's, it verges on, on disorderly, Senator Collins. Um, Mr. Acting Deputy President, I withdraw. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, let's let's have a look at my involvement in the process. I had one direct, one direct and aggressive involvement in this tender process, for which I not only do not apologise. But 
of which I advised the parliament properly that I was doing. I wonder if you could stop your non-stop interjection, Senator Macdonald. Mr Acting Dep Deputy President, that was to ensure that there was Australian involvement in this project. And that was one of the issues which led me, Mr Acting Deputy President, to, to begin the process of establishing what became the McPhee inquiry. I acted responsibly, Mr President, and that's where this censure motion falls absolutely to the ground, not just on the hypocrisy of uh, attacking me for involving myself, not involving myself in a tender when they were in here attacking Minister Balkus for doing exactly that, but what my involvement was. Well, I'll explain it to the Senate. I had a great concern that Australian industry got the maximum benefit out of this, and I explained it directly to the board in this way and to the Senate. I said that my primary concern was that the board got for the CAA and for Australia, and Senator McGibbon knows better than most people in this chamber how urgently it's needed, the best state-of-the-art air traffic control system that we could get on price, on budget and so on. Secondary to that, and not by a short margin, uh, not by a long margin, by a short margin, was that Australian industry should have the maximum involvement in that project. I formally addressed the board twice on that issue in very formal terms and told the board that whichever tenderer was successful, they had to be, so far as the government was concerned, mindful of the maximum involvement of Australian industry in that tender. Mr Acting Deputy President, Senator McGibbon may be interested in this, even if Senator Macdonald isn't, and I think he is. Now, I had to say that I said publicly, Senator Macdonald, I really do wish you would stop ceaselessly interjecting. It's very disorderly. Mr Acting Deputy President, I, Order, Order, Senator Macdonald, you're distracting the minister. And I, and I had to is... say, Mr Acting Deputy Sorry. President, I said this to the board, that I would have been delighted if IBM had won the contract on those grounds of Australian involvement. I wasn't suggesting for a minute that they should get it, but I would have been delighted as the minister if the board had taken that decision, because IBM employ 4,600 Australians. They've been established in this country for 60 years and they export hundreds of millions of dollars' worth already of product from this country. But I had no dispute, as the McPhee report had no dispute, with the technical evaluation process rejecting IBM, because IBM, as Senator McGibbon knows, operate on technology which is from the 60s and which is currently being phased out in the home of IBM in the United States. And it was on those grounds that IBM was taken out of the process, a matter that Mr McPhee found was perfectly appropriate and perfectly correct. But at the end of the process, we had two front runners. And Mr McPhee concludes again, and clearly these critics have not read the report, and certainly Senator O'Chee hasn't read it, and I'll get on to that in a minute, in terms of the outrageous press release he issued yesterday. There were Hughes and Thompson were the front runners. And Mr McPhee said that was also correct and proper. That's the correct decision that the board should have made. They were the front runners. And it is a fact that they were neck and neck. And an examination of the technical evaluation process shows that, because in every single criteria, on scores out of 100, they were literally points in front or behind on every one of those criteria. And it came down, as Senator McGibbon knows, to that very important issue, as it turned out to be in the minds of the board members, of the actual number of lines of computer code that were contained in the flight data processing components of the, uh, of the system itself. And that was an extremely important consideration in the minds of those members. But that's how close and how tight it was. Mr McPhee finds again correctly that both companies are companies that produce a high quality product which works well. And again, Mr Acting Deputy President, to put into context a lot of those uh, quotes from me, as well as making outrageous uh, accusations of corruption, which Mr McPhee has laid absolutely to rest in this report, outrageous statements were being made about the operation of Thompson Radar. And it would have been irresponsible of me, irresponsible as the Minister for Aviation, to have not strongly rebutted those claims, because Thompson Radar, as well as operating the air traffic control systems in 46 per cent of the world outside the United States, and in the whole of New Zealand, also operates air traffic control systems 
in Cairns, Coolangatta, Melbourne, Adelaide and Perth, where the people that fly into those ports also are interested in a bit of safe flying. And the non-stop and the, read the report that's contained in there, Senator, and the non-stop public statements of Senator O'Chee in particular about unsafe flying conditions at Cairns in particular, and predicting that aircraft were going to collide in the air over Cairns were outrageous and had to be strongly rebutted. And I'm pleased again to see that the McPhee report has absolutely and categorically laid those to rest. And I'll just refer to that particular section of, uh, of the McPhee report, uh, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, where he says this about uh, the constant accusations from Senator O'Chee that the Thompson system was unsafe. A very grave statement to make publicly. He says this. The controllers have many years' experience in procedural control. In the review's opinion, the political and media attention given to the difficulties at Cairns and Coolangatta exaggerated the seriousness of the problems being experienced. And it goes on to make a conclusion in, in uh, emphasised type. The review is satisfied that the software problems, although serious, did not create a threat to air safety. And he goes on in another section of the report to indicate that the Thompson systems in all of these places are operating satisfactorily. As I, having visited the towers, personally spoken not just to the controllers but the technicians, and personally viewed as a responsible minister, the problems in those places, after they were reported, were satisfied they were. Because I wasn't simply acting on the appalling statements of Senator O'Chee. I personally investigated the matter and was assured by the controllers on the site and the technicians that the radars were in fact operating as safely as Mr McPhee said they were. The person that should be censured in here censured, is Senator O'Chee. The outrageous public statement that he issued yeah, oh yeah, have a listen, Senator. Have a listen. This press statement was issued by Senator O'Chee yesterday in response to the McPhee report. And it says this unbelievably, and I quote from it. There have been so many doubts expressed about the Thompson radar system that the Australian travelling public can now have very little confidence left with the system. That is an outrageous statement of mistruth that could only have been made by someone who did not even have the decency to read the McPhee report and is now in here censuring me, allegedly, in terms of the findings of it. The McPhee report, of course, absolutely rebutted that. And Senator O'Chee might treat lightly, Mr. President, might treat lightly outrageous claims about unsafe air traffic control in Australia. But I can tell you this as the minister responsible. We have got an $8 billion a year tourist industry that hangs off the safe operations and the reputations of those airports. And it is irresponsible, incredibly irresponsible, for people in public life to make public statements, as Senator O'Chee did yesterday, alleging that the actual radar systems themselves, the Thompson systems, are inherently unsafe. Well, I've got to tell you, Mr President, if they are, 46 per cent of the world's air traffic control systems are equally unsafe. Mr. President, Mr Deputy President, I addressed the board, as I said, two occasions on the question of Australian involvement in the project. I scrupulously said to the board on both occasions and advised this parliament when I did it that I was not involving myself politically in the tender process, but the government did have a legitimate concern about maximising the value for Australia of these projects. I had numerous meetings with the chief executive and the chairman of the CIA on exactly the same matter. Mr Acting Deputy President, when the CIA shortlisted the tenderers to two, Hughes and Thompson, I was advised, I was advised that AWA, a major Australian company, was involved in both tenders, that is Hughes and Thompson. And I was told that, I imagine in good faith, but as I later found out, and I was angry to find out, inaccurately. So I was quite relaxed about that, quite relaxed. As I said, I would like to have seen IBM on the question of Australian involvement have got up, employing 4,600 Australians here and having been in this country for 60 years. I was satisfied they had been technically correctly ruled out. But I was also satisfied when I was told that if Hughes won, AWA won, and if Thompson won, AWA won. Mr. Acting Deputy President, Mr. Acting Deputy President, the problem was that that was not, in fact, strictly correct, as I later discovered. 
Now, to indicate the importance of this, aside from the FDP component of an air traffic control system, that is the flight data processing heart of the system on which these line codes became the determining factor, according to the report in the minds of half a dozen of the directors, and Dr Edwards gave wrongly weighted advice on that matter, the communication side of air traffic control is a major component of the system. And AWA are, the, are as good as anyone in the world at providing that communications equipment. And I was advised that AWA was an essential component of providing the communications equipment of both final bids, and I remain satisfied of that, until I discovered, to my anger, from AWA that that was not, in fact, strictly correct. Because the situation was that Hughes had entered into an agreement with AWA to provide the communications component of their bid. It was also an option with the Thompson bid. That is, AWA were also involved in the sense that they could have been used as an option for Thompson as well. But Thompson were also offering their own in-house communications equipment, which I had not originally been advised of. And they were offering it at the time I was involved in this at a cheaper price, a cheaper price than AWA could have provided it, because it was explained to me finally when I asked for an explanation that a premium would be charged by Thompson on using someone else's equipment. Now I was not very happy when I found that out, and I advised uh, the chief executive and the chairman of the board of the CAA that I was not happy. And I have no hesitation in making this public for the first time. I didn't tell Mr McPhee because Mr McPhee rightly considered, even though he had an absolute right to interview me, that it was not required because his report clearly lays the blame where it should be. But I asked the chief executive and the chairman to come and speak to me about that and, they, and, and Dr Edwards, and they in fact laid out what the situation was. And this was at the beginning, and I make this clear, of the detailed specification period. It's important to note that because What's been ignored in this debate so far is that no final decision had been taken by the board when this process was interrupted. Thompson had been declared as the preferred contractor, but there was still a detailed specification period to be gone through. And what I said to the chairman, and he accepted it, and to the chief executive, and to Dr Edwards was this. I said, I've got to tell you that I was under the impression, and I see where this misunderstanding has occurred, that AWA, this important Australian communications company, was an essential component of both final bids. I now discover that this is the situation. Is this correct? And I was told it was. And I said to them, well, look, I have to tell you this. If at the end of this specification period either Thompson or Hughes are chosen and both the flight data processing part of the, of the system and the communication system are both sourced from overseas, when I know that there are world-standard Australian companies capable of producing the communications equipment—and I, of course, was specifically referring to the Thompson bid—I said that the government will be extremely unhappy indeed about the result of that tender process. Now, I have no difficulty in placing that on the record because I said before unblushingly that my only direct political involvement in this process was in asserting the government's concern about maximising the job creation for Australians, the technical flow on returns for Australians, by involving Australian companies. I was then assured that my uh, very strong comments had been noted, and uh, they, uh, they then departed. I then, because of that concern—and Senator Schott alluded to this last night, and indeed even Senator Calvert did. In a, in a comment last night, which was correct, about my alleged preferences. And I have to say he's right. And I confirm that he's right, which just shows you uh, how much involvement I had. Because if I had any preference, it was for that tenderer, con knowing that both of them were neck and neck technically, that employed more Australians than the other. And I don't step back from that. I then, Mr. President, Mr. Deputy President, put in train the processes for establishing an independent inquiry that we're now debating here today, which I don't feature in a, in a critical sense. I called the two most senior officers of my department over, Mr Evans, the secretary, and the associate secretary, Mr Beale, and this was held over a period of some months, and it culminated in two meetings in May, in May, where we actually got down to the detailed discussion of how this inquiry would be set up, 
what classes of people would be involved in it. And I can remember, for example, a suggestion was made, oh, perhaps the Auditor General could do it. And I said, no, I think it should be conducted by an eminent lawyer, totally independent of the Commonwealth, totally independent of the CIA, no Commonwealth government involvement. And I was given detailed advice on the procedures involved. The facts are, Mr Deputy President, as I've just indicated, I acted scrupulously correctly. I responded certainly aggressively and robustly, but they were responses to ridiculous attacks on Australia's air traffic control system, stupid attacks on a company which has got a world-established record for providing safe air traffic control systems, which Mr McPhee, of course, has absolutely alluded to. Now, I know, Mr President, I know, Mr. President that Senator O'Chee is about to speak. And I would like to ask Senator O'Chee, seeing as it's coming up to Christmas, which is the heaviest user time of the year for our air traffic control systems, it's when most people fly in this country, how he can responsibly, on the basis of this report, make a public statement yesterday as a senator in this country alleging that the air traffic control systems at Cairns, Coolangatta, Melbourne, Adelaide and Perth are unsafe because they operate with Thompson radar systems, when I know, and Mr McPhee has stated categorically in this report, that nothing of the, of the sort is the truth. And as I said before, I, I deliberately exclude Senator McGibbon from this, because Senator McGibbon, as Mr McPhee says rightly, is a, uh, a, a, well, say an expert. He is certainly highly skilled in terms of his background. But I say, and I assert this now, that Senator O'Chee is the one that should be being censured in here, uh, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President. And I would like Senator O'Chee to do something for me now when he speaks. Find the section of the McPhee report which allows him to claim that the air traffic control systems in most of our major city centres are unsafe. Quote that from the McPhee report, and if he can't find it, I'd like him to publicly withdraw that allegation now so that people aren't frightened either here or overseas, of using our airports. Order. The question is, Senator O'Chee. Acting Deputy President, uh, the speech we've just heard is rather like watching the Goodyear blimp, because it really was full of hot air, totally full of hot air, but very, very thin on real facts. And I think it's about time that we got down to some real facts again. Senator McGibbon gave a very good exposition of the real facts. I intend to follow up on the real facts instead of the assertions that Senator Collins has made. Now, if you listen to this debate, Senator Collins would have you believe that he was the saviour of the Australian air traffic control system. He would have you believe that he was the one personally responsible for this inquiry. He would have you believe he was personally responsible for ensuring that we had the review, and he would have you believe that here he was, some sort of omniscient, omnipotent um, grandfather figure, hanging over the uh, place, uh, uh, ready to pounce on the slightest, the slightest uh, whiff of anything uh, that was wrong in the process. Of course, that is not borne out by the facts. And those of us in this chamber have a very good recollection of how Senator Collins dealt with the allegations that have been made about the process, about the operation of the systems, and ultimately about whether the result was fair and accurate. And Senator McGibbon has gone through some of the things today that Senator Collins said to honourable senators on this side of the chamber in estimates hearings when we tried to, to ask questions about this. For example, my colleague Senator Macdonald was told to shut up and stop making silly interjections. Other honourable senators were told they were stupid. He told the Estimates Committee that he was going to do as he bloody well liked. Language which is wholly unacceptable, but even worse because it evidences an attitude which showed a total and utter disregard for the concerns that were being raised, not just on this side of the chamber, but on the other side of the chamber as well. And I would say this to those who sit in judgment on this censure motion today. This censure motion is not about the CAA. It is not about Mr Baldwin and Edwards per se, although their background, their activities and their character are relevant factors. 
This censure motion is about how Minister Collins conducted himself both in and outside this chamber as the relevant minister who was responsible for this portfolio. And when a serious allegation about the operational standard of a radar system or about the tender processes or about the people who preside over those tender processes is raised, it is never, never appropriate for a minister of the Crown to abuse honourable senators and say they are stupid, to say they are ignorant, or to say to them, when they are endeavouring on behalf of the Australian public to raise very real concerns, that he will do as he bloody well likes. That is not acceptable. And that in itself ought to be the basis for a censure motion against Minister Collins. It ought to be the basis for a censure motion which can proceed on those facts alone. But this censure motion does not rely solely on that, and in fact, uh, Senator McGibbon has gone further, and I intend to go further now myself and show that what we had was a consistent pattern of incompetence or unwillingness on behalf of Senator Collins to listen to the facts, to treat them with open ears, and to realise for once in his life that those of us on this side are not necessarily people who are out to score a political point, but people with very real fears. Now, Senator Collins wishes to address comments that have been made about the radar systems in Cairns. Fine. I'm happy to do that. All senators on this side are happy to do it. While we're at it, we should address the radar system in Melbourne, because Senator Collins has referred to it. Now, while Senator Collins was talking, my friend and colleague on this side, Senator Calvert, who was on the Public Works Committee, told me about the very real concerns that air traffic controllers had expressed to the Public Works Committee about the operation of the radar systems in Melbourne. And lest anybody here believe the sort of stuff that we've heard from Senator Collins, it's not just a case of missing planes, but it's a, it's a problem, in fact, that we had for a long time incorrect slant ranges on the aircraft uh, on the screens, so they could be miles away from the proper position. And the air traffic controllers themselves said that the reason, the reason why they delayed aircraft into Melbourne for a very long period of time, why the, the separation range was increased from what it was originally intended to be, was because at the original separation range it would not have been proper to operate the air traffic control system as the primary means of separating aircraft in that airspace. They had to change the specifications. And only after changing the specifications were the air traffic controllers, the people who at the end of the day wear the flak if something goes wrong. Only then, only after changing the, the parameters, were they happy to continue using it and only because they didn't have an alternative. And that, you see, is the true measure of the, of, the, uh, of the gravitas of this situation. It is really about a system which was not performing adequately. But it goes further than that because having established the system did not perform adequately, and everybody knows it didn't. Everybody knows it didn't. Air traffic controllers were coming to people on this side and to the other side of the chamber and saying, these are our fears and these are our concerns. Senator Kernow raised a matter about it, again, on information provided by air traffic controllers and by engineers. So having established that there was a problem, the next question is, what did the minister do about it? The minister would have us believe that he immediately moved to set up this review. Utter nonsense. The minister, in fact, spent week after week, month after month in this chamber, every time one of us on this side of the chamber got up and asked a question about it calling us uh, sleazy, calling us um, uh, disreputable, calling us uh, dishonest, calling us stupid or calling us silly. Yet at the end of the day, the comments that we made about how the process, the evaluation process was awry, were proved to be correct. And the real problem for Senator Collins is that Senator Collins, Senator Collins would have us believe that, uh, that his only involvement in this was in relation to the Australian content of the system. Well, that is not correct, because I intend to convict Senator Collins on his own words. 
These were his words in answer to a colleague of mine, Senator Macdonald, who asked a question about the process in estimates committees on the 31st of March this year. And Senator Collins said, and I quote, I described this as being rubbish, and it was, that this particular process that put the CAA in a weak position. In fact, it is as good a position for getting maximum benefit to the travelling public as I have seen. Now, the point, Senator Collins, is that in this report, which you, uh, in your usual fashion, assert that those of us on this side of the chamber have not read, in this report, Mr McPhee says that the process weakened the position of the CAA. So Senator Collins can't just say that he was solely concerned with the Australian content of it. Senator Collins had obviously made inquiries, or I would hope he had made inquiries, about the process for him to make that sort of comment. Either he made inquiries and was totally duped as a minister, for which he must wear the responsibility, or he made, in, he made assertions in the estimates committee. He made assertions in the estimates committee that would lead one to believe he had made inquiries, when in fact none had been made at all. And that is the way Senator Collins has always operated his portfolio responsibilities. Operations of portfolio responsibilities on the basis of assertion, and not on the basis of fact. And then, of course, uh, Senator Collins would have us believe that when he started to set up the independent process of review, he insisted that there be absolutely no government contact at all. And yet we find, of course, that the first person proposed by Senator Cook, who, if we believe Senator Collins picked up the bundle, the first person proposed was Mr Pat Brazzle former secretary of the Attorney General's Department. But this was after Senator Collins ceased to have ministerial responsibility for this, after Senator Collins ceased to have ministerial responsibility for this. So he can't say that the proposal was put up and then he vetoed it, because he was no longer Minister for Shipping and Aviation Support at that point in time. Yes. So that is why Senator Collins is again convicted on his own words. But finally, I think we should go to the people that Senator Collins was so busily defending in this chamber and the people Senator Collins was so busily defending in the Estimates Committee. One Mr Frank Baldwin, one Dr Rob Edwards. Because Senator Collins knows, and it was pointed out to him, not only by honourable senators on this side of the chamber, but he also knows, because it was pointed out to him by civil air, that these gentlemen were the subject of a parliamentary committee of inquiry in New Zealand into exactly the same sorts of matters that were raised here. And one thing and one thing alone should be sufficient to show that there was no proper exercise of ministerial responsibility. And that is that Dr Rob Edwards appeared at the first hearing day of that inquiry in New Zealand whilst he was still an employee of Airways Corporation. And it was only after the first hearing day, and only after it was patently obvious from a public inquiry there are questions over Dr Edwards' uh, ability to perform his task or his uh, adequacy for the job, it was only after that that Dr Edwards resigned and in fact took up a place with CAA. And if this minister had been doing his job, it would be totally and utterly unsatisfactory for this minister to allow the CAA to appoint as head of its projects division a man who was under inquiry for his management of projects in New Zealand. Whether that inquiry, whether that inquiry was to vindicate him or otherwise, it would be wholly unacceptable for this minister to allow that to go on. Now, Senator Collins has just interjected it was a board appointment. Yet Senator Collins has also indicated in this chamber that he, is, uh, he has had no qualms about demonstrating to the board, in quote his words, in a robust fashion, end of quote, his views, to, to shove his views down their throat. So why didn't he shove his, his
his views down their throat on this matter? Was it because he was ignorant or was it because he couldn't care less? Those of us on this side do care about the operation of the Civil Aviation Authority, and we do care about the people who are appointed by the Civil Aviation Authority to oversee the most important contract that the Civil Aviation Authority was to sign. Not my words, but the words of Mr McPhee. And that is why we get to the situation where, uh, where Senator Collins, for manifest reasons, has been, has been convicted on his own words and on his own failure to perform his task properly. That is why Senator Collins has been brought in here today, not out of a sense of, of political, uh, political expediency, not out of a sense of, 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 of knife-twisting or anything of the contrary, because those of us on this side of the chamber staunchly refused to make this a political debate when we were seeking to have an inquiry. That is why those of us on this side of the chamber could have, for example, tabled enormous amounts of well, Senator Collins, you know, you're a man who, who, who's known to keep uh, a special regard for the truth. You save it for special occasions. Perhaps it might be better, though, if you stopped your interjections and kept them for a special occasion, a special occasion when you're right. Now, what we have here with, with uh, this matter is a whole situation where the, uh, the, uh, the responsibility for this contract went awry from sometime around about December or maybe earlier. And it was months and months and months, six months in fact, that Senator Collins had responsibility for it when he did nothing about setting up an inquiry. It was six hours when Senator Cook had responsibility for this portfolio in which he did set up the inquiry. And that, that you see, is the true measure of Senator Collins' culpability. Six hours it took Senator Cook to realise there was something wrong. Six months it took Senator Collins, and still there was no inquiry. Six hours versus six months. And that in itself is evidence that Senator Collins should be censured. And finally, I'd like to say something else. Senator Collins continues in this chamber to slur members of this side of the chamber. We do not find that acceptable. We do not find Senator Collins' attitude to this matter to be at all acceptable. And we do not find on this side of the chamber Senator Collins to be fit to hold a ministerial office, and that is why this censure motion has been moved. Senator Collins wants to, wants to, wants to go on the attack, wants to badmouth members of this side of the, of, the, of the parliament, but that will not do. What Senator Collins has failed to do today is to defend himself. What Senator Collins has failed to do is to defend his lack of action. And what Senator Collins has failed to do is to defend his lack of integrity when it's come to these issues because of the way in which he has misled this Senate. That is why this motion should be supported. That is why Senator Collins should be censured. And that is why he is no longer fit to be a minister in this or any other government. Order. Senator. Senator. Order. I have no knowledge of any agreement. I, 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 in, I intend to speak for two minutes. Uh, Senator MacDonald. I, I understand the next speaker, Senator Bell, is not uh, quite ready, uh, uh, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President. Senator Bourne is not quite ready then. Uh, thank you, Minister. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, just for a couple of minutes, I, I just want to bring the Senate back to the terms of the uh, censure motion. Uh, uh, which is that the uh, Senate censure the minister for his persistent failure to immediately investigate the, invest uh, the allegations of irregularities. Mr Acting Deputy President, as my colleagues uh, Senator McGibbon and Senator O'Chee have very clearly and succinctly pointed out, uh, over a long period of time they, Senator Archer, Senator Calvert, the Public Works Committee, everyone else told Senator Collins about this. They told him he should look at it a bit closer. They told him something uh, was wrong, and he continued to ignore it. All he did, all he did, was abuse those that were suggesting he should look at it. All he did was tell us to shut up, uh, tell us to be quiet, tell us that he'd do what he bloody well liked, and uh, took absolutely no notice when we were trying to tell him what it was all about. 
We were trying to say to him he should look at Mr Baldwin's administration of uh, the uh, department, that he should be a bit careful about what was happening. And this is what so Senator Collins said in response to that. Mr Baldwin is a very professional administrator. He is a very good one. Now, I don't think Mr McPhee agrees with that. People on this side were trying to say to uh, uh, Senator Collins, look at it, have a look at it, see, see that there's not something going wrong. Senator Cook was able to take up the uh, challenge. Within a few short hours, Senator Cook was able to uh, attend to it. Senator Collins, for many, many months, was told about this, but refused to do anything about it, refused to do anything except uh, uh, protect and, and promote and praise uh, the people uh, that have now been uh, uh, reported on in this particular uh, motion. I, and, and abuse, uh, as Senator O'Chee says, and abuse um, uh, those of us um, on this side. Now, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, I think the case has been very well made out. Uh, in my speech yesterday, uh, I raised a lot of issues, which I won't repeat again today. I did then call upon Senator Collins to do the right thing and resign. If he doesn't, uh, Mr Keating, if he had any courage at all or any uh, concern about the, uh, the way uh, Parliament operates, should sack him and uh, so benefit the whole of Australia. But I urge uh, the Senate. Uh, right. You right? But I, I urge uh, the Senate to support the motion. Senator Kerno. Oh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. The Democrats think that the question is whether the minister persistently failed to investigate allegations of irregularities and whether we can prove that that really was an inordinate delay anyway. And as far as we can see, the timeline is this, that in mid-March the tender was determined by early April when Public Works Committee started the inquiry into the building's works involved in TATS. Obvious problems were surfing, surfacing in relation to the tender process. In early May, Senator Collins began discussions with his department about setting up an inquiry. On the 27th of May, Senator Cook took over the portfolio. On the 3rd of June, the Public Works Committee tabled its report and recommended an inquiry be held into the awarding of the contract to Thompson. And on the 11th of July, the inquiry started. So we have a period, technically, of about six weeks between the determination of the tender and Senator Collins's first discussions with officers of his department about setting up an inquiry. Three weeks later, yes, three weeks later, 31st of March to May, is that inordinate? Senate, three weeks later, Senator Cook was the minister responsible. Now, one week after that, the Public Works Committee recommended an inquiry. Five weeks later, Mr McPhee had been appointed and the inquiry had started. So, I mean, yet you have to judge. There are a lot of questions. There are a lot of questions, but are they about Senator Collins or are they, or are they about the bigger question of the role of GBEs, the concept of arm's length? Well, I think they could well be. And are there questions about the actions of Mr Baldwin and Dr Edwards, for example? Now, let me put on the record that the Democrats believe that there is a strong case that the two executives most responsible for this debacle, Mr Baldwin and Dr Edwards, should be dismissed immediately. We think it's inconceivable that Hughes could have any confidence in the rerun tender process if those two officials are reinstated. There is also sufficient evidence to warrant a review of the appointment of the chairman and the deputy chairman, Mr Ted Butcher and Mr Henry Bosch. They oversaw, in our view, a clearly flawed process and appeared to us not to properly and independently question the judgment and action of the two senior executives in question, Mr Baldwin and Dr Edwards. Mr Butcher is, after all, the chairman of the National Rail Corporation as well as the Civil Aviation Authority, and he surely must take responsibility for the haphazard and hasty sequence of events leading to the decision to favour Thompson over Hughes, and his position in the NRC, in the National Rail Corporation, is critical to the national interest, and reassurance as to his judgment and his determination to act is needed. Now, I, in response to one of Senator Macdonald's interjection, I said, really, what's happened here raises the big question of the role of GBEs, the way in which this government 
with the support of the opposition who said, yes, 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 corporatise, you must corporatise, not as good as privatising, but it's, but it's a good first step along the road. So it raises the question of the role of GBEs, their relationship with government, the notion of what arm's length really should mean in relation to GBEs. Now, Mr McPhee said, as I understand it, that he felt that the chief executive and the board either did not know or did not properly understand the Civil Aviation Act, uh, which established the CAA, in that it seemed to him that they interpreted the interpreted that act to mean that the sole purpose of the CAA was to operate on a commercial basis. And again, uh, I think the assumption is that um, the relationship between government and GBE, in this case the C Civil Aviation Authority, was akin to one between a board and shareholders. But the Democrats would argue strongly that because the government has ownership there is a more direct sense of, of control and responsibility that is required. And although the government does have many government business enterprises under its authority, we think that it's the old line, horses for courses, that there are some which quite obviously it may wish to say have a primary uh, objective of operating commercially, but there are quite clearly others where the prime consideration is the purpose of delivering public good. And if I can read from Mr McPhee's report, chapter two, the board of, this is page 11, quite clearly specifies the board of the CAA has the purposes, A, to decide the objectives, strategies and policies to be followed by the authority, and B, to ensure that the authority performs its functions in a proper, efficient and economical manner. Now, this does not mean that its sole objective is to operate on a commercial basis. Also, Mr McPhee suggested that there were other considerations that governments ought to have in mind. And on page 13, he, he lists an indicative and far from exhaustive list of the possible objectives of the government to be met by the CAA beyond the efficient production of the specified products of the CAA. And he talks in, in the first instance about the provision of safety in relation to civil aviation. He talks about artificial deterrence to demand for or supply of civil aviation. Now, the first one is quite clearly a public good. The second one he describes as reducing the incidence and therefore the cost of externalities. He talks about assistance to Australian industry to meet the wider policy objectives of producing a portfolio of goods and services. So I think I remember when we debated this a couple of years ago, and we talked about what a wonderful delivery of services we were going to get from this corporatised CAA. I think we should look again. We should say it has failed to, to deliver. In one, in one sense, we have a GBE which clearly seems to be ignoring its uh, purpose and its major considerations beyond commercial. We need, the government needs to take a good, long and hard look at the way the CAA board is interpreting the act which establishes it. And the whole point of the comments that I have made uh, lead me to ask again, what is the point of having corporatisation? What is the point if we're just going to have a board at arm's length making these sorts of decisions, costing this amount of money for a review and a government standing back? I hope this will cause the government to look more closely at its relationship not just with this government business enter enterprise, but with all its government business enterprises. Order, Senator Cook. Uh, President, uh, I rise to ask the opposition to reconsider this motion and preferably withdraw it, and if, if not, uh, for the Senate to defeat it. Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President, it's uh, somewhat invidious of me, for me, as the responsible minister, to be put in a position of having to speak on the independent review of the CAA so soon after the report has uh, been tabled.
because some matters that arise from the report are in action and in hand now, and I think it is in the public interest and the interest of the parliament that uh, those actions be carried through and dealt with fully and properly and, uh, and uh, attended to uh, in a way in which they can be without the issues uh, being taken at a political level in a way that may well distort the outcomes. The, uh, the McPhee report is an important report, of that there is no doubt. And as I say, the dealing of the effects with, uh, of that report have, has some time to run and is not yet complete. One of the uh, key issues, until the uh, report has been properly dealt with and completed, is the morale and integrity of the CAA and its ability to oversee air safety and regulation in Australia. And uh, quite clearly, when a report of this character is, is, is tabled, it must have a damaging impact on morale. I think we ought not add to that uh, unnecessarily. The other reason why I rise, however, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, is I don't want to see an injustice done. And if this uh, motion were carried, I think an injustice would be done to my colleague, uh, Senator Collins. There uh, uh, are three, four points that I would wish to make, and I'll make them hopefully succinctly and briefly and then resume my seat. Four points that I think put beyond question that this motion should not succeed if it is not withdrawn. The first is the, if you like, the logistical possibilities of uh, the practical life of government. That is the timeline between the critical decisions. Uh, the Democrats have just uh, put down what, what appears to me to be about the right timetable. And uh, I think from that timetable it can be seen that uh, government moved with haste and propriety moved with haste and propriety uh, and dealt with this uh, promptly. The second point I make is the charter given to the independent inquirer, Mr McPhee. He had, uh, to put it in the colloquial, an open slather. And uh, he was properly uh, able to report on any matter that engaged his attention about this issue. And he did so. And uh, he was invited to report the brutal truth of the circumstances as he found them. He entered no finding against uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Senator Collins, uh, nor did he enter a finding against uh, the board, but he did enter a finding against the officers of the, of the uh, authority. And uh, I think that has got to be respected, because if uh, Mr McPhee believed there was some improper conduct by the minister, his charter was that he would report that. And I think uh, it is uh, true that Mr McPhee, and certainly it's one of the reasons why uh, I thought he was an appropriate choice for the inquiry, that Mr McPhee is widely regarded as an, as an iconoclastic individual, able to withstand criticism if he makes unpopular decisions. And if his decision and finding in this case were unpopular with us, I don't think that would deter, as a government, I don't think that would deter him from making them. And uh, the fact that he didn't, uh, and he has that reputation, I think has got to be respected. Third point is one that I've just alluded to, the chain of responsibility. This comes uh, in for some discussion in the report. The chain of the responsibility is from the authority to the board to the minister. The board is responsible on behalf of the authority to the minister. The proper connection is the chairman of the board to the minister. The debate in the report is about other lines of authority to the parliament and I think that they are quite properly drawn observations in the report. Uh, however, um, I, I think to, uh, to admonish the minister for the conduct of the officers ignores the chain of command, and that is not appropriate in logic or in fact in these circumstances. The fourth point that I make uh, is that uh, neither I nor Senator Collins had very much warning that uh, our portfolio arrangements would be changed. And uh, I certainly didn't, and I'm pretty sure no, nor did Senator Collins. This Senate, above all chambers in Australia, is probably very familiar with the, with the uh, cause and effect of the circumstances, the resignation of the then Minister, Senator Richardson. Uh, and as someone who has been, uh, according to the pecking order, so-called promoted from one portfolio to another, you always leave a portfolio to take your newer and higher responsibilities with some element of regret. You have regret because 
any minister worth their salt on whatever, whatever side of the House commits themselves to a program of involvement with their portfolio, and if that, that uh, tenure is truncated unexpectedly, you have got projects running that you want to complete that are important in your view and that you invested effort and time into that you can't complete and you are called to, uh, to other duties. Someone comes in and then completes them for you and uh, in some cases they get criticised for doing what you would have done and where the blame in other cases they get the praise for doing what, they would have, what you would have done and take the credit. Uh, I have to say, Madam Acting Deputy President, that uh, I am absolutely certain in my mind that uh, uh, had there not been a change in portfolio responsibility from Senator Collins to me, there would have been, uh, in any case, under Senator Collins's uh, stewardship, an independent inquiry uh, of the sort that we've now got. I should also say that uh, uh, not only am I confident about that, but uh, when the uh, baton changed from Senator Collins to me, when the baton changed from Senator Collins to me, as a new uh, Tyro minister, it was incumbent on me, as I saw it, to consult deeply with Senator Collins about some of these uh, transitional managerial issues. And uh, I did on the subject of the inquiry, on the subject of the appointment of the inquirer, on the subject of the terms of reference to the inquiry, and on the subject of uh, the, uh, the licence the inquirer would have, and on the issue, which was a critical one at the time, as to whether the uh, uh, process of uh, of the, uh, of the um, um, Thompson uh, bid should be discontinued while the inquiry was being conducted or not. And uh, uh, while, of course, ministers take responsibility for their own decisions, uh, I leant heavily on the crutch of Senator Collins' advice and counsel in those matters. So I uh, regard the transition in the portfolio responsibility from him to me as being as seamless. Uh, and without, without a, uh, a, uh, a dislocative break between portfolio responsibilities as any government would want it to be when their, when their ministerial responsibilities are changed. For those four reasons, I uh, ask that the opposition consider the withdrawal of this motion. If they don't, I ask the Senate to defeat it. Uh, Senator McGibbon. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Chairman. In closing the debate, uh, I'll deal with the speakers in the inverse order in which they spoke. And, uh, it's not possible, Senator uh, Cook, for the Senate to accept your plea uh, to withdraw this motion. The debate has clearly demonstrated that beyond any shadow of doubt, let alone reasonable doubt, Senator Collins is guilty of the charge. He failed to responsibly discharge the duties vested in him. I listened with great uh, interest to what uh, Senator uh, Cook had to say, but like so many other speakers in this uh, debate, he failed to deal with the issue before the chair, which is not a debate about how the department operates or the authority operates or anything like that. The debate is about what Senator Collins did or did not do as a matter of fact. I agree very much with Senator Cook's plea that the morale of the department should not be damaged. But as someone who knows the department intimately and has for 20 or 30 years, I can tell you that the morale is very, very da badly damaged at the present time. And uh, while any change in the morale is to be deplored, it is a matter of degree, of slight degree, that uh, the morale is worse today than it was yesterday. I'd like to thank the Democrats for a nice, sensitive support for the government once more. It must be about 40 years since someone tried to teach me in any Latin. But uh, I still remember that slogan that used to be on those great uh, buildings that the AMP invested their funds in in all the country towns, with a statue on the top and a slogan underneath, Amicus Curtis in Re in Curta, which to my uh, distant uh, Latin thinking means a certain friend in uncertain times. And uh, politics is a matter of shifting loyalties, but. Uh, at least the Labor Party have the great luxury that I don't think any other party has enjoyed in politics in the Australian Parliament of knowing that it doesn't matter how black the night, the Democrats are there plodding along loyally, uncritically, giving them unfailing support. It's funny, it's funny you never it's, say uh, that when they support you. It just you, keeps sir. on and on. <laughs> now, I would like to. You I don't, never say that when they support you. I don't you. wish. <laughs> I, uh, 
I, I don't wish. I don't wish to dignify this light and lightweight right contribution of the Democrats with respectability by dissecting it in detail. But great play was made by uh, the Speaker for the Democrats, Senator Kernow, about the fact that the government somehow, because it reacted in oh, something like uh, five or six months, had acted with great expedition. Oh, six weeks. Well, <laughs> that makes your case even worse, Senator Kernow, because I just happen to have reasonably good briefs with me when I move on something, and all these pages deal with the chronology of the TATS contract. And I find that the leading question in relation to me was asked on the 10th of September, oh, sure. 1991. <laughs> Now I realise well, from your sacked, prognostications the first on the uh, oh, what, what uh, economic scene, Senator Kernow, that you don't share the great oh, distinction in mathematics, in mathematics that uh, a lot of us in this chamber have. Oh, but sorry, I would I think it's rather appalling to genius? claim Order. that the 10th of September was only 1991, was only six weeks before the inquiry was initiated. And for the rest of the time of the Democrats, we had this discourse about GDBs and other irrelevances. The point at issue is that Senator Collins, in his own speech, in his own defence, failed to establish that he had effectively coped with the abundant evidence that was, taught, that was given we'll divide, won't we? that things were wrong, seriously wrong, in the authority. He talked about the instructions he gave to the board on numerous occasions. To the greatest of respect, utterly irrelevant, nothing to do with the motion. He talked about the business of direct interference, of how he wouldn't dare to interfere in a commercial outcome. Again, nothing to do with the motion before the chair. Senator Collins never had the courage to take the charge on and defend himself against it. And the charge is that when he was faced with overwhelming evidence that the process by which the outcome of a major commercial contract was being grossly uh, distorted and being conducted in an improper and incompetent way, he did nothing about it. And the facts speak for themselves. The chronology of the events speak for himself. The moment Senator Cook came in, literally or uh, metaphorically, uh, we had an inquiry. Senator Collins did nothing. And I would quote from chapter 11 of the uh, McPhee report, because in one sentence on page 88 of the report it says, under no test of fair play or professional competence could the methods of inquiry or the quality of the conclusions, they're talking here about the TATS contract during the post-December 1991 phrase be regarded as being adequate. That sums it up. That was the point that members on both sides of the parliament were making. The process was flawed and fatally flawed. That was found to be a matter of fact by the inquiry. That is what we're saying today. What we're saying is Senator Collins failed to listen to the critics of the program and intercept it, take the appropriate action at a time when a great deal of trauma, hurt and expense for the Australian public would have been saved. That is why he is negligent in the discharge of his duties. That is why we unhesitatingly find him today guilty of not discharging the responsibilities that have vested him in him as a minister. I therefore move the motion. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. no. I think the noes have it. Division required? Division. Ring the bell.
little bit mm. more on. Yeah, but what is it? What is it? Not well, theoretically, you can do it within eight hours. Another no, second. Yeah. As well as you could do it within eight hours, oh. but mm. we'd probably operate on 14 days for full day. Yeah, I don't But that's what it's. But that is that what it's going to be? No, mm. Is that what you? We haven't determined a readiness for the second device on the, no. for the period of time that'll be up. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what I was wondering, what do we want to be the normal readiness of, you, the, you, of, the, of the of the second? Of the second. Oh. Lock the doors. Order. The question is that the uh, censure motion moved by Senator McGibbon be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Brownhill teller for the ayes and Senator Jones teller for the noes.
Order. Result of the division there being 31 ayes and 37 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. Would all senators please resume their seats? Order. Would honourable senators, honourable senators please resume their seats or leave the chamber? Those honourable senators standing, take a seat or leave the chamber. I might uh, call Senator Bishop for a moment. Sen Senator Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Mr. Deputy President, I seek leave to present three positions which are not in conformity with the standing orders as the petitions pardon me, take that out, which are not in conformity <clears throat> with the standing orders as they are not in the correct form. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. I present to the Senate three petitions, similar in wording, from 240, 888, and 5,470 petitioners, respectively, requesting that the Senate ensure that the Australian national flag is not changed or replaced without first being voted upon and approved by the people of Australia in a national, referend national referendum. I move that the petitions be received. The question is that the petitions be received. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Short. Mr. Deputy President, uh, I wanted to, do, wanted to do this after question time, but I seek your uh, guidance as to whether I can do it now. And that is uh, that, in accordance with the resolution of the Senate of the 28th of September 1988 relating to unanswered questions on notice. Uh, I ask, uh, wish to ask uh, Senator Collins for an explanation as to why my question on notice number 2170, which has been on the notice paper since the 20th of August, that is for four months, uh, uh, has not uh, been answered. Uh, in doing so, I, I point out that this is my second such request, the first being on the 4th of November 1992. I also point out that the unanswered question was one asked of all departments, and uh, given that DASIT is uh, now the only department not to have responded. I do wish to uh, just place on the record my uh, concern and disappointment and criticism, I guess, of the, uh, the minister that this matter has been allowed to uh, remain outstanding for so long. I did give Senator Collins notice uh, earlier uh, about this matter. Um, uh, if I may uh, uh, respond uh, on that, Mr. Yeah, I, could, yeah. could I have the standing order? Uh, Sen Senator, I, I'm, I'm just, um, I, I just want to check whether we we can do it here. I, I think that uh, this is probably not the time, but I'd just like to check. I'd just, uh, if I may, indicate to uh, Senator Short, I'll pass that on to Senator Collins. I assure you uh, his absence from the chamber is not a discourtesy. As you know, he's been involved in the censure motion and the concurrent cabinet meeting, an item which uh, is a major consideration for him. And he sort of, as I understand, if that meeting's on, he's rushed off there, and that's why he hasn't been able to be present. It's at the conclusion of question time, so you would need leave. Could I retrospectively have yes, leave? Yes. Thank you. Leave is granted. You've said virtually what you want to say, have you? 
Yes, I have nothing more to add. Thanks, Mr. Deputy. Senator Mr. Deputy President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to Australia's participation in the United Nations peacekeeping operation in Somalia. Oh, is leave, leave is granted. Senator Ray. Mr. Deputy President, I move that the Senate a expresses its profound sympathy on behalf of all Australians for the suffering being endured by the people of Somalia as a result of famine, clan warfare and banditry. B commends the efforts being made by those organisations and individuals who are working to relieve that suffering. C affirms Australia's support for the efforts of the United Nations Secretary General, his special representatives and others to promote a political settlement in Somalia and to facilitate the distribution of relief assistance. D endorses the aims of Operation Restore Hope as set out in the United Nations Security Resolution 794 to provide a secure environment for the distribution of humanitarian relief. E expresses its support for the Australian contribution to Operation Restore Hope and for Australia's continued participation in the United Nations peacekeeping operation, UNISOM, and F expresses its full confidence in and support for the men and women of the Australian Defence Force who are being deployed to Somalia and looks forward to their safe return. Mr Deputy President, the uh, situation in uh, Somalia... Uh, uh, before I call the, the Minister, I understand that informal arrangements have been made to limit the time in, for the debate and that the speaking times during the debate will be as follows. The Minister, 10 minutes. The Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, 10 minutes. The Democrat spokesperson, 10 minutes. And other senators wishing to speak, 5 minutes. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clock, uh, clerks to set the clock accordingly. Minister. <coughs> Mr Deputy President, the situation in Somalia is an international tragedy. Devastating famine, factional conflict and gang warfare have already taken the lives of an estimated 250,000 Somalis, and two million more are assessed as a, at immediate risk of starvation. Despite the chaos and lawlessness, Australian and other international non-governmental organisations have displayed remarkable courage and dedication to get food and medicine to the starving. As the Prime Minister said, the Australian community has been rightly proud of the efforts of these groups. The Australian community has also demonstrated extraordinary compassion and generosity in responding to the human tragedy of Somalia. Public appeals in Australia have now raised over $11 million for Somalia, and government has contributed direct humanitarian assistance to Somalia of some $8.5 million so far this calendar year. And last weekend, the Australian people donated more than $600,000 to appeals for Somalia and other drought and famine-stricken countries in Africa. The United Nations Security Council, in Resolution 751, established a peacekeeping operation, UNISOM, in April of this year in order to facilitate humanitarian relief to Somalia. UNISOM, however, has, provide, has proved unable to create the necessary peaceful environment to meet its prime objective of allowing for the provision of urgent humanitarian assistance. The offer by President Bush to provide substantial US troops to a new international coalition to enforce peace in Somalia was therefore welcomed by the international community. It offered the opportunity to break the impasse that had developed. Food donated by the international community was being plundered by armed gangs or had to remain in warehouses because safe passage could not be guaranteed. On the 3rd of December, the UN Security Council unanimously adopted Resolution 794, which called for the establishment, as soon as possible, of a secure environment for humanitarian relief in Somalia. As the Secretary-General of the United Nations, Boutros Ghali, said in a message to the people of Somalia, he said, the United Nations is taking action in Somalia in the cause of security, humanitarian relief and political reconciliation. The United Nations intends to restore the hope of the Somali people. The resolution invited member states to contribute to the multinational force. In response to that resolution and at the invitation of the United States, 
the government decided to contribute an infantry battalion group to the US-led International Coalition Enforcement Operation. Australia will join at least 20 other nations in the International Coalition. The Australian Battalion Group is based on the 1st Battalion, the Royal Australian Regiment from Townsville. It is part of the ADF's Operational Deployment Force. The group will consist of 900 personnel and will include four rifle companies, a reduced squadron of 30 armoured personnel carriers and logistic and engineer support elements. The Australian contingent will be commanded by Colonel Bill Mallor. The battalion group is the minimum sized unit that can be fully support and protect itself and can readily integrate with the coalition forces. Possible tasks for the battalion group could include the security of major airfields, seaports, key installations and food distribution points, and oversighting relief operations. The government has de decided that the battalion group will be provided from s for 17 weeks. This timing has been made clear to our partners in the operation who have welcomed our offer. The estimated additional cost for the 17-week deployment is $19.557 million. The coalition force will be United States-led, with the operational control of Australian forces delegated to the combined task force commander, but will remain under national command. These command and control arrangements are consistent with the comb past combined operations, including the Gulf War. Rules of engagement are being developed in close consultation with the, uh, with the coalition and will be approved by the government. Members of the Australian contingent will have the right to protect themselves if threatened at all times. They will be armed with their normal complement of infantry small arms and weapons, but I have to say this operation will entail risks. As I informed the Senate on the 15th of November, a careful assessment of the security situation has been undertaken by the intelligence agencies and considered by government. If the coalition does not involve itself in disarming the Somali factions, the threat assessment for our troops will be medium to high. If, however, the task involves disarming the factions, the risk would be high to very high. No final decision has been taken by the UN on disarming Somalis. However, as I told the Senate, if the follow-on UNISOM operation is to be made successful, some attempt must be made disarm, to disarm the bands. Security Resolution 794 authorises all necessary means to establish, as soon as possible, a secure environment for humanitarian relief operations in Somalia. The main body of Australian troops will arrive in Somalia by mid-January 1993. A small reconnaissance party will leave for Somalia in the next few days, with an advance party de departing in early January. Equipment and vehicles for the contingent will be transported by HMAS Jarvis Bay and HMAS Tobruk to arrive at approximately the same time as the main body of the troops. As I said, the highest priority for the coalition is to allow food and relief to be brought to the starving Somalis. The coalition's other major task will be to create an environment in which the UN peacekeeping operation, UNISOM, can take over and operate in a more secure and stable environment. Australia will continue to, to participate in the UNISON operation and will expand the size of the movement control unit, which we have already committed, from 30 to 45 personnel. Our contribution to Operation Restore Hope will be the largest commitment of Australian ground forces overseas in the last 20 years. It increases sharply our total contribution to UN-mandated peacekeeping and other operations around the world. These contributions are a clear demonstration of Australia's support in ensuring that the United Nations is able to respond effectively to major humanitarian and security challenges. I'm sure all senators will join with me in expressing their support for and confidence in those men and women who are going to be deployed to Somalia. They carry with them the, proud, the very proud traditions of the Australian Defence Forces. Our thoughts are with them and their families as they prepare for this important task. We do look forward to welcoming them home at the conclusion of their deployment. Mr Deputy President, in the remaining time may I address some of the issues that have already been raised. In the other place, Mr Hewson did raise three issues. He asked whether the opposition, and I assume other parliamentarians, could be kept abreast of the threat assessment in this area, 
The answer to that is an unequivocal, unequivocal yes. Secondly, uh, the question of funding was raised and whether, in fact, there would be cuts in the defence budget to fund this. The additional $19.557 million is supplemented to the defence budget, so no other capability will indeed be reduced because of this commitment. Thirdly, I think Mr Hewson slightly misinterpreted the question of 17 weeks when he said 17 weeks from today. It will be 17 weeks from the date of, of deployment. I'm not saying Mr Hewson in any way deliberately misinterpreted this, but I thought I'd put the record straight. Finally, uh, Senator Powell was kind enough to uh, show me a copy of an amendment that she believed was necessary to this. I, uh, having had a negotiated motion that everyone agreed to, would not accept the amendment, but I have expressed in my speech the sentiments that would be reflected in that amendment. It's now our role as a partner in this particular thing to put our point of view, and if that point of view prevails, then we'll certainly be in that particular situation. If it doesn't, we can't unilaterally do that sort of thing without the help of our coalition party partners. <coughs> I understand that uh, there's virtually uniform, uh, if not uniform, support for this resolution, and I do commend it to the Senate. Senator Hill. Deputy President, um, uh, the coalition is <coughs> pleased to support the government's decision in this instance and to also support the resolution that's before the Senate uh, today. Uh, obviously, the decision to commit Australian forces overseas is one that uh, would never be taken without very careful consideration. Um, and we accept that the government has uh, exercised due care. In, uh, in, in addressing it in this, uh, this instance. Uh, likewise, uh, our support will, will never be given without very uh, careful thought uh, also. But uh, what is occurring in Somalia is, is a human tragedy of, a, of enormous uh, consequence, uh, consequences. And um, uh, it is, um, no doubt it's happened before, but it is uh, somewhat exciting that the international community really for the first time is prepared as an international community uh, to help a situation such as this where law and order has totally, totally broken down, uh, where the consequences of that is uh, mass, mass starvation uh, and, uh, and loss, of, uh, loss of life. But nevertheless, the decision of the international community to intervene in the eternal affairs of uh, a country is a big step for the, the UN to, to take, even though the humanitarian cause is no doubt uh, uh, just. Uh, and there will be those, and I think it's sensible that, that uh, have some caution about what type of uh, precedent is being, is being created. But uh, I, I, must, I remember addressing a United Nations Association conference here in Canberra about 18 months ago in which I said in, this, in, in the circumstances of the new world order, I thought the international community should have the courage to do this in exceptional circumstances. Uh, I wasn't, of course, thinking it didn't have the benefit to, to, of wisdom to know what was the tragedy that was going to unfold in, in Somalia. But the one the instance that immediately comes to mind, of course, is when the, uh, the Kurds were bombed with poison gas in Iraq a few years ago. Uh, and the international community stood back uh, embarrassed but not feeling that there was any capacity to intervene in, in such horrendous circumstances. Well, now we have reached, as part of an international community, a new maturity and confidence that is going to dissuade um, uh, dictators and warlords from uh, such uh, appalling conduct in relation to their citizens in the, in the future. So I hope that uh, uh, I am therefore pleased that the in international community has shown this courage uh, on this occasion and, and while stating the obvious cautions that, uh, that it must be uh, um, a humanitarian cause of uh, unambiguous demand of, of severe consequence, nevertheless um, having stated that caution uh, we're pleased that the precedent has been set and hope that it will, it will uh, help contribute to a more stable and peaceful uh, world in the future, peacefully not only in relation to conflicts between states but conflicts now, now within states. 
Uh, the, I commend the, uh, the United States again, as I did in relation to the Gulf War. I think that it should be mentioned uh, again, prepared to show a leadership uh, which in many ways only the US really can show, and as the one superpower in the world, uh, it has a major responsibility. I hope that it will continue to exercise that responsibility under President-elect uh, elect Clinton. Uh, his predecessor, in my view, has shown that le international leadership that is, is worthy of uh, commendation. We commended him during the, Bush, during the, uh, the Gulf War. Uh, and, I, and I do again in these, uh, in these different circumstances. The Australian uh, commitment to a, a force that will be operationally headed by the United States uh, might cause some concern, but it doesn't cause uh, me concern. It seems to, be, to me to be a sensible uh, command relationship uh, in, these, uh, in these difficult circumstances. It might be so that one day in the future the international community will reach yet another level of confidence uh, when they are able to put large forces uh, such as this into an operation under a UN uh, uh, command. Uh, and clearly the UN Charter allows for this, provides for this, but I think that's another stage of confidence um, uh, in an operation of this size <laughs> that is yet to be, yet to be reached. But perhaps uh, we might be gradually heading in that uh, in that direction. Uh, it is, um, but this is a, a step along the road. Uh, the the difficult question is the question of uh, disarming uh, the, uh, the the heavily armed uh, young young uh, men, uh, and there is, as the minister has said, clear risks associated with that. But I I join with the, with the minister, um, and I think with Senator Powell obviously through the sentiment that she's put in her, her amendment that I respectfully suggest is probably unnecessary today, provided that the sentiment is expressed, that the, that the, the objective of providing humanitarian relief is only going to permit a long-term benefit if peace and stability can be restored. Uh, and I can't see how peace and stability is going to be restored uh, without uh, an effort in dis disarming the, the thugs and the gangs and the warlords. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, it seems to me to be a necessary logical step towards what we hope will be the ultimate objective, or what we know is the ultimate objective of, of UNISOM, and the, contributing, uh, and the contribution being made uh, in, uh, in this, in this uh, uh, operation, uh, Operation Restore, Restore Hope, and that is, as I said, to achieve an ultimate peace and stability within, within Somalia for the benefit of the Somali, Somalia for the benefit of the Somali, Somali people. So um, I think that it is going to be necessary, and this does seem to be the force that uh, is most appropriate to do it to maximise the potential for UNISOM to achieve, to achieve its uh, its objectives. Uh, Mr. Deputy President, the Australian Armed Forces do have a proud record in, uh, in peacekeeping work. I've uh, visited them throughout the world, most recently uh, in Cambodia, and I, I said on a recent occasion uh, uh, they are clearly uh, a credit to Australia and Cambodia, as they have been wherever they have served in, in these roles, uh, and I'm sure that they will they will leave Somalia um, with Australia's reputation uh, uh, further enhanced as a result of their contribution. There are risks, however, associated with this, uh, and uh, it is necessary, I think, uh, for us to recognise that and to, to express uh, our appreciation that Australian forces are prepared under the Australian flag to serve the international community in this way, but nevertheless at uh, uh, at risk to, uh, to themselves, uh, and of course their families make uh, just as great a commitment as the men and women who, who go into the, into the field in this, uh, in this task. So we wish them well in, in what is a, a, a good cause, a difficult task, uh, but a good cause. Uh, we trust that they will all return uh, safely, uh, and we want them to go knowing that they have the full confidence and support of this parliament. Senator Ball. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Democrats are very pleased to support this motion before the Senate in its entirety. 
The imminent deployment of Australian troops to Somalia is a welcome and a necessary response to a grave humanitarian crisis. As we all know, Somalians have died and are continuing to die in appalling numbers. Many are dying because relief operations are being disrupted by gangs of armed thugs. This is, of course, an intolerable situation, and it has been absolutely clear for some time that armed intervention is the only way of maximising the reach of emergency food aid. It's for this reason that the United States, to its credit, offered to lead what can perhaps be called a peace enforcement operation and dubbed that Restore Hope. The United Nations Security Council in its Resolution 794, adopted unanimously on 3 December 1992, accepted the offer and laid the legal foundations for armed intervention in accordance with Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. The Democrats support the Security Council resolution and the Australian Government's decision to contribute troops to the operation which is now underway. We particularly endorse the final part of the motion before the Senate, expressing full confidence in and support for the men and women of the Australian Defence Force who are being deployed to Somalia and very much look forward to their safe return. I also recently visited Australian troops in Cambodia in both Phnom Penh and in Battambang and I was also very impressed by their dedication to duty and by the way they are very much respected by the other troops in Cambodia and I believe we will do the same excellent job in Somalia. The Democrats also endorse the government's view that disarmament of the warring factions should be a top priority of this operation. There has been a difference of opinion between the United States and the UN Secretary General, Boutros Ghali, on this point, and we're persuaded to the Secretary General's position. Clearly, total disarmament is an ideal and it cannot be achieved. Maximum disarmament must be pursued for the very obvious reason that the likelihood of a return to anarchy and violence after the troops withdraw will be proportional to the number of weapons available to renegade gangs. It would be naive to assume that this operation is guaranteed to succeed. Intervention of this nature by the UN breaks new ground, and as the situation in Cambodia makes clear, there is much still to be learned. But the uncertainties are no excuse for inaction. The Democrats welcome the deployment of Australian forces not only because of the potential to alleviate the desperate privations to which so many Somalians are subject. We also welcome it as evidence of an increasing willingness on the part of the world community to collectively enforce humanitarian norms. The size of Australia's deployment to Somalia is a welcome demonstration that this government is prepared to give more than token support for the new ideals now being put into practice by the United Nations. Our contributions to this force, to the unprecedented operation now occurring in, occurring in Cambodia and to other contingents scattered around the world are ample evidence of that commitment. The Democrats note the concerns of those who argue that these deployments weaken our capacity to respond to developments in our own region. There is clearly a balance to be struck but the general absence of security concerns in our region suggests to us that the risks are not that high. The Democrats are well aware that our support for this operation and for the operation in Cambodia will be compared with our opposition to the Gulf War. I'd like to spend a little time on this comparison because it goes to the heart of our concept of the new world order. There are several critical differences between Operation Restore Hope and Operation Desert Storm on which our support for the Somalian deployment is based. First, the United Nations endorsement of the Gulf War was reluctant and a mere formality. Had no endorsement been forthcoming, the war would have occurred anyway. While the size of the United States Somalian deployment makes it practical for the US to maintain operational control of the forces there, it's quite obvious from Resolution 794 and surrounding events that the United Nations is firmly in control of this initiative. Second, the Gulf War would not have taken place had the United States' national interests not been threatened. Despite all the denials, the Gulf War was an oil, for oil war first and foremost. The Somalian operation, by contrast, is motivated by humanitarian concerns, which are shared far more equally by the international community. Third, the Gulf War was a humanitarian disaster. Iraqis who could not be held responsible for the excesses of their dictatorial leader were made to suffer in order to liberate Iraq's victims in Kuwait. It's now clear that the predominant victims of the war have been Iraqi children under the age of five, more than 100,000 of whom have died through a combination of malnourishment and poor sanitation. Serious human rights abuses have occurred since the restoration to power of the Kuwaiti royal family. In Somalia, by contrast, there is an excellent chance that significant humanitarian gains will be achieved. There is one common thread running through the Gulf War and Somalian disaster which should give the world community and our government food for thought. The seeds of the Gulf War were sown by a myriad of nations, East and West, which sold or donated arms to Iraq to the point that it became a major threat to Middle East security. 
The full extent of that stupid and short-sighted traffic in weapons is still being exposed in Britain, in the United States and elsewhere. The destruction of Somalia had its roots in the tug of war for influence between the United States and the Soviet Union it was, as it was then. Somalian dictatorships were variously backed by the superpowers. A protracted war of insurgency and violent counterinsurgency during the rule of the dictator, Said Barre, culminated in his downfall and the final descent into anarchy, all fuelled by imported weapons and the paralysed unwillingness of the United Nations to intervene. In 1989-90, even the Hawke government approved the sale of two strike master aircraft to the Barre regime, which had a counterinsurgency squadron employed against its own people. Fortunately, that sale did not proceed for commercial reasons. I have already referred to the heartening change in the United Nations role in enforcing humanitarian norms. It's regrettable that this willingness to take new directions doesn't extend to restraining the international trade in arms. It's well documented that the flow of arms into the Middle East is continuing unabated, raising grave concerns about the military potential of Iran and Syria and making a future conflagration all the more likely. As I've already said, a, majority, a major priority of the United Nations operation in Somalia must be the disarmament of the armed gangs, which are now compounding the misery of the Somalian people. It's equally important that future flows of arms into Somalia be made as difficult as possible. Because of that, the Democrats support Senator Powell's amendment. We believe disarming the rebel clans is a most necessary part of this process. I thank Senator Ray for his offer to keep parliamentarians informed of the process of Operation Restore Hope, and I look forward to receiving information as it becomes available. The Democrats strongly support Australia's contribution to this important attempt to alleviate humanitarian crisis in Somalia. We support the motion. Senator Powell. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. In the short time available to me, uh, I do want to concentrate on the issue which is raised by my amendment to, to this motion, which I move, uh, and that is to add an additional paragraph which says uh, that the Senate supports the view of the UN Secretary-General that to secure the distribution of aid and ensure that peace and good order is restored to Somalia following the withdrawal of the UN forces, rebel clans should be disarmed. Uh, I welcome the government bringing this resolution before the parliament, uh, before the deployment of troops to Somalia, and I support the resolution. Um, but I have moved the amendment uh, that I've moved because of my concern that the UN-backed US-led international coalition, of which Australia is now to become part, must be firmly based uh, on a long-term, viable, achievable strategy to bring lasting peace to Somalia. And I believe this must begin through the disarmament process, which um, I've supported in my amendment, um, and uh, which the UN Secretary General has clearly expected would take place. I am concerned that the difference of opinion that appears to have emerged between the uh, Secretary General and the uh, US-led uh, force leadership does demonstrate that there's been uh, some, at least, insufficient planning and consultation as to why the troops are there, uh, what their activities should involve, and indeed, quite possibly, what the long-term goals are. Um, I welcome the uh, commitment by the minister uh, and by the shadow minister uh, with regard to the terms of my uh, amendment. However, I persist with it on the basis that I do uh, believe it underscores that concern that I have with um, the process that's taking place in Somalia, a process which, of course, I do support because uh, it does have the potential um, to, uh, to have, as uh, Senator Bourne has said, significant long-term humanitarian um, uh, provide those benefits to, uh, to Somalia. Uh, I'd also just briefly um, uh, reiterate the point again made by Senator Bourne uh, that uh, we all of us internationally need to take, uh, have pause for thought about the arms trade which uh, has fuelled the warlords in Somalia, as indeed it has fuelled uh, other conflicts and continues to do so around the world. And as, uh, as during the Gulf War, uh, we also now should uh, address ourselves as a nation to that problem uh, in the United Nations and indeed um, in, our own, uh, in our own national um, uh, trade and uh, involvement. Um, but on, on the question of uh, the development of a long-term strategy towards peace in Somalia, uh, I particularly welcome the government's uh, support for the disarmament of the gangs, um, of the thugs and the warlords, uh, 
uh, during this process, and I do hope that our involvement uh, now as part of the force will mean that uh, indeed um, the Secretary General's uh, um, expectation will in fact be met. Uh, and I do urge uh, the Australian um, government to persist with that. Uh, but I do also want to point to the fact that there, it is important that uh, a, an African, a Somalian solution, a based solution should be sought. Um, and that any long-term future uh, will demand the active support and participation from the people in Somalia. Uh, I would, uh, uh, there, there is an initiative that I want to refer to only briefly. There will be much more public exposure of this initiative uh, tomorrow, but I wonder whether um, there is general awareness that uh, there is in fact a major peace conference to take place in the north of Somalia um, early next year. Which, costs, which is to cost only $50,000, um, which could demonstrate a basis for the resolution of conflict throughout the country, um, that indeed, um, uh, given that uh, there needs to be a local solution, this particular conference that is to take place might preserve, uh, present a very good model. Um, a real long-term solution will uh, necessarily involve recognition of the traditional leadership in the nation, as this particular conference is doing. Um, it's a concern that there is really even now very little understood that there have been already through the non-government organisations, uh, uh, one of which is the, um, the basis for this conference in, in the north. Um, that there have been significant moves towards local rec reconciliation in the north, and uh, I certainly urge this government, uh, particularly now that it does have the involvement, uh, to use any diplomatic leverage that it has towards those sorts of solutions. I support the motion, particularly Part F, uh, which recognises the well-respected work of the Australian Defence Forces in peacekeeping forces around the country, um, and commend my amendment to the Senate. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to make some brief comments on the motion moved by Senator Ray over Australia's participation in the United Nations peacekeeping operation in Somalia. The use of Australian troops for the humanitarian aims of the operation comes as a significant and historic point. Senator Chris Schott um, spoke of human rights as an international concern in launching the uh, Foreign Affairs Joint um, Foreign Affairs um, Subcommittee's uh, Human Rights Report on Australia's role in promoting human rights, and I believe it is appropriate that we are uh, participating in an international peacekeeping force which has the positive and worthy purpose of humanitarian concern. Therefore, I support the expression and spirit of this motion. However, I remain very ambivalent about Australia's peacekeeping force because of the emphasis being placed on suppressing and disarming the warring parties well in advance of food arriving to help the starving people in Somalia. And I make that point in relation to the arrival of quite a massive military force in a particular location in Somalia and uh, as, as happened today, with the news that food would be coming on the weekend. And while I realise it might have quite um, complicated logistic implications to combine those two, I believe a true message of humanitarian aid, which is being enforced and secured by military assistance, needs to be expressed together rather than separately, because there's a danger that a double message may go to local Somali people, as well as to other nations in similar situations, such as Mozambique, that we will conquer first before we feed you. And I think it's very important that those two um, aims are not seen to be separate in the light of the suffering of the people we are seeking to aid. On the one hand, the American commanders appear to be saying that their role is to ensure that food gets to the hungry, something we cannot argue with, although we may not like the measures that are necessary to achieve that goal in these dire circumstances, and then they will leave. Some have suggested that the United States will leave behind a well-fed as well as well-armed Somalia. 
The United Nations leadership, however, is wanting the US to disarm the countryside and the towns before getting the food through. And while I agree with the concerns that have been expressed by Senator Powell and um, Senator Bourne for the Democrats, I think there is that danger of the uh, separation of military force and food aid that may actually send a message that there is a military involvement here. And that disarmament, of course, would of necessity involve a much greater level of military action and the use of force. And this confusion, if that's not too strong a word, is coming through in the Australian part of the operation too. Because we hear that the Australian government is supportive of the United Nations position while it acknowledges that this would place the troops in greater danger, um, as mentioned in the AAP news story of December the 15th while the commander of the Australian troops says that the troops will be under American command on a day-to-day -day basis. AAP News on yesterday, December the 16th, quotes Colonel Bill Meller. The Americans will provide operational command. They will specifically task the battalion on a day-to-day -day basis. Colonel Meller went on to say, the aim of the enforcement operation is to provide security for the delivery of humanitarian assistance thus clearly showing the divergence of the agenda. We must remember that pre-1977, the USSR, and post-1977, the USA, bear some responsibility for the present state of Somalia and the presence of the very arms that the warlords have been using in their fighting. The long-term future of a country where quite massive intervention is required, leaves the very open question of how does this affect the local people and their own efforts to bring about long-term sustainable development for their people? Where does this put the status of an African Somalian solution? We must be aware that disempowerment may be an undesirable and unforeseen consequence of the United Nations uh, troops' involvement in Somalia. Order. Senator Chairman, your time has expired. Order. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Powell be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against say no. Yes. I think the noes have it. Order. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Ministerial statements. Government responses to parliamentary committee reports. Government's response to the Senate Select Committee on Superannuation report on the safeguarding super bracket, the regulation of superannuation in the bracket, and a related document entitled Strengthening Super Security, a new prudential arrangement for superannuation. And I seek leave to incorporate the responses in Hansard and as, as well to move a motion in relation to the documents. Is leave granted? There be no objection. Leave is granted. I move that the Senate take note of the documents. Request that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Brownhill. I move that the debate be adjourned. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Order. In accordance with the usual practice, I table a list of parliamentary committee reports to which the government has not responded within the prescribed period. This list has been circulated to honourable senators. The concurrence of the Senate list will be incorporated in Hansard. Order. Senators will recall the visit to Parliament House on the 13th and 15th of October 1992 by members of the New Zealand Finance and Expenditure Committee. The visit was part of a regular committee exchange agreement between the Australian and New Zealand parliaments, which the Speaker and I and the New Zealand Speaker regard as very important in ensuring that our parliaments and parliamentarians remain in close contact. For the information of senators and others, I present a transcript of a seminar in which the New Zealand committee members took part with a number of leading Australian academics to discuss parliamentary accountability in both countries. Government documents. Document number one, Department of Employment, Education and Training. 
Number two, supervising scientist for the Alligator Rivers region. Tobacco Research and Development Council, Horticultural Research and Development Corporation, Grape and Wine Research Development Corporation. I am. I am. Horticultural Policy Council, Exotic Animal Disease Preparedness Consultative Council. Exandus, Department of Prime Ministries and Energy, Australian Port Corporation, Peak Research and Development Corporation. Cotton Research and Development Corporation, Department of Prime Ministries and Energy, Department of Veterans Affairs, National Museum of Australia, Snowy Mountains Hydroelectric, and your report, Snowy Mountains Hydroelectric Equal Opportunities, Equal Opportunities, Department of Prime Industries and Energy, Australia Week Board, Australian Sports Drug Agency. Um, Mr. Acting Deputy President, I move that the, Se the Senate take note of the report, Australian Sports Drug Agency. Uh, I seek leave to continue my remarks, but would agree to it being called on later in this half hour, uh, should there be anybody who wish to speak upon it. Very eminently sensible suggestion, Senator Reid. Thank you. Aubrey Wodonga Development Corporation, Land, Land and Water Research Development Corporation, Australian Securities Commission, Administrative Appeals Tribunal, Criminology Research Council, Privacy Commissioner, Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions, Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission, Department of Veterans Affairs, Papua New Guinea Superannuation Scheme, Special Broadcasting Service, Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Australian Broadcasting Tribunal, Qantas Airways Limited, Department of the Arts, Sport and the Environment and Territories, Australian Heritage Commission. Australian Industry Development Corporation. <laughs> Australian France Foundation, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Australian New Zealand Foundation. Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, CSIRO, Department of Employment, Education and Training, Australian Fisheries Management Authority, Australian Honey Board, Committee for the Review of the System for Review of Migration Decisions, Australian Institute of Criminology, CSL Limited, CSL Limited, Housing Assistance Act, 1989, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Repatriation Commission of the Department of Veterans Affairs. Order. Published Nursing Home and Hostel Standards Monitoring Statements, report for the period 1 August 1992 to 31 October 1992. Commonwealth Funds Management Limited, report for 1991-92. Department of Tourism report for the period 27 December 1991 to 31 92 I'm sorry, Senator McGuire. I uh, seek uh, to speak on this report, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Which number are we? Uh, Department of Tourism, number three from yesterday. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Senator McGuire. The, uh, no, this is the 1991-92 annual report of the Department of Tourism recording uh, uh, visitors to Australia in that uh, period of 2.3 million visitors. Uh, the report is interesting reading. It shows that since 1985, uh, seven years ago, the the number of inbound tourists to Australia has doubled in that, in that period, uh, and the target for the year 2000 is 6.5 million visitors from overseas every year to Australia. The report makes it uh, very clear that export earnings from tourism now are worth 
some $8,200 million annually to the Australian economy, $8.2 billion. And, uh, that uh, figure now rivals the total annual proceeds from sales of our some of our traditional commodities to other countries. Uh, the tourism sector now contributes some 450,000 jobs to the Australian economy. It's very important to note that this uh, report actually says, and I quote, international tourism is increasingly competitive, unquote. And of course, in that context, we have to look at the potential effect of a goods and services tax on the Australian tourism sector, because the reality is, and the studies show it, that a goods and services tax would severely damage the Australian international tourism industry. And I uh, quote here in this context a report done by the Department of the Treasury, the Independent Public Service Department of the Treasury, which has looked at the impact potentially of a goods and services tax on tourism and has identified a cost increase for accommodation as a result of a goods and services tax of 13 per cent. So Dr Hewson's proposed goods and services tax would add 13 per cent to accommodation costs in tourism. It would add 12 per cent, if ever implemented, to the cost of travel uh, by aircraft or other means of transport, 12 per cent increase in travel costs as a, re a result of a goods and services tax. And the reality is that such a tax would seriously reduce Australia's relative price advantage for international tourists, because what would happen is that Australia would become a more expensive destination for overseas tourists compared with other countries. The goods and services tax, if implemented, would narrow our cost advantage compared with other countries. And the reality is that tourist brochures published overseas would record higher prices for tours to Australia, holiday packages to Australia. Prices in Australia would rise while prices in other countries were relatively constant. And of course Australia is a long haul destination for tourists. Tourism is a very price sensitive commodity and anything that uh, in the form of a goods and services tax for example which added to the cost of tourism would in fact uh, reduce competitiveness and tend to reduce the demand for tourism to Australia because Australia would become less competitive. So there we have a crazy policy being put forward by the opposition of this country proposing to implement a goods and services tax on a key export earner, a major uh, generator of foreign exchange for Australia. International tourism is now worth over $8,000 million annually to Australia and we have a nonsensical policy which would add to the costs on that industry. And uh, it's interesting to note that uh, opposition spokespersons in this place repeatedly claim that in the so-called fight back packages, package there would be offsets for the tourism industry because things like payroll tax they claim would be abolished by this fight back policy. But the reality is that 85 per cent, 85 per cent of the businesses in the tourism sector do not pay payroll tax now because there is an exemption from payroll tax for small businesses. So only 15 per cent, only 15 per cent, only 15 per cent of the producers in the industry pay payroll tax. So therefore they, the 85 per cent who don't cannot benefit from any reduction in payroll tax. And uh, I, uh, I now call, because of the enormous damage that will be done to tourism by this crazy policy that's going to tax an export industry, I now call on Dr Hewson, when he makes his announcement tomorrow, I call on him to exempt international tourism from the goods and services tax. He must do that. It's a major generator of foreign exchange for the Australian balance of payments. It's one way we can earn hard currency, and Dr Hewson must avoid damaging this major industry by exempting tourism from a goods and services tax. Well, the question is that the Senate take note of the report. Those that have been to say aye, those against say no. I think uh, the ayes have it. Senator Panizza, were you seeking to attract my attention? Uh, yes, I was uh, seeking your attention, uh, Mr Deputy President, to go back to uh, number three on the red, as a proposed presentation of papers number three, and briefly also uh, later on on number 18. Ms. Leib, Grant, I leave. there'd be no objection. Senator Panizza? Yeah, well, the first one, Mr. De uh, Deputy President.
to take note of the report. I seek leave to take note of the report. I move that the Senate take note of the report. Right. Okay. I can start talking now. The, the, the front desk is uh, finished changing over. Now, I just want to briefly address the Tobacco Research Council report, and uh, just to briefly just say what I have said many times in the past. Whereas this government have been prepared to ban tobacco advertising in Australia, except in certain uh, favoured uh, events which will bring in the major sponsorship, tobacco sponsorship into Australia, uh, namely uh, the, the Adelaide Grand Prix, Eastern Creek and Mount Panorama and those sort of things. But what sticks in my throat, Madam Acting Deputy President, is the fact that this government puts in $413,000 in this year's budget into tobacco research, where we have, uh, though it may be a legal crop to grow, it may be a legal product to sell. This government has banned, and uh, we've supported it, uh, because Senator Heron has given it, uh, knows far better than I the effects of, uh, of advertising on tobacco. But I believe if you're going to ban tobacco advertising, you ban it completely. You don't only ban it very selectively. But the, uh, the point I have stood up to make is to point out the double standards of the government. The double standards of the government on advertising, of course, but not only that is the double standards with the tobacco industry. By giving them 413,000 out of consolidated funds, it, it, it's not uh, consolidated revenue. As not a matter of fact is uh, given the tobacco back their own levy, where growers have uh, been levied 0.05 per cent on gross production. And that's their own funds, as far as I'm concerned, and the government are giving it back to them to use. But there is $413,000 in this year's budget for tobacco research. Well, if tobacco is that bad to use, and I believe that it is, uh, Senator Heron, an eminent surgeon from uh, Brisbane, very has told eminent. us about that. Very eminent has told us about that, and I go along with him. And I've had experience of uh, seeing uh, some of my relations die from tobacco smoking, and indeed my mother-in-law died of <laughs> passive smoking, I believe. But here we have the double standard by putting $413,000 into research when they're, they're running around banning tobacco advertising. Now the government, this government and any future government has got to address that. If they want to stay with one standard, Madam Acting Deputy President, or whether to run or two, they've got to make up their mind if the tobacco industry is needed in Australia, whether it should be encouraged in Australia, or whatever. Now, Senator Cook told me once when I asked him at estimates, uh, when I asked him at estimates, uh, he said, "Well, it's a valuable export uh, uh, crop in for Australia, tobacco, but well, if it is, they say, if it is, well then." They should be doing different tobacco advertising, but they do go down the right line on tobacco advertising. As long as they take it right across the board, then they shouldn't be subsidising or paying money to research uh, for for continual growing of tobacco if it's not uh, if it's not healthy to smoke anyhow. So I thought that I would bring that to the attention of the Senate again, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, Senator Heron. Uh, on another report, Madam Acting Deputy yeah. President, I move that the Senate takes note of the report. Uh, Senator Heron, are you seeking to re rearrange the uh, order of reports we'd address? Madam Acting Deputy President, the next item was to be on the uh, Private Health Insurance Administration Council. Yes, look, Senator Heron, can I seek your indulgence and just get one small matter out of the way in the meantime? Uh, Senator Crichton Brown? Thank you very much, uh, Madam De Acting Deputy Chairman. I, I wonder. Would the Senate indulge me to the extent of uh, granting me leave to address the number 19, which is the Australian Sports Drug Agency's annual report? Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave granted. Senator thank thank you very much. I thank the Senate. Madam Acting Deputy Chairman, um, I speak on the Australian Sports Drug Agency's annual report for 1991-92, and I commence by congratulating the agency on a very excellent report, and it's not without significance. Uh, to note that the, um, that the report observes that the, Senate, the Secretary of the Senate Committee, uh, which uh, deals with the annual reports, 
inform the agency that as this annual report for 1990-91 was used as a model for other authorities. It's a very comprehensive uh, report. And I, I refer just to one or two matters in the report. I, I note that, um, um, well, first of all, I, I uh, take this opportunity to congratulate the Chief Executive of ASDA, Mr Steve Haynes, uh, on uh, his award uh, as best administrator at the yeah, rec recent, yeah, yeah. At, at the recent um, uh, sports awards in Melbourne. The yeah, Confederation of Australian Sports Awards in Melbourne recently, which I think was a reflection not only of the excellent administrative capacity he's got, but also a reflection on the contribution he's making to sport in Australia generally. And having said that, I observe that uh, the report uh, draw to our attention that there's litigation presently taking place between Martin Vinicombe and uh, the agency. Uh, one of the difficulties confronted with the uh, sporting uh, associations and authorities is that notwithstanding the fact uh, that uh, when that athletes may be detected uh, as uh, having uh, ingested uh, sports performance uh, drugs uh, of a bad nature for which they should be suspended from competition, they have on a number of occasions been able to resort to the courts and uh, have, their, um, have the ban overturned on appeal. And the difficulty in some cases is that a number of the sporting authorities simply do not have the funding available to them to properly and adequately defend the, the original administrative uh, uh, requirements and the decision. And I note that uh, the American athlete Reynolds, commonly known as Butch Reynolds, who was detected uh, for cheating, um, has now, now sued, uh, um, I think it was the Amer American Amateur Athletic Association, no, it was the International Amateur Athletic Association he's sued uh, for several million dollars. And it just shows uh, the difficulty that, uh, that sports officials and administrators have in ensuring that the provisions are correct so as to um, enable them to properly eliminate the cheats in sport of Mr Reynolds, of course, is one. Um, Madam Acting Deputy Chairman, I refer also to the, to the Appendix 12 of the report, which draws to our attention the matter of clenbuterol. Clenbuterol is a drug which is used by asthmatics. It is both um, in the beta category and it's also a, an anabolic agent. And a number of athletes have used clenbuterol because they believed it wasn't particularly proscribed on the ISA doping list. However, the ISA uh, practice of including the words and related substances means that that possible loophole uh, does not exist. However, it's not without significance that there is at least one Australian athlete who has been detected positive using clenbuterol for the purpose of enhancing his performance is now appealing uh, his suspension and that will embroil, I suspect, Athletics Australia in, uh, again, uh, very large uh, costs. It's a pity that the IOC didn't take the matter of the clenbuterol up earlier so as to clarify the situation. Uh, because it was drawn to the difficulty of clenbuterol was drawn to their attention by the by the Canadian um, the Canadian um, um, drug agency. Um, however, um, the ISC did absolutely nothing about it for something like 18 months, and uh, now various uh, sporting bodies around the world uh, find themselves confronted uh, with the uh, with that difficulty. I concluded uh, by also just drawing quickly the. Senate's attention to Appendix 3, which refers to our, to our um, memorandum of understanding with Canada and the United Kingdom concerning reciprocal development enforcement of measures against doping in sport. And I can only say that until such time as we have arrangements of that nature, including China, America, and, um, and all the uh, European countries, we will not eliminate um, cheating uh, at the Olympic Games, and our own Australian athletes will continue to be disadvantaged given that we've got the most rigid regime of any, of any uh, program Orders, in the world. Um, Senator Crichton, your time's expired. Uh, Senator Heron? Um, no. Sorry. I'm the Senator. He's on. Uh, Senator Byrne? Uh, very briefly, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President, I just want to draw attention to Appendix 8 of this report, which outlines the uh, difference uh, between the states 
in the manner of dealing with uh, uh, penalties, uh, uh, applying penalties for uh, uh, the taking of anabolic steroids. And it is quite remarkable that uh, the ACT uh, has uh, a very, very low level of, uh, uh, of penalty and uh, very moderate uh, laws uh, to discourage people from uh, uh, taking anabolic steroids. I mean, it really is quite striking that in the, the, uh, the, the territory in which the federal capital, uh, uh, the, the federal parliament exists, and uh, uh, where uh, there is a determined bipartisan approach against the taking of steroids, we have an administration that uh, appears to take a remarkably lenient view. Uh, for example, uh, uh, to the question in Appendix 8, uh, of, is it an offence for unauthorised supply of anabolic steroids through pharmacies, uh, we see that in uh, Tasmania and New South Wales it's a, there's a $2,000 fine in New South Wales or two years jail. In Queensland it's $1,200. In Victoria it's $5,000. In Western Australia, it's $100,000 or 25 years jail. In the ACT, it's $200. Now, that, quite frankly, is, I think, just disgraceful. They could have 20 years jail. Um, the, uh, uh, to the question, is it a requirement that a pharmacist is required to keep a record of all prescriptions dispensed? In uh, the ACT, uh, the fine for not doing so is $40. In Victoria, it's $5,000 or 12 months in jail. In New South Wales, it's $800 or six months in jail. Um, are all wholesalers of veterinary and human scheduled products licensed? Um, for example, veterinary products, and I mention those because uh, many uh, uh, drug takers appear to be taking veterinary products. Uh, yes, it is uh, uh, required that they uh, be licensed, but in the ACT, the fine for not doing so is $200. In Western Australia, it's $100,000 or 25 years jail. In, uh, uh, in Queensland, it's $1,200. In Victoria, it's, uh, it's $2,000. Uh, to the question, uh, is it a requirement of the wholesale license that supply of scheduled products can only be to a license or permit holder? Uh, within the state, uh, breaching that uh, brings about a fine of uh, what $1,200 in Queensland, $2,000 in Victoria, $100,000 or 25 years jail in Western Australia. In uh, the ACT, $200. Now, it just seems to me that uh, um, this sort of thing is totally unacceptable, particularly when you come to this question: Is possession? of Section 4 substances, such as anabolic steroids, an offence in every state and territory of this nation except the ACT, it is an offence. But it is not an offence in the ACT. Now, really, uh, uh, that something has to, be, uh, has to be done about this. Uh, I mean, it's, it's regarded so seriously that uh, I mean, it, all the other states have very high penalties. In New South Wales, it's $2,000 or two years jail. In Western Australia, it's $100,000 or 25 years jail. And I must say, Western Australia is leading the nation in its uh, fight against uh, anabolic steroids. In Victoria, it's $2,000. Uh, and in uh, Tasmania, $5,000 or two years jail. Uh, I mean, I can go through this. There's a lot more in this schedule. All I do is plead with the ACT administration to fix this mess up. Well, the question is: the question is, the report. Be, the Senate take note of the report. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Heron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. Mr. Deputy President, I think it's absolutely extraordinary that we're faced with the tabling today of 53 documents. Which, uh, most of which were unavailable to tabling so that we were unable to peruse them. I think it's abs it, it is extraordinary behaviour on the last day of sitting of this Senate that this should occur. And uh, I wish that recorded in, in the minutes. I also wish to refer to the 
Private Health Insurance Administration Council report uh, and seek leave to uh, that, uh, move that the Senate take note of that. Well, sorry. Well, this is where I'm having difficulty finding it in the in the uh, number on the uh, current thing, or is it in the previous in yesterday's notice paper? Order it being 6:30. The sitting of the Senate is suspended until 8 p.m. Mr Deputy President, prior to the dinner adjournment, I was speaking uh, to, about the absurdity of the tabling of 40, 53 documents today and on the notice paper 75 documents that the Senate is supposed to consider with each speaker at five minute intervals for the benefit of listeners to this, for readers of Hansard, some of them, for instance, are mainly urban, the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders that runs to 280 pages, a physical and sport education report from the Senate Standing Committee on Environment, Recreation and the Arts, which were tabled today, which runs to 159 pages, prescribed health, pharmacy and medicinal supply. Uh, which runs to 61 pages, and it is, I think it is not just an absurdity, it uh, does little justice to the Senate. These documents of quite major significance are considered in such a short period of time. I think it's a reflection of the mismanagement of government business that this should occur in this way, and it, it really uh, casts a slur on the way in which this Senate treats the public of Australia, who we are supposed to represent in this manner. But I am speaking on government document number 54, Operations of the Registered Health Benefits Organisations Report for 1991-92, uh, to be considered. Now, I've taken up one minute of my precious five minutes in time to to bring out the absurdity of this process. But this document is of very major significance, and I read from it, and I repeat, it is on the operations of the Registered Health Benefits Organisations, the Private Health Insurance Administration Council, and I quote from the report, the proportion of the population covered by private health insurance continues to decline. Over the year, the privately insured population of the Australian population, the privately insured proportion of the Australian population fell from 43 per cent at the end of June 1991 to 40.9 per cent at the end of June 1992. 
The state which sustained the largest decline was Victoria, which fell from 47.9 per cent to 42.9 per cent, five percentage points over the year. All states registered declines, with the smallest decline occurring in Western Australia, 0.5 percentage points. The industry has lost approximately 119,000 members Australia-wide over the year, with Victoria accounting for slightly more than half of the loss. All states, apart from Victoria, re recorded significant increases in the number of persons covered aged 65 years and more. Now, the significance of that from the coverage of the Australian population and looking after their health care is enormous. And it underlines the argument of the Victorian Parliament and the New South Wales Parliament as to how they are going to cope. How are they going to cope with this 119,000 people now dependent on the public hospital system of Australia for their health care when they are already stretched to the limits? And I noticed yesterday, Mr Deputy President, you being a Queenslander, would have seen the Courier-Mail report yesterday where the headline was, Hospitals Face Costs Clamp, Staff Told to Work Harder. I ask you, Mr President, Mr Deputy President, is that that, that is, that is the, that is the, uh, that is the uh, future, because that's the way in which Medicare is going, and yet we have this, not only the blind eye turned to it, as I mentioned today, uh, about the uh, possibility of the loss of an eye being compensated for $28,000 and the Speaker of the other chamber getting $65,000 for an injury to his elbow. It is alleged, of course, on the other side that he's always only had one eye anyway. But uh, we are facing in this. Just think of the claim on you, uh, Senator Ray, if you were to have a more serious injury, uh, as I mentioned previously, about loss of uh, certain uh, matters of serious significance between the legs, because that uh, might occur to you if you fell off a bicycle and got caught in a chain. Uh, Mr. Deputy President, the, uh, this is a very serious matter. Number 54. That, that is a very serious matter, Mr. President, Mr. Vice President. This is a very serious matter too, because people such as that, who are not covered, whom I might say are not covered by private insurance, and I think it will be interesting to see whether the Speaker was covered by private hospital insurance. My information was that he paid it out of his pocket, because these people, and then didn't pay the bill, by the way. Uh, this he, he was not covered, and then he got the hospital bill and didn't pay it. But uh, that being so. That accounts for 10 per cent of the population who do not, are not privately insured and are prepared to pay for the bill. In fact, the majority of them do pay the bill when it's put to them. But there is a significant proportion of people in this country who pay for their own hospital care. And those figures won't show up in these, this report of this document, the operations of the registered health benefits organisations. So, while there are 40.9 per cent of the population of Australia covered by private insurance, and as I mentioned, a significant number over the age of 65 who take more out of it than they put in, this country is facing a serious crisis, and yet it is ignored by the government. And I think that it, will, it needs to be addressed, whichever government in his power is in power, because this crisis is occurring today, and it's no good pretending that it doesn't exist. Order. Time has expired for consideration of government documents. I shall move to the tabling of documents. In accordance with the provisions of the Audit Act 1901, on behalf of the President, I present the following report of the Auditor General, Report No. 17 of 1992-93, Audit Project Audit, Medifraud and Excessive Servicing Health Insurance Commission. Senator Knowles. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. What do you want to? A big pardon. What do you want to do? Talk on the auditor's report. Well, you have to seek leave like, yeah, to move a motion. Yeah, pardon. I, yes, I do. I just got to say thank you <laughs> for calling me. Is leave, is leave granted? I seek leave. Leave is to, granted. Now, if you can move to take note of the report. Move to take note of the document, and this is a particularly significant uh, auditor general's report, Mr. President, Mr. Deputy President, uh, and one that we've been waiting on for a very long time. Um, the first I heard about uh, the investigation into Medi fraud was uh, some three or four months ago, 
and it's taken a considerable length of time to actually drag Reef and Hall out of the government the information that uh, uh, was now contained in the Auditor General's report. And it's a very sad state of affairs because what we have really found is that um, the recommendations that were put to the Health Insurance Commission over 10 years ago have in fact been almost totally and utterly ignored. What we've actually seen is in the past year, 1991-92, around $4.6 billion of Medicare fraud. $4.6 billion. Now, one can only imagine what the unemployed could do in terms of job creation with $4.6 billion. And of course, the uh, recoveries for fraud have been but $1 million. And uh, over seven years, the uh, number of providers who have been prosecuted have been 43. Now, it would be very easy for any government to slip into a situation of doctor bashing. And I don't believe it's the doctors who are primarily at fault. It's the system that is clearly at fault. And one notable admission, omission, I suppose, not admission, omission, from the Auditor General's report tonight is the question of bulk billing. When we're talking in such colossal terms and the amount of money, it's, uh, it is just amazing that the whole question of bulk billing hasn't been raised. And as my colleague uh, and friend Senator Heron, who of course is a, uh, a notable surgeon, will mention probably later on, the ability for fraud under bulk billing is just enormous. But the key findings of this report are as follows. That there was a lack of prosecutions and disciplinary action. That the performance of the Health Insurance Commission, with the exception of the last 12 months, shows little improvement over that of the then Department of Health in the early 1980s. The Commission's legislative powers to combat fraud and excessive servicing are deficient in regard to investigation and prosecution of unethical uh, providers. Medical service committees of inquiry, the main disciplinary bodies, were not operating effectively. The growth in uh, pathology benefits has in fact slowed to the extent that there was a marginal decrease in expenditure in 1991-92 compared with the previous year. However, diagnostic imaging expenditure is still escalating. And the ability to release information for investigation is important in preventing many fraud and the Commission has been reluctant to fully utilise its powers under the Health Insurance Act because of uncertainty about the effect of privacy legislation. And a comprehensive policy is needed. And of course, what the uh, uh, Auditor General's report is actually re recommending is a number of changes, and particularly those in the legislative areas, because they cite a legislative weakness as one of the greatest difficulties enabling the Health Insurance Commission to be able to pursue many fraud. And of course, one of the other areas is to have competent investigators. But I think what we also saw in the Harvey Bates report, and we are now seeing in the Auditor General's report, and the Harvey Bates report is of course the private consultant's report done as a precursor to this report, is that the Health Insurance Commission itself was particularly lax in terms of pursuing and investigating uh, within the guidelines that they had at the time, and also um, taking up the recommendations of the Joint Committee of Public uh, of Accounts, the Parliamentary Joint Committee of Public Accounts, uh, which issued a number of reports in the middle mid 80s dealing with fraud and over servicing. And, uh, that committee's reports revealed a number of factors which affected the Commonwealth health budget at that time. And they included the legislative weakness, prosecution difficulties, um, that is, for example, the problems associated with collecting admissible evidence, uh, medical benefits schedule, for example, the lack of clarity in the schedule, technological advances, especially in regard to pathology, the oversupply of doctors and entrepreneurial fraud. But as I say, one of the notable omissions even in that 
which is a collection of the recommendations from the uh, Parliamentary Joint Committee on Public Accounts back in the 80s, is the question of bulk billing. And that question of bulk billing is one that simply cannot be ignored. And, uh, it is a great pity that the government has continued to try and hide what's going on in terms of Medi fraud, and as recently as when I persisted and persisted and persisted to get a copy of the consultant's report. And I find it absolutely amazing to see developments in this parliament by this government of absolutely and utterly ignoring parliamentary requests. And that is what has happened on this occasion, as of course has happened recently with other documents. That this Senate has requested the tabling of certain documents, and yet the responsible minister has said no. Now, there is absolutely no reason why Mr Howe should have said no to the request for the, for the Harvey Bates report a number of weeks ago. It was alleged by him that it would teach people how to commit fraud. It certainly did nothing of the sort. And of course, what we are seeing today in the Auditor General's report proves exactly that. If he was trying to conceal parliamentary inactivity, by the government, then that is one thing. If he was trying to conceal the inadequacies of the Health Insurance Commission, then that's another thing. But to simply use an excuse of saying that it would teach people how to commit fraud is totally and utterly misleading, Mr Deputy President. And what we are seeing in this uh, Auditor General's report is most disturbing because the amount of money that has been wasted and frittered away at a time when this country and a million people who are unemployed cannot afford that. And I certainly hope that we will see the Health Insurance Commission act swiftly on the recommendations of the Auditor General's report and read it closely and also look very closely at the comprehensive report put together by the consultants to Harvey Bates. Senator Patterson. I want to follow on speak, to speak on the same report as Senator Knowles, and I won't reiterate the point she's made. But I want to say I have seen today one of the most farcical press releases that I've ever seen since I've been in this place. A press release put out by Mr Howe, who somehow has had some flash of light on the road to Damascus that not, something is not well with Medicare. Somehow light has dawned on him. In the mid-1980s there was a report that highlighted the problems that were surrounding um, the uh, Medicare system and uh, it included uh, concern about fraud, it included concern about the lack of legislative powers under the Health Act or the Health Insurance Act to apprehend people and uh, deal with them for in fact engaging in fraud and or over-servicing, and uh, nothing has been done about it. Nothing. Until a year ago, we hear, we begin to see something done. Why? Because the Auditor General decided that they would do a full audit. They'd do an audit. And suddenly, the Health Insurance Commission decides it will appoint a consultant, and things started to happen. And what's Mr Howe say in his press release? He says that uh, the Minister for Health and Housing and Community Services, Brian Howe, today signalled the government would move quickly to draw up legislative proposals designed to enable the Health Insurance Commission to deal more effectively with fraud and over-servicing of Medicare and pharmaceutical benefits. He should have done that seven years ago, when he was told there were problems. But somehow it's taken the Auditor General going in there and then Harvey Bates, the consultant, for the, for the minister to do anything about it. How much? money has been lost? How much of the Australian taxpayers money has been lost? How much money has gone in fraud that could have been used to reduce those dreadful hospital waiting lists? Millions and millions and millions of dollars wasted in fraud. Hip operations not done. Cataract operations not done. People living in pain and anguish because this minister has sat on his hands and obviously previous health ministers have sat on their hands doing nothing about what they knew existed. They'd been told. And uh, he said 
He was going to have open and wide consultations. This will make you laugh, Senator Knowles, if you haven't read it. Open, oh, sorry, you, Mr. Deputy President. Open and wide, uh, wide and open consultations with the medical and pharmacy professions. Well, they'll find that most entertaining, I'm sure. They will find that entertaining because what are we told over and over and over again by the health professions? Every time you have the optometrist in, we were never consulted. We don't, we don't get consulted. The pathologists come in, we weren't consulted. The, pharma, the pharmacists come in, we weren't consulted. The medicos come in, we weren't consulted. People in the disability field, we weren't consulted. Every time with this minister, we hear we haven't been consulted. I don't think there's a minister around where I get the same complaints from peak bodies and constituents that they were never consulted. And here, Mr Ha, on the road to Damascus, has suddenly discovered that the way through, the way forward is with open and wide consultations. I could have told Mr Ha before I even came into this place. That is the way to get to move forward, to consult, to find out, to say to people, we've got a limited amount of money, how are we going to achieve this together? That's not what's done. The message comes from down on high, some bureaucratic idea which is totally incomprehensible, like the concept of merging all small rural nursing homes 250k apart, some idiotic suggestion that came some years ago. They're the sorts of things that come. No concept about the humans at the end of the line, real people. Open and wide consultation he's going to have. And uh, he says, goes on to say uh, he'll get a, an advisor. He's going to get an advisor now. He's going to appoint um, a, a proper advisor or an advisor that will help him will play a key role in consultations and in making sure we get it right. He said that he will be appointing an eminent medical practitioner. Well, I'm going to tell Mr Howe it's too late. He should have got it right when he first got in and when his other ministers were in, his, in health. He's got it so wrong that he won't have the chance to get it right because it's going to be the coalition that gets it right. That's who's going to get it right, not Mr Howe with his fancy consultant. He should have had someone in there years ago. The fraud has been extensive. We don't know how much it is, and Senator Heron will deal with that in more detail. We've got, they've got no idea—7 per cent, 10 per cent. It's anybody's guess. He also goes on to say they're going to review diagnostic imaging services. Well, good for him. But when you see the figures, they've been going out for a long time too. Something should have been done about that before this. It took the Auditor General going in for somehow Mr Howe to be shaken and jolted into doing something about our Medicare system, which is in disarray, which is not delivering services to people who are genuinely in need, those people who genuinely need the service. And I've said this before and I'll say it again, that when I have the local news agent ringing me up to tell me he cannot bear to see an old lady who comes into his news agency week in and week out deteriorating because she's waited two years to get a hip replacement, or 14 months, I can't remember what it is, but it most probably seems like 10 years to her. He rang me in desperation. He's got nothing to do with this lady. She's a customer of his. He rang me in desperation. There are ladies and men, women and men, like that throughout Australia waiting while the minister sat on his hand, while the hands, while the fraud has gone on, and he knew in the mid-80s, early 80s in fact, that we needed legislative changes, that there were difficulties in, in uh, having prosecutions, that there were problems with the medical um, benefit schedule, there were technological advances in, in medicine that were needed to be addressed, and uh, there was fraud. All those things he knew. The Auditor General hasn't told us anything much new. A few extra things, most probably about the oversupply of doctors, because that's changed maybe in the last six or seven years. But everything else was in that early report in some form or other. And nothing has been done by this government. And you will, the government will stand condemned because the public health is one of the major issues next to the unemployment that is so drastic in this country, the worst it's been in 60 years, the worst recession we've had in 60 years. And now we've got a health system in total disarray, and we have the minister coming in, coming, distributing around the, the press galleries an absolutely farcical story about how he's now seen the light and he's going to do something about it. Well, Mr Howe, let me tell you, it is too late. It is too late. You won't have the chance because it will be 
Bob Woods, the Minister for Health, who will address the problems and make sure that the dollar, the health dollar, is delivered in the right place to those people in need, and we will reduce those hospital waiting lists. We'll get a proper balance between private and public health, and we will restore a health system, the best health system in the world. We will restore that. We had that, and we will restore that. And Mr. Howe is so late; it doesn't matter. Question, Senator Herring. Mr. Deputy President, the Auditor General's report on Medifraud and excessive servicing is an absolute indictment of the Health Insurance Commission and of Medicare itself. And I would particularly wish to draw your attention to the overview on the first page. And I quote, at that time, the extent of fraud and over-servicing was estimated by the then Department of Health to be at least 7 per cent of the total medical benefits expenditure by the Commonwealth and Health Funds. This 7 per cent represented $100 million in the 1981-92 financial year, when Commonwealth medical benefits expenditure amounted to $1,497 million. The Australian Medical Association agreed with this figure. Mr Deputy President, in 1982, the Australian Medical Association cooperated uh, with the then Minister for Health, Dr Blewett. And when Dr Blewett came out with an announcement that the Medicare fraud amounted to 7 per cent of the total medical benefits, they agreed with him and said that we should cooperate in, in doing something about this. When those figures were analysed, and it was event eventually Dr Blewett had to concede that there was no veracity at all in that statement, and the president of the Australian Medical Association apologised to his members and was not uh, re-elected on the next occasion. In fact, he stood down because he, has, he had misled both his membership and the Australian public. And yet this document, based on that, figures, on that figure, said that there's the baseline is 7 per cent, and then following on that, They've extrapolated from that that therefore it must be more uh, as a result. Now, if you look at these figures, uh, or continuing on, look at these figures perhaps in the report. In seven years, the recoveries from excess servicing was a half a million dollars. In seven years, now it's estimated that Medicare expenditure over that period of time, of course, would be in the vicinity of. Uh, seven times uh, between three and four thousand million dollars, and out of that they got back uh, five hundred thousand dollars, an average of seventy one thousand four hundred and twenty dollars a year. I did a quick calculation on my calculator, and that's point zero 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 one five five per cent an infinitesimal amount and as I mentioned, uh, it was a very fifty one Act, medical practitioners were disciplined uh, for the recovery of that amount of money. In 91-92, $55,000 was re recovered from four providers, four providers, Senator McKeonan, from the 36,000 doctors in Australia. Four were prosecuted and $55,000. It's, it is absolutely unbelievable. Now, it's unbelievable on two counts. Unbelievable that the current mechanisms, and I support the report in that regard, the current mechanisms are such that with that enormous expenditure of money, $4,600 million, you're able to recover $55,000. It's absurd. Because, and that was on over what is called excessive servicing. But let's look at fraud, deliberate attempts to steal. In seven years, as I, as I said, I estimated about $28,000 million was put out by Medicare, $5.6 million recovered. If you go to your calculator and take $5.6 million as a percentage of $28,000 million, you again come down to a 0 .00 something percent, an infinitesimal amount of money. In that period of time, 43 medical practitioners were prosecuted out of over 12,000 investigations. 12,000 investigations occurred and 43 were actually prosecuted out of the 36,000 doctors that exist in this country. It's absolutely absurd, absolutely. Now, I'm not saying that there are not people that are, that are committing fraud, nor that there are some that are excessively servicing, but it, 
uh, that excessive servicing, for instance, can be explained in some uh, cases by a, a simple example of a friend of mine and anaesthetist who was investigated by a medical services committee of inquiry because he was putting in three times the average intravenous drips into a patient and he was investigated. They then discovered that he was the chief anaesthetist of the Prince Charles Cardiac Hospital in Brisbane, uh, which required at least four drips to be put in, in any patient having either a coronary bypass operation or a heart transplant. But that explains some of those 12,000 investigations that didn't proceed. The mind boggles, actually, at how much money could have been spent, and this report doesn't allude to it, could have been spent on investigating those 43 uh, over seven years, 43 doctors over seven years, who uh, committed Medifraud. In 1991-92, as I mentioned, $4,600 million, $4, million was paid out in Medicare, and the recovery was $1 million out of that. Senator Panitza, that's 0.00002% of the total expenditure. Four providers were actually prosecuted. Four providers were actually prosecuted out of the 36,000 doctors in Australia. And of those four that were prosecuted, it's not mentioned in the report that only uh, at least one of them, for a significant sum of money, appealed to the High Court and the judgment was overturned, and he was paid out over $1 million, a pathologist. He was paid out over $1 million. I just bring these figures to your attention because they show that the, there is obviously, and I support the uh, audit office in this, uh, this degree, it demonstrates that there uh, is very little, or there is very little uh, uh, legislation that can deal with this problem. And it also shows that there are very few resources to deal with this problem. Now, what's the basic problem? How can this occur? Well, both Senator Knowles and Senator Patterson referred to it. The basis of it is that under Medicare, you give a blank check. You give people a card, they go to any doctor, and they zip it through a machine and they sign it. And there is no check on it. There is no co-payment by the doctor. If Senator Ray had to put his hand in his pocket and pay out some money for a service, he would say, what am I getting for this service? Why am I spending this money? What, do I, why, why, what am I getting for it? And he, he would uh, then say, say, I want to get my money's worth out of this. But under Medicare, he can go, he can sign a blank check. He needn't even know what's put on that blank check. And it costs him nothing. So Senator Ray says to himself, this is magic. It's cost me zilch. I've got the service, I've got the pathology test done, isn't that great? Not appreciating, not appreciating that the taxpayer is picking it up at the other end and it gives the potential for fraud. Now, in this report, there are four case studies, and I draw your attention to it, Mr Vice President, the case studies. Tattoo removal. Tattoo removal where tattoos were removed by laser, and in this, in, in this, this doctor actually advertised the removal of tattoos at no cost to the patient by direct billing of Medicare for their, for their removal. What uh, he did, in fact, was uh, do multiple removals over a long period of time, bulk billed Medicare, made a fortune out of it. The second case study is a public health CT scan, and I won't bore you with the details because they're in the report. But in this case, a man decided to make money by having CT scans, going to different doctors, giving false names, giving complaints, because he thought this was an absolute bonanza. He got $284 every time he had a CT scan. Case study three was double dipping, uh, where in relation to, in Adelaide, the Institute of Medical and Veterinary Science, a state-operated pathology laboratory, provides pathology to doctors and providers. The Commonwealth assists with funding of the institute. Uh, for the unethical pathologist, it's possible to have work undertaken by the Institute of Medical and Veterinary Science and then bill the patient Medicare, and that's in fact what happened under case three. And the final case was Cape Four, was where a grandmother nicknamed Granny Robin recently obtained nine, med nine Medicare cards and went around uh, claiming on with birth certificates of dead women. So once you've got bulk billing, 
it's, a, it's capable of exploitation. And the four examples that are used in that are an indictment of the Medicare system. Now, the department recognised that last year and wanted to bring in co-payment so that patients would be the, the, would be the people who would uh, put a break on this possibility. Now, all of the medic organised medical profession wants to prevent the very thing that's referred to in that. And I almost, like Senator Patterson, laughed when I saw that press release of the minister is going to appoint an eminent medical person to advise him. When the Senate Standing Committee on Community Services and, and Health investigated radiology, uh, the minister sent along his adviser on this to brief us on our report, which uh, we uh, believed was also an indictment on the department. The adviser didn't have any idea about radiology, was unable to tell us anything. The, the minister was not prepared himself to come along and brief us. Uh, so if uh, what uh, he's got in his press report is any indication, uh, I wish him well, because he's never done that before. He, he should involve the organised professions in advising him, because I'm sure they will. All of us on both sides of the parliament want to stamp out fraud. It, it has to be done. It, the mechanisms have to be given to the Health Insurance Commission, in particularly the neural, neural networking system of uh, computerisation, where they put in for $500,000 and they were given $237,000. When we're looking at a budget of $4,600 million, they must be given the resources to stamp this out. But basic to it is bulk billing. Until you get rid of bulk billing, you're going to have medi fraud and over servicing. The question is that the Senate take note of the report, those that have been say, oh, the country. No, I think the eyes have it. In accordance with the provisions of the Audit Act 1901, on behalf of the President, I present the following report of the Auditor General. Report number 18 of 1992-93, Efficiency Audit Department of Social Security Administration of Special Benefits. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I seek leave to move that the Senate take note of the Auditor General's report. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Patterson. Thank you very much. Honourable Senators will recall, I'm sure, every detail, but uh, we recall that the provision of special benefits under the under Social Security Act is intended to provide adequate income uh, for people in hardship who, 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 though, who, although unable to support themselves or their dependents, not otherwise entitled to a pension or allowance. A basic condition of the payment is that the claimant is in severe Hard, financial hardship, and uh, consideration is given to both the long-term and the short-term needs of the applicant when he or she is applying for the benefit. The rate of special benefit payable is discretionary, although it cannot exceed the rate of the job search allowance. In short, special benefits are intended as payments of last resort to help those in dire financial circumstances. During the financial year 1991-92, Special beneficiary numbers increased from 29,800 to 34,800, or by 17 per cent. Payment outlays rose from 261.7 million in 1990-91 to 304.1 million in 1992. The release of the Auditor General's report today by the Australian National Audit Office confirms that tighter administration of special benefit by the Department of Social Security and a more rigorous application of DSS guidelines could save up to seven million in annual benefit payments. Now, Senator Richardson, when he was Minister for Social Security, got up in this chamber over and over and over again, especially when Fight Back first came out, saying there was no more there were no more savings that could be made in Social Security. Everything was as tight as possible, and uh, we used the term taut and terrific, that it was you know, nothing could be done in Social Security to make savings. Well, here we've got, even in one small program, an estimated savings by the Auditor General of $7 million. The um, ANAO estimates, estimates that further savings may be achieved by revising DSS guidelines to make them more consistent with the underlying purpose, purposes of special benefits, namely to support only those individuals who are in immediate hardship and without any other available means of support for reasons beyond their control. 
The report also outlines that there were some inconsistencies in the in internal guidelines uh, for this pr uh, program. Now, we're all aware of the parlous state of the economy, the record 11.4 per cent unemployment and the hardship many in our community are suffering. And it's essential, absolutely essential, that the financial relief the government provides is well targeted and reaches most in need. It's very much like the last report we just debated in health, that the money is limited and it ought to be targeted or to make sure that we reach the right people rather than, in that case, uh, being uh, lost to fraud or, in this case, being lost because the program hasn't really been directed at those to whom the program is uh, targeted. It is apparent from today's report that, this is not, uh, that the targeting has not uh, been achieved. And I refer in particular to the uh, fact that it's found that the special benefit has been used to accommodate difficult or sensitive cases from mainstream social security programs. Some would be assisted more appropriately under such programs as job search allowance and disability support. The Auditor General has said that there are people who would fit much better under those programs, but uh, maybe because it's too hard or it's uh, easier to, to, to um, put them under special benefits, they've been slotted into that category. Amongst the key recommendations the ANO has made is that the Social Security Act and supporting guidelines need to be reviewed and strengthened to make them more consistent with the underlying purposes of special benefit, but not to disadvantage the truly needy, and that more gu guidelines and support should be given to regional office staff in the exercise of their discretionary powers under this legislation. Now, while the DSS has recognised problems in the administration of the special benefit for some time and has, in the 1992-93 budget, introduced measures that are expected to tighten the administration of the special benefit, which is expected to save $3.7 in a full year, I am disappointed in its response to this report. The Department has only agreed to or partly agreed with 12 of the 22 uh, ANAO recommendations. In addition, the DSSS has not agreed with the uh, ANAO's savings estimate and has further indicated that it believes that the guidelines are matters for government consideration only. I believe this is a, just a shallow response. I would like to put on, my rec on the record my extreme disappointment at the blinkered view of the Department in refusing to take on board many of the recommendations made by the Australian Audit Office. The question is that the report be noted. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no, I think the ayes have it. On behalf of the President, in accordance with the provisions of Audit Act 1901, I present the following report of the Auditor General. Report number 19 of 1992-93, Project Audits, Department of Immigration, Local Government and Ethnic Affairs, Adult Migrant English Program and other audits. Senator Noel. May the Senate take note and seek leave to continue my remarks at a later hour. Question that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. We have the President, in accordance with the provisions of the Audit Act 1901, I present the following report of the Auditor General. Report number 20 of 1992-93, Project Audit, Department of Employment, Education and Training, Administration of the OS Study Program, Turnaround Times, Postpayment Verification and <coughs> Debt Recovery. Senator Bone. Thank you, President. I seek leave to move a motion in respect to the report. Leave granted. No opposition. Leave uh, granted. Mr Eckenberry, President, I move the Senate take note of the report and I uh, uh, seek leave to continue my remarks at a later hour this day. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Behalf of the President, in accordance with the provisions of the Audit Act 1901, I present the following report of the Auditor General. Report number 21 of 1992-93, Project Audits, Department of Employment, Education and Training, Industry Service Centres, Special Entry Level Training, Subsidised Private Overseas Students, Revenue Collection, Advances and Trust Accounts. Senator Bunn. I seek leave to move a motion in respect to this report. Is leave granted? No objection. Leave it granted. Deputy President, I move the Senate take note of the report and I seek leave to continue my remarks at a later hour of the state. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. <coughs> Half of the President, in accordance with the provisions of the Audit Act 1901, I present the following report of the Auditor General. Report number 22 of 1992-93, Efficiency Audits, Department of Defence, New Submarine Project. 
Senator the President, I seek leave to move the motion in respect of this report. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Directing every President, I move the Senate take note of the report and I seek leave to continue my remarks at a later hour of this date. Is leave, leave granted? Leave is not granted. No, 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 not that I know. Yeah, I just wanted to do it after you got your legislation. That was all. Is leave, is leave granted? I need some guidance. Order. Order. Senator Barr. Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, this report is uh, by the Auditor General uh, on the Department of Defence new submarine project relates to, to the project to build new Collins class submarines in Australia uh, and is of significance to the defence of Australia, according to the Auditor General, because it represents an important commitment of expenditure of five billion in April 1992 prices. The contract for the submarines includes necessary performance standards and the project offices in the process of ensuring proper testing against these standards. The project office is also taking reasonable steps to ensure the submarines will meet quality requirements. The audit office is concerned, however, about the financial management of the project and the achievement of the contracted delivery schedule. As the Senate will be aware, uh, senators from New South Wales have expressed concern initially about the failure of uh, of appropriate uh, volumes of this contract uh, to come to New South Wales. Therefore, it's quite disappointing to find uh, that the main findings of this audit uh, are, are these, that the contract does not adequately protect the Commonwealth against loss, that the Commonwealth has advanced funds, initially $120 million to the contractor without adequate information about the need for those funds. In its dealings with the contractor, the project office has frequently taken a position which would be more appropriate if it were dealing with a fellow government entity rather than a commercial organisation with a primary responsibility to its shareholders. The project office has not given sufficient weight to the importance of the timing of the payments, and the project office's assertion that the project is on schedule is not supported by the data that can be obtained from the contract monitoring and control system and the audit office believes the slippage which is evident within the schedule will be difficult to recover prior to the launch and commissioning dates for the first submarine, and the contract amendment procedures may have resulted in excessive prices being charged by the contractor. Uh, the report indicates that the audit office has made a number of recommendations primarily intended to ensure that future contracts overcome the problems identified. Now, the Department of Defence does contest a number of the audit office findings, but agrees in principle with 15 uh, of the 30 recommendations in the report. But in particular, and very briefly, I just want to mention uh, a couple of other uh, points made by the Auditor General. And this particular uh, conclusion about the risk of loss of funds is that the protection provided by the contract is insufficient relative to the losses that may be sustained by the Commonwealth in the event of failure or default by the contractor. And it makes the point that the contract does not prevent the repatriation of dividends to shareholders prior to the major risks of the contract being overcome. Sufficient dividends, uh, sorry, significant dividends and management salaries paid since the commencement of the contract mean that in the event of the con of contractor default, the total value of assets that can be obtained from the contractor are less than the value paid by the Commonwealth to that time, and the contract specifically prevents recourse by the Commonwealth to the contractor's share in relation to any deficit. Uh, it also uh, makes a point about financial risk without an appropriate return, because it's, uh, the Auditor General says substantial funds have been advanced to the contractor without sufficient certainty that this action is in the Commonwealth's interests. Uh, and it makes the, the point I won't uh, read too much of it. No doubt that the Minister will want to respond. The advance of funds in this case was based only on the Auditor General describes as a belief. The contractor did not provide budgeted cash flow statements or profit and loss statements to allow the Commonwealth or its consultants to verify the amount required. 
I might say this relates to uh, um, considerable amounts of money because the Commonwealth, the, the contract provides for the Commonwealth to pay uh, ASC claims on a 30-day basis related to actual progress. The average monthly claim made by ASC to 30th of June 1991 was 37 million dollars. The ASC earned nine million dollars in interest in 1987-88, which would indicate uh, as an average investment of about 80 million dollars. So obviously, providing upfront funding, which was not needed, obviously not needed by ASC because it was put, on, put in the bank to earn interest, irrespective of reasons for such funding has provided with the company with a means of making significant returns to shareholders before any major risk area has been overcome. And as the Auditor General concludes, the contractor earned $9 million in interest in the, its first year of operation and $77 million in interest in its four years of operation. This is not indicative of a slightly positive cash flow of Commonwealth money. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I uh, commend the Auditor General's uh, report. I haven't dealt with it uh, at, at great length because we have uh, pressures of legislation, uh, but I do ask that uh, the uh, Department of Defence perhaps may, uh, may consider that uh, more than just 15 of the 30 recommendations uh, merit uh, serious attention. Senator McGibbon. Mr Deputy President, I'd like to speak also on the Auditor General audit report which is an efficiency audit <coughs> into the Department of Defence new submarine program. It is terribly important for public life in Australia that there is an independent auditor. Here, here. The parliament raises taxes, which is never a pleasant obligation on the members of this parliament. And uh, the payment of taxes, despite the legislative backing for it, is largely voluntary. It depends on the goodwill of the community to pay them. Now, there's a contrary side to that, and that is that it puts an obligation on the parliament to account very clearly for the way it spends that money. And uh, one of the ways of reassuring the public that the money has been spent properly and uh, honestly is by having an independent auditor. We've seen in the last 48 hours the great problems the Civil Aviation Authority got into because it didn't recognise. Order. That's a very good point, and that's a point. I'm glad you raised that, uh, Senator, because instead of messing around with, with this sort of nonsensical efficiency auditor, audit, if the Auditor General had got into the Civil Aviation Authority on the expenditure and the loss, I would argue, of several hundred million dollars through maladministration cumulatively over the years, we'd all be better off. So it is important that we have an independent auditor, Mr Deputy Chairman, and it is important that that auditor is not a, an instrument of the executive government. It is important that the auditor is answerable to the parliament. And his purpose ought to be to prevent fraud, theft and other malpractices in a financial arena in relation to the expenditure of public funds. But in recent times, the Auditor General, for reasons that I don't follow, has gone into this concept of efficiency audits. And it may well be possible to run an efficiency audit if you've got a chain of fish shops or hardware stores or something like that where you've got volume sales and you've got some pattern by which you can assess efficiency. But when it's applied to the Department of Defence, which by any standards is a notoriously uncommercial body where you have to have reserve capacity where you have to provide for unforeseen contingencies, where it becomes increasingly difficult to buy missiles and equipment uh, other than being part of a block purpose that you have purchased that you hold for years, the efficiency audit is really quite nonsensical. And I've said on many occasions when they've come up with these efficiency audits that the Auditor General ought to back off from the efficiency audit. By all means go into defence and assure everyone that the money has been properly spent. But let's keep away from uh, the efficiency side of it, which the, the Auditor General simply has no methodology that is competent to assess the situation. Now, we've seen in recent years glaring examples of the inadequacy of an efficiency audit. We had the, uh, a recent audit on training areas. Now, the Department of Defence probably 10 or 12 years ago, for a very low price, bought a very large area of land at Yampi Sound as a training area. That was bought for the next 100 years. The Auditor General got very indignant about the fact that 
600 or uh, 1.2 million, I forget what it was, the figures are relevant, it was a relatively low sum, has never been used. No one's ever been on the land. Totally incapable of understanding that it's for the future. And of course, his report on the ADF reserves was absolutely legendary for the misdirections and the uh, false conclusions that it accepted. Now, I come back to the important point, and that is that the auditor has to be seen to be independent and objective. And my great fear is that the auditor is debasing his reputation by getting into quite nonsensical areas. Now, dealing with the report that's before us, most of the report, as it seems to me, deals with the contract that was set up between the government and the Australian Submarine Corporation. And I have very great difficulty in agreeing anything that the auditor says about that. Now, it is a matter of public record that the Australian Submarine Corporation, based in Adelaide, was set up as a pork-barrelling political exercise by Mr Beasley, not Senator Ray. But put that, put that one to one side because I don't Order. wish to embarrass Senator Schott. Order, Senator Schott. The fact remains Order. that a legally binding contract was drawn up between the Commonwealth and the Australian Submarine Corporation. And while it might be of interest for the uh, Auditor General or any other element of the Department of Finance to look at the terms of the contract with the benefit of hindsight and see how it could be uh, improved in the future, the fact is that it was a contract that was freely entered into between the ASC and the Commonwealth. And if the Commonwealth is now being taken down in the eyes of the Auditor-General because he thinks the payments are extravagant, I'm afraid that's just too bad. Let the Commonwealth Government, which is the present government in power, wear the blame for writing an ill-advised contract. It is not fair, as I think the Auditor-General tries to do, to hang the blame for the contract on the uh, Australian Submarine Corporation. But in conclusion, I come back to the point that I started on. The Auditor-General ought to back off from efficiency audits. If he persists with this path, he will debase the high prestige that his uh, organisation has because he's applying methodology which is totally inappropriate to a department like the Department of Defence and its contractors. Question is, Minister. Mr Acting Deputy President, it's the first time I've ever bothered to come into the chamber to discuss an Auditor General's report. I normally follow due process and draw up a response, as I must, send it to the Minister for Finance and implement the necessary adjustments recommended by the Auditor. I was somewhat disappointed to know that this report had been leaked at least to one member of the Opposition some weeks ago. and I think that's disappointing from my point of view because it leaves me in a poor position. You can imagine how much more seriously I viewed the fact that the Auditor-General's press release on this was issued yesterday, before it was tabled in this chamber or in the other chamber. Uh, inquiries uh, were then instituted as to why this occurred. And, uh, the claim was made back to us. Unfortunately, uh, Minister, the press release was accidentally issued. Now, this is a sign to me that the Auditor General either doesn't respect his responsibility to report to this parliament before he reports to the press, or that we have a fairly unprofessional organisation in some aspects. Either way, I think it raises serious questions about the management of the Australian Audit Office. I'm then contacted today to be told that the Auditor-General plans to have a background briefing for the press tomorrow on this particular report. Now, I, don't know where, I don't know the ethics of that, but I do know that I don't like public servants having background briefings. I also wondered uh, and had some doubts when I was contacted or the department was contacted for an efficiency audit on the purchase of the additional up to 18 F-111s before I'd even sent the negotiating team to Washington. And I wish here tonight to acknowledge some of the criticisms of the Auditor General, but also I think I might be contesting some of, the, these, some of these claims tonight to give the Senate a more balanced view. I want to first of all look at the audit methodology. Now, in looking at the report, I must first say that I appreciate the difficulties that the Audit Office has in conducting a review of such a very large and complex project. But the Audit Office's timetable in issuing this report today was self-imposed. 
My department has strongly advised the audit office that more time be given to discuss all the issues involved in this report. Brief discussion in recent weeks has led to a substantial modification of the auditor's original stance. No doubt, further careful examination would lead to a significant shift in their position. I want to give one indication of that. You will notice uh, there is the issue, and I think uh, Senator Bone touched on it. There was an issue uh, here, was on the, in, a, in a range of issues, there was mention made that in the, uh, there was a $5 billion contract with a $10 million original uh, of private investment, and that this particular matter was serious. In discussions with my department, it was agreed to take that matter out of the executive summary because it was uncertain and simply leave it in the body of the report. That was agreed. That's the way it is in the report. What's the first major issue? The first major issue in the Auditor General's press release touches on that very point to be highlighted. The thing that agreed between my department and the Auditor General was uncertain, taken out of the executive summary, but put up front in that press release that was issued yesterday. I'm most unhappy about that particular uh, effort. Now, uh, the facts are that the audit office frankly lacks the technical expertise to address the biggest risks in this particular project, and that's the engineering and the software aspects. And it lacks the commercial experience to fully appreciate the practical realities of a fixed price contract, one under fierce competition. Now, in the rush to get this report tabled, the audit uh, office did not accept my department's request for its response to be fully self-contained. In other words, you have the auditor's views. We put our views back. What happens? Our views aren't put up front, back or anywhere. They're cut and paste and distributed through with full editorial, uh, full editorial rights to, uh, to the Auditor General. Now, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, do you mind? Order. Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, I will tonight table the response of the Defence Department in its, in its comprehensive and completeness. So at least senators can read it and see what our overall response is, argued in a logical way, rather than cut and paste through the report. So I table that. Um, well, I haven't had an incorporate, incorporate, I haven't been able to clear that with you, Senator. But could I uh, assure you there is no defamation in it, and seek leave to incorporate our full response? Is leave granted? There being no objection, leaves granted. I'm most grateful to the Senate and to the Senators that have allowed me to follow that course in corporate. Thank you. Now, as I say, I think that, that and I won't repeat all that, what's in that, does address some of the issues here. Now, the Audit Office has also raised many new points in comments on the Department's response, which have not been discussed at all with the Department. Again, I think that's poor methodology. And uh, I think at least I'm pleased to see that uh, the report is in printed form because the original intention was simply to table a photocopy. Now, I have to say that the submarine project is a complex project, both in technical and commercial terms. I appreciate that auditors who have never seen a submarine or been associated with a project management would have some difficulty in coming to grips with the issues. The Audit Office has actually done a good job considering its lack of experience and expertise on these projects, but it would have been better for the Audit Office to have taken more time to be educated on these matters. Let me move to the question of the overall judgment of the project. The report concentrates on certain financial aspects and strikingly avoids any overall balanced judgment of the project. The project was always a high-risk one and openly entered into by the government with that knowledge. The biggest risk was always known to be in the technical engineering areas. Indeed, it is the technical risk which generates most of the schedule and cost risks. Lost in the audit office reports is the significance of its implicit finding that the technical aspects of the project have been well managed by the project office. It's extraordinary that in an audit of five billion project, whose risks are primar pri primarily technology driven, should be so superficial about this issue. It's not, just this, it's not just that this side of the project has been handled well, and that credit should be given where credit's due. This still remains, and always would remain, the biggest area of risk, and the failure of the audit team to consider how much risk remains and whether it is being rigorously and sensibly pursued 
in my view, is a culpable offence. The department's review, backing the project office and the Australian Submarine Corporation, is this, and this is the key part of what I have to say tonight. The submarine is on time, it's on budget, and it's with an enhanced performance. And that's the essence of what a fixed price contract's about. It seems to me that what the auditor is yearning back for is a cost plus contract, which have proved to be disastrous in the past. Now the auditor, of course, and the audit doesn't directly dispute that contention I've just put down, that it's on price, on cost, with enhanced quality. Uh, it does. It sort of says, look, we're a bit unsure about whether it's on, on schedule. But it can't really argue one way or the other. It does not suggest that the project is at serious risk of going beyond its budget, but suggests a new performance measure because commercial project management would not be satisfied with completing a major project within a fairly generous budget. Noting, of course, that the budget reflects the Australian Submarine Corporation's fixed price was developed in a strong competition. Now, I don't believe that's a balanced judgment. No one in defence is saying the project has no risk, nor is anyone suggesting defence should not pursue the best possible financial and performance result. But surely we can expect a major audit to give us a serious judgment on how the project's going on schedule, cost and performance, and if it's in line with the original bu budget estimate and performance requirements. But if it, that's the case, the report should have said so. Let's move on to some of the key criticisms. Many of the Auditor, Auditor General's comments are made with the benefit of 2020 hindsight. Now, there's no recognition that the contract was won after fierce competition. The alternative tenderer sought nearly double the upfront funding to ASC. The upfront funding to ASC was negotiated downwards from its winning bid before the contract was signed. The government, through the contract, was establishing a new consortium and a new industry. The contract was only signed after the most exhaustive process, which included defence committees, the Department of Finance and the Attorney-General's Department. The Audit Office suggests that somehow, somehow in a fixed-price contract, the government should monitor in detail a contractor's cash flow and should claim backup, backup uh, front funds not directly required. We can certainly look at that in future, I have to say. But let us not pretend that such an arrangement will not affect the contract price or the sharing of risks between the Commonwealth and the contractor. The issues are not simple, and I'm concerned that the Audit Office comments do not reflect commercial experience. Now, the Audit Office also expresses concern <coughs> about Australian Submarine Corporation's dividend payments. And in a graph on page 10 highlights the company's profits and dividends compared to the shareholders' <coughs> assets. Now, I have to stress that this is a $5 billion project in an industry effectively created by the Commonwealth. To suggest that the contractor's risk is merely the shareholders' capital of $10 million and that the profits ought only to relate to that is just plain silly. The more important question is whether the dividend payments increase the Commonwealth's risk to any significant degree. The fact is, with the advice of the Department of Finance and Attorney Generals, the Department has a substantial financial guarantee. If the contract circums circumscribed dividend payments, presumably there would have to be some contract cost involved. The real issue is whether the overall array of financial guarantees, mortgaging and vesting, provides sufficient insurance for the Commonwealth. Unfortunately, that issue was not adequately discussed because of the Audit Office's self-imposed deadline. The Audit Office comments on the Department's response has not been seen before, but the Department's position has the support of the Attorney-General's Department. The other major criticism concerns contract amendments and the claim that the Commonwealth has paid more than it should. I don't intend to go into all the details here. That is a matter for the Department to handle in due course. But it is clear that the rights and wrongs in this area are heavily dependent on technical considerations, which the Audit Office does not appear to be in a strong position to judge. I am also concerned that the Audit Office does not appear to appreciate some of the commercial as aspects of this area. There is a suggestion that somehow contract amendments can be negotiated by the Commonwealth from a position of strength and that greater use should be made of cost-based funding arrangements. 
Now, the issues here are complex, but I'm concerned that the audit officer's proposals could in fact add to the Commonwealth's costs and risks and remove the benefits of a fixed price contract. Again, time has not allowed the audit office and the department to sensibly discuss these issues. The audit office also raises concerns over opportunity costs. There is no evidence here that the problem is a significant one for the submarine project, and there is no appreciation of the consequences of pursuing opportunity costs in a fixed price contract, such as might arise from the Commonwealth telling a contractor how to schedule and manage detailed work packages. Now, having said all that, I'm not trying to cover up the fact that there have been some mistakes made with the project. It would be unrealistic to expect nothing to go wrong in a $5 billion project. My firm view is that the department has come a long way in its project management capacity in the last decade, and the sub submarine project is a considerable advance on the past and, might I say, a considerable advance in any comparable project being built overseas. This report has made a number of very worthy recommendations, which I have asked my department to look at closely and which will improve the management of the project. Might I say in this, though, Mr Deputy, Acting Deputy President, there is another area in this, and that is the Australian Submarine Corporation itself, who the auditor did not talk to, yet it has taken some big hits in his report, so much so that it may well dent their credibility in trying to market the submarine overseas. So I'd very briefly like to put on the record uh, some of the views from the Australian Submarine Corporation and then seek, in due course, permission to incorporate their press release. But Mr Don Williams, the managing director of the Australian Submarine Corporation, has expressed his concern about the report, particularly at suggestions that his company is intent only on short-term gain at the expense of the Commonwealth. Dr Williams has stated publicly that Australian Submarine Corporation's first objectives are to deliver a quality product and to achieve budget profit margins and that the ASC does not see itself as a single contract company. Now, I can certainly believe him in this because I've seen him make investments in South Australia and in Newcastle and explore possibilities at the moment in Western Australia. Dr Williams has also stated that the audit office fails to appreciate the commercial reality of staying in business based on quality and integrity. In other words, Mr. what uh, Dr Williams is saying is they're not going to have their reputation besmirched by poor quality work, cost overruns, etc., when they intend to stay in the shipbuilding and associated industry into the, into the long and distant future. I also know that his view that the overall management of this project by the Department and the Navy has been a remarkable achievement in the face of substantial risk and a wide range of uh, knockers. Now, uh, Mr Deputy President, I, uh, as I said at the opening, <coughs> I did feel, because of the nature of this particular report, I needed to put some of the counterclaims on the record. I'm deeply appreciative of the fact that the Senate has seen fit to incorporate the Defence Department's response. And I would also seek leave, and I think I, I did clear this through Senator Bohm, that the press release issued by the Australian Submarine Corporation uh, be incorporated in Hansard to put their views down. Leave granted. No, I guess leave is granted. So we'll the question is that the Senator I, I move that the debate be adjourned. The question is that the debate be adjourned. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Acting Deputy Minister. President, I seek leave to make a brief statement on uh, business of the Senate. Leave granted. No objection. Leave is granted. Thank you, uh, Mr. Long. Acting Deputy President. And I, uh, there have been discussions between uh, Senator Hill and myself and advice to. Uh, the minor parties and independents. I hope the message has got to everybody. We've certainly been trying to do so about a proposal to change the order of business for the remainder of the evening to, I think, suit everybody's convenience. I do understand that uh, there are some members of the opposition who have an interest in going to a meeting that might be being conducted in the not too distant future, and they would like to organise the business to facilitate uh, that. Can I call quorums? <laughs> But it is very, very much in the government's interest as well to proceed in this way because it may, what we are proposing to do is move more expeditiously to government business and legislation. The downside is, I accept that it's possible, it reduces some of the time pressure on people speaking on reports because there isn't the pressure of subsequent business. But 
it may be the pressure of the hour and their colleagues' ire will compensate. But anyway, I think it's in everyone's interest. So let me outline what it is we are proposing to do. And I understand we have the concurrence of all senators. We are not proposing to present to table at this stage any more of the any of those committee reports. They will still be on the notice paper. They will still be tabled later this evening, but not now. Uh, we will proceed directly to government business, subject to two matters. One is a privileges report to be presented by Senator Teague, which he assures me will be very brief, and some messages to come in from the House of Representatives. Just to assure those concerned, those messages will not include at this stage the migration bill, which we will do a few minutes subsequently. And also to clarify for people who are trying to time their arrival here, the first item of government business will be finalising the seafarers' legislation, and we will then proceed to deal with the migration package following the presentation of the message from the House. I thank the senators for their cooperation in proceeding in that manner. Clark. 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 With list circulated to honourable senators. Senator Teague. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I present the 40th report. Uh, of the Committee of Privileges, entitled Persons Referred to in the Senate, Ms Margaret Piper, Ms Eve Lester and Mr Seth Richardson, and move that the report be printed. The, the question is that motion be agreed to. Those other opinions say aye. Those against, I think the ayes have it. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion in relation to the report. Is leave granted? No objection, leave is so granted. Senator Teague. I move that the report be adopted. Question is the report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Senator, Senator Teague. Oh, after you, Bob. Your, 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 your motion. Senator, minute, uh, Secretary. Senator McMullen. Uh, I move that intervening business uh, be pers On the matter of the privilege report, could I move that the uh, debate be adjourned and I seek leave to continue my, my remarks at a later hour this day. You can move to take note and seek leave to continue your remarks. I would move to take note and seek leave to continue my remarks at a later hour. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. Leave is not granted. Can I speak to the report now, Mr. Acting Deputy President? Obviously, the, you call the Senate to take note, and you can therefore automatically speak. Mr. Acting Deputy President, I haven't had an opportunity to read this report, which has just been tabled, but I am aware that I have got an honourable mention in the report. I think it uh, obviously I would have liked the opportunity to have had some time to discuss this, uh, to read it, to analyse what the contents of the report is and what the assertions that are made uh, where I am named. But unfortunately, the, uh, the festive season and the season of cooperation hasn't got to one of my senatorial colleagues, and uh, I've been refused that opportunity that opportunity, um, I uh, made some comments in this chamber some weeks ago when the, a matter of uh, migration was being discussed and I drew attention to a set of witnesses that had appeared before the uh, committee. I made the remark that in my opinion, and it was an opinion shared by a number of members of the Joint Standing Committee on Migration Regulations, that this was the poorest set of uh, witnesses that had ever appeared before any parliamentary committee that I had attended. It was like, truly like extracting teeth in getting any information out from them. Even when, you asked, when one asked direct questions, it was uh, extremely difficult to get a direct answer and the people weaved they were all around the place. I made the comment in one particular instance where I said I also doubt very much whether they are getting the proper legal service 
the, that they should be getting. I was referring, of course, to the, uh, the asylum seekers that are held at various detention centres around Australia. I repeated those views here in this place very early on Tuesday morning and probably will repeat those views for a third time in a later debate in this place on the same subject matter. I am, uh, one of my colleagues might refer to the other colleagues might refer to the fact that we do have a number of people who uh, suck on the public tit and ex exist by doing that. It uh, probably is a very appropriate remark to make in these circumstances. Now, it is, I don't want to delay the, uh, the processes of the Chamber. I will study this document and I will respond to what the committee have got, uh, what references the committee have uh, made in the document. I, uh, the procedure now, Mr. Acting Deputy President, I, is I seek to leave to continue my remarks, or is? Well, leave's already been refused, but you can do so again. But I, I believe Senator Panizza wants to speak. To you. No, right. Yeah, okay, seek leave. I seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? No, I'm speaking on the matter. Oh, sorry, Senator Harry. Um, Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, Mr. President, uh, uh, Acting Deputy President, um, Senator McKeonan has just repeated some of the outrageous comments that he's made previously, which influenced the, the person so maligned uh, to make uh, a statement to the President of the Senate pursuant. Uh, to the uh, resolution of the Senate. He has made an assertion, a complete, uh, a, an assertion again, uh, that um, uh, the uh, witnesses um, earned the accolade of being perhaps the worst set of witnesses that have ever appeared before a parliamentary inquiry. They did not uh, want to answer any questions. We did not get direct answers to our questions. And he said that that was shared by a number of persons well, I, on the committee. Well, I'd like to know who the other members of the committee were, because none of those members have raised that matter, so far as I am aware, in the parliament or outside of the parliament. And indeed, uh, if um, uh, this is a very short report of the Privileges Committee, and indeed the comments that uh, the response that is made by the people that are maligned. The state says these comments, that is the comments by Senator McKeonan, imply that in our evidence the Joint Standing Committee on Migration Regulations, we were being purposely evasive and trying to disguise the truth. We attempted to answer as accurately as possible and to the best of our knowledge uh, the, um, uh, the questions that were put to us. There were times, however, uh, that their questions appear to us to be vague or misdirected. And Mr Acting Deputy President, if you have a look at the transcript, as I have, you will see uh, that there uh, was some uh, that, that, that the basis on which um, Senator McKeonan uh, made his unfounded accusations um, uh, was um, uh, was in uh, paragraph 6 of the document before us, um, where it says, um, se uh, where it repeats uh, Senator McKeonan's statement. We asked direct questions of Mr Richardson and Ms Piper in this committee to ascertain how much they were getting out of the public purse, etc. etc. Um, the initial answer to our question on the matter of funding was that it was $55,000. Through persistent further questioning, we got agreement that the funding was in the region of a half million dollars. And this is the response that the people who were maligned have made. The answer, 55,000 uh, bracket plus 30,000, was the correct answer to the question asked. That is, the amount of money received by RACs. Our attempts to explain the difference between the funding allocation to RACs and uh, RCOA, the Refugee Council of Australia, were interrupted by further questions. It was never our intention to disguise the figures, and, we in, and in fact we had brought the figures to the inquiry 
as evidenced by their presentation in case we were asked to them. Now, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, these people, many of whom have, um, uh, have um, uh, dedicated themselves uh, to the um, uh, rule of law in this particular area, have been unjustly uh, maligned by Senator McKinnon under parliamentary privilege. And I ask Senator McKinnon if he's got the guts to get outside and uh, to go outside and and uh, and make the same statements about these people as he has done within this chamber. But he won't do that. He won't do that. Order. He won't do that. And uh, if you if you in a matter of such important which Im impugns Order. impugns Order, the Senator integrity, McKinney. Mr. Acting Deputy President which impugns the integrity of uh, these people, including questioning uh, their um, uh, legal professionalism, uh, it is a disgrace. In fact, um, the, the, um, uh, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Yes. These people uh, have been involved in uh, cases which have in fact been successful before the courts. And it's taken legislation of this parliament produced by the government to overturn those, uh, those decisions of the, uh, of the courts. And without, um, and it, it wouldn't be appropriate, Mr Acting Deputy uh, President, uh, to, um, uh, to um, uh, anticipate debate but we are going to deal with another one of those uh, this uh, tonight. That is to say, another attempt by the government to uh, circumvent a decision of the High Court, uh, uh, which uh, the lawyers uh, for the um, applicants for refugee status uh, uh, have been successful. The question is, if the report be noted. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Mr. Acting Deputy Minister. President, I move that intervening business be postponed till after consideration of general business orders of the day relating to committee reports numbers 5 and 11, committee of privilege report number 36 and 37, respectively. I move it in the fond hope that, with the cooperation of my friends Senators McKeon and Harry, we might do these two a little more quickly than the last one. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Mr Senator Acting Deputy Chief. President, on behalf of the Committee of Privileges, I wish to thank Senators for their cooperation in bringing on these two reports. The Committee was concerned to ensure that the conclusions in the reports were endorsed by the Senate so that the outstanding matters could be resolved. Clark. The reports, Committee of Privileges 36 report adjourned debate on the motion to endorse the findings and adopt the recommendations. Which is motion. Motion. But the question is that motion be agreed to? Uh, all those that opinion say aye, those against no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Order of the day relating to committee reports number 11, Privileges 37th report uh, adjourned debate on the motion that the Senate endorse the findings contained in the report. <laughs> The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes? Yeah, the ayes have it. Yeah. Clark. On behalf of the President, a message being received from the House of Representatives acquainting the Senate that the House of Representatives have agreed to the Territories Legislation Amendment Bill 1992 without amendment. Clark. Another message on behalf of the President. Messages have been received from the House of Representatives acquainting the Senate that the House of Representatives have agreed to the amendments made by the Senate in the following bills. Taxation Laws Amendment, Fringe Benefits Tax Measures Bill 1992, Taxation Laws Amendment Superannuation Bill 1992, Taxation Laws Amendment Bill No. 6 1992, National Health and Medical Research Council Bill 1992, Health Insurance Quality Assurance Confidentiality Amendment Bill 1992 and Medicare Agreements Bill 1992. The following message has been received from the House of Representatives. Minister. 
The House of Representatives returns to the Senate the bill entitled a bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and acquaints the Senate the House of Representatives have agreed to amend number two, amendment number two made by the Senate and has disagreed to amendment number one set forth in the annex schedule and for the reasons shown therein. The House of Representatives desires the reconsideration of the Senate by the bill in respect of the amendment disagreed to. Minister. Mr Acting Deputy President, I move that consideration of the message in committee of the whole be an order of the day for a later hour of the day. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no, I think the ayes have it. Clark. Government business order of the day, Seafarers Rehabilitation and Compensation Bill 1992 and three associated bills in committee. Minister. Committee. And the committee last met at quarter to one this morning uh, today. With the Seafarers Rehabilitation and Compensation Bill 1992 and the amendment by moved thereto by Senator Panizza. The question is the. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman? Yes. Mr. Uh, the Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's an accurate description of where we'd reached. It uh, lacks some of the pageantry of what we were doing. The, uh, we were, with the, were within nanoseconds of concluding a hands across the chamber agreement, I think. The uh, synopsis is that uh, Senator Panizza had moved a motion, Senator Bell had supported it, I'd poked a few holes in it, and we'd agreed to resolve the difference, and then we adjourned. Uh, in the interim, we've resolved, we've resolved the difference, I think. And uh, any one of us, Senator Panizza, Senator Bell, or I, could, uh, could be the ones that actually moved the outcome. Uh, but it, since it's what is formally before you is Senator Panitza's uh, motion. It seems to fall to me to uh, move it, and I uh, don't in any way sh uh, shirk from that. There is a, uh, a further amendment now circulating in my name, uh, and uh, in two parts. And uh, the first part, as I recall, part one, copies effectively the words in Senator Panitza's amendment. And in the second part, the difference is that there is a one capital A, which, uh, rather than naming employer organisations, substitutes the word such organisations which represent employers or employees, as the minister thinks appropriate. I trust, if I might interpolate at this point, the minister thinks always that the appropriate ones are the representative ones and, and uh, not some others. And uh, 1B, which uh, provides that uh, a failure to consult as required by subsection 1A does not affect the validity of a regulation That'll prescribing an amount for the purposes of this mm -hmm. section. Uh, I move uh, that amendment, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Senator um, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator uh, uh, for that to happen, you will have to withdraw your amendment. I leave, and then the minister will have to move his. Uh, if that's satisfactory to you. Yes. Okay. Well, at this stage, I withdraw my amendment. Sleep granted. Uh, leave is granted. Now, if I can, Mr. Chairman, if I can now speak on the amendment moved by Chief the minister, because I thought the right. minister's amendment was amen uh, well, was amending my amendment actually. Well, I'll get Senator Cook to formally move it, and then you can speak to it. Senator Cook. Move. Right. So now, I'm speaking Senator to the Minister. amendment. Uh, moved uh, by uh, Senator Cook. Uh, I, uh, the coalition did believe in the first place that uh, the amendment as we had and agreed to by the Democrats uh, covered the situation. And I do believe that uh, this new amendment, amendment to our amendment, has made it rather co unnecessarily complicated. Because we're, I believe, or we believe that the minister ha has got a regulatory uh, sort of function in the situation. 
the employers have a commercial responsibility. There's a responsibility to have the money there if uh, certain events do happen, and the employees were the beneficiaries. In fact, as Martin Byrne at the hearing the other night didn't seem to play, play, place much importance, well, he didn't say much about about this situation that uh, we uh, had flagged our amendment to him. And, uh, as I said, he said very little, so I presume that he accepted that uh, as long as the money was there, everything was okay. Because I believe what we are talking is a simply a matter of mechanics. Uh, it seems to have been well established in all the discussions that the money is going to be there. We are taking out that $1 million and replacing it with the prescribed. So I thought that we could have, because the minister, whether, whether employee E's are included, or in, and in fact, if whether the employer organisations are included, the minister can consult with who he likes, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that he certainly consults with his department and others outside of the department who think so necessary. And I believe that he could have consulted without this amendment uh, with anyone, employees especially, without uh, amending my amendment. But, ha however, as we have come to an agreement, uh, Mr. Chairman in a round-table discussion before coming back into this chamber. And, of course, within the spirit of Christmas, uh, I, uh, on behalf of the coalition, we do accept uh, the minister's amendment. And because well, that's one thing we have got to do, this uh, old act was, uh, has been around since 1911, so it's 81 years in existence. And I think it's, it is time that it, it was brought up to scratch and brought up to scratch uh, sooner than later. So the coalition will accept the minister's amendment. Senator Bell. Uh, Mr Chairman, without adding to the ceremony at all, the Democrats agree with the amendment proposed by the minister. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is the remaining bills... Oh, is it the... Bill quick, quick? Bill the question is that the bill is amended to be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Contrary, no, I think you always have it. Is the wish of the committee that the remaining bills be taken together? Is the wish of the committee that the bills be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that bills uh, be passed without amendment or request. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no, I think you always have it. The question is that the bills be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no, I think the eyes have it. Order. The Chairman of Committee, Senator Colston, reports that the Committee has considered the Seafarers Rehabilitation and Compensation Bill 1992 and three related bills and agreed to them with one amendment. Minister? I move the report of the Committee be adopted. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister? I move the bills be read a third time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Seafarers Rehabilitation and Compensation Bill 1992, Seafarers Rehabilitation and Compensation Transitional Provisions and Consequential Amendments Bill 1992, Seafarers Rehabilitation and Compensation Levy Bill 1992, Seafarers Rehabilitation and Compensation Levy Collection Bill 1992. Order. Uh, the President has received a message, and it, as such, a message has been received from the House of Representatives forwarding the Migration Amendment Bill No. 4, 1992, for concurrence. Minister. Mr Acting Deputy President, I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Leave granted. Been no objection. Leave is granted. Senator Teague. Mr. Acting Deputy President, the opposition uh, supports this bill and uh, notes the uh, need, as proposed by the government, uh, in full consultation uh, with the opposition, for there to be. Uh, certainty uh, in the, the matter of uh, the intention that we in this parliament had 
when we adopted uh, the Migration Act and its uh, provisions as they now stand. Indeed, as we debated in, uh, and passed in May uh, this year, and uh, as a result of the, a uh, High Court, High Court uh, ruling uh, with regard to a recent uh, immigration case that came before it, there were some comments made by members of the bench, uh, and uh, these comments, uh, from these comments, it appears that uh, a number of the asylum seekers, uh, people arriving by boat illegally on Australia's shore, uh, may, and I stress the word may, have been unlawfully in custody under Section 88 of the Act from the time they first entered Australia until the amendment uh, was enacted. Now it is also possible, and I stress the word possible, that if they were unlawfully held a claim for damages could arise. The defect in Section 88, which has given rise to this possibility, was discussed by Justices Brennan, Dean and Dawson. It was suggested that detention is only authorised until the de departure of a vessel carrying the alien from Australia, or until such earlier time as an authorised officer directs. It's, it's on the rub of when a boat bringing an illegal entrant arrives to the point when that boat departs that we have uh, provisions in, the, in Section 88 of the Act. Now, the problem arises which was not fully foreseen and which may, and I stress the, the, the word may, uh, lead to a problem, uh, and that is this. In the particular case considered by the court, it was informed that the vessel had been burned by quarantine officials. The view of the court was that once a vessel no longer exists, or for that matter could never depart, the authority to detain a person lawfully uh, might cease to have effect. Now, what we're about here, with all due respect to the High Court, is because they have a duty to independently adjudicate on the law as adopted by the Parliament. But what we have is what I would with full respect still to the courts at every level in this land, see as a litigious game of hide and seek, in which over recent years, indeed over the last 10 years, not only in Australia, but in the United States, in Canada, in uh, a wide number of countries which uh, receive immigrants and which there is in fact quite a large uh, phenomenon of illegal uh, migration, we uh, have this litigious game of hide and seek. And uh, I would even say well-intentioned uh, um, lawyers seek to uh, uphold what they see as the rights of illegal immigrants and to find every loophole they can in immigration law in order to help their client uh, achieve the goal of gaining uh, permanency in the country that they've chosen to, to, to come to, as I would say, illegally, without papers, without entry permit, without visa, without often uh, even a passport. And uh, what is at issue in this uh, game of hide and seek is in fact the national interest of Australia and the integrity of our immigration uh, law. We must have a law that uh, genuinely fulfils the intentions of the elected representatives in the parliament. Now, I say without seeking to provoke the, some who may speak after me, and I see Senator Harradine uh, Senator Chambret in the chamber. I, I wish to underline a paragraph in the House of Representatives speech of the minister, the speech that has been uh, incorporated just now as the second reading speech for this bill. I quote from the House of Reps, uh, page 3946 of yesterday's Hansard. This uncertainty turns not on the central issue of unauthorised arrival, 
but on the haphazard fate of the boat on which the people travelled. I, I, I read it again because I, in my few minutes of speaking, I believe this is the central fact to understand. This uncertainty turns not on the central issue of an authorised arrival, but on the haphazard fate of the boat on which the people travelled. If the boat was burnt, put in a museum, as one boat was recently, uh, or uh, disposed of in some way, there is a possible interpretation that section 88 of the Immigration Act no longer provides that the person uh, that came on that boat uh, can be right lawfully detained. Now, I, I just am a plain man. I, I'm, not, I'm not into litigious hide-and-seek except to, to try and win a battle on behalf of the people of Australia and on behalf of the intentions of the parliament. And that is, I would say, there is never any intention to allow uh, an escape from section 88 of the Act by this parliament un under such grounds. Let me mention just a few uh, examples. One vessel that arrived in recent years was called the Collie. Uh, there were 79 people on board, all illegal immigrants. Uh, it was sunk. It couldn't depart Australia. Another boat was the Echo. It had 10 people on board, all illegal immigrants. It's committed to a museum. It can't leave Australia. There's another boat called the George with 77 illegal immigrants. It was burnt. Uh, another boat called the Harry with 10 uh, illegal immigrants. It was sold and beached. And the Dalmatian with 33 illegal immigrants. Fate unknown. Because of the haphazard outcome of what happens to that boat, are we trying to maintain that we will allow some lawyers to drive their coach and horses through a loophole in the law uh, just to serve uh, to break down the intentions of this parliament and indeed of the integrity of our immigration laws. It is because of the doubt then uh, necessary to see that with regard to um, a particular period there be all the more certainty as to what the intention of this parliament has been all along. And the period that is uh, concerned is from the 19th of November 1989 to the 1st of November next year. After that date, that latter date, the uh, um, immigration reform uh, bill's measures, which we adopted uh, recently, uh, will uh, make for certainty. Uh, so that I have to say especially to senators uh, in the chamber, that I do not believe that appeals to so-called human rights or appeals to the uh, covenant on human and civil, uh, 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 civil and human rights or considerations of the rights of persons uh, to be uh, imprisoned or detained uh, or, or uh, or the conditions on which they, they, they are detained, uh, bear upon this matter as much as what I've said about the haphazard nature of the, of the uh, outcome of the vessel on which they arrived in relationship to the, to the words that happened to exist in Clause 88 of the, of the Act. I um, won't say very much more because I have read carefully the House of Representatives speeches of the Minister, Mr Hand, and of my uh, close colleague, the Shadow Minister for Immigration and Ethic Affairs, um, Member for Dundas, Mr Philip Ruddock. I, uh, I want to quote two sections of um, Mr Ruddock's speech to underline them. He calls this bill an important piece of legislation designed to ensure that the provisions of the Migration Act, which were enacted last May, are valid. And I wish to quote from page 3951 of Hansard where he says, and this is not just with regard to these last four or five debates on immigration law in which I have participated 
and spoken for the opposition, but right back to the, uh, to the reformulation of the whole act that we were involved in a few years ago. It's all a result of making sure that we have clear law that can gain the parliament's intention uh, despite this litigious game of hide and seek. We are not wishing to uh, in any way in, in the immigration law of Australia to see any breakdown of human rights, any discrimination, any uh, inhumane or, uh, or, or action lacking in compassion. We're wanting to see fairness, justice, uh, truth, but certainly integrity in the intended immigration law of Australia. And therefore I quote uh, Mr Ruddock in these words. It has always been clear that our principal problem has been the unduly legalistic approach that has had to be adopted because of the government's view that we ought to provide ready access to judicial review of administrative decisions. And he goes on to talk about the creative way in which the High Court of Australia has uh, got into the business of determining refugee claims and so on. And not just the High Court, but uh, in uh, um, uh, but other, other courts. So it's for the reasons that have been already set out in the House of Representatives, and uh, which I repeat now, that we wish to see the original intention of the Parliament uh, in, these, in the original enactment, uh, in, the, uh, in the amending bill of May last uh, this year, uh, and uh, uh, to, uh, to, to maintain that uh, original intention despite this litigious game of hide and seek that we um, support the bill and we wish it a speedy passage. Uh, Senator Spindler. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, the Senate is debating the Migration Amendment Bill No. 4, 1992. The government has initiated this bill uh, because it wishes to respond to the consequences of the High Court's decision that 37 boat people were unlawfully detained because their vessel was no longer in existence or in an Australian port. In other words, it could never depart. The relevant section that uh, the uh, uh, minister sought to uh, support his decisions uh, in this area is section 88, which deals with provisions relating to stowaways where the presence or departure of their boat is obviously a significant factor. The government sought to use that section to justify their continuing detention of the 37 boat people whose boat had been burned. The government realized that it could not amend Section 88 retrospectively, and rather than make an attempt to do that, it has brought in the provision in the current bill which states, and I quote, the compensation that may be awarded to a designated person for an action under subsection 2 is to be $1 for each day of the person's unlawful custody. The minister claims that the provision is not contrary to Article 9.5 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and I quote, anyone who has been the victim of unlawful arrest or detention shall have an enforceable right to compensation. However, it is clear that this is mere subterfuge and that in substance this provision is contrary to the principles of international human rights guaranteeing the, right, the rule of law. It raises again the issue on which the Democrats have opposed the government's recent amendment to the Migration Law Amendment Bill, namely that people who are before Australian courts should be accorded equality in our legal system even if they are not citizens or residents at the time. Uh, accordingly, Acting Deputy President, the Australian Democrats will be opposing this uh, bill. However, it must be acknowledged uh, that there are competing principles at work uh, and that different views on this issue are possible. And it is my understanding that uh, some of my colleagues, and in particular Senator Coulter, who will be expressing his views shortly, may take a different view uh, on this issue, which uh, in many ways is a conscience issue. Uh, Senator Shamrat. Uh, sorry, 
We've agreed to change if okay. that's with All me. Right. Senator Shamarad. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. It's hard to avoid being cynical as the government yet again rushes into the parliament to amend the legislation dealing with people seeking asylum in Australia. If it wasn't so tragic to the people concerned, this could be categorised as the oops legislation. The government has tried and tried again to make sure that gaining refugee status in Australia is well nigh impossible unless people come through proper channels and wait in the queue. But each time it has discovered it has left a tiny window through which the light of justice and fairness can shine. Of course, this legislation has come about because the High Court has ruled on the government's policy of detention without recourse to court jurisdiction. In May of this year, we saw legislation rushed in here to head off a court challenge, and now the government again wants to make sure that the courts are not able to evaluate the legal validity of its policies. So it's time to try and close the window once more. In May of this year, we had the extraordinary situation of the government insisting that even a court did not have the power to release someone held in custody by the department. Why is this government so hell-bent on this process, which relies on detaining people against their will without recourse to the power of the courts to adjudicate on the merits of their detention? Whose interests are being served by this regime of detention without relief? It costs the Australian community thousands of dollars per person held. Just for interest, at a very conservative estimate, $11,000 a day a year per person in Port Hedland and 27,000 per person per year at Villawood or elsewhere. This imprisonment reinforces antagonism towards these people in the, in the community by making them seem different, not to say criminal, and denies people opportunities for overcoming the fears which they have sought to escape by coming here. Studies overseas have shown that in countries where refugee applicants are not detained during their processing, only 3% fail to appear for the various steps required for their application. But even putting aside the remote possibility that the Australian government could come at that, we have groups in our community which are willing and ready to provide accommodation and support for these people and to see them through the application process. The bill seeks to clarify some other matters which managed to slip through the net last time. So the 273-day detention period during which the processing must be completed is now to be able to be extended by a further 90 days for each extra step of an appeal process. A person's detention may so become nine months or 12 or 15. Where will it end? The government says that it is committed to ensuring that people will not be held in custody for three years or longer, as has happened to a number of people. But it seems to want to have the right to punish people with extra detention if they choose to appeal a negative decision. We now also have the infamy of the government setting people's right to compensation for illegal detention over the past few years at a paltry $1 per day. And to add to the infamy, it recognises that a compensation claim can only proceed for the 104 people who fall within the High Court determination. But nonetheless, it wants to limit the Court's decision-making powers by setting the level of compensation. A dollar per day is an insult to those who have been illegally detained. In fact, the notion of someone bringing such an action, making use of legal representation, possibly costing thousands of dollars, is an obscenity. Is this the hallmark of a civilised and caring society? Australia has limited by this legislation its liability to a total of some $23,000, shared between 104 people, potentially, and yet may still spend ten times that defending their obligation to pay it. Such is the stupidity of this government's attitude towards this tiny number of unfortunate people. Just to make it concrete, they are prepared to not contest the claim of 71 of these people whose boat is no longer in existence. This would amount to $300 compensation for each person 
for their 10 months unlawful detention. However, this department is prepared to contest the claims of the 33 people whose case for unlawful custody was upheld in the federal court and who, through this legislation, would potentially gain $60 per person. The total number of refugee applications from people currently in Australia exceeds 21,000. But this government has singled out a small handful of less than 500 for all the harsh treatment, manipulation of our standard legal processes and indeed the skewing of our entire immigration agenda to boot. Why is the Australian government so deeply committed to allowing only 5% of refugee applications to succeed when compared to other countries, and Canada is an obvious example, why are we so miserly with onshore applications? Even if we were to accept all those who are at present in detention centres, especially those who have been in custody for three years or more, would it make any significant difference to our immigration program? Of course not. Section 6 of the bill also provides a catch-all clause to negate any further possibility of redress to the courts at a state or federal level for unlawful custody, apart from the compensation I have outlined above. One of the pillars of a free country is recourse to the courts. Yet through the insertion of Section 54RA1 in the Act, there can be no further opportunities for these 104 or any other refugees that arrived in Australia after the 19th of November 1989 to find any sort of remedy through court proceedings. This legislation is another disgraceful episode in this government's refugee policy blundering. It seeks to snuff out the light of hope for a just and fair hearing for those who leave their homelands in terror and despair. What is happening to this country? What's happening in this government and in this parliament? It has become heartless and inhuman. This legislation and the decision-making and motivation underlying it expose a serious value vacuum in our society. The stories we hear from Germany regarding the resurgence of the neo-Nazi movement, promoting jingoism and racism, are not so far afield. In Australia, it is emanating from our government policies rather than from subversive minorities. Our international reputation is at risk here. Our approach to refugees exposes totally our hypocrisy in decrying human rights violations of other countries. Now, as I've mentioned once before in a different context, the problem with racism is that people who have racist values and attitudes have great difficulty acknowledging that they are racist. They believe firmly that they are right and everyone else is wrong. They live in an encapsulated world of black and white values and concrete thinking. The reasons underlying the go this government's preoccupation with migration legislation from the point of view of its supporters is simple. This land is ours. Only if people apply through the correct bureaucratic processes will they be given consideration of their civil rights and access to due process of law. If we are not strict in enforcing our borders, we will be inundated by hordes trying to take advantage of our lenience and steal from us the benefits of this land. This is the supporters of this legislation, Senator Harradine. It is not uh, myself. Well, to those who have no difficulty with the view I have just expounded, let me assure you there is another view. I believe there are many, many people who share it with me and with Senator Harradine and with the Democrats. Unfortunately, very few of these people are in Parliament today. They are ordinary Australians who are not seized by fear or self-interest, but remember how fortunate we are to be in this country and that we have done nothing to deserve being in this part of the world rather than being born into some other part of the world or going to it or being trapped in it. The spirit of this is blatant in the second verse of our national anthem. Beneath our radiant Southern Cross, we'll toil with hearts and hands to make this common wealth of ours renowned of all the lands. 
For those who've come across the sea, we've boundless plains to share. With courage, let us all combine to advance Australia fair. I believe that strongly that the spirit reflected in that anthem still remains the dominant community view. That the narrow view reflected in this legislation is pathology, a disease which as yet has not pervaded or overwhelmed us. However, the disease emanates from the history of this country and is badly in need of treatment. White Australia has a black history. This paranoia that people will rush in and steal our land may well be related to the fact that European Australia stole this land from its Aboriginal occupants only 200 years ago. I remember distinctly a brilliant cartoon, unfortunately I can't recall distinctly its creator, in which the traditional Captain Cook arrival scene has one Aboriginal person on shore saying to another, mark my words, one day these boat people will take us over. Australia's lack of justice to Aboriginal people is now matched by its lack of justice to the unfortunate 450 boat people or designated persons who have tried to gain refuge on our shores. Um. Senator McKeon. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I intend to be brief in my contribution to this very important piece of legislation, and I will refrain from, during my speech, from referring to an earlier matter of debate that uh, was raised, but it is something that I will address in the future, that a parliament of this, that a committee of this parliament can bring down reports and incorporate material into it without first giving the individuals concerned in it an opportunity of responding to distortions, distortions in a brief examination which I could prove but will refrain from uh, doing so at this juncture because of the pressure of other business on it. That, but I, it is something that I will be addressing when, this parliament, when the next parliament, when this parliament resumes or when a new parliament is elected next year. I want to, on this legislation, commend the Minister and the Department and the other de government departments for their very speedy action in moving to protect the, the taxpayers of Australia. That's who we're talking about protecting here, the taxpayers of Australia. Unfortunately, they should have perhaps moved on this matter quite some period of time ago and saved the taxpayers of Australia many millions of dollars, which have been, some of which, which have been poured into some sections of the legal fraternity to provide services which weren't adequate to the task. And I don't say that in every instance where government funds have been given to, to sections of the legal profession to, pr to protect the interests of individuals involved in refugee applications. I do commend the, uh, the Minister and I record the thanks on behalf of the taxpayers of Australia for the cooperation that the opposition parties have shown in getting the legislation through the House of Representatives last night or early this morning and hopefully getting it through this place sometime tonight or early tomorrow morning. That's where our obligations have got to lie. They are the people that elected us to this place to govern on their behalf and to spend money on their behalf. And we would be abrogating our responsibility if we did not very quickly take action and enact legislation to protect the taxpayers' funds. Because the damages claims that are being pressed in the High Court on behalf of some asylum seekers are seeking damages against the government. Government itself has got no money. Government is in charge of taxpayers' funds. And we do have to protect those funds, and I com again commend the Minister and all concerned for moving so speedily in order to do so. Senator Shamaret, in her uh, contribution, asked why the government is singling out some 500 people. I, I understood you to say 500, but I accept your interjection too in order to correct it. Yeah. Uh, 500 or 104, the record will show. But wait, the government is not signalling them out. The individuals who came here unauthorised, unasked, 
didn't apply to the people that singled themselves out. In many cases, they were the people who got together enough money to bribe boat owners in order to come to this country, to illegally enter this country. We didn't bring them in. They could have applied to the normal refugee stream in some cases and sought refugee status. They didn't do that. They came here, maybe misguided, but we're not getting to the truth on all applications, possibly because of the, some of the legal assistance that they are receiving. Maybe sometime the truth will out. I hope it certainly does. Uh, the government has got a the government and the parliament has got a commendable record on refugees in this country. It's a, it's a record that goes back until the early part of this century, and it's a record that all Australians have got to be proud of. And this government, this government, the fourth Labour government, is sticking with that record. In the recent and recently announced immigration programme for 1992-93, there was considerable debate and considerable consultation with the community, with the taxpayers of Australia, with ethnic groups, with government departments and with state governments on what the intake for immigration ought to be in this current financial year, 92-93. It was determined by government that it be 80,000 in total. 12.5% of that would be made up of refugees, 12.5%, an increase in percentage terms from the last year, an increase accounted for by the fact that last, last year, last financial year, the, sum, the figure was 12,000. 12, it's gone down to 10,000, but the overall program has been reduced from 110 to 80,000. Government is stuck with its principal thing of looking after refugees. But where do we get the refugees from? We get them from all parts of this very troubled earth of ours. All parts of the earth. And I refer senators, honourable senators, to the report of the Joint Standing Committee on Migration Regulations that was tabled in this place about two months ago to give an indication of where people, refugees, are coming from. A great proportion of those, a number of those people in the intake for last year actually come from refugee camps, from true refugees, people who have been displaced for a whole number of reasons in their own country. And I advocated on a number of occasions in this place that that is where the priority should lie, that the people who don't have homes, that are living in appalling subhuman conditions in many parts of the world, including in our very near neighbours in Asia, they're the people we should be looking after first. And we shouldn't allow people, simply because they've got some money and are able to bribe their way into Australia, take up the places that are allocated in our refugee programme. It shouldn't be allowed. And it is disgraceful, as the Minister said last night, that some of those people are now seeking to sue the taxpayers of Australia, the people who have kept them here for, in some cases, far, far too long, up to three years, and everybody agrees with that, that it is too long. Now they've got the gall to sue the taxpayers of Australia. Well, I'll tell you, Senators, the taxpayers have had enough on this. And some of the interjections that I've been getting from my right have talked about white Australia policy. This is the danger. There are dangers in this argument that the taxpayers, the general public, are getting fed up of preferential, apparent preferential treatment seen to be given to some people. That's where the racism is coming from, because we're seen to be doing it. In some cases, it's very difficult to argue a country point of view, but it can be done if we persist. But we've got to do it with equity. We can't just bend over and give it to the, some of the people who have uh, got some, merely got some money in order to bribe their, uh, their way into Australia. That it is a very troubled earth. It is a very troubled earth. In my constituency work, and I do do constituency work, the greater proportion of my work is immigration. And the greater proportion of the work that I do with the constituents who come into me is trying and explaining why their near relatives cannot get in under the normal family reunion programs, why they're not able to because of the, the placing and meeting the points test. We've got to argue that point through because of the limited 
positions available in our immigration programme as determined by the elected government of the day. One of the most soul-destroying things that I do have to do is when you get people with, with relatives living in places like Bosnia-Herzegovina, where nightly you see it on television stations, people getting came, killed, maimed, mutilated by some of their former, what were their former nationals. And you can't, we can't fit those people into the refugee program. I'm pleased to say we've had some success and been able to move very speedily. And I commend the embassy in Geneva who are handling most of the claims under tremendously trying circumstances where we are able to relieve the suffering for those people who are there and get them reunited with their relatives in Australia. That's the job Australia should be doing. We should maintain control on it. We have to maintain control on it. The public demands we maintain control. And by putting through this legislation here tonight, we are showing yet again that the Parliament of Australia, the democratically elected Parliament of Australia, is determined to maintain that control and protect the taxpayers. I thank the uh, Senate for its, uh, allowing me to speak on this occasion tonight. Senator Harrodin, um, <clears throat> Mr Acting Deputy President, this uh, piece of legislation is a further shameful chapter in the government's record, shameful record, in its treatment of refugees and applicants for refugees to Australia. I stand in this chamber in agreement, in total agreement, with what Mr Justice Einfeld said about Australia's treatment of boat people. And he said that Australia's treatment of boat people seeking asylum had been a shameful blot on its compassion and humanity. Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, others too have condemned Australia's treatment of uh, applicants for refugee status. Among those have been Brian Vertigan, the Federal Human Rights Commissioner. This legislation is intended to dress dramatically and drastically limit compensation to be made to applicants for refugee status who have been illegally detained. And it is another indication of the callous treatment of refugees and by the government and its absolute contempt uh, for the judicial processes, including for the High Court. The High Court ruled last week that the government had detained 37 boat people unlawfully and that these boat people were entitled to compensation. <clears throat> it also declared invalid a law prohibiting a court uh, from releasing a boat person from custody. And honourable senators will recall that that law was passed by this parliament in, uh, in uh, May of this year. And that a number of us, Senator the Democrats, Senator Shamarat and myself, were vigorously opposed to that provision. The High Court struck down that provision. Under this legislation, compensation will be limited to one dollar a day for any period of detention found unlawful by a court. And clearly, intentionally, this legislation is designed to circumvent that decision of the High Court. What a preposterous situation it is. Let me tell the Senate what the essence of this legislation is. The essence is that if 
a, uh, if a, 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 an applicant or a boat person has been found by a court to have been illegally detained in a descent, detention centre and that that boat person is entitled to compensation, the government will determine that compensation. Just think of that and think of the president that that says. The federal government was the perpetrator of um, uh, the illegal detention for which um, uh, the sufferings of, for, from which uh, the boat persons are entitled to, to compensation. And under this legislation, the federal government sets itself up as the judge of the compensation to be made to the victims of its illegal act. Shame. Now that's a disgraceful situation. I've never heard that occur in any other legislation at all. And I challenge the minister, the Minister for Justice, uh, to, uh, to relay to the Senate, to tell the Senate what other legislation there is which contain, <coughs> contains such a preposterous pr provision. The implications in general areas of law are mind-boggling. If you can have the perpetrator of a crime being the judge of what compensation is going to be paid to the victims of the crime, then we are on the downward slide. And that's, and that's, precise, that's precisely what this bill does. Precisely what this bill does. The government should have heard what the High Court said. It should have gracefully accepted the decision of the High Court and agreed to relieve the torment and suffering which have been imposed on the boat people and which they have suffered both in Cambodia and in Australia by releasing them from detention and allowing their stay on humanitarian grounds. Now that appeal has just been recently been made by the Australian Catholic Bishops' Conference um, uh, meeting in Sydney, and I, and, uh, I uh, put to the Senate that uh, the government, in respect of these 37 people, already have power to do just that. It says that it does not have, uh, the, the, the minister says that he does not have the power in respect of certain uh, circumstances, and I'll, I'll come to that in the committee stages, uh, to grant a, a permanent uh, uh, visa, permanent entry uh, on humanitarian grounds. I have an amendment being circulated which will put that beyond doubt. And there will be no excuse by the government or by the minister uh, by saying that he is bound hand and foot. He has no power uh, to consider matters on humanitarian grounds. Instead, instead of gracefully accepting the High Court decision and in taking that action, the government has used devious and outrageous means to circum circumvent the High Court's uh, decision, which was to uphold individual <coughs> human rights of these people. Now, Minister, the, uh, uh, the Minister representing, uh, the Minister assisting the Minister of Immigration, Senator Tate, is also the Minister for Justice. And how he can sit here and see this bill do what it do is doing is beyond me. Constitutionally, this legislation represents an unwarranted interference with the judicial power. It has set—I'll come to the Parliament's original decision—and 
high courts and any other courts look at the decision of uh, the uh, intention of Parliament, and they have looked at obviously the intentions of Parliament, and they've come down with decisions, which uh, a, a decision which struck out uh, a part of the previous legislation. I'll come to that in a minute. The government has set a totally unacceptable precedent in any democratic and civilised society committed to the rule of law. And again, I, uh, I look over there through you, Mr Chairman. Uh, well, I don't look through you to the, the minister, but I, I look at the minister and I wonder how he, as Minister for Justice, can countenance that. The legislation, as has been indicated by Senator Spindler, is contrary to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and our obligations thereunder. The Covenant provides in Article 9.5 that anyone who has been the victim of unlawful detention shall have an enforceable right to compensation. It also provides that all persons are equal before the law and are entitled without discrimination to the equal protection of the law. That's in Article 26. Discrimination on the basis of status is prohibited, and yet this legislation discriminates against applications, applicants for refugee status whom the government has described as designated persons. <coughs> Mr Acting Deputy President, the Minister's response to all of that as, uh, is to blackguard, and Senator McKinnon's, is to blackguard the boat people. Bear in mind there have only been about 400 land on the place. People are being told out there that there are thousands there are 400. And the minister blackguards these people who have suffered torment in their place of origin and enormous difficulties in their coming to Australia and have then suffered torment in detention in Australia for up to three years, or over three years, some of them. He described, the minister described these people as queue jumpers and, uh, he, and uh, Mr uh, and Senator McKellen accused them uh, of bribing their way into Australia. Uh, no proof, a dreadful accusation an assertion which should be condemned. These people have rights. They may be yellow, they may be coloured, but they've got rights, the same as we have. <coughs> the, um, the statement has been made that they've come in here and, and, and uh, uh, the uh, opposition uh, spokesperson Senator Teague, they've come in here without papers, without visa, without passport. <coughs> Mr Deputy President, they came from a country, Cambodia, where there was no embassy of Australia at a time when that country was not even recognised. The government of that country wasn't even recognised by Australia. How can they be queue jumpers? Queue jumpers suggest the, the word queue jumping suggests that people haven't gone through the appropriate process. There was no process to go through. Many of them suffered under Pol Pot. Many of them have suffered further under the Hun Sen, Hun, Hun Sen regime the Vietnamese-backed uh, uh, government, and they came out here at a time when we did not recognise that uh, government of, uh, of Cambodia. And it's shameful to call them queue jumpers. It's morally shameful 
and it's factually shameful. Mr. Um, uh, act, uh, Mr. Deputy President, I hear what Senator uh, Teague said, that there is a legal game of hide-and-seek. Hide they're playing a legal game of hide-and-seek. Well, if they're playing a legal game of hide-and-seek, if they're playing a legal game of hide and seek, let me just say this to you. It is, a, is it a game to depart from the country of your origins, to come to this country? Is it a game to suffer detention for over three years in this country? Well, I'll, I'll tell you this. These people, it wasn't the lawyers in this, uh, uh, at all. These people, uh, the, the, a number of church groups and community organisations had asked the department to allow these people to be released from detention into various communities on the cognizance of those church groups and community organisations. The department deliberately and with intent refused that particular offer and kept these people in detention unlawfully as we have seen and their lawyers did the right thing in attempting to get them released from the custody into which they unlawfully uh, were kept two days before that particular case came before the federal courts, this government rushed through this parliament legislation to prevent a court uh, from considering the release of those people. That's what it did, and I opposed it, and it was subsequently struck down by the High Court. And I might say, Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, that I will be moving an amendment to the second reading stage that this matter be referred to the scrutiny of Bill's committee, and I'll come to that in a minute. Well, no, I'll come to it now because it's a germane point. The bill previously in, in uh, May was presented to us. Uh, was rushed through the House of uh, Representatives. Order. Was Order. It being 10.30 p.m., I put the question that the Senate do now adjourn. Those that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the nays have it. Senator Harrodin. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. This uh, um, measure, the, the measure to deny these people their day in court was rushed through the House of Representatives and rushed through this place two days before the court case, without the bill going to the scrutiny of bills committee. However, after the bill was passed uh, and uh, in, uh, uh, in October of uh, this year, the scrutiny of bills committee did have a look at that bill. And the scrutiny uh, uh, of bills uh, committee uh, said a number of things about the uh, the uh, the measure, um, and it said, as to the para as to the provision that a court is not to order the release from custody of a designated person, the scrutiny of bills committee said this: the committee suggests that the combined effect of the new paragraph 54R, 3E, and section 54S is that a designated person effectively would be denied access to the courts for the purposes of determining whether or not they should continue to be detained. The committee suggests that this may be considered to be contrary to Article 9, Paragraph 4 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And it was drawing that to our attention given its terms of reference. And the terms of reference of the scrutiny of bills uh, committee includes a term of reference which says that um, uh, uh, that uh, uh, it must uh, uh, um, uh, report in regard to acts or, uh, or bills which um, trespass unduly on personal rights and liberties. And the High Court found 
that it did trespass on these rights. That's what the High Court found. And what I'm suggesting to you tonight is the courts will find parts of this legislation uh, to be so trampling on the individual human rights of persons. And what I'm asking the committee to do, unlike what, they did la la what uh, the parliament did last uh, uh, year, uh, on last May, is to allow this measure to go to the scrutiny of Bill's committee. As I said in the Senate on December the 7th, the government's treatment of refugees has been disgraceful, callous, uncivilised, bordering on the barbaric. Its handling of, this, of legislation in this area has been secretive and surreptitious as indicated by its latest actions in ramming through the legislation in the early hours of this morning through the House of Representatives and expecting the Senate to kowtow to its wishes on this the last day of Parliament. If the Senate succumbs to these outrageous tactics in disregard for the rule of law and the rights of individuals and proper parliamentary procedures, it will be a day of shame. Uh, thank you, Senator Harrity. Uh, Senator Coulter. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This legislation which is before us tonight, the Migration Amendment Bill No. 4, is indeed a, an extremely difficult piece of legislation uh, from the point of view of, of um, conscience and the point of view of balancing the, um, the appropriate uh, demands of various sections of the community for justice and fairness. And I've had a great deal of difficulty uh, with this uh, piece of legislation, but um, I have to tell the Senate that I have come down on the side different from that of my colleague, Senator Spindler, whose position I very much respect and uh, who I, I can fully understand and uh, fully um, sympathise with his position. But on balance, I have to say that I have come down on the other side, and I'd like the uh, few moments to explain why I have taken that position. I don't know what, other, what the position of my other colleagues will be, because I think this is very much a matter of conscience. Let me say, first of all, that um, I, I also am on record repeatedly as saying that um, Australia should substantially increase its intake of refugees, that uh, the position of the Democrats has for a long time been one in which uh, those who come here for economic reasons, either their own or the perceived economic uh, advantage of Australia, <coughs> should be uh, pushed aside in favour of those who, uh, who come here for humanitarian reasons. And for those reasons, we have argued against the business migration, the skills migration program, and argued for a substantial increase in migration. Uh, migration of uh, refugees. <clears throat> let me also, let me also uh, say, uh, in support of uh, something that um, Senator Harradine, a point that Senator Harradine made, that um, Section 88 of the um, primary legislation is one that it seems should have been reviewed a long time before, and uh, there is no doubt in my mind that the department has been uh, lax in not attending to this before, and uh, to do it at this late hour is uh, a long way less than ideal. But this situation um, has arisen because um, the High Court has ruled, as um, several um, other senators have said, uh, that the um, part of the, of the legislation recently passed through, through this parliament in relation to the ability of the courts to uh, order release from detention was invalid, and in the course of that judgment have also uh, passed some remarks about the availability of the means of, uh, of uh, egress from Australia uh, being uh, the means by which they came in here. And it would seem <coughs> that that part of the High Court decision does involve, uh, as Senator Baden-Teague pointed out, a very, very considerable degree of arbitrariness in that uh, if the uh, uh, success of a case for um, compensation to
turns on whether the boats have been destroyed or not, uh, and may have been destroyed for very good reasons, for reasons of, say, quarantine, uh, then uh, it seems a, a bad law that, uh, that compensation should simply turn on that. Um, and one example has been uh, given to us in the uh, minister's second reading speech in which people were actually brought into Australia, uh, rescued and brought into Australia on a uh, naval vessel. And uh, because that naval vessel has gone back into international waters, their means of, of uh, entry into Australia is no longer available to them. And therefore, having been rescued, they may be, uh, um, through this arbitrary mechanism, be eligible for compensation. And that seems um, unusual and, and unfair. It certainly is discriminatory. However, having spoken to uh, Father Frank Brennan this afternoon, a person whom I very much admire and respect in this particular area, he points out that even if that leg of a claim were to uh, uh, not stand up, <coughs> the, the claim might still stand in relation to the fact that section 88 was being used in, a, in, a, in an inappropriate way. And he pointed out to me that uh, that section was originally used in relation to people who'd stowed away, people who were therefore uh, um, only likely to be retained, uh, uh, put into uh, detention, detained for a very short time, and then returned to the uh, to the boat on which they'd come in, and uh, off they would go. And he argues that it may well be that uh, these people would. Uh, be able to uh, still sustain a case for compensation on the grounds that Section 88 was being used in a way which was not intended uh, originally. <clears throat> so we're then left with a situation in which the number of people who may indeed be eligible for compensation could indeed be quite large, and I understand the number is some 267 people. And that, in my mind, raises uh, another issue of fairness and equity, and that is that uh, <clears throat> if uh, the amount of compensation is going to be very large, then one must balance the demands on that amount of money for other um, perfectly good humanitarian needs in the community. And Senator Chamaret, in her contribution, mentioned the Aboriginal people from whom we, the white people, the, the Europeans, took this continent 200 years ago. And one is aware of medical programs, of health programs, of education programs, of a whole lot of other things uh, which are underfunded in terms of the, um, the indigenous people of this country. And yet uh, uh, money might well be expended on people who are not Australian uh, citizens but who have come here um, for their own reasons and who have not yet entered Australia, and that's the next point that I want to raise, <clears throat> that it seems to me that um, these people are claiming, and the word detention is used quite a lot, in a sense these people are not in detention. These people have not yet entered Australia. They are, uh, as it were, in, a, in the same position as people who uh, would be in, uh, in quarantine. Uh, they have not... Um, got uh, visas or passports and they would enter Australia when they pass out of uh, that place of detention through the gates with the appropriate paperwork and then become, uh, come into Australia. So that the, the argument in relation to um, fairness and the extension of Australian law to those people who are not yet in Australia but who are claiming refugee status, the status of, which, of whom has not yet been determined in my view is no different from a refugee who may be living under equally horrible or even worse conditions who is also outside Australia but still in their country of origin or in some third country. And I've been to some fairly horrific refugee uh, camps in places like Jordan where uh, Palestinian refugees are living. And if we're going to extend the rights of Australian law to um, potential refugees who have not yet entered Australia but who are in detention camps on Australian soil, it seems to me that we should then logically extend Australian law to those refugees who are in detention camps 
who are applying for refugee status who might be on Jordanian soil or some other soil. And, uh, the, the issue of, of how far you extend this particular prerogative seems to me to become extremely blurred. I think it is fair to uh, argue the fairness and equity of, uh, or to compare the fairness and equity of those who have come here and whether they have, to use um, uh, Senator McKinnon's term, bought their way in, they nonetheless have presumably had enough money to buy a boat to get to our shores. To compare their uh, rights with the rights of those who don't have that facility and who are in refugee camps, say in Jordan, and who are going through the processes of, of applying, <coughs> applying to enter Australia as refugees. And I, I think there is a real equation that has to be weighed up here very carefully, and I, I have great difficulty in, in accepting the argument that simply because people have been able to buy a boat and, and uh, land on our shores unannounced that their rights uh, should supersede the rights of those who, uh, who are somewhere else and applying for, uh, for entry. It seems to me that those people should be uh, treated equally and then either Australian law has to be extended to those people in terms of compensation if, if they're in detention or, um, or if, if not, if they're in some other status, well then the appropriate status is to treat them as people who are applying for entry but who've not yet entered. The other aspect in relation to detention is that these people are not uh, like prisoners who are kept in jail. They are perfectly free to go back to the country of origin um, in that uh, I understand at every stage the, uh, the offer is there. They can be flown back to their, uh, their country of origin and they're therefore uh, not quite in the same situation as somebody um, who is in jail. The thing is they're being detained in terms of not being allowed across that border from the uh, detention camp into Australia. Um, so it is for those reasons, it is for those reasons that uh, on balance, and it is very much on balance, um, I am concerned that, uh, that this, uh, this legislation um, should be passed. I want to reflect again on the inadequate, inadequate way that the government uh, apparently over quite a long period of time has dealt with this legislation so that continually we find these, uh, these loopholes that need to be plugged at the last minute. That is a very unsatisfactory situation and one that I hope that the uh, government will now uh, give some attention to and review very, very uh, quickly so that uh, these things don't, uh, don't occur again. In relation to uh, the reference to a committee, and this is the last item I want to uh, pick up, it does seem to me that if we, um, if we refer this matter to a committee at this stage, uh, then there will be, in the interim, a large number of applications before the courts and we will be very much in the situation that we were in last time when uh, the argument will be put that uh, we can't change the, uh, the situation once the matters are before the court. So I think if one is going to, uh, if one perceives that this is a, a loophole, however unsatisfactory it is to close it in this uh, arbitrary and peremptory way, nonetheless I think it is better that it be done. And I have, I have great difficulty with this. I've, I've spent many hours this afternoon worrying about this, uh, this legislation. Um, I fully sympathise with the position that's uh, been taken by um, Senator Harradine, Senator Shamaret, uh, Senator Spindler and probably some others of my colleagues, but on balance, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I have to say that I come down on this one on the other side. Uh, Minister, Sen oh. I rise just for a minute uh, to speak to the amendment uh, uh, that Senator Harradine. Oh, Senator Harradine's amendment. Oh, yeah. hmm? Hmm? Yes, you can speak the amendment. Senator Thank you. Um, uh, I thought I thought it was uh, uh, useful to speak just before the minister uh, summed up the whole debate, uh, as this um, has been circulated uh, this evening from Senator Harradine. Uh, that he would wish to see the bill uh, 
uh, not proceed with tonight, but referred uh, to the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills. Uh, this is tantamount to uh, the bill not being passed. And in my own remarks earlier, on behalf of the opposition, I uh, noted the urgency of this legislation, and uh, uh, therefore, uh, in the uh, considerations that we would uh, we would wish to see um, followed, we are in fact having to come down on on the ground of urgency for this bill being completed uh, tonight. Thank you, Senator T. The minister, Senator Tate. Oh, excuse me. Oh, Senator Spindler. May, I'm sorry, I didn't see thank you. Thank you. May I briefly address also the amendment that is being moved by Senator Herodin? Uh, I will be supporting the amendment, Madam Making Deputy President. Uh, I believe that uh, due parliamentary process needs to be observed at all times, even if a bill is rushed through at the last minute, and perhaps even more so, and particularly a bill that proposes to vary uh, the legal rights for a particular class of persons on Australian soil going before Australian courts, yet they are going to be denied uh, their rights uh, to challenge in court the amount of damages if they are found, and only in that case, if they are found to have been unlawfully detained. I believe that is a, pr a principle that needs examination before this chamber votes on it uh, in the hurry in which we are asked to uh, be doing it tonight and hence uh, we'll be supporting Senator Herodine's amendment. Yes, thank you, Senator mm. Spindler. Uh, I think you Do you wish to speak to the amendment too, Senator Herodine? I Shemarek? would like to, please, yes. Madam Deputy President. Um, I rise to indicate, probably not surprisingly to people, my support for Senator Herodine's amendment. And um, I would like to just purely and simply defend the additional openness to compassion that this amendment allows us to have by um, referring to the Canadian policy on uh, request for immigration status. Requests for refugee status can be made at Canadian ports of entry at any Canada immigration centre for those already in Canada or for those contravening immigration law at the beginning of an immigration uh, inquiry. Senator Shamaret, is that relevant to this particular I, I bill? believe it to be. The minister says it isn't. You've, well, got, to be could... you've got to be relevant to okay. the amendment that's been proposed by Senator Harradine. Senator Shamaret. All right. If I, if I may just say then that I support Senator Harradine's amendment because it allows the minister additional discretion. It escapes from the tight legality of the legislation currently before us, and it allows us as a nation to have a true consideration for strong humanitarian grounds, as he says in um, 47A1B. It allows strong humanitarian grounds for the grant of a permanent yeah. entry permit to the person. And why uh, I was referring... Senator as I understand it, that's uh, the amendment that Senator Harradine is going to move in committee. I think it's a, a different amendment that he has uh, put to the, the second reading. Um, it's the, you would oh, be able to okay, speak I'm to sorry. It, um, you would be um, able to speak to it in the committee stages. Um, Senator okay, Shamaret. I'll seek leave later. Yes, sorry. Thank you. No, that's all right. Thank you. Now the minister. Thank you, Senator Tate. Madam uh, Acting Deputy President, may I first? Uh, in setting the context for this debate, absolutely reject the extravagant language of both Senator Shamaret and Senator Harradine. Senator Shamaret, for example, claiming that we're involved here in yet another expression of government-sponsored resurgence of Nazism. That's what she said when she's speaking of a government which, in the most difficult and trying times in the Australian community, still finds enough compassion, to use your terms, to permit and to welcome 10,000 refugees or those who satisfy humanitarian criteria into this, into this country. That's, 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 that's what we do. That's what we do. We take 10,000 people into this country on humanitarian and refugee grounds every year, including over the last several years of, the, uh, of, of this government being in office and with the support of the opposition and I think of the Australian community, despite hard times, tens of thousands of Cambodian refugees, tens of thousands of Cambodian refugees recognising their plight and, uh, and going to the border camps and assisting them to come to this country to find a future for themselves and their families. So to 
speak of the record of this government and this country and this community of Australia in those terms I th I just has to be utterly rejected as being in, uh, flying in the face of facts. And as for Senator Harrody saying that the, that the, the government and the parliament was being invited by the, uh, by the government tonight to act in a racist way because these people were brown or yellow. That's what you said. What about the fact of the Polish people who arrived in a, unannounced in a vessel the other, uh, what, back in October, was it? Back in October. They were also assessed against the, against the international criteria in a process which allowed, of course, for natural justice. They were found not to have satisfied the internationally accepted criteria relating to a refugee status. Their claim was not accepted and they were returned, uh, they were deported. They were returned to their, well, I don't know where, to, their, to some other country. Now, the fact is that that was done in an even-handed way. The only point I'm making is that they're not brown or, or yellow. And for Senator Harradin to make a claim that this is racially motivated legislation also has to be utterly rejected. The and as, 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 for, as for the idea that, uh, that, that you should find some, some solace in the words of Mr Justice Einfeld, why you call him Mr Justice Einfeld, I don't know. I don't think he was acting in a judicial capacity. Was he exercising judicial power when he made the remarks to which you refer? when apparently he said that uh, there was a shameful blot on our compassion and humanity, the way in which we treated those who were seeking to have a claim for refugee status recognised, when in fact, in, in fact there is a most exhaustive process of assessment of that claim, most exhaustive process according to the principles of natural justice. And perhaps it's that exhaustive process which is more to the point of any criticism uh, than, uh, than a claim uh, that uh, thereby we're demonstrating a lack of compassion and humanity. Really, Senator Harradine's and perhaps other senators have their main uh, argument, I believe, directed against the detention at all of these people who arrive unannounced whilst their claim is being assessed. And the fact of whether it's a lawful or unlawful detention is, in a sense, a secondary matter to their major objection to that process of holding the people in custody, in detention, for a period which has, in some instances, been lengthy whilst the claims are being assessed and dealt with. So I reject the general, uh, as, as I say, uh, uh, claims that have been uh, put in a way to sort of colour the argument and to try to move people uh, to oppose this particular legislation. Now this particular legislation is, uh, and, and I admire Senator Coulter from, for exposing the way in which he wrestled and tackled, uh, wrestled with and tackled the, the various arguments that can be put in relation to this particular piece of legislation. It is not straightforward to give your unambiguous uh, adherence to what is put forward by the government uh, tonight to the parliament as a way of dealing with a very uh, difficult situation. But the fact is that uh, we were faced with the High Court decision which expressed uh, a view as to the lawfulness or unlawfulness of the custody of certain persons who were uh, uh, held, uh, it was intended under Section 88 of the Migration Act, and uh, a majority of the judges indicated their view that uh, that detention or, or custody ought to be characterised as unlawful if, in fact, the vessel on which the people arrived was no longer available to take them back uh, out into international waters. Basically, that's what it amounted to. And I think Senator Coulter was the one who I thought made a very telling comment when he said that of the, of the people detained, one is, if nothing is done, going to arrive at a situation where, for example, if two boatloads of people came into the same uh, inlet in northwest uh, Aust Western Australia, one of which was riddled with uh, some disease-bearing uh, uh, organism, which justified destruction by the quarantine authorities in order to preserve the Australian community from the uh, encroachment of some exotic disease which could do great damage to our pastoral industries or to our uh, human health. And the other vessel was not so riddled and therefore was able to be uh, tied up at a wharf when, uh, when uh, seized by, uh, lawful, uh, by, by the various authorities concerned. Then those people who were on the boat that was destroyed in order to protect the Australian community would now have a claim for damages would now have a claim for compensation from the Australian community in relation to their detention, whereas the others would not. 
Now, really, this is, a, this is an absurd situation, and uh, I don't see anything untoward in the Parliament of the Commonwealth of Australia saying, and I emphasise this, not that there is an interference with the judicial power, not that there is an interference with the right of the court to determine whether the detention was unlawful or not. That is still a very proper, central, primary task of the bench of judges who will be approached in relation to these matters. The bench of judges will decide whether the detention was lawful or unlawful in accordance with the criteria which has been pointed to by the High Court in relation to section 88. But uh, that's their primary function. It is not being stripped away. All the parliament is being asked to do this evening is, in relation to a decision made by a court that the detention was unlawful, that the quantum of the compensation be limited and restricted. That the compensation be limited and restricted. And in that way, uh, the, uh, the interests of the Australian community will, I believe, be properly protected by decision of the parliament. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, that would be a well justifiable approach which would be well understood within the Australian community which we represent, not in a racist, xenophobic way, not in a neo-Nazi way, but in a simple way to recognise the, uh, the needs of the Australian community and the capacity of the Australian community to deal with the consequences of the High Court decision in this regard. Senator Coulter again gave the example of persons being rescued at sea. Consider this for a moment persons rescued at sea from a boat that would otherwise sink and they would have perished perished in the waters close to Australia. These persons were rescued by uh, the HMAS Townsville, brought into Darwin, and because the HMAS Townsville had to then go on other duties and was therefore not available to take these people back into international waters or back to their country of origin or their transit uh, country or whatever it might be, does anyone seriously suggest that the Australian community should now, in respect of those persons saved from perishing by an Australian Navy vessel, should have an, a, a large compensation package offered to them for the period uh, that they were detained unlawfully, if that's what a court determined uh, their detention to be? It is just absolutely absurd. Whereas those whose boat did not founder came into the port of Darwin, was tied up at the wharf, would not have such a claim against the Australian people for compensation. Now, what the, uh, what the bill is saying is that in that situation where you have that consequence, the claim, the limit, uh, there is a limit to the compensation to be determined by the parliament uh, and that that limit uh, is, uh, is, is justifiable and uh, I believe uh, can be supported in good conscience by senators. Finally, Senator Harradine says that uh, well, perhaps the matter should be sent to the Scrutiny of Bills Committee. The senator is one of the founders of the, and I think, if not the inaugural chairman, certainly an early chairman of the Scrutiny of Bills Committee. I understand its role, I think, reasonably well. Its role was to alert the parliament, to alert the Senate chamber in particular, of those instances where legislation might otherwise escape scrutiny and a provision or some effect or impact on, uh, on the rights of, uh, of those who would be subject to the bill might not be noted in a way which would allow proper debate in the chamber before a decision was made whether to give support to the uh, proposed legislation, to the bill concerned. That is not the case tonight. Senators know the situation. We are having, having a very vigorous debate, which I think just exemplifies my point. There is no need for the scrutiny of bills committee to alert us to the various uh, controversial elements in the bill. I believe we're well able tonight to make a decision. Well, well, well able tonight to make a decision, and I believe we ought to do so. Therefore, I commend the second reading to the chamber. Yes, thank you, Minister. The question before the Senate tonight is: the amendment moved by Senator Harradine be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. no. The noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
prison that comes in usually. Lock the doors. Order. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Harradine be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Bourne, teller for the ayes, and Senator Reid, teller for the noes.
Order. The result of the division there being six ayes and 50 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. All honourable senators, please resume their seats. Order. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. Order. The question is the bill will be now read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Jones, tell her for the ayes, and Senator Bourne, tell her for the nose.
Order result of the division there being 50 ayes and 7 noes. The question is resolved in the affirmative. Mr Clark. Act 1958 in relation to certain non-citizens. Those honourable senators still standing, please resume their seats or leave the chamber. Those senators standing and still, please resume their seats or leave the chamber. Is it the wish of the committee that the is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Harrodin. Um, uh, whilst uh, some of the opposition members are around, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Senator Tate uh, whether the effect of clause three, uh, whether clause three has a retrospective effect such that it would deny rights. Uh, it, it could deny rights to certain people, uh, rights that they already had. The Honourable Minister. Senator. Uh I don't know that I've completely grasped the, uh, the question because what this is designed to do is, of course, to include those persons who uh, arrive uh, in the territorial sea of Australia uh, between uh, uh, the 1st of December, isn't it, of 92, and the 1st of November, 30th of November, 1st of November, 93. So it deals with a group of those who a group of those who might arrive in the future and uh, therefore doesn't strip away the rights of those who have arrived in the past, as I understand it, Senator. Senator Harrity. There's the um, date today, Minister. I think it's about uh, the... Um, what is the date? I think it's... it's nearly, nearly the 25th. 17th, isn't it? This uh, clearly is retrospective. It is an operation uh, from the 1st of uh, December. Not, uh, well, if nobody has arrived, then why don't you make it from uh, today? And thus we would not be voting for retrospective legislation. As it is at the present moment, it is retrospective legislation. If you say that there's nobody arrived, in your knowledge, nobody has arrived thus far. Uh, who knows? There may indeed have been some people arrived. But on the face of it, what I'm asking you, is it not retrospective legislation? The Honourable Minister. Mr President, the, uh, uh, Mr Chairman, the object of the, uh, of the bill is to make sure that there is no gap in the, uh, in the coverage of the legislation. We therefore mark down the 1st of December as the uh, operative uh, time to, uh, uh, to uh, have the extension to uh, November, 1st of November 1993. Uh, they mark the, the, ver the uh, beginning and the finishing limits of, of this uh, provision. Um, I suppose it is possible that somebody may have sneaked in uh, in the interim over the last couple of weeks. Uh, I can't deny that that is a possibility. And uh, it is intended that the legislation to that extent deal with such a situation. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Shamaret. I'd like to um, Would those honourable senators standing Please take a seat. I'd like to ask the minister to respond to a question that actually was pl uh, 
put by Senator Harradine in his earlier speech, where um, he talked about um, the section, excuse me, I'm just trying to find it, um, regarding the determination of compensation uh, being made by the perpetrators of the particular unlawful offence. And um, I would also like the minister to comment on um, how uh, what is being done in this legislation uh, where the um, 54RA, where it refers to compensation, how this will put Australia in relation to the International Covenant of uh, Civil and Political Rights, uh, section 9.5, where it says that where a person has been detained unlawfully, they have an enforceable right to compensation. The Honourable the Minister. Mr Chairman, Senator Shamrat won't find a provision saying that the executive will determine the amount of, or the limit of compensation in this particular bill. The whole point of the exercise is that we are asking the parliament to determine the limit and the amount and the quantum of compensation uh, so that the rhetoric of Senator Harradine uh, is really ill-founded. It is not simply the, the uh, executive making the decision as to the quantum. We are coming to the parliament of the Commonwealth of Australia asking it to, uh, to pass that uh, particular provision, which, Senator, you'll find on page three of the bill, uh, clause six, 54RA3. The compensation that may be awarded to a designated person in an action under subsection two is to be a dollar for each day of the person's unlawful custody. Now, as I say, that is a provision which is uh, to be given parliamentary uh, status, uh, statutory status, if, if passed by the parliament, it is not an executive matter. Uh, as to the question of uh, the relationship to, I think it was uh, uh, the uh, International Covenant, I, got, uh, I thought I did have some note here but I just can't put my hand on it, but basically of course the government is not stripping away the, uh, uh, the right to uh, compensation. It is uh, setting, setting a, a level of compensation, it's setting a quantum, uh, but it is not denying the, uh, the process, as I say, most importantly, of allowing a judicial tribunal to determine whether the detention was unlawful or not. That's the basic judicial function. Uh, as to the quantum, that is being dealt with uh, in the way suggested in the bill, and the government does not believe that that uh, is uh, at variance with uh, the international covenant which the senator mentioned. Um, I agree with the Minister uh, and uh, I note that Senator Charmeret appears to be quoting from uh, Senator Harradine's press release of today's date in which uh, the words uh, stand, the federal government was the perpetrator of the illegal detention. Now <coughs> uh, it sets itself up as the judge of what compensation is to be made. And when I read that um, Mr Chairman, uh, I had the same uh, <coughs> re response, that is that no, it is the parliament that is determining the law. It's the parliament that is setting the limitation on the compensation. And I can only say through you, Mr Chairman, uh, in concert with the Minister, Senator Tate, uh, to Senator Harrodin and Senator Chamaret, that they seem not to have uh, grasped the burden the central element of the reason for this legislation, uh, as explained in the remarks that I tried uh, as clearly as I could to set out, um, when we, uh, and, and as of course uh, Senator Tate did in summing up this second reading debate, and uh, I think as Senator Coulter um, got to the kernel of us as, as, as well, and that is the arbitrariness of seeing uh, an avenue to compensation never intended by this parliament, never intended, and the arbitrariness of that avenue opening up as a loophole uh, on, the, on the grounds that the boat may not any longer exist on which they arrived. And I, I think we could, uh, again, have all sorts of semantics uh, for another half an hour. I don't w wish to ri rise again. 
but I just want to say that there is no, uh, no uh, point of difference in regard to this legislation between the government and the opposition. The government and the opposition uh, have a, an approach to the integrity of Australia's uh, immigration law which seems to have been um, lost by my good friends, uh, the Honourable Senators, Senator Schoenritt and Senator Harradine. And I can only appeal to you not to create uh, straw men by the questions that you ask of, uh, of this, uh, this legislation. Because I'm on my feet, uh, Mr Chairman, I uh, wish to refer to the uh, amendment that has been circulated from Senator Harradine. And uh, it would uh, um, be a form of words that would require the minister uh, to uh, respond within 28 days um, and allow uh, to any application for refugee status um, uh, and the granting of a, a permanent entry permit uh, on the grounds of strong human on, on uh, the basis of strong humanitarian grounds. Um, the opposition believes that the, oppos uh, that the legislation is in a form which is uh, adequate, and we do not uh, support. We do not support Order. this uh, amendment. Uh, Order. Would those honourable senators standing please take a seat or leave the chamber? Senator Harrington. I find that extraordinary. Uh, that uh, and an indicative of a closed mind approach of, uh, towards this matter, Senator Teague. Uh, has just stated that he would vote against the amendment that I've circulated that uh, has been circulated but not moved he has not given me the courtesy of hearing any uh, 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 arguments that I might advance in favor of that particular well, measure Senator Stanley, please take a seat uh, and I'll come back to that in a minute and I do also take uh, uh, note of his statement that the opposition and the government are at one in this matter. I wonder whether in their hearts all of the opposition and all of the government are at one in this matter, particularly uh, in its um, uh, legal consequences. Um, the final thing that I just wanted to briefly mention without arguing it about it is a statement by uh, Senator Teague that uh, we should not carry on with semantics and we should not uh, raise straw men. Well, I've heard a few semantics around this joint tonight, uh, this, uh, this chamber tonight, uh, and uh, those semantics included uh, the uh, statements of uh, discrimination, the, 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 the suggestion that certain people would be discriminated against in that they wouldn't be able to claim that they were illegally detained because they had been uh, brought into uh, Australia by a ship uh, of the Australian Navy that rescued them. Well, that's arguable anyhow, because that ship, as I understand, has left Australian shores. But, uh, uh, but all right, that's, uh, that's arguable. I won't get into that argument. That's a semantic argument uh, for, this, for the purpose of this chamber. But what I do say is that's not the fault. The, the, the faults in the legislation is not the fault of the refugees. They are not straw men. They are real people. And they're real people that have suffered in their own country and suffered at the hands of this government in Australia. And I remind the Senate that there were church groups and community groups that appealed to the government, to ap appeal to the government to allow these people to release in their custody and on their cognizance. And the government deliberately, deliberately refused that request and, in my view, callously refused that request. Can't blame the refugees then for seeking to go to the courts to, have, uh, 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 to, to, in, uh, to, to be released from that detention, to be released from the detention. And, uh, I'm not uh, talking about semantics at all. What I do want to ask the minister on this particular clause is uh, uh, this uh, question. 
on, uh, uh, no, on 54A, I'm sorry, uh, uh, 54RA1, 54RA1. Um, does that uh, clause remove a person's common law right for damages for false imprisonment? The Mr. Chairman. Senator Harrity. As I understood it, the minister has said yes. I appeal to the Senate to listen to that statement. The minister has said that 54RA1 removes the common law right of a person uh, to. Uh, 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 removes a person's common law right for damages, uh, uh, to, for actions for damages for false imprisonment. Well, if it can be done for these people, it can be done again for others. Unless we regard these people as somehow different, as somehow not equal to others. And if we are doing that, we are for sure contravening the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and we are for sure undermining the rule of law. I ask another question uh, in regard now to 54RA3. Uh, uh, which fixes the compensation that may be awarded under section 2 at one dollar for each day of that person's unlawful detention. And might I remind the chamber that 54RA2 uh, uh, substitutes uh, for a person's common law right a paltry right, a paltry right uh, to compensation determined by the uh, well de de technically determined by this parliament but we all know determined by the government and i restate what i said because it's accurate the perpetrator of the un uh, of uh, uh, of the action um, the perpetrator of uh, uh, of uh, the actions which kept uh, these people in unlawful detention has set, its, set uh, itself up as the judge for the amount of the, uh, uh, for what compensation were paid to its victims. Now we go to uh, and the question that I want to ask about 54 RA3 uh, is this: Can the minister? Uh, advise the Parliament of legislation which uh, limits uh, compensation um, uh, for um, uh, persons who have um, uh, suffered uh, damages, uh, who have suffered uh, false imprisonment. What is the situation through you, Mr Chairman, of uh, the federal police. If the federal police have detained persons unlawfully, is there legislation which limits the compensation uh, payable, uh, uh, or the, the compensation which is meted out to those persons? Or is that not a matter for the courts to determine, having regard to all of the relevant circumstances? Chairman, uh, Senator Harradine's raised uh, various matters. As to, can I just go back to the question of uh, 54A1 and the question of unlawful imprisonment, the retrospective effect, as it was put, uh, that uh, would take away the right to sue for damages in relation to unlawful uh, detention? Uh, can I make it very clear? I just want to re-emphasise what I've said before: that the question of the unlawful detention, the false imprisonment, is proper and still for a court, for a judicial determination, it still remains proper, and nothing in this particular bill affects that. I just simply want to emphasise that what is uh, negated is the uh, usual uh, method of, uh, of uh, receiving an award of damages from the, uh, 
from the court should the detention be found to be unlawful. Senator Herodine then moved to uh, uh, section 54 RA3 to talk about the provision for compensation and reiterated again what is patently untrue. Perhaps I can't put it that way, Senator. I beg your pardon, Senator. But, well, it is, it is patently not the case that the government controls the Senate. We are a minority in the Senate, government members of, the, of this chamber. The Senate will determine this matter, not the government. And uh, the government uh, is, is not uh, imposing this matter. This will be a matter for the vote of the, of the Senate as a chamber of the Commonwealth Parliament. As to the question of uh, whether I know of any uh, statutory uh, uh, provision which is uh, analogous to this or, or perhaps a precedent for this, no, Senator, I don't know of any such provision. This is a case where, to go back once again to the second reading debate and not to linger on it again, where the unlawfulness of the detention or the custody depends on a set of circumstances which I would submit are quite different to the sort of unlawful detention that might occur if, uh, if a federal police officer, without any cause whatsoever, simply took somebody off the street and, uh, and held them against their will. Uh, this is a situation where the unlawfulness arises from the fact, for example, it is claimed by some, no doubt it would be tested in a court, uh, that uh, where uh, an R uh, a Royal Australian Navy uh, vessel rescues a foundering boat and takes the uh, uh, bedraggled and forlorn uh, survivors of, of the sinking of the vessel uh, from almost certain death and brings them into a port and then sails away on other duties, uh, that uh, by that fact of sailing away, the detention of the uh, boat people becomes unlawful. That is a very different circumstance to the one that uh, Senator Harradine was uh, pointing to as a, perhaps an analogy, and I believe it is in that peculiarity that the right of the parliament to substitute its view as to appropriate compensation for that would otherwise be awarded by a court is proper to the parliament of the Commonwealth of Australia, and uh, th that is why I believe that the provision can be supported. So, so uh, at what that. stage did the department become a suspect uh, that uh, uh, the uh, suspect that the uh, 37 uh, ha were being uh, unlawfully detained? Minister. Senator, I may have missed the first part, but I don't think I, I think I've tried to be scrupulous in not making a judgment as to whether any particular group of persons was unlawfully detained or held in custody. I understand the High Court to have made some suggestions that certain persons could be said to have been so held if it were the fact that, for example, boats were burned or whatever. Uh, and I have uh, merely uh, tried to give some examples of where that claim could be made so that the detention could be characterised as unlawful. Uh, but I don't think I've, and I certainly didn't mean to assert and substitute my judgment for that of a court as to whether uh, the 37 or the 14 or the 103 were unlawfully detained. That's a matter for the courts. Not answering, that is not answering my question. This legislation, you are asking us to tighten loopholes. You've said it in the second reading speech. Uh, you also mounted uh, a. Uh, you also pushed through legislation here in May to tighten the loopholes to uh, ensure that persons were no longer detained under 88, Section 88, but were de re detained uh, under um, 4B. Um, what I'm asking you: When was it? Last year, sometime last year, or was it? January, February of this year, that uh, the department became concerned that perhaps um, holding uh, uh, these uh, people or holding any boat person uh, or any uh, applicant for refugee status under Section 88 uh, in detention may not be lawful.
Well, Senator, yeah, I, I'm sure. just trying to recall with, the, with officials uh, some of the history of the matter, but as has been reiterated during the debate today, this was all the, the May legislation was triggered by an approach by some people to uh, a court uh, with a suggestion that uh, detention could be said to be unlawful. Uh, I would imagine that uh, it must have been some time in April or thereabouts that uh, this matter was being discussed, and uh, uh, it would may. Uh, so it's about that time that the matter was discussed. But I think the the uh, that is not sort of a primary consideration in in the uh, in the Senate's deliberations on this bill tonight. Uh, that may have been relevant to the uh, discussions in May. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to ask the uh, minister a couple of questions on the quantum of um, uh, damage that the bill provides. Uh, Senator Herodine called it paltry. Uh, I call it a subterfuge. Uh, I put it to the minister that essentially uh, the whole provision uh, fixing the damages at no more than one dollar was introduced to uh, uh, technically, at least, uh, evade uh, the um, international convention that uh, people must have the right to have uh, uh, to lawful to compensation if they have been unlawfully detained. And uh, if the minister doesn't agree with that proposition. Uh, I'd like to tell me, tell the Senate, um, how he has arrived at uh, one dollar per day. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Chairman, uh, I don't think it's fair to characterise uh, this particular provision of a quantum, a limited quantum of damages. Uh, or compensation that might be available to a person as a subterfuge or a way to avoid an implication from uh, an international undertaking uh, that Australia has entered into. Uh, it is a way in which the, uh, 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 the Parliament is uh, setting a limit given the peculiar character, the peculiar character of the circumstances which may lead a court to hold the, the detention or uh, custody of persons during a particular period of time was unlawful. It is a very unusual circumstance. It is unlikely to have a precedent, a precedent or, a, uh, or a similar situation uh, arising in, in the future. And I believe that um, uh, the amount of compensation is, uh, is uh, not uh, to be properly characterised as, as mere tokenism. It is a proper recognition but uh, I would have to agree, obviously, a limited one. Senator Swindler. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I just find it difficult uh, that the minister feels a um, person's freedom for 24 hours is worth one dollar. Uh, I just really find it difficult to understand. And uh, uh, I wonder if the, the minister can give me any, any precedent uh, in Australia or, or anywhere else where uh, the, a person's freedom, perhaps in a, in a comparative uh, imposition of a monetary fine and imprisonment, was equated to, to one dollar, because I really don't know, and I, I'm searching for the, the government's logic uh, for it. The Honourable Minister. We're trying to grapple with the logic, in inverted commas, of the High Court. That's the problem that this Parliament is confronting, Senator. One is confronting a situation where, if I may repeat, you may have been out of the chamber, but it arises from an example which Senator Coulter, I think, rightly put, that if two vessels limped into port, one of which was riddled with some disease-bearing organism, such as threatened the integrity of uh, the, uh, of the uh, human health of the Australian community or posed a real threat to uh, the pastoral industry in northwest West Australia, and therefore the boat was destroyed. Uh, uh, burned at uh, the order of quarantine authorities, and the other boat was not so infected and uh, was allowed to be tied up at the port, then in relation to those, if the High Court's uh, decision or elements of the decision are correct, uh, the, uh, the persons who came in on the vessel that was burned would be entitled 
to have their detention subsequently characterised as unlawful and would be, if the parliament didn't act, entitled to compensation or damages determined by the court in some way which is uh, unsupervised or uncontrolled by this parliament. Now, that is a very... And the others wouldn't. The others wouldn't. And I won't go through the Royal Navy example yet again. I mean, it is just such a peculiar situation that the government is inviting the parliament to act in this way, uh, and uh, the fact that we can't point to precedent uh, only illustrates, I think, the fact that this is uh, a totally uh, singular situation which has been brought about by the logic of the High Court decision. The question before the Chair is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Colt. Thank you, Mr uh, Chairman. <clears throat> Could I ask the Minister two questions? It seems to me that there are two elements to this. One is whether the detention was lawful or not lawful, and then flowing from that is the question of, uh, if it's unlawful, the question of compensation. The first question is, if the amount of compensation which is payable is increased, does that not increase the arbitrariness of the difference between those people whose boat is destroyed and the pe persons whose boat is not destroyed, so that it actually decreases the arbitrariness of the decision in reducing the amount of compensation? And secondly, uh, on the question of the lawfulness of the detention, and this is the more serious question, is it the intention of the government in setting the compensation at a very low level that people might be continued to be kept in custody unlawfully simply because the amount of compensation which is payable has been reduced? Or would, if the court judged that the detention was unlawful, that those people would be released? Because I think that is the more substantial issue. The Honourable the Minister. Look, uh, as, as to the first point you made, Senator, I think it's, it's probably theoretically true, uh, or, or will be practically true, that um, the compensation level will be such that the discriminatory aspect of it, I suppose, is minimised uh, than if it were a large quantum of compensation that were granted. If that's your point, I, I suppose I can agree. Um, as to your second point, um, there's been so much legislation going through, perhaps I'm not uh, as alert as I ought to be, but um, the government in, uh, in... I've forgotten the actual thread of the argument. Uh, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, that's right. Yeah. Yes, that's right. That's right, uh, Senator. Those who are presently held in custody or detention have been held in custody or detention lawfully, and the High Court has confirmed that uh, since uh, since May, since the passage of uh, of the legislation. So, our dealing with uh, those who may be said to have been held unlawfully up to that point, in the way that's suggested in this bill doesn't really have an impact on, uh, has, has, has any relation to uh, the government's decision or good faith or bad faith in continuing to detain people under the present or current uh, provisions. But I'm not sure that I've understood completely your, your point. If you wanted to reiterate it, I'd be happy to try to respond. Senator Calder. Mr Chairman, uh, I think the point's fairly simple, and that is that if there is a case that which I understand there is, that people have been detained unlawfully. Uh, if those people are still in detention and the cost of keeping them in detention is only a dollar a day, is it the intention of the government, if the High Court rules that their detention is illegal, to continue to keep them in detention because it's very cheap for the government to keep them in detention? Or will the government, will the government release them uh, because the High Court is, is is, is, does, 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 cost, does cost become a, a factor in, in, in the uh, thinking of the government as to whether they're going to adhere 
to the decision of the High Court or not. Minister? Now, I understand where the confusion comes in is in Senator Coulter's using the present tense. Uh, the quantum, uh, the question of this dollar a day business, only refers to that period of detention which could be characterised as unlawful up till the 6th of May, isn't it, when the present provisions came into effect. So the continuing holding of people in detention cannot be characterised as unlawful in the way that the High Court spoke of it in, uh, in elements of that judgment. So uh, you, your question doesn't really flow. Well, the question is that the bill stand is printed. Senator Spindler. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, could the Minister please tell me if uh, these, uh, this provision is limited to uh, the case where a boat either is or isn't uh, available anymore for people to leave, or if uh, people had, were found, say, in the next two or three weeks after the, this bill comes into effect, uh, would be found on an entirely different ground to have been uh, held uh, unlawfully. Would not this provision of uh, $1 per day apply equally to them? I just think we seem to be hung up on that one example. Honourable Minister. Mr uh, Chairman, um, yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Mr Chairman, if in fact a person were detained unlawfully, if a person were found by a court to have been held in custody unlawfully between the 19th of November 1989 and before this bill commenced, then the terms of the bill would be uh, invoked, would be uh, triggered, would, would apply, and the uh, provisions relating, therefore, to, uh, uh, to compensation would come into operation. I think the point that is being made is that the parliament is being asked to respond to indications given in the High Court judgment that the detention that would be uh, characterised as unlawful would, uh, uh, in the opinion of the High Court, be uh, related to those situations such as we have been describing and illustrating during the course of the uh, debate. But the terms of the legislation itself don't restrict it in that way. It's up to the court to determine what's unlawful or not. Um, uh, my questions, uh, Mr Chairman, relate to our international obligations um, under the, in particular, the um, ICCPR, just for shortness, and I um, refer to Article 9, uh, Section 4, and then later to Section 5. And um, I ask the Minister, under 54RA1, where, uh, as I understand it, the right of a designated person who's in custody between 19th November 89 until May um, to access to common law, either under state or federal or territory um, law, is removed. And just in passing, Senator Spindler, that's what would actually uh, restrict the compensation to boats because this legislation that we're being asked to pass tonight denies any access to any other people who may have been in slightly different circumstances, who may have been considered for unlawful imprisonment. Um, they can no longer be considered. And I refer to the minister, uh, to section four. This particular um, section, 54RA1, does it not contravene article 9.4, which states, anyone who is deprived of his liberty by arrest or detention shall be entitled to take proceedings before a court in order that that court may decide without delay on the lawfulness of his detention and order his release if the detention is not lawful. That's my first question. My second question relates 
to section 5 and again refers back to the contemptuously small amount that is being uh, determined uh, for the limitation of compensation. And um, I'd like to ask the minister, in section 5, where it says, anyone who has been victim of unlawful arrest or detention shall have an enforceable right to compensation. I ask the minister for his definition of compensation. How is compensation normally determined under law? And can it possibly be identical for 104 or so people? Or is it not the case that an understanding of compensation has to take into consideration the individual circumstances of each person who is asking for that compensation before a court of law? The Honourable Minister. Mr Chairman, I need to emphasise that the question of the lawfulness of the custody or detention is and always should remain a matter for the court to determine. And therefore, in that respect, the first uh, part of the International Covenant, which Senator Shamrett adverted to, I believe is properly uh, observed in terms of this particular bill. Uh, as to the question of, uh, of compensation, uh, I think we're reiterating matters. But quite clearly, compensation is, uh, in this case, awarded by a court uh, if it decides to award it uh, in the amount of a dollar per day for each, uh, for each day of the person's unlawful custody. Compensation is a, a monetary mark or response by uh, society to the finding of the court that a detention or holding in custody has been unlawful. Uh, it is, a, is, a, uh, is a, an amount which uh, is properly uh, described as a social response, if you like, or a community response uh, uh, to, to that uh, finding, uh, and the amount, of course, uh, which the society is prepared to pay in a particular circumstance can, I think, be properly determined and uh, quantified and limited by the society's elected representatives, and that's what the parliament is being invited to do tonight. Senator Shemrat. We not, um, through you, Mr Chairman, Minister, preempting the court's determination of what is appropriate by making something uniform. And um, I'd also like to point out here that it was parliament who moved the legislation in May and uh, therefore was in error in making what the federal court believed could be um, a determination of unlawful detention. And it's again parliament that is being, able to, being asked to set the penalty. We are similarly being asked to set a penalty which is quite irrespective of the individual circumstances of the people who may be uh, in that category of unlawful detention. And it is, to use Senator Coulter's term, an arbitrary provision that we're being asked to ratify. The Honourable the Minister. Mr Chairman, I don't think I can add a great deal more. I have indicated that, yes, it is a deliberate action of the parliament to substitute its own judgment as to a fair response, monetary response in this case by society, to a finding of a court that uh, detention or custody was unlawful. Uh, but, uh, um, and therefore, of course, what Senator Shamred says about the different operation of the provision that would be the case if the court awarded compensation is undoubtedly true. Uh, but I still urge the, uh, the Senate, of course, to accept that this is a proper role for the Parliament in this peculiar situation. Chairman, I'll be very brief. I, I'm aware of the time, uh, but there are three very quick uh, matters that I want to raise. Um, how many um, uh, persons uh, uh, does the department uh, estimate uh, are likely to be uh, uh, the rights of whom are likely to be affected uh, by this legislation? Um, are they? Are they they are, and are those people only Cambodians, or are they uh, 
uh, Chinese, uh, Vietnamese. In respect of uh, uh, <coughs> those people, uh, in respect of the uh, forcible return of uh, persons who have sought refugee status in Australia who have come from China, uh, PRC nationals, what um, is the situation in regard to uh, Mr. Connie Bear's um, uh, uh, visit to the PRC? Uh, what um, can uh, the government give a guarantee that persons who have um, been forcibly sent back to the PRC uh, uh, have not and will not be punished. Um, and finally, um, the minister mentioned uh, that I'd use the word racist. I don't know that I did use that. I, I, I used the word, but I don't know that I used it in my uh, statement. Um, and if I did, I probably did so because Michael Phillips, the Assistant Director of Determination of Refugee Status of the Department uh, of Immigration of Dilgia, in Dateline of SBS November the 11th, 1992, described the attitude um, of uh, uh, some people in the uh, department in this area as having a rejection mentality, as being biased and extremely racist and having preconceived ideas. That Beg your pardon? That doesn't justify his statement, doesn't justify this bill being called racist. These people, racist. these people have been detained in custody. It's not racist. They have been illegally, illegally detained. Uh, they have uh, been illegally held in detention. That's what we're talking about. This, well, They've been illegally uh, held in detention. These people have been, and deliberately so. I'm not. Uh, th th this is a Michael Phillips, the assistant director of the Determination of Refugee Status, has been saying this. And uh, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to say, and I want to reiterate the fact that it's not their, it's not the problem. Of these people that have been detained. They've been offered, um, I suppose, at any stage to go back to Cambodia, to go back to China. Although they've been held in detention some of them for three years and they haven't chosen to do so, they could have had free flights to China, free flights to Cambodia with champagne, chicken and champagne breakfast. They haven't, they've decided to suffer the detention, the illegal detention. That's what we're talking about. Don't let me. Don't get me going on the th uh, on the situation, um, and the the points that have been made here are, are beside the point. They are red herrings. There are pe there were church groups, as I've said before, and the community groups that have asked for these people to be released into their custody, and the department has deliberately refused. And it's they that have held have been. Uh, holding them illegally in custody. But I'm sorry, come back, uh, Mr Chairman, to those two questions particularly. How many are involved or whose rights are, are affected by this bill? And uh, the uh, question that I ask in regard to um, uh, what guarantees uh, have been received and uh, how have these been tested? And I come back and I have to ask this question because I've asked it again and again and not given a satisfactory answer, those seven um, refugees that were forcibly sent back from Port Headland to China, um, are they or are they not in custody? There is an affidavit being presented to the Federal Court in Perth which states that they are in, 
in uh, jail and uh, undergoing re-education, uh, which involves uh, forced labour. <coughs> Mr Chairman, as to the first question that Senator Harradine uh, raised about uh, those whose rights are likely to be affected, that would depend on the government or the department or myself here offering an opinion as to whether a certain number were unlawfully detained. Of course, that would be a question for the court. But of those who have been detained, um, I'm advised that it's in the order of about perhaps 300 people. And uh, so it would be a portion, greater or smaller, of that number who, about whom a court could find that they were, had been unlawfully detained in the, in the previous period, if the High Court's uh, indications are followed through. As to the visit of the Secretary of the Department, Mr Connie Bear, to Beijing recently, I understand that he was given assurances at a very high level within the Foreign Ministry of uh, the People's Republic of China to the effect that uh, those who returned or were returned from Australia, both instances, uh, would not be mistreated or, um, or persecuted simply because of their uh, fleeing, that's the word, from, uh, from China. Uh, and. Uh, that assurance was given, as I say, at an extremely high level and uh, is understood by the Australian government to have the, uh, the full authority of the, of the Chinese government in its, uh, in its being given. Uh, Senator Harradine refers to an affidavit uh, presented to the federal court in some proceeding in, I think it was in Perth. I'm not in a position to uh, say whether that particular affidavit uh, uh, can be found to be uh, um, uh, justified or truly pointing to, uh, to the facts uh, as uh, it claims to or, or, or uh, alleges to present. All I can do is repeat the assurances that have been given at those high levels and I believe that uh, uh, that was the proper task uh, and responsibility of the uh, Secretary of the Department, and that is what he obtained. Chairman, I can't let that go. Um, uh, I um, had the honour of having dinner with um, uh, Professor Wong Rumong, one of the most uh, famous of uh, Chinese dissidents, uh, who was jailed by the KMT, uh, was uh, became a communist, went right through the system, was jailed by the communists, and uh, is uh, a very well-known author. And uh, I put that question to him, and his response uh, clearly was that you do not believe what the Chinese, or the PRC officials tell the outside world, you believe what they tell their own people. Now, they told the outside world that nothing happened in Tiananmen Square. The same people who Mr. Connie Bear uh, was, uh, uh, to, uh, who gave Mr. Connie Bear uh, those assurances. Did Mr. Connie Bear, or did it have any of our officials been to the area which, uh, where these people were returned and um, actually seen for themselves? whether or not what is stated in that, um, in that affidavit, this very serious question, very serious indeed, what was stated in that affidavit on the information provided by a Chinese uh, a PRC security officer, whether that was correct or not. Mr uh, Chairman, no independent uh, uh, team has been sent to, uh, to uh, check the uh, particulars of the allegations that are contained in the uh, affidavit that's been put in 
to a court, a federal court in Perth. Uh, as I say, the uh, responsibility and the uh, task uh, of the uh, Secretary of the Department uh, was uh, discharged in the way that I've described, and uh, that is the uh, sum that I, uh, sum of that matter that I can relate to the Senate. The question is that the bill stand is printed. Could I move my amendment, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman? Um, my amendment um, that is, I move the amendment uh, circulated in my name. Um, and uh, would point out uh, to the committee uh, that um, uh, this is uh, an amendment to insert after section 47 of the Principal Act uh, a, a, a certain particular, uh, partic a particular provision. And uh, it is uh, for the minister to grant a permanent entry, uh, may grant a permanent entry uh, permit to a person whose application for refugee status has been rejected etc. and uh, goes through the circumstances of that. Uh, Honourable Senators will have read it, so I'm not going to take up the time. Um, the reason that I'm putting this forward is that there, I believe that there are circumstances in which uh, uh, the exercise of the, uh, by the Minister uh, of um, a power to grant uh, Permanent entry, a permanent entry permit on strong humanitarian grounds is warranted. Now that's recognised in any event um, uh, by the provisions of section 115 of the legislation. Uh, and I quote from a uh, copy of a letter which the minister provided to me and uh, um, after our last uh, discussion here on the 9th of December, or maybe it was the 8th of December. Uh, the current mechanism for allowing some persons rejected for refugee status to stay in Australia on humanitarian grounds makes use of the Minister's power under section 115. In essence, the Minister grants applicants a domestic protection temporary entry permit in spite of the fact that they have been found not to meet an essential criterion for the permit namely that they have been determined to be a refugee. The key point is that to access the minister's powers, a, an entry permit review application must have been rejected. A refugee status review rejection does not trigger the minister's section 115 powers. This rejects the fact that at the time section 115 was drafted, refugee status decisions were not formally incorporated into the Act. And, uh, Rather than read it all, I seek leave to have the uh, minister's letter incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Yeah. There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in short, um, and I will be very short, uh, it seems to me that um, there could well be circumstances uh, where the minister may consider, pursuant to his letter, that he does have, that he has no power, that his hands are tied. Uh, there may be circumstances where he'd say, yes, clearly there are strong humanitarian grounds, and um, we should consider those grounds. We shouldn't close the option up. Under the present circumstances, pursuant to the letter that he has written to me, he does not have power. Uh, um, um, uh, and I read uh, the penultimate uh, uh, sentence. As noted above, in the case of a designated person or a prohibited entrant, the minister has no power to ac accede to a recommendation to grant an entry permit on humanitarian grounds. Now that is, I believe, to be unduly, uh, un unduly restricted. Restrictive, and I think any reasonable person would understand that. So uh, this is uh, this provision, and I'm, I'm talking now not about, not necessarily talking about uh, the uh, uh, the people under current review, although I know that there have been appeals, including by the Australian Bishop Conference, for those to be allowed uh, entry. Um, on 
humanitarian grounds. But in general terms, I'm, I believe that this measure deserves to be supported. It uh, does set certain time limits. It's not a Kathleen Mavorny, uh, uh, perhaps for the Hansards, um, use another term. I oh, know they, they know all these terms. Um, uh, it's not putting a thing on the long finger and stretching things out because I have included provision here that um, if uh, the applicant's refugee application for a refugee status has been rejected um, and the person applies to the Minister for Permanent Entry Permit within 14 days, so he's got to re he or she has got to apply within 14 days, and there are strong, there's got to be strong humanitarian grounds for the grant of a permanent entry a permit to the person. This enables, it's not a mandatory thing, and enables the minister to consider that and to grant permanent entry permit if the minister so chooses. And the minister must determine the application uh, within 28 days of receiving the application. So I think it's perfectly reasonable, and I appeal to the uh, to the committee to um, uh, accede to to this um, uh, to, to this uh, amendment. Mr. Chairman, the oh, I'm sorry, thank you, Pardon, Senator. Senator Chairman. Mr. Chairman, may I speak in support of this amendment? Um, I would like to um, just uh, introduce it by saying I don't regard this legislation to be racist. And I think policies may be determined as being racist. Um, I agree that this legislation about which we're considering the amendment is a logical extension of the 4B legislation which this parliament passed in May um, earlier this year. Um, and I don't regard this legislation as racist, as I said, but it is arguably discriminatory. And I say here to call arguments coloured or emotive may be a way of marginalising it. People are entitled to hold their different views. And in my view, the policy underlying this legislation does represent a discriminatory stance. Our migration intake is, in my view, slanted. If people have money, connections and the ability to fill in forms, they are facilitated in access to this country. Senator Tate said earlier, as an example of our generosity, that we take 10,000 refugees. This legislation determines that we only take 10,000 refugees who are able to undergo bureaucratic procedures. That, in my view, is discriminatory because it is attached to a capacity to fill in forms, undergo entry requirements, the obvious example given by Senator Harradine was the ridiculous labelling of people from Cambodia as queue jumpers when there is no existing queue. Determination of refugee status should be based not on capacity to fulfil procedures but on an examination of certain factors that have to do with the situation from which those people have come rather than on their capacity to comply with correct bureaucratic process. I cite the Canadian Practice and Policy, which is quoted in the Joint Standing Committee on Migration Regulations August 1992 report, entitled appropriately... Senator Shemaret, are you speaking to the amendment? I am. I, I'm sorry. It does seem a bit convoluted, but it will come back, and it will come back fairly shortly, Mr Chairman. Um, it's entitled Australia's Refugee and Humanitarian System Achieving a Balance Between Refuge and Control. And I'm using this as an illustration that Senator Harradine's amendment actually assists us to achieve a balance between refuge and control. In sections 2.47, 4.8 and 4.9 of this report, we are given an example of the procedures that are used in, in the Canadian ports of entry. Um, requests for refugee status can be made at Canadian ports of entry, at any Canada immigration centre for those already in Canada, or for those contravening immigration law at the beginning of an immigration inquiry. At the preliminary stage, senior immigration officers carry out a pre-inquiry review of any humanitarian and compassionate factors on the case which may warrant special consideration. 
The factors considered are whether it is a person upon whom their government likely will impose severe sanctions on their return home, it is a person upon whom others in Canada already are dependent, and it is an individual whose personal circumstances in relation to the laws and practices of their country are such that they will suffer unduly on returning home. Individuals who meet these criteria can be granted permanent residence on humanitarian and compassionate grounds and are not required to go through the refugee determination process. I support Senator Haradine's amendment because it reduces the cold, technical, inhuman, watertight implacability of this Australian migration legislation. It opens up, without um, allowing the concern that people have expressed about judicial process, it actually opens up to the discretion of the minister the humanitarian factors that we ought to be taking into consideration. I therefore urge other people in this oh. chamber to support it also. The uh, minister? Mr Chairman, the government won't be accepting this amendment. The bill is designed to remedy a particular uh, problem that has arisen. Uh, we don't believe that uh, this is an opportune moment to be vesting the minister with the sort of power that uh, is uh, envisaged uh, in Senator Haradine's amendment. Would the Honourable Senator Standing please take a seat? And, uh, in fact, I think Senator Shamaret's uh, remarks uh, really led to uh, uh, the, uh, a true description <coughs> of, uh, of what is intended, in a sense, and, and Senator Shamaret spoke in glowing terms of the Canada or Canadian uh, system, where I think he said in the end uh, a person doesn't have to go through the rigours of the refugee determination process. Yes, well, that's precisely what, uh, in a sense, Senator Haradine's amendment would achieve, that one would formally go through a refugee determination process, but in the end the pressure would be on the minister to grant uh, entry anyway. And uh, I believe that that would uh, not be an appropriate uh, way to, uh, to uh, deal with uh, with uh, certain matters, and certainly not uh, not in the context anyway of this bill tonight. And for that reason, the government will be opposing the amendment. Senator Spindler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, simply to say that we'll be supporting this amendment and uh, summarising briefly all our arguments. It would be a brave person indeed who, in this particular area, could foretell every circumstance and could draft legislation which. Uh, is designed to meet every possible configuration uh, of uh, uh, human circumstances in this situation. Uh, we believe that some discretion must be left and some responsibility must be left with the Minister uh, to discharge in this situation. As I said, we will be supporting the bill. The amendment. The question is the amendment be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Knows have it. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Does that opinion say aye? aye. Just Senator to point Harrell. out uh, um, that, that uh, we're not seeking to divide uh, on on these questions. Um, we've made it clear um, uh, our opposition to the clauses of the bill. Uh, where and uh, so far as I'm concerned, I don't seek to divide on this. My Mm -hmm. well, the question is that the bill stand is printed. Chairman, that opinion, that Chairman very briefly, I rise only because we've concluded the debate at the committee stage to say that when the matters similar to this were before the chamber on the 7th and 8th of December, I asked the minister and the officers informally and formally for a point-by-point -point answer to two articles that had appeared in The Australian that were making allegations about a government uh, practice in the detention of uh, boat people. And I, I, I still expect that response. I haven't got it yet. The parliament's, uh, the parliament's finishing. But I would like that to be I would like that to be to, uh, I would like still to get the response. I'm not going to speak for any longer than to mention that yesterday in The Australian there was another article that was uh, uh, <coughs> by Louise Williams and it was uh, citing uh, a, a, a former person, um, um, an officer at the Villawood Retention Centre, a Mr Barrow, 
and he gave, made other allegations. I, I asked uh, through you, Mr Chairman, uh, and I am patient with the government, but I would like to see the government's responses to these matters uh, as soon as it may be uh, practical to, to receive it. The Honourable the Minister. Chairman. Senator Teague did on that occasion indicate that he was going to ask questions in relation to these matters point by point. I was briefed to respond. He didn't ask the questions. He didn't ask the questions in the committee stage of that debate. Well, there may, be, may have been a misunderstanding, but uh, we were ready to respond uh, fairly comprehensively uh, to the various points. If we can put the matters together, we will, but I do not want to leave it on the record that we ignored Senator Teague's request. We understand there's been a misunderstanding as to the timing of the response. Uh, we will respond, uh, I hope, this side of Christmas. The question is the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. <coughs> I, think, <coughs> I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Chairman of Committee Senator Colston reports that the committee has considered the Migration Amendment Bill No. 4, 1992, and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. The question is the report of the committee be adopted. Those that have been say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I move Minister. that the bill be now read a third time. The question is the bill be read a third time. Those that have been say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. A bill for an act to amend the Migration Act 1958 in relation to certain non-citizens. Government business order of the day, taxation laws amendment, car parking bill 1992, consideration, committee of the whole of the message of the House of Representatives. Where's your car parking stuff on? Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like to uh, move, and I assure the, the House uh, that I'll be very brief on this. The arguments have been pretty well rehearsed, and I won't uh, uh, extend them, but I nevertheless think it's fairly important. So I will move formally that the Senate does not insist upon the amendment with which the House has disagreed. Uh, I'm aware that Senator Watson has an amendment to move to that, and, uh, and uh, I imagine Senator Kernow will want to come down and speak to it as well. But I just want to make a few points to make it clear the government's concern, even with the amendment which Senator Watson has now moved, which I accept is a significant step forward from where we were with the first amendment that was sent back with which the House disagreed. But the one, the one which he has circulated does solve two of the problems which I had and I recognise that. But it still causes two problems. The, the first and most obvious problem is a revenue problem. It, it, it will cost uh, the revenue. Uh, it's very hard to be specific, but my very personal estimate, it is not an official estimate, is that it will cost the revenue about $10 million. Mm -hmm. Now, that means either $10 million less that we have with which to provide public services, 10 million we have to get from some other taxpayers, or, or an increase in the deficit of 10 million. One of those three things. And I think you've got to, each time we propose an amendment thinking we're being generous to one group, we've got to reflect on the fact that we're, being, we're punishing someone else. That's the first. The second is it imposes an inequity. Let me just give you two examples. We have, if the, if the amendment is accepted, if the amendment proposed by Senator Watson is accepted, we get two absurdities. One is that 
the Vice Chancellor of the University of Melbourne will be able to park tax free in the centre of Melbourne and the tutor of the university who gets paid about the same as a low to middle range uh, clerk in any private sector institution, they'll be able to, but the vice, let me come back to the tutors because I want to make a comment about that, but the vice chancellor of the university will be able to park tax free, but the person who comes to uh, paint the building will not be able to do so. If they have free car parking back at their headquarters, the clerk in any public service or private sector on one-tenth of the salary of the vice-chancellor will not. Now, I don't blame the vice-chancellor for being concerned about that. What I can't work out is why the Senate is concerned about it. The second concern, the second ridiculous anomaly, let me have a look. Senator Kerno raised with me privately and then in her interjection the analogy of the university tutor. Let me put this to you, Senator Kerno. What you are proposing is that that university tutor will be able to drive into the university, park in the staff car park tax-free, but the person who works in the bank on the university campus will not. The person who works anywhere where they are not employees of the university will be doing exactly the same thing, but their tax situation will be different. Now, I think you're creating absurd anomalies and we would very strongly suggest that uh, it is not the most appropriate thing to do and we would, uh, I hope, that the Senate will take this last opportunity to reconsider its position. I don't wish to take any more of the Senate's time than that. Senator Watson. I thank the Parliamentary Secretary for his comments. The hour is late. I thank also the Parliamentary Secretary for advising the Senate of the cost of the revenue of $10 million. We acknowledge that uh, the cost of the revenue is a significant amount of money and could well be in that order. We do not dispute that amount. The Senate has to honour a commitment to the budget in terms of this bill of $90 million. That $90 million will be met and will be exceeded by a quite a significant amount. The Senate may recall that when we examined the budget papers, the figure for car parking was $120 million. That was based on the premise of a start-up date in April. By the government's own action, the deferral is to the 1st of July. Further, by the government's own action, in terms of the amendments that it made, initiated through this House in terms of the Fringe Benefit Assessment Act, the grossing up impact reduced the second year's take quite significantly. So, by the government's own action, it has significantly reduced the revenue from car parking on two accounts. The Parliamentary Secretary mentioned certain inequities. I put it to you, Parliamentary Secretary, this car parking bill is full of inequities. The one kilometre discrimination. You can have one part of your factory within the one kilometre. You have another part of the fa factory just across the road or down the road outside the one kilometre. It's full of discrimination. But haven't you any concern, haven't you any compassion for those struggling demonstrators in the physics labs and the chemistry labs and the, right, who are working part-time, struggling to get a, a, an undergraduate degree, working for a postgraduate degree, and also think of also not only the demonstrators but the part-time tutors. You might have been one yourself. Think of all those people who came up the hard way, pulling themselves up by the bootstraps, coming into, in, onto campus right, in the old Volkswagen, etc. However, now you've, you've selected the vice chancellors. I'm selecting the struggling people because I put it to you, parliamentary secretary. This whole bill is not going to attract the tax from the sort of people that you say it is. Yes, it will. But the real people that you are catching are the poor workers, those who work and who park in the, at the back of the factory, around Tullamarine, etc. 
What's the boss going to say, boys, out on the street because of the car parking legislation? Because it's going to cost us too much, too much money or cost you your jobs, your job or out on the street for your car. Full of discrimination. So don't come to me with a sad story at the university. But, Parliamentary Secretary, universities are short of money, TAFEs are short of money, schools are short of money. And the whole purpose, uh, the whole purpose of these amendments, really, are designed to help those who have a lesser ability to pay. We have tremendous concerns about the impact on the business community because we don't like taxes on business. But we also have a far greater concern about those sections of the community who have a lesser ability to pay. Now, I must respond to the manner in which the parliamentary secretary in the other house uh, had some concerns about uh, our inclusion of uh, religion, uh, etc., and religious institutions. And he quite rightly said that the ministers of religion, in the pursuit of their pastoral duties, are not subject to the same degree of fringe benefits taxes as others. But I put it to you, parliamentary secretary, what about the part-time secretary who comes in five hours a day for one day a week is going to get caught but, and the church has got to pay the fringe benefits car park tax. Or the church gardener who comes in, works you know, six or seven hours mowing the lawns, cleaning up all the, and the cleaners, etc., works behind the parks behind the church, again going to get caught by the fringe benefits tax. These are the people that that parliamentary secretary down there, in following his prescribed notes so closely, right, uh, failed to acknowledge. You, see, you can always draw exceptions, but we are concerned about, we are concerned about uh, these particular categories, and uh, I'd like to thank all those who have contributed uh, to this new amendment that I now move on behalf of the coalition. Uh, and that the committee does not insist on the amendment that is agreed to by the House of Representatives but proposes the following amendment in substitution. Clause 5, page 5, at the end of the clause, add the following subclause to section 58G of the Principal Act is amended by adding at the end of the following subsection to if the employer of an employee is a, a scientific institution other than an institute carrying on by a company, society or association, the purpose of profit or gain to its individual shareholders or members, or b, a religious institution or c, a charitable institution or d, a public educational institution, the following benefits provided in respect of the employment of that employee are exempt benefits. An eligible car parking benefit, a eligible car parking expense payment benefit, and f, a car parking benefit. Now, I move that on behalf of the, uh, of the Federal uh, Coalition, Liberal National Parties. Now, may I just explain the difference between this amendment and the amendment that I originally sent down to the House was that my amendment was in terms of the Car Parking Act. I have now included my amendment as part of the Fringe Benefit Assessment Act. This is a lot neater procedure in terms of people wanting to uh, index and follow in proper sequence over time uh, the effect of the exemption on these particular institutions. It's far easier to go to the Fringe Benefits Act, which is readily available, readily out, rather than a separate little act called the Car Parking Act. Now, the intention, of course, with the Car Parking Act was that it did get incorporated in the Fringe Benefit Act. And uh, so, uh, so it's a tidying up process, and I thank the tax office for the assistance which they have given us, and uh, uh, that is acknowledged. So on behalf of the coalition, I move that particular amendment. And, uh, and I must say that uh, since this has been mentioned, there's been almost all party sort of support for this sort of, uh, for, for, you know, uh, around the traps, put it that way, for uh, this particular uh, amendment that we're, we're putting, and I think it will be immensely popular uh, in, in, amongst the uh, s public educational institutions, the uh, charitable institutions. Now, you might say a couple of those terms are, a couple of those terms are perhaps a little superfluous, but I think it indicates our intention to include them in it. I thank the Parliamentary Secretary for his goodwill. I would ask the Honourable Senator Standing to take a seat. Senator Cannon. Mr Chairman, Senator Watson is particularly persuasive at this uh, late hour of the morning. 
Look, we, we've given this a lot of consideration, and we can all use selective examples. We've heard the vice chancellor, we've heard the, the painter, um, we've heard the tutor. I think the question is the Im what, what will be the impact of this on particularly um, public educational institutions who will have a choice of absorbing the cost or passing it on. And uh, if it is passed on, then this is a, a, an impost on those who seek the services of these public educational institutions. And I, I really think that in, in recent years these institutions have been starved of funds. Now, Senator Schott interjected a little while ago, well, we, just can't, we can't raise the revenue to give these institutions more money. Well, I mean, there's no suggestion of this revenue being tied. I mean, all of this revenue goes into the black hole. Yes, I know. Just like Hex was going to be, Hex was going to find its way back into education. All those, oh, <laughs> oh yeah, yes. So you know, it, it is. It's just a revenue-raising measure. Uh, okay, Senator Watson's uh, amendment is uh, said to be going to cost 10 million, and. Senator Watson has asserted previously that, that although the government has estimated this, the whole measure will raise them 90 million in the first year, that uh, his assessment is that it's going to be double that at least. There's, there's a huge amount, of, huge amount. There's a windfall coming to you, and you want to quibble. You want to quibble over 10 million at this stage. <coughs> Beg your pardon. It is, it is. But don't but let's not lose sight of what you're going to make out of it either, Parliamentary Secretary. So um, well to be brief, we uh, we we are attracted to Senator Watson's uh, amendment. Senator Short. Uh, just wanna just say on this uh, this amendment. I, I appreciate the bona fides of Senator Watson in raising this issue protecting inst scientific institutions, schools, churches. It's basically, supporting, it's basically supporting the motherhood groups in the community that all of us uh, would support, uh, would naturally feel obliged to support. But I really think that the question at stake is an issue of equity. Now, it is true, Senator Watson, that uh, you say there are uh, inequities in the kilometre, whether it's one kilometre or one and a half kilometres, wherever you draw the line, if you're on the wrong side of the line. But it, what it means is if you're inside the line, no matter what your income, no matter who you are, you have to pay. What you're doing with this amendment is putting another inequity in. You're putting another equity, putting another inequity in, in that if you happen to be in a certain occupation, you will get an advantage. And uh, if it's not, and uh, if it's not just the, uh, if it's not just the example of the chancellor of a vice chancellor of a university. Uh, there are many other people who are on medium and upper medium level incomes, but even low income earners who may be affected in these institutions. There are other very low income earners in that kilometre range working in the private sector who will also be affected and have to pay. So what I find is that you are doing is that within that one kilometre range, once you define the boundary, I think it is an I think it is an equitable it is an equitable that if you happen to be in the private sector you have to pay but if you're in the public sector or in a in a general charitable area uh, religious area you don't pay now well the, em the employer pays right the employer the employer pays and what we're saying is if you happen to if you if you happen to be, if you, what, what I'm saying is, you happen to be in private sector uh, employer, you have to pay. If you're a certain public sector, charitable institution, etc., you don't have to pay. And, uh, and then, what, what I'm always intrigued about, Senator Watson, is when you draw up lists, you always find somebody who goes out of their way with a clever tax accountant to find a way to broaden that exemption to, uh, into definitions. Now, I notice in A, uh, 2A, you say, other than an institution carried on by a company, so company, society or association for the purposes of profit or to gain to its individual shareholders or members. Now, many of our universities, for example, are now setting up 
private companies, subsidiary companies, to commercialise their research, to take advantage of the encouragement we have given to make profit. No, well, because they want to take advantage of their research. So if you happen to be, if you happen to be the head of a particular research section that is a commercial operation as well, making a profit, uh, you're not going to pay. You're not going to pay. Uh, have to pay under your amendment the tax. But if down the road you happen to be a private enterprise research body uh, making a profit, uh, which they want to make a profit, commercialisation, you do have to pay. This is where I think you run into the problem of creating an inequity and a different whether people are high income or low income earners within the one kilometre. Your argument about one kilometre is a different argument. What I say to you, argue is that in terms of real equity, once you're inside the line, there should be no exemptions. The final point I want, once, what final point I want to say in a practical way, many people in those institutions uh, will get a real advantage. They'll be using their car park. Take my own case in South Australia, Adelaide University. It is, an, it is in the prime site of almost the central centre of the central business district of Adelaide. It has hundreds of car parks for staff. They will all be exempt, but the social advantages for those staff to use that car park, which they can, of a weekend after hours to, for their social amenity of going to uh, uh, shopping, uh, going to entertainment and so on, will be an advantage. They get that, that is a real advantage to be able to park your car in the Adelaide University grounds close to the central business district, all the entertainment areas of Adelaide. They will pay nothing, but if you're in the private sector, a hundred yards down the road, you will have to pay. I don't, I don't think an institution like the Adelaide University should be exempt. I think it creates an equity that, uh, uh, that will create some sense of, dis of, uh, of, uh, of upset, of uh, envy between two different groups of people. And I really think that the amendment, I can understand in a, sim in a simple way, it seems good, but you are creating real inequity between groups of people within the one kilometre. And therefore, uh, I'd urge you, Senator Watson and, uh, and Senator Kerno from the Democrats, to consider the issue of real equity. Mr. Mr. Chairman, just can, I, can, can I respond to a number of the points raised by Senator Schott? I think it's very important that we clarify the issue that the employers pay the fringe benefit tax on behalf of the employees. In effect, Mr Chairman, it is a poll tax, and the rate of poll tax is, is determined by the price that, uh, at, the, at the nearest um, uh, commercial parking, pa parking station, uh, admittedly the, the, the lowest one. But, so that, that parking station does not discriminate between the rich fellows and the very poor fellows, and this is another bad feature of this tax. Like a lot. Fancy putting a tax on the rich at the same level as the poor, and, and this is effective. And this is effectively what we are doing. But come on. So, 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 so what, what, what we're looking at? We're seeing a poll tax imposed by this government that discriminates, what? Very, very strongly against the lower sections of the community. Now. You know, I, I'm quite appalled by it. a man who, of the humanity and humility of Senator Schott sort of supporting, uh, supporting this tax to be imposed on universities. And, you know, uh, it is late in the night, and perhaps we'd better stop talking, I think, before we say something that's... I think so. <laughs> the question is that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Right. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the motion as amended be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the resolution be reported. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The chairman of committees. Uh Senator Colston reports that the committee has considered message number 750 from the House of Representatives in relation to the Taxation Laws Amendment to Car Parking Bill 1992. It does not insist on the amendment disagreed to by the House of Representatives but has agreed to an amendment in substitution. 
Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Acting Deputy President, I move that the report of the committee be adopted and in the process I just make a very brief statement because senators will undoubtedly be concerned that we might be about to have a bit of our famous late night uh, legislative ping pong. I can assure you reluctantly that we are not and that the House of Representatives will accept the amendment which you've just passed. And uh, next time you have a, p a pet project which you would like funded, come and see me and I'll tell you why we haven't got the revenue to do it. Clark? Sorry, the question, the question is the uh, motion be agreed to? The report of the committee be adopted. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The following message has been received from the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives returns to the Senate the bill entitled A Bill for an Act to Amend the Law Relating to Taxation and acquaints the Senate that the House of Representatives has agreed to amendments numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9 and 10 made by the Senate, has disagreed to amendment number 8 made by the Senate, but in place thereof has made the amendment as indicated by the annexed schedule and has agreed to amendment number 11 of the Senate with the amendment as shown in the said schedule. The House of Representatives desires the concurrence of the Senate in the amendment made by the House of Representatives in place of Senate amendment number 8 and in the amendment made by the House of Representatives to amendment number 11 of the Senate. Parliamentary Secretary. I move that the message be considered in Committee of the Whole forthwith. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. I don't think the ayes have it. Order. The committee is considering message number 757 from the House of Representatives in relation to the Taxation Laws Amendment Bill number 5, 1992. Uh, Mr Senator Chairman, I move one, uh, that one, the committee does not insist upon the Senate's Amendment number 8 to which the House of Representatives has disagreed and agrees to the amendment made by the House in place thereof, and two, the committee agrees to the amendment made by the House of Representatives to the Senate's Amendment number 11. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Senator Watson. Thank you, Mr Chairman. The uh, return schedule uh, does appear to meet the Liberal National Party Coalition's uh, amendment, which was passed by the Senate on the 16th of December 1992, and was, which was subsequently, I think, rejected today by the House of Representatives. Now, honourable senators will note that in lieu of the date uh, that was agreed to by the Senate, being, I think, the 5th of uh, November, wasn't it, N 1992, that the return date from the House of Representatives, uh, the agreed date, was budget night of the 18th of August, uh, 1992. Um, given this change date, very long and considered um, thought, in that we regret that the budget papers were written in such a way that there was a doubt so far as the ordinary reasonable man was concerned about whether operating leases came within the ambit of the definition of royalty. And for that reason we believe that it was incumbent on government to so frame their budget documents to make sure not that the top ten tax experts in Australia understand what the government meant, but what the ordinary reasonable man in Australia meant. Now, as a result of our backtracking, there will be some harm and some hurt to at least one particular company that made a very passionate appeal to a number of senators and to the Bills Committee. In fact, um, I think uh, all those who were present at that meeting were, were very deeply moved by the comments that were made, and those comments led to the coalition framing our original amendment 
to ensure that there was no retrospectivity, that contracts validly made, which now appear to be prior to budget night, will not get caught up retrospectively in terms of the new legislation. We on the side of this House have a, something of an abhorrence to retrospective legislation. So it's retrospective legislation not of a kind of changing tax rates, but of fundamentally altering the structure of the taxation that is going to apply to those particular payments. I remind the Senate that these particular payments would be sub and uh, arrangements, dividend withholding, royalty withholding tax, were actually scrutinised by the tax department, quite open. Tax was paid on an assessment basis, depending where they went. In some cases, there was a uh, exemption, and, uh, and assessments were made in relation to this withholding tax. Then along comes the government on budget night and changes the whole basis, and effectively, where the companies in Australia are responsible for the tax, the rate is up to 43 per cent gross, a very draconian rate. I understand why. They're trying to discourage certain payments that go off to uh, places like Jersey or tax haven countries. But I remind you that we've got to be very careful in this country that in trying to eliminate tax avoidance, there are a lot of other genuine contracts that go off to a, lo a lot of other countries around the world that are not necessarily tax haven countries. Ta countries that have built up degrees of expertise where in Australia we require their we require that expertise to be transferred, to be used and to be developed here in Australia. And it's generally in the scientific area, the new technology. And these are the industries that we should be trying to promote and to encourage in Australia. Now, I know there will always be people who will try and minimise tax arrangements. But, and uh, so we, we fully in agree, we, we hold no. As, as, as an opposition, we believe that it is right and, right and pro proper to plug loopholes within the law, which people are exploiting. But where contracts have been validly made, we believe that uh, they should expire before the new rules are going to apply. And you'll, you'll note that we've been particularly concerned that uh, in the definition of contract that there's been no extension arrangements allowed. So we're fairly tight on it. So I think our bona fides in terms of the tax avoidance debate are quite clear, but it's the retrospective effect, the impact that it's going to have on industry and on employment. And uh, because in relation to one particular exception, there will be an impact, but it will, because it's going back to budget night, it won't wipe out entirely the com company. True, it will have some severe financial ramifications, but I think we've got to consider that good law is not made by uh, hard cases, or put it this way, bad law often results from hard, hard cases. So uh, the normal situation is to apply as from the announcement or as from budget night. And uh, with that warning given to government, if they continue to so frame their announcements in ambiguous or unclear terms that the ordinary reasonable man ca can't understand, we may have in future to insist on a later date. I thank the, the parliamentary secretary. I thank our colleagues for the, uh, the support that they've given this, this amendment. Senator Kerno. Mr Chairman, it sounds like... Um Senator Watson's done one of those opposition deals with the government on this matter. I can't um, believe that, Senator Watson. I thought any Democrats were allowed to do that. But that deal has uh, improved upon the original bill to some extent. And the only point I wanted to make is when Senator uh, McMullen, when we last uh, talked about this amendment, uh, was talking about opposition and Democrats being uh, assisting tax avoidance, and we made the point about um, pursuing purity at the expense of uh, jobs for Australians. I mean, I just ask you to imagine 
um, a boss going up to an employee and saying, well, look, you know, the government's doing a great thing. It's just decided to put a tax on non-residents who are rorting the Australian tax system. That's a great idea. Unfortunately, though, the impact of it is that uh, it's going to be a, a tax under contracts that we've just signed where this is going to have a huge financial impact on us and we're probably going to have to lay off the whole 175 of you. And that's what Senator Watson was saying. In the pursuit of tax purity, we're prepared to sacrifice people's jobs. And, and I just don't think we can do that at this point in time. We're not mad about this as a matter of principle, but we won't pursue it. Well, the question is that the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the resolution be reported to the Senate. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Chairman of Committee, Senator Colston, reports that the Committee has considered message number 757 from the House of Representatives in relation to the Taxation Laws Amendment Bill No. 5, 1992, and reports that it, one, does not insist upon the Senate's Amendment No. 8, to which the House of Representatives has disagreed, and agrees to the amendment made by the, by the House in place thereof, and two, agrees to the amendment made by the House of Representatives to the Senate's Amendment No. 11. Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Acting Deputy President, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. A clerk. A message has been received from the House of Representatives acquainting the Senate that the House of Representatives has made the requested amendment to the Customs Tariff Amendment Bill No. 1992. Parliamentary Secretary. We read a third time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Customs Tariff Act 1987. A message has been received from the House of Representatives returning the Petroleum Submerged Lands Amendment Bill 1992 and acquainting the Senate that the House of Representatives has agreed to it without amendment. Parliamentary Secretary. Yep. Messages have been received from the House of Representatives acquainting the Senate that the House of Representatives has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate in the Social Security Legislation Amendment Bill No. 3, 1992, and the Corporate Law Reform Bill, 1992. Clark. Business Order of the Day, Rural Adjustment Bill, 1992, and Associated Bills in Committee. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken no, as a whole? No. Hold on. We have to deal with this one first. Well, mm. bill which the, uh, Isn't that what we're doing? No. That, that bill. Uh, well, we'll, be, we'll deal with the um, Rural Adjustment Act 1992. Uh, is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it's so ordered. The question is that this bill stand as printed. Senator Lees. Thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, Madam Chair. I uh, seek leave to move amendments one and two together. I'm sorry, Senator Lees. My amendments together, amendments one and two together. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave granted, Senator Lees. I move those amendments and just speak briefly to them. Uh, they are to add an extra four people to the council, and I think anyone who has uh, read uh, this bill will realise how important the Rural Adjustment uh, uh, Council is going to be. It's going to be the body now that uh, will be advising government and will have a major impact on the future of agriculture in this country. And these amendments uh, add four people to it to bring it up to 11. Two of those people are to be appointed because of their expertise in banking and two because of their expertise in rural counselling services. 
Senator Tamling. Um, Madam Chairman, these um, amendments increase the size of the Rural Adjustment Scheme Advisory Council from 7 to 11 and make provisions for four additional members to come from banking, uh, two of them, and, for, and rural counselling, that's two areas. The bill already makes it quite clear that there will be diversity on the council, with one representative from state government, one representative from the Commonwealth government, one representative from primary industry, one representative from the uh, NFF, and the rest with experience in financial matters, including banking. The coalition is of the view uh, that the Democrat concerns uh, are already covered in the bill uh, and will not be supporting the amendment. Minister. Uh, Madam Chairman, um, uh, I have uh, a series of Democrat amendments, but the one that uh, I guess I should start with is the one I'm most familiar with. The view of the government is to uh, not accept any of these amendments. And uh, the amendment moved by Senator Lees um, dealing with clause 6, page 3 and clause 6, page 3, paragraph 3d. On that amendment, I should say that the key points are that the administration of rural adjustment of the Rural Adjustment Scheme, RAS, is devolved, of course, to the state RAS authorities. The Rural Adjustment Scheme Advisory Council is intended to provide oversighting at the strategic level by the Commonwealth and monitoring of the effectiveness of this scheme. It's therefore inappropriate to expand the size of the um, Rural Adjustment Scheme Advisory Council, which could lead to the perception of increased Commonwealth direction and upset the balanced relationships with the states. And the expertise sought by the expanded membership is well covered, in our view, by the expertise criteria for membership outlined under Clause 6.3 of the Bill. The membership will include members who specifically have expertise in rural counselling and in banking. In addition, a membership of eight is considered to be the maximum for an effective working size given the role and functions proposed for the Council, 12, including a chairperson, as proposed in the amendment, would be far too uh, unwieldy in our view. The proposed amendment is to some extent factually incorrect. The rural counselling services are part of a joint Commonwealth state program which is separate from the rural adjustment scheme. There are no state rural adjustment schemes in that sense. As I've said, the government will not be supporting these amendments. I note that there are a number of other amendments that have been moved as well. We will not be supporting those either. The question is the amendments moved by Senator Lees be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. The question is the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. We move to the States Grants Rural Adjustment Act 1988. The question is that this bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. We move to an act relating to the provision of income support, otherwise referred to as the Farm Household Support Act 1992. The question is that this bill stand as printed. Senator Lees. If I could just ask the minister several questions on this bill. Firstly, can he give uh, a commitment that accessing the uh, new child support payment, that is what was formerly known as family allowance, family allowance supplement, is not ruled out by the farm household support provision that no other support payment is received? I, uh, I, I'm just checking with my adviser. I have no instructions on that at the moment. If there are some other questions, perhaps I can suggest that uh, they be put, and I'll obtain instructions on that first que question, Senator Lees, in a moment. Senator Lees. Uh, Minister, you can understand, I'm sure, how uh, concerned farm families are that they could lose their family allowance and family allowance supplement, or what is now known as the child support payment. And that's why I'm asking. I have been specifically requested. To, uh, to get a commitment uh, on that uh, well, this morning. Uh, the next question I have is about the, how the Social Security will treat the re-establishment grants once farmers are actually off the land, presumably in the city, looking for work. 
if they cannot find work, um, how is that uh, perhaps as much as 45,000 going to be counted? Do they have to spend most of it, in other words, get down to their, their liquid asset threshold level, which if they're independent and single will be about 5,000, with family I think it's 10, um, or are they able to somehow treat that, that, have that treated differently by Social Security if they uh, do in fact find themselves on unemployment benefits? Minister. Perhaps I uh, am in a position now, Madam uh, Chairman, to, uh, to deal with the first question Senator Lees uh, put to me. The uh, briefing I have uh, in the summary of the Farm Household Support Bill uh, says, uh, and I think this does cover the point you raised, Senator Lees, that the Farm Household Support Scheme outlined in this bill is to commence, of course, on the 20th of March 1993. It replaces the household support provisions of Part C of the old Rural Adjustment Scheme. The uh, Farm Household Support Scheme is essentially a loan available for up to two years for farmers who are unable to obtain carry-on finance from commercial sources or RAS support. Its purpose is to assist farmers to meet the daily living requirements of the farm family. I think that does answer, the, uh, I think that does answer your first question. Are you shaking your head? I understand perfectly what you've just said, but does that exclude them from child support payments? Every other family in the country, given uh... no, it does not exclude them from family support payments. Well, the question is, oh, Senator Lees. Can I now ask uh, for the second question to be answered? That's the one as to how the grants will be treated by Social Security once farmers, presumably find themselves in the city and probably, given uh, the unemployment situation at the moment, on unemployment benefits? Will they have to spend, in other words, live on it for months until they get it down below the um, liquid asset threshold, or will they have some special treatment so that they can keep that, perhaps um, looking eventually at buying a house or some such, and still tap immediately into unemployment benefits if necessary? Minister, did you My advice is, uh, Senator, that of course this is a loan, and it's a loan applicable while they're on the farm. If they leave the farm, the loan then doesn't apply. So if they if they transfer to the city, vacate the farm, as I'm advised, that means that uh, the loan doesn't apply, and they are a normal beneficiary as far as social welfare might be concerned. I'm not speaking, Minister, of the loan. I'm speaking of the grant, and uh, perhaps Senator Tambling might. Uh, uh, I think, Senator, it's uh, some $45,000 maximum, tapering out uh, once uh, the farmer actually gets more than that out of the farm and cutting out altogether at 90000 That's not a loan. That, that's the exit grant. Just a bit of patience, Senator Lees, and we might get there. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm advised it's inalienable. It, uh, uh, once they leave the farm with that, with that grant, um, they are then entitled, and I'll be careful about these words and I'll look for my advisers to correct me if I'm wrong, they'll be entitled to uh, then receive uh, any welfare benefits or whatever other benefits there might be in the normal way. In a normal way, as a person who is an, is an ordinary resident in the city would be entitled to receive payment. Senator Lees. I'm sorry, Minister, I realise it's getting very late, but an ordinary resident in the city would have that $45,000, which presumably will be in cash, treated as uh, a, an excessive amount of money in terms of Social Security, and they would have to spend that liquid asset down to presumably $10,000 for a family. That's Minister. right. They'll, they'll have to do that. It won't be available so that they've got a special treatment. They will have to spend it down until they are eligible to other payments. Senator Lees. Um, can I ask the minister, this is, relates to clause 50, what interest rate will the farmers be paying if they do indeed end up with a loan? Uh, 
Uh, my adviser is un unable to advise me. I, my understanding of this bill is that there is a lower interest rate than is normally commercially payable. Um, but uh, I'll ask my uh, adviser to check that and provide you with uh, exactly the answer in a few minutes. Senator Lees. Well, perhaps if I could ask the minister what terms the loan uh, will be uh, repaid on. If they leave the farm, they're supposed to repay it straight away. That's right. But when they're on the farm, yeah. Minister. Uh, I apologise to the Senate, but this is uh, a bit slow, unfortunately. The advice I have is this, that of course if they leave the farm and they have not repaid the, the loan, they then have to pay it, repay it in full. And if they don't, debt recovery proceedings will be instituted. While they remain on the farm, after, uh, after two years they have to commence repayment of the loan and the terms of the repayment are negotiable. It depends on the circumstances that each uh, individual landholder finds themselves in, and you know, obviously some assessment procedure will be made as to what is a fair uh, term for repayment. Senator Lees. Uh, my next question relates to clause uh, 41 on page 16, and uh, it may take just a moment if I can just explain it. There are a series of very heavy penalties, including imprisonment for six months and imprisonment for 12 months relating to a person who, uh, without reasonable excuse, refu refuses to fail or comply with a notice. And basically that is about uh, uh, actually notifying of change of circumstances. And it says specifically this section extends to acts, omissions, matters and things outside Australia, whether or not in a foreign country. And I ask the minister what sort of events outside Australia and likely to have an effect on your income do you have to notify? For ex for presumably things like a breakthrough in the GATT talks or floods in California. And I, I am serious about this because there is a very heavy penalty for not notifying. Minister. I'm advised that these are the standard provisions for all social security payments. This is not something specific to this program. It's something that applies uh, for all social security and it's applied in this program uh, routinely. It therefore contains no specific clauses about uh, rural life or farm life. It, uh, it applies on the general social security level. So farm, uh, earthquakes in California or floods in some other place aren't the criteria. Senator Lees. I therefore uh move <coughs> amendments and I seek leave to move uh, amendments 1, 5, 10, 11, 12 and 13 together. Leave Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you. These amendments seek to change the nature of the scheme from a loan scheme to a normal welfare payment while retaining the financial incentive offered for families to leave farming. In conjunction with other amendments, the effect is to extend the timeframes for decision making without such an onus on the first nine months. The Democrats believe the only strings which should be attached to basic household support are to make the farmer consult on a regular basis with rural diagnostic experts uh, so that they can ascertain very clearly what their situation is and to get some support to know what the options are and uh, to look at debt restructuring. Now, the minister's office has told us that basically this is already allowed for in the legislation so we don't have to move uh, anything to, to, write, to try and write it in. 
And uh, I reiterate that the amendments retain the incentive offered that if you decide to leave the farm uh, within the first nine months, you get the whole uh, nine months farm support as a grant. The Democrats believe that, plus access to re-establishment grants, provide adequate incentive to leave without the threat of another debt hanging over your head if you don't. The bottom line to us is that under the normal process of commercial loans, those farmers who are genuinely unviable will eventually be forced to leave the land anyway. I'm advised uh, that due to, some, due to some drafting complexities, these amendments may not be in 100 per cent accurate form. However, we do have confirmation that only another hour or two would be able to fix them up if it is the will of the Senate to pass these. And uh, rather than have any uh, delay to the initial consideration of these bills, I propose to deal with them as they are, uh, especially since both the government and the opposition have uh, indicated that they are not going to be supporting the amendments. Senator Tambly. Kill me. Kill, kill. Um, it's very uh, indicative that uh, we're dealing with this legislation at such a late oh, hour on the last day of the sitting uh, in the calendar year and possibly the last day uh, in the term of um, this government. Unfortunately, as has become the practice, uh, the government seems to schedule primary industry and rural affairs <laughs> matters, uh, whether it's in the appropriations debate or, or for Senate consideration. Uh, at this very late stage and late hour. I would indicate that it is now um, uh, 1.20 in the morning, um, and uh, we are now being forced to consider, as Senator Lees has said, very complex legislation and very complex um, uh, amendments. Well, we were um, given an indication a day or so ago by Senator Lees of the area she wished to pursue in, in this area, but the amendments themselves were not made available to us. Uh, in the present form until just before question time this afternoon. So uh, I think uh, I should indicate that uh, it would certainly be the coalition's policy to move towards grants, and we would certainly be intending to do that um, following the next election, which won't be that far away. But uh, we're certainly very sick and tired of amending the government's mistakes to legislation, uh, and that is obvious in the fact that the Democrats have had so many problems in drafting the technical amendments to this particular legislation. Um, there is, of course, and I, I think the minister has uh, possibly indicated that there's no guarantee that the government would accept any of these amendments at this particular time. The uh, National Farmers Federation uh, was not consulted regarding these amendments, and I believe that is an important consideration. And uh, they certainly want to see the legislation proceed. So the uh, fact that this consultation has not proceeded and the fact that the, the complexity and the, the manner in which these uh, amendments are being uh, foisted on us at the very last minute uh, and the fact that our policies are clear uh, and uh, it will be very much uh, a matter of supporting uh, the farmers, but uh, in this instance we will certainly not be supporting the amendments. Minister? It's not the intention of the government to support the amendments either. Uh, Madam, Act the, Madam Deputy uh, Chairman, uh, in summary, uh, we would explain our position as saying that the nature of these amendments changes the character, as character of the measures that we are proposing to put in place, and it changes the character of a loan to the character of a grant. On the, uh, on the face of it, that may seem to be something worthwhile, but uh, it's not appropriate in these circumstances. It, uh, it would confer a benefit uh, on this group, which other groups who don't have access to this sort of privilege would of course want as well. And uh, uh, it, it, it is not appropriate to, uh, to deal with these things uh, in this manner, so that rather than create uh, this sort of unnecessary precedent, we believe the loan approach is a uh, worthwhile way um, of uh, encouraging good farm management and a worthwhile way of, uh, of proceeding so that uh, farmers can evaluate their risk and take some responsibility as well. We oppose the amendments. The question is, the amendments moved by Senator Lees be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. Senator Lees. I move uh, the uh, package of amendments on a separate sheet titled Additional Amendments 1, 2, 3 and 4. I seek leave to move them together. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave granted. Senator Lees. 
Uh, these certainly are very tightly drafted and the intention is very, very clear. Indeed, the intention is to implement Liberal policy as best I understand it. These amendments retain but delay the loan component of the scheme so that the farm household support becomes at first a nine-month income tested welfare grant equivalent to JSA, which is not conditional on whether the farmer finally leaves or not. After nine months, it then becomes a loan. Now, I understand from my reading of what I can find of Liberal policy that this is it. This is uh, what they basically would do if, if in government. And while it's far from ideal as far as what the Democrats want, it's certainly a lot better than what the government is offering. And just to uh, listen to the minister's comments there, uh, it would be uh, fine if there was nothing other than a management problem on a farm. But looking at what's happening uh, on the west coast of South Australia at the moment, as of this morning, it seems that the entire crop now has gone, some $70 million uh, worth of crops that were to have been the saviour for many of those farmers. And we listened to Senator Boswell here on the night that we gave our second reading speeches talking about droughts in other parts of the country. There are so many things, Minister, that are well and truly out of the hands of our farmers. And uh, your legislation that we are finally dealing with tonight is probably going to see some 20 per cent of family farms uh, now in existence uh, close to the point where those people presumably will simply join the unemployment queues in the city. And I commend these amendments to the Senate. Senator Lees, before I call um, Senator Tamling or the Minister, I'm just wondering if you can uh, um, give us some direction as to the manner in which you intend to proceed. We're now talking about the amendments one to four marked as additional amendments. They, ha they had to be moved if the previous amendments failed, if the previous right. amendments failed, the, the contingent yes. amendments. On the previous package of amendments, which are numbered one to 15, not all of those have been moved. What do you intend to move the remaining amendments in that package? In two additional, additional packages after this group. Right. Thank you. Okay. Senator Tambling. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I can accept the point that Senator Lees makes with regard to the plight of uh, many fa farmers in Australia today, and certainly the point was made very clearly by my colleague Senator Boswell with regard to the situation in Queensland the other evening. Uh, his speech was certainly um, very far-reaching, and uh, I would certainly commend it uh, to anyone uh, in the farm industry. But uh, once again, we're seeing this. Uh, typical Democrat rush to uh, achieve things at the last minute uh, with um, hundreds of— there's a rush. The, the amendments were made available at 2 o'clock today, um, and um, uh, it's these, uh, our position has been very clear. Uh, our policy is well stated by the shadow minister, Mr Bruce Lloyd, and uh, certainly in government uh, we will amend this legislation to achieve all of the objectives that we have set forward in our policy. And we certainly won't be blackmailed by the Democrats uh, on technical amendments that are rushed at last minutes, which have been proposed without the proper consultation with the NFF uh, or particularly with the rural community, let alone parliamentary colleagues. Uh, we will not be supporting the amendments. Senator Lees. I can't let a lot of that nonsense go unanswered. I certainly have consulted with rural, rural groups. No, not with the NFF. I don't believe that the NFF truly represents the farmers that are going to be hit hard by this legislation. And uh, the, those in South Australia that I have consulted uh, can bear, uh, if you wish, uh, plenty of evidence to bring. For they have plenty of evidence to bring forward to show you why uh, the, uh, the government legislation, as it exists, is probably going to change the face of farming in Australia for the worse, forever. And uh, I simply say that basically these are what the Liberal Party proposes. I see absolutely no reason for them not supporting them. You have had the thrust of these amendments for well over a fortnight. These amendments have not changed in any substantial sense, and you have had these for over a week. And uh, I see that as a, as a very, very weak excuse to try now and say you haven't had time to consider them when I know you have. Senator Tambling. Madam Chairman, the only point I would wish to make in response to the comments just made by Senator Lees when she implies that this legislation and the amendments were made available a fortnight ago is I would just clearly indicate that the first occasion uh, on which uh, we, we saw the proposals for these amendments was on Tuesday of this week. Minister. Uh, the reason why we won't support these amendments is, has already been explained to the chamber by Senator Lees. That is, the Liberal Party amendments meant to embarrass the opposition in, in uh, forcing them to a vote. Well, that's an exercise that takes place in this place from time to time, but we won't be party to it. We'll oppose the amendments. 
The question is uh, the amendments one to four marked uh, on the sheet moved by Senator Lee's additional amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. The ayes have it. Is, is a division required? Bring the bells. Me if I want to vote, I have to sit down. Oh. Um. Lock the doors. The question is the four amendments moved by Senator Lees be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Bourne teller for the ayes, Senator Brownhill teller for the noes.
Order. The result of the division being ayes 8, noes 55. The question is resolved in the negative. Would honourable senators please resume their seats or leave the chamber?